This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Jakeway, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 51 Pyramus and Thisbe. About two thirds of the way along the Faubourg Saint Honor, and in the rear of one of the most imposing mansions in this rich neighborhood, where the various houses vie with each other for elegance of design and magnificence of construction, extended a large garden, where the wide-spreading chestnut trees raised their heads high above the walls in a solid rampart, and with the coming of every spring scattered a shower of delicate pink and white blossoms into the large stone vases that stood upon the two square pilasters of a curiously wrought iron gate that dated from the time of Louis the Twelfth. This noble entrance, however, in spite of its striking appearance and the graceful effect of the geraniums planted in the two vases, as they waved their variegated leaves in the wind and charmed the eye with their scarlet bloom, had fallen into utter disuse. The proprietors of the mansion had many years before thought it best to confine themselves to the possession of the house itself with its thickly planted courtyard, opening into the Faubourg saint Honore, and to the garden shut in by this gate, which formerly communicated with a fine kitchen garden of about an acre. For the demon of speculation drew a line, or in other words projected a street, at the farther side of the kitchen garden. The street was laid out, a name was chosen and posted up on an iron plate, but before construction was begun, it occurred to the possessor of the property that a handsome sum might be obtained for the ground then devoted to fruits and vegetables by building along the line of the proposed street, and so making it a branch of communication with the Faubourg saint Honore itself, one of the most important thoroughfares in the city of Paris. In matters of speculation, however, though man proposes, money disposes. From some such difficulty, the newly named street died almost in birth, and the purchaser of the kitchen garden, having paid a high price for it, and being quite unable to find anyone willing to take his bargain off his hands without a considerable loss, yet still clinging to the belief that at some future day he should obtain a sum for it that would repay him, not only for his past outlay, but also the interest upon the capital locked up in his new acquisition, contented himself with letting the ground temporarily to some market gardeners at a yearly rental of five hundred francs. And so, as we have said, the iron gate leading into the kitchen garden had been closed up and left to the rust, which bade fair before long to eat off its hinges, while to prevent the ignoble glances of the diggers and delvers of the ground from presuming to sully the aristocratic enclosure belonging to the mansion, the gate had been boarded up to a height of six feet. True, the planks were not so closely adjusted but that a hasty peep might be obtained through their interstices, but the strict decorum and rigid propriety of the inhabitants of the house left no grounds for apprehending that advantage would be taken of that circumstance. Horticulture seemed, however, to have been abandoned in the deserted kitchen garden, and where cabbages, carrots, radishes, peas, and melons had once flourished, a scanty crop of lucerne alone bore evidence of its being deemed worthy of cultivation. A small low door gave egress from the walled space we have been describing into the projected street, the ground having been abandoned as unproductive by its various renters, and had now fallen so completely in general estimation as to return not even the one-half per cent it had originally paid. Towards the house the chestnut trees we have before mentioned rose high above the wall, without in any way affecting the growth of other luxuriant shrubs and flowers that eagerly dressed forward to fill up the vacant spaces, as though asserting their right to enjoy the boon of light and air. At one corner, where the foliage became so thick as almost to shut out day, a large stone bench and sundry rustic seats indicated that this sheltered spot was either in general favor or particular use by some inhabitant of the house, which was faintly discernible through the dense mass of verdure that partially concealed it, though situated but a hundred paces off. Whoever had selected this retired portion of the grounds as the boundary of a walk, or as a place for meditation, was abundantly justified in the choice by the absence of all glare, the cool refreshing shade, 
the screen it afforded from the scorching rays of the sun, that found no entrance there even during the burning days of hottest summer, the incessant and melodious warbling of birds, and the entire removal from either the noise of the street or the bustle of the mansion. On the evening of one of the warmest days spring had yet bestowed on the inhabitants of Paris, might be seen negligently thrown upon the stone bench a book, a parasol, and a work basket, from which hung a partly embroidered cambric handkerchief, while at a little distance from these articles was a young woman, standing close to the iron gate, endeavoring to discern something on the other side by means of the openings in the planks. The earnestness of her attitude and the fixed gaze with which she seemed to seek the object of her wishes, proving how much her feelings were interested in the matter. At that instant the little side gate leading from the waste ground to the street was noiselessly opened, and a tall, powerful young man appeared. He was dressed in a common gray blouse and velvet cap, but his carefully arranged hair, beard, and mustache, all of the richest and glossiest black, ill accorded with his plebeian attire. After casting a rapid glance around him, in order to assure himself that he was unobserved, he entered by the small gate, and, carefully closing and securing it after him, proceeded with a hurried step towards the barrier. At the sight of him she expected, though probably not in such a costume, the young woman started in terror and was about to make a hasty retreat. But the eye of love had already seen, even through the narrow chinks of the wooden palisades, the movement of the white robe and observed the fluttering of the blue sash. Pressing his lips close to the planks, he exclaimed, Don't be alarmed, Valentine, it is I. Again the timid girl found courage to return to the gate, saying as she did so, And why did you come so late today? It is almost dinner time, and I had to use no little diplomacy to get rid of my watchful mother-in-law, my too devoted maid, and my troublesome brother, who is always teasing me about coming to work at my embroidery, which I am in a fair way never to get done. So pray excuse yourself as well as you can for having made me wait, and, after that, tell me why I see you in a dress so singular that at first I did not recognize you. Dearest Valentine, said the young man, the difference between our respective stations makes me fear to offend you by speaking of my love, but yet I cannot find myself in your presence without longing to pour forth my soul and tell you how fondly I adore you. If it be but to carry away with me the recollection of such sweet moments, I could even thank you for chiding me, for it leaves me a gleam of hope, that if you did not expect me, and that indeed would be worse than vanity to suppose, at least I was in your thoughts. You asked me the cause of my being late, and why I come disguised. I will candidly explain the reason of both, and I trust to your goodness to pardon me. I have chosen a trade. A trade? Oh, Maximilian, how can you jest at a time when we have such deep cause for uneasiness? Heaven keep me from jesting with that which is far dearer to me than life itself. But listen to me, Valentine, and I will tell you all about it. I became weary of ranging fields and scaling walls, and seriously alarmed at the idea suggested by you, that if caught hovering about here, your father would very likely have me sent to prison as a thief. That would compromise the honor of the French army, to say nothing of the fact that the continual presence of a captain of spies in a place where no warlike projects could be supposed to account for it, might well create surprise. So I have become a gardener, and, consequently, adopted the costume of my calling. What excessive nonsense you talk, Maximilian! Nonsense? Pray do not call what I consider the wisest action of my life by such a name. Consider, by becoming a gardener, I effectually screen our meetings from all suspicion or danger. I beseech of you, Maximilian, to cease trifling and tell me what you really mean. Simply, that having ascertained that the piece of ground on which I stand was to let, I made application for it was readily accepted by the proprietor, and am now master of this fine crop of lucerne. Think of that, Valentine. There is nothing now to prevent my building myself a little hut on my plantation, and residing not twenty yards from you. Only imagine what happiness that would afford me. I can scarcely contain myself at the bare idea. Such felicity seems above all price, as a thing impossible and unattainable. But would you believe that I purchase all this delight, joy, and happiness, for which I would cheerfully have surrendered ten years of my life, 
at the small cost of 500 francs per annum, paid quarterly? Henceforth we have nothing to fear. I am on my own ground and have an undoubted right to place a ladder against the wall and to look over when I please, without having any apprehensions of being taken off by the police as a suspicious character. I may also enjoy the precious privilege of assuring you of my fond, faithful, and unalterable affection whenever you visit your favorite bower, unless, indeed, it offends your pride to listen to professions of love from the lips of a poor workman clad in a blouse and cap. A faint cry of mingled pleasure and surprise escaped from the lips of Valentine, who almost instantly said in a saddened tone, as though some envious cloud darkened the joy which illumined her heart, Alas, no, Maximilian, this must not be, for many reasons. We should presume too much on our own strength, and, like others, perhaps, be led astray by our blind confidence in each other's prudence. How can you for an instant entertain so unworthy a thought, dear Valentine? Have I not, from the first blessed hour of our acquaintance, schooled all my words and actions to your sentiments and ideas? And you have, I am sure, the fullest confidence in my honor. When you spoke to me of experiencing a vague and indefinite sense of coming danger, I placed myself blindly and devotedly at your service, asking no other reward than the pleasure of being useful to you. And have I ever since, by word or look, given you cause of regret for having selected me from the numbers that would willingly have sacrificed their lives for you? You told me, my dear Valentine, that you were engaged to Monsieur Depinay, and that your father was resolved upon completing the match, and that from his will there was no appeal, as Monsieur de Villefort was never known to change a determination once formed. I kept in the background as you wished, and waited, not for the decision of your heart or my own, but hoping that Providence would graciously interpose in our behalf and order events in our favor. But what cared I for delays or difficulties, Valentine, as long as you confessed that you loved me and took pity on me? If you will only repeat that avowal now and then, I can endure anything. Ah, Maximilian, that is the very thing that makes you so bold and which renders me at once so happy and unhappy that I frequently ask myself whether it is better for me to endure the harshness of my mother-in-law and her blind preference for her own child, or to be, as I now am, insensible to any pleasure save such as I find in these meetings, so fraught with danger to both. I will not admit that word, returned the young man. It is at once cruel and unjust. Is it possible to find a more submissive slave than myself? You have permitted me to converse with you from time to time, Valentine, but forbidden my ever following you in your walks or elsewhere. Have I not obeyed? And since I found means to enter this enclosure to exchange a few words with you through this gate, to be close to you without really seeing you, have I ever asked so much as to touch the hem of your gown or tried to pass this barrier which is but a trifle to one of my youth and strength? Never has a complaint or a murmur escaped me. I have been bound by my promises as rigidly as any knight of olden times. Come, come, dearest Valentine, confess that what I say is true, lest I be tempted to call you unjust. It is true, said Valentine, as she passed the end of her slender fingers through a small opening in the planks, and permitted Maximilian to press his lips to them. And you are a true and faithful friend, but still you acted from motives of self-interest, my dear Maximilian. For you well knew that from the moment in which you had manifested an opposite spirit, all would have been ended between us. You promised to bestow on me the friendly affection of a brother. For I have no friend but yourself on earth, who am neglected and forgotten by my father, harassed and persecuted by my mother-in-law, and left to the sole companionship of a paralyzed and speechless old man, whose withered hand can no longer press mine, and who can speak to me with the eye alone although there still lingers in his heart the warmest tenderness for his poor grandchild. Oh, how bitter a fate is mine, to serve either as a victim or an enemy to all who are stronger than myself, while my only friend and supporter is a living corpse. Indeed, indeed, Maximilian, I am very miserable, and if you love me it must be out of pity. Valentine, replied the young man, deeply affected, I will not say you are all I love in the world, for I dearly prize my sister and brother-in-law, but my affection for them is calm and tranquil, in no manner resembling what I feel for you. When I think of you, my heart beats fast, the blood burns in my veins, and I can hardly breathe. 
but I solemnly promise you to restrain all this ardor, this fervor and intensity of feeling, until you yourself shall require me to render them available in serving or assisting you. Monsieur Franz is not expected to return home for a year to come, I am told. In that time many favorable and unforeseen chances may befriend us. Let us then hope for the best. Hope is so sweet a comforter. Meanwhile, Valentine, while reproaching me with selfishness, think a little what you have been to me, the beautiful but cold resemblance of a marble Venus. What promise of future reward have you made me for all the submission and obedience I have evinced? None whatever. What granted me? Scarcely more. You tell me of Monsieur Franz Stepinet, your betrothed lover, and you shrink from the idea of being his wife. But tell me, Valentine, is there no other sorrow in your heart? You see me devoted to you, body and soul, my life and each warm drop that circles round my heart are consecrated to your service. You know full well that my existence is bound up in yours, that were I to lose you I would not outlive the hour of such crushing misery. Yet you speak with calmness of the prospect of your being the wife of another. O oh, Valentine, were I in your place, and did I feel conscious, as you do, of being worshipped, adored, with such a love as mine, a hundred times at least should I have passed my hand between these iron bars, and said, Take this hand, dearest Maximilian, and believe that, living or dead, I am yours, yours only and forever. The poor girl made no reply, but her lover could plainly hear her sobs and tears. A rapid change took place in the young man's feelings. "'Dearest, dearest Valentine,' exclaimed he, "'forgive me if I have offended you, "'and forget the words I spoke "'if they have unwittingly caused you pain.' "'No, Maximilian, I am not offended,' answered she. "'But do you not see what a poor, helpless being I am, "'almost a stranger and an outcast in my father's house, "'where even he is seldom seen, "'whose will has been thwarted "'and spirits broken from the age of ten years, "'beneath the iron rod so sternly held over me, oppressed, mortified, and persecuted day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. No person has cared for, even observed my sufferings, nor have I ever breathed one word on the subject save to yourself. Outwardly and in the eyes of the world I am surrounded by kindness and affection, but the reverse is the case. The general remark is, oh, it cannot be expected that one of so stern a character as Monsieur Villefort could lavish the tenderness some fathers do on their daughters. What though she has lost her own mother at a tender age, she has had the happiness to find a second mother in Madame de Villefort. The world, however, is mistaken. My father abandons me from utter indifference, while my mother-in-law detests me, with a hatred so much the more terrible because it is veiled beneath a continual smile. "'Hate you, sweet Valentine?' exclaimed the young man. "'How is it possible for anyone to do that?' "'Alas!' replied the weeping girl." I am obliged to own that my mother-in-law's aversion to me arises from a very natural source, her overweening love for her own child, my brother Edward. But why should it? I do not know. But though unwilling to introduce money matters into our present conversation, I will just say this much, that her extreme dislike to me has its origin there, and I much fear she envies me the fortune I enjoy right of my mother, and which will be more than doubled at the death of Monsieur and Madame de saint Marin, whose sole heiress I am. Madame de Villefort has nothing of her own, and hates me for being so richly endowed. Alas, how gladly would I exchange the half of this wealth for the happiness of at least sharing my father's love. God knows I would prefer sacrificing the whole so that it would obtain me a happy and affectionate home. Poor Valentine! I seem to myself as though living a life of bondage, yet at the same time am so conscious of my own weakness that I fear to break the restraint in which I am held, lest I fall utterly helpless. Then, too, my father is not a person whose orders may be infringed with impunity. Protected as he is by his high position and firmly established reputation for talent and unswerving integrity, no one could oppose him. He is all-powerful even with the king. He would crush you at a word. Dear Maximilian, believe me when I assure you that if I do not attempt to resist my father's commands, it is more on your account than my own. But why, Valentine, do you persist in anticipating the worst? Why picture so gloomy a future? Because I judge it from the past. 
Still, consider that although I may not be, strictly speaking, what is termed an illustrious match for you, I am, for many reasons, not altogether so much beneath your alliance. The days when such distinctions were so nicely weighed and considered no longer exist in France, and the first families of the monarchy have intermarried with those of the empire. The aristocracy of the lands has allied itself with the nobility of the canon. Now I belong to this last-named class, and certainly my prospects of military preferment are most encouraging as well as certain. My fortune, though small, is free and unfettered, and the memory of my late father is respected in our country, Valentine, as that of the most upright and honorable merchant of the city. I say our country because you were born not far from Marseille. Don't speak of Marseille. I beg of you, Maximilian. That one word brings back my mother to my recollection, my angel mother who died too soon for myself and all who knew her but who, after watching over her child during the brief period allotted to her in this world, now, I fondly hope, watches from her home in heaven. Oh, if my mother were still living, there would be nothing to fear, Maximilian, for I would tell her that I loved you, and she would protect us. I fear, Valentine, replied the lover, that were she living, I should never have had the happiness of knowing you. You would then have been too happy to have stooped from your grandeur to bestow a thought on me. Now it is you who are unjust, Maximilian, cried Valentine. But there is one thing I wish to know. And what is that? inquired the young man, perceiving that Valentine hesitated. Tell me truly, Maximilian, whether in former days, when our fathers dwelt at Marseilles, there was ever any misunderstanding between them. Not that I am aware of, replied the young man, unless, indeed, any ill feeling might have arisen from their being of opposite parties. Your father was, as you know, a zealous partisan of the Bourbons, while mine was wholly devoted to the Emperor. There could not possibly be any other difference between them, but why do you ask? I will tell you, replied the young girl, for it is but right you should know. Well, on the day when your appointment as an officer of the Legion of Honor was announced in the papers, we were all sitting with my grandfather, Monsieur Nortier. Monsieur Danglars was there also. You recollect, Monsieur Danglars, do you not, Maximilian, the banker, whose horses ran away with my mother-in-law and little brother and very nearly killed them? While the rest of the company were discussing the approaching marriage of Mademoiselle Danglars, I was reading the paper to my grandfather, but when I came to the paragraph about you, although I had done nothing else but read it over to myself all the morning, you know you had told me all about it the previous evening, I felt so happy and yet so nervous at the idea of speaking your name aloud, and before so many people, that I really think I should have passed it over, but for the fear that my doing so might create suspicions as to the cause of my silence. So I summoned up all my courage and read it as firmly and as steadily as I could. Dear Valentine, well, would you believe it? Directly my father caught the sound of your name, he turned round quite hastily, and... Like a poor silly thing, I was so persuaded that everyone must be as much affected as myself by the utterance of your name, that I was not surprised to see my father start, and almost tremble, but I even thought, though that surely must have been a mistake, that Monsieur Danglars trembled too. Moral, moral, cried my father. Stop a bit. Then knitting his brows into a deep frown, he added, Surely this cannot be one of the moral family who lived at Marseilles and gave us so much trouble from their violent Bonapartism, I mean, about the year 1815. Yes, replied Monsieur Danglars, I believe he is the son of the old shipowner. Indeed, answered Maximilian, and what did your father say then, Valentine? Oh, such a dreadful thing that I don't dare to tell you. Always tell me everything, said Maximilian with a smile. Ah, continued my father, still frowning, their idolized emperor treated these madmen as they deserved. He called them food for powder, which was precisely all they were good for, and I am delighted to see that the present government have adopted this salutary principle with all its pristine vigor. If Algiers were good for nothing but to furnish the means of carrying so admirable an idea into practice, it would be an acquisition well worthy of struggling to obtain, though it certainly does cost France somewhat dear to assert her rights in that uncivilized country. Brutal politics, I must confess, said Maximilian. But don't attach any serious importance, dear, to what your father said. My father was not a bit behind yours in that sort of talk. 
Why, said he, does not the emperor, who has devised so many clever and efficient modes of improving the art of war, organize a regiment of lawyers, judges, and legal practitioners, sending them in the hottest fire the enemy could maintain, and using them to save better men? You see, my dear, that for picturesque expression and generosity of spirit, there is not much to choose between the language of either party. But what did Monsieur Dangler say to this outburst on the part of the procureur? Oh, he laughed, and in that singular manner so peculiar to himself, half malicious, half ferocious, he almost immediately got up and took his leave. Then, for the first time, I observed the agitation of my grandfather, and I must tell you, Maximilian, that I am the only person capable of discerning emotion in his paralyzed frame. And I suspected that the conversation that had been carried on in his presence, for they always say and do what they like before the dear old man, without the smallest regard for his feelings, had made a strong impression on his mind, for, naturally enough, it must have pained him to hear the emperor he so devotedly loved and served spoken of in that depreciating manner. The name of Monsieur Nortier, interposed Maximilian, is celebrated throughout Europe. He was a statesman of high standing, and you may or may not know, Valentine, that he took a leading part in every Bonapartist conspiracy set on foot during the restoration of the Bourbons. Oh, I have often heard whispers of such things that seem to me most strange. The father a Bonapartist, the son a Royalist. What can have been the reason of so singular a difference in parties and politics? But to resume my story, I turned towards my grandfather, as though to question him as to the cause of his emotion. He looked expressively at the newspaper I had been reading. What is the matter, dear grandfather? said I. Are you pleased? He gave me a sign in the affirmative. With what my father said just now, he returned a sign in the negative. Perhaps you liked what Monsieur Danglars said. Another sign in the negative. Oh, then you were glad to hear that Monsieur Morel, I didn't dare to say Maximilian, had been made an officer of the Legion of Honor? He signified assent. Only think of the poor old man's being so pleased to think that you, who were a perfect stranger to him, had been made an officer of the Legion of Honor. Perhaps it was a mere whim on his part, for he is falling, they say, into second childhood, but I love him for showing so much interest in you. How singular, murmured Maximilian. Your father hates me, while your grandfather, on the contrary? What strange feelings are aroused by politics? Hush, cried Valentine suddenly. Someone is coming. Maximilian leaped at one bound into his crop of lucerne, which he began to pull up in the most ruthless way, under the pretext of being occupied in weeding it. "'Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle!' exclaimed a voice from behind the trees. "'Madame is searching for you everywhere. There is a visitor in the drawing-room.' "'A visitor?' inquired Valentine, much agitated. "'Who is it?' "'Some grand personage. A prince, I believe they said. The Count of Monte Cristo.' "'I will come directly,' cried Valentine aloud. The name of Monte Cristo sent an electric shock through the young man on the other side of the iron gate to whom Valentine's I am coming was the customary signal of farewell. Now then, said Maximilian, leading on the handle of his spade, I would give a good deal to know how it comes about that the Count of Monte Cristo is acquainted with Monsieur de Villefort. End of chapter 51「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Jakeway. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 52. Toxicology. It was really the Count of Monte Cristo who had just arrived at Madame de Villefort's for the purpose of returning the procurer's visit. And at his name, as may be easily imagined, the whole house was in confusion. Madame de Villefort, who was alone in her drawing-room when the Count was announced, desired that her son might be brought thither, instantly to renew his thanks to the Count. And Edward, who heard this great personage talked of for two whole days, made all possible haste to come to him, not from obedience to his mother or out of any feeling of gratitude to the Count, but from sheer curiosity, and that some chance remark might give him the opportunity for making one of the impertinent speeches which made his mother say, Oh, that naughty child, but I can't be severe with him. He is really so bright. After the usual civilities, the Count inquired after Monsieur de Villefort. 
"'My husband dines with a chancellor,' replied the young lady. "'He has just gone, and I am sure he'll be exceedingly sorry "'not to have had the pleasure of seeing you before he went.' Two visitors who were there when the Count arrived, having gazed at him with all their eyes, retired after that reasonable delay which politeness admits and curiosity requires. "'What is your sister Valentine doing?' inquired Madame de Villefort of Edward. "'Tell someone to bid her come here, that I may have the honor of introducing her to the Count.' "'You have a daughter, then, Madame?' inquired the Count. "'Very young, I presume?' The daughter of Monsieur de Villefort, by his first marriage, replied the young wife, a fine, well-grown girl. But melancholy, interrupted Master Edward, snatching the feathers out of the tail of a splendid parquet that was screaming on its gilded perch, in order to make a plume for his hat. Madame de Villefort merely cried, Be still, Edward. She then added, This young madcap is, however, very nearly right, and merely re-echoes what he has heard me say with pain a hundred times for Mademoiselle de Villefort is, in spite of all we can do to rouse her, of a melancholy disposition and taciturn habit, which frequently injure the effect of her beauty. But what detains her? Go, Edward, and see. Because they are looking for her where she is not to be found. And where are they looking for her? With Grandpapa Nortier. And do you think she is not there? No, 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 she is not there, replied Edward, singing his words. "'And where is she, then? If you know, why don't you tell?' "'She is under the big chestnut-tree,' replied the spoiled brat, as he gave, in spite of his mother's commands, live flies to the parrot, which seemed keenly to relish such fare. Madame de Villefort stretched out her hand to ring, intending to direct her waiting-maid to the spot where she would find Valentine, when the young lady herself entered the apartment. She appeared much dejected, and any person who considered her attentively might have observed the traces of recent tears in her eyes. Valentine, whom we have in the rapid march of our narrative presented to our readers without formally introducing her, was a tall and graceful girl of nineteen, with bright chestnut hair, deep blue eyes, and that reposeful air of quiet distinction which characterized her mother. Her white and slender fingers, her pearly neck, her cheeks tinted with varying hues reminded one of the lovely English women who have been so poetically compared in their manner to the gracefulness of a swan. She entered the apartment, and seeing near her stepmother the stranger of whom she had already heard so much, saluted him without any girlish awkwardness, or even lowering her eyes, and with an elegance that redoubled the Count's attention. He rose to return the salutation. "'Mademoiselle de Villefort, my daughter-in-law,' said Madame de Villefort to Monte Cristo, leaning back on her sofa and motioning toward Valentine with her hand. "'And Monsieur de Monte Cristo, King of China, Emperor of Cochin China,' said the young imp, looking slyly towards his sister. Madame de Villefort at this really did turn pale, and was very nearly angry with this household plague who answered to the name of Edward. But the Count, on the contrary, smiled and appeared to look at the boy complacently, which caused the maternal heart to bound again with joy and enthusiasm. "'But, madame,' replied the Count, continuing the conversation and looking by turns at Madame de Villefort and Valentine, "'have I not already had the honor of meeting yourself and Mademoiselle before? I could not help thinking so just now. The idea came over my mind, and as Mademoiselle entered, the sight of her was an additional ray of light, thrown on a confused remembrance, excuse the remark. I do not think it likely, sir. Mademoiselle de Villefort is not very fond of society, and we very seldom go out, said the young lady. Then it was not in society that I met with Mademoiselle or yourself, madame, or this charming little merry boy. Besides, the Parisian world is entirely unknown to me, for, as I believe I told you, I have been in Paris but very few days. No, but perhaps you will permit me to call to mind. Stay. The Count placed his hand on his brow as if to collect his thoughts. No, it was somewhere away from here. It was... I do not know. But it appears that this recollection is connected with a lovely sky and some religious fate. Mademoiselle was holding flowers in her hand. The interesting boy was chasing a beautiful peacock in a garden. And you, madame, were under the trellis of some arbor. Pray come to my aid, madame. Do not these circumstances appeal to your memory? No, indeed, replied madame de Villefort. And yet it appears to me, sir, that 
If I had met you anywhere, the recollection of you must have been imprinted on my memory. Perhaps the Count saw us in Italy, said Valentine timidly. Yes, in Italy. It was in Italy, most probably, replied Monte Cristo. You have traveled then in Italy, mademoiselle? Yes, madame and I were there two years ago. The doctors, anxious for my lungs, had prescribed the air of Naples. We went by Bologna, Perugia, and Rome. Ah, yes, true, mademoiselle, exclaimed Monte Cristo, as if this simple explanation was sufficient to revive the recollection he sought. It was at Perugia, on Corpus Christi Day, in the garden of the Hotel des Postes, when chance brought us together. You, Madame de Villefort, and her son, I now remember having had the honor of meeting you. I perfectly well remember Perugia, sir, and the Hotel des Postes, and the festival of which you speak, said Madame de Villefort. But in vain do I tax my memory, of whose treachery I am ashamed, for I really do not recall to mind that I ever had the pleasure of seeing you before. It is strange, but neither do I recollect meeting with you, observed Valentine, raising her beautiful eyes to the Count. But I remember it perfectly, interposed the darling Edward. I will assist your memory, madame, continued the Count. The day had been burning hot. You were waiting for horses which were delayed in consequence of the festival. Mademoiselle was walking in the shade of the garden, and your son disappeared in pursuit of the peacock. And I caught it, mamma, don't you remember? interposed Edward and I pulled three such beautiful feathers out of his tail. You, madame, remained under the arbor. Do you not remember that while you were seated on a stone bench, and while, as I told you, Mademoiselle de Villefort and your young son were absent, you conversed for a considerable time with somebody? Yes, in truth, yes, answered the young lady, turning very red. I do remember conversing with a person wrapped in a long woolen mantle. He was a medical man, I think. Precisely so, madame. This man was myself. For a fortnight I had been at that hotel, during which period I had cured my valet de chambre of a fever, and my landlord of the jaundice, so that I really acquired a reputation as a skillful physician. We discoursed a long time, madame, on the different subjects, of Perugino, of Raphael, of manners, customs, of the famous Aquatafana, of which they had told you, I think you said, that certain individuals in Perugia had preserved the secret. Yes, true, replied Madame de Villefort, somewhat uneasily. I remember now. I do not recollect now all the various subjects of which we discoursed, Madame, continued the Count with perfect calmness. But I perfectly remember that, falling into the error which others had entertained respecting me, you consulted me as to the health of Mademoiselle de Villefort. Yes, really, sir, you were in fact a medical man, said Madame de Villefort, since you had cured the sick. Moliere or Beaumarchais would reply to you, madame, that it was precisely because I was not that I had cured my patients. For myself, I am content to say to you that I have studied chemistry and the natural sciences somewhat deeply, but still only as an amateur, you understand. At this moment the clock struck six. It is six o'clock, said madame de Villefort, evidently agitated. Valentine, will you not go and see if your grandpapa will have his dinner? Valentine rose, and, saluting the Count, left the apartment without speaking. "'Oh, madame,' said the Count, when Valentine had left the room, "'was it on my account that you sent Mademoiselle de Villefort away?' "'By no means,' replied the young lady quickly. "'But this is the hour when we usually give Monsieur Nortier the unwelcome meal that sustains his pitiful existence. "'You are aware, sir, of the deplorable condition of my husband's father?' "'Yes, madame, Monsieur de Villefort spoke of it to me. A paralysis, I think.' Alas, yes, the poor old gentleman is entirely helpless. The mind alone is still active in this human machine, and that is faint and flickering, like the light of a lamp about to expire. But excuse me, sir, for talking of our domestic misfortunes. I interrupted you at the moment when you were telling me that you were a skillful chemist. No, madame, I did not say as much as that, replied the Count with a smile. Quite the contrary. I have studied chemistry because, having determined to live in eastern climates, I have been desirous of following the example of King Mithridates. Mithridates Rex Ponticus, said the young scamp as he tore some beautiful portraits out of a splendid album, the individual who took cream in his cup of poison every morning at breakfast. Edward, you naughty boy, exclaimed Madame de Villefort, snatching the mutilated book from the urchin's grasp. You are positively past bearing. You really disturb the conversation. Go, leave us, and join your sister Valentine in dear Grandpapa Nortier's room. The album, said Edward sulkily. What do you mean, the album? I want the album. 
How dare you tear out the drawings? Oh, it, it amuses me. Go. Go at once. I won't go unless you give me the album, said the boy, seating himself doggedly in an armchair, according to his habit of never giving way. Take it, then, and pray disturb us no longer, said Madame de Villefort, giving the album to Edward, who then went towards the door, led by his mother. The Count followed her with his eyes. Let us see if she shuts the door after him, he muttered. Madame de Villefort closed the door carefully after the child, the Count appearing not to notice her. Then, casting a scrutinizing glance around the chamber, the young wife returned to her chair, in which she seated herself. "'Allow me to observe, madame,' said the Count, with that kind tone he could assume so well. "'You are really very severe with that dear, clever child.' "'Oh, sometimes severity is quite necessary,' replied Madame de Villefort, with all a mother's real firmness. It was his Cornelius Nepos that Master Edward was repeating, when he referred to King Mithridates, continued the Count, and you interrupted him in a quotation which proves that his tutor has by no means neglected him, for your son is really advanced for his years. The fact is, Count, answered the mother, agreeably flattered, he has great aptitude and learns all that is set before him. He has but one fault, he is somewhat willful. But really, on referring for the moment to what he said, do you truly believe that Mithridates used these precautions, and that these precautions were efficacious? I think so, madame, because I myself have made use of them, that I might not be poisoned at Naples, at Palermo, and at Smyrna, that is to say, on three several occasions when, but for these precautions, I must have lost my life. And your precautions were successful? Completely so. Yes, I remember now you're mentioning to me at Perugia something of this sort. Indeed, said the Count, with an air of surprise, remarkably well counterfeited, I really did not remember. I inquired of you if poisons acted equally and with the same effect on men of the North as on men of the South, and you answered me that the cold and sluggish habits of the North did not present the same aptitude as the rich and energetic temperaments of the natives of the South. And that is the case, observed Monte Cristo. I have seen Russians devour, without being visibly inconvenienced, vegetable substances which would infallibly have killed a Neapolitan or an Arab. And you really believe the result would be still more sure with us than in the East? And in the midst of our fogs and rains a man would habituate himself more easily than in a warm latitude to this progressive absorption of poison? Certainly, it being at the same time perfectly understood that he should have been duly fortified against the poison to which he had not been accustomed. Yes, I understand that, and how would you habituate yourself, for instance, or rather, how did you habituate yourself to it? Oh, very easily. Suppose you knew beforehand the poison that would be made use of against you. Suppose the poison was, for instance, brucine. Brucine is extracted from the false agnostura, is it not? inquired Madame de Villefort. Precisely, Madame, replied Monte Cristo. But I perceive I have not much to teach you. Allow me to compliment you on your knowledge. Such learning is very rare among ladies. Oh, I am aware of that, said Madame de Villefort. But I have a passion for the occult sciences, which speak to the imagination like poetry, and are reducible to figures like an algebraic equation. But go on, I beg of you. What you say interests me to the greatest degree. Well, replied Monte Cristo, suppose, then, that this poison was brucine, and you were to take a milligram the first day, two milligrams the second day, and so on. Well, at the end of ten days you would have taken a centigram. At the end of twenty days, increasing another milligram, you would have taken three hundred centigrams, that is to say, a dose which you would support without inconvenience, and which would be very dangerous for any other person who had not taken the same precautions as yourself. Well, then, at the end of a month, when drinking water from the same carafe, you would kill the person who drank with you, without your perceiving, otherwise than from slight inconvenience, that there was any poisonous substance mingled with this water. Do you know any other counterpoisons? I do not. I have often read and read again the history of Mithridates, said Madame de Villefort in a tone of reflection, and had always considered it a fable. No, madame, contrary to most history, it is true. But what you tell me, madame, what you inquire of me, is not the result of a chance query. For two years ago you asked me the same questions, and said then that for a very long time this history of Mithridates had occupied your mind. True, sir. The two favorite studies of my youth were botany and mineralogy, and subsequently, when I learned that the use of simples frequently explained the whole history of a people, 
and the entire life of individuals in the East, as flowers betoken and symbolize a love affair, I have regretted that I was not a man, that I might have been a flamel, a fontana, or a cabanas. And the more, madame, said Monte Cristo, as the Orientals do not confine themselves, as did Mithridates, to make a cuirass of his poisons, but they also made them a dagger. Science becomes in their hands not only a defensive weapon, but still more frequently an offensive one. The one serves against all their physical sufferings, the other against all their enemies. With opium, belladonna, brucea, snakewood, and the cherry laurel, they put to sleep all who stand in their way. There is not one of these women, Egyptian, Turkish, or Greek, whom here you call good women, who do not know how, by means of chemistry, to stupefy a doctor, and in psychology to amaze a confessor. Really, said Madame de Villefort, whose eyes sparkled with strange fire at this conversation. Oh, yes, indeed, Madame, continued Monte Cristo. The secret dramas of the East begin with a love filter and end with a death potion. Begin with paradise and end with hell. There are as many elixirs of every kind as there are caprices and peculiarities in the physical and moral nature of humanity. And I will say further, the art of these chemists is capable with the utmost precision to accommodate and proportion the remedy and the bane to yearnings for love or desires for vengeance. But, sir, remarked the young woman, these eastern societies, in the midst of which you have passed a portion of your existence, are as fantastic as the tales that come from their strange land. A man can easily be put out of the way there, then. It is indeed the Baghdad and Basora of the Thousand and One Nights. The sultans and viziers who rule over society there, and who constitute what in France we call the government, are really Harun al-Rashid's and Jafar's, who not only pardon a prisoner, but even make him a prime minister if his crime has been an ingenious one, and who, under such circumstances, have the whole story written in letters of gold to divert their hours of idleness and ennui. By no means, madame. The fanciful exists no longer in the East. There, disguised under other names, and concealed under other costumes, are police agents, magistrates, attorneys general, and bailiffs. They hang, behead, and impale their criminals in the most agreeable possible manner. But some of these, like clever rogues, have contrived to escape human justice, and succeed in their fraudulent enterprises by cunning stratagems. Amongst us, a simpleton, possessed by the demon of hate or cupidity, who has an enemy to destroy or some near relation to dispose of, goes straight to the grocers or druggists, gives a false name which leads more easily to his detection than his real one, and under the pretext that the rats prevent him from sleeping, purchases five or six grams of arsenic. If he is really a cunning fellow, he goes to five or six different druggists or grocers, and thereby becomes only five or six times more easily traced. Then, when he has acquired his specific, he administers duly to his enemy, or near kinsman, a dose of arsenic which would make a mammoth or mastodon burst, and which, without rhyme or reason, makes his victim utter groans which alarm the entire neighborhood. Then arrive a crowd of policemen and constables. They fetch a doctor who opens the dead body, and collects from the entrails and stomach a quantity of arsenic in a spoon. Next day a hundred newspapers relate the fact with the names of the victim and the murderer. The same evening the grocer or grocers, druggist or druggists, come and say, It was I who sold the arsenic to the gentleman, and rather than not recognize the guilty purchaser, they will recognize twenty. Then the foolish criminal is taken, imprisoned, interrogated, confronted, confounded, condemned, and cut off by hemp or steel. Or if she be a woman of any consideration, they lock her up for life. This is the way in which you northerns understand chemistry, madam. Desruz was, however, I must confess, more skillful. What would you have, sir, said the lady, laughing? We do what we can. All the world has not the secret of the Medicis or the Borgias. Now, replied the Count, shrugging his shoulders, shall I tell you the cause of all these stupidities? It is because, at your theatres, by what at least I could judge by reading the pieces they play, they see persons swallow the contents of a phial, or suck the bottom of a ring, and fall dead instantly. Five minutes afterwards the curtain falls and the spectators depart. They are ignorant of the consequences of the murder. They see neither the police commissary with his badge of office, nor the corporal with his four men, and so the poor fools believe that the whole thing is as easy as lying. But go a little way from France, go either to Aleppo or Cairo, or only to Naples or Rome, 
and you will see people passing by you in the streets, people erect, smiling, and fresh-colored, of whom Asmodeus, if you were holding on by the skirt of his mantle, would say, That man was poisoned three weeks ago. He will be a dead man in a month. Then, remarked Madame de Villefort, they have again discovered the secret of the famous Aquatifana that they said was lost at Perugia. Ah, but Madame, does mankind ever lose anything? The arts change about and make a tour of the world. Things take a different name and the vulgar do not follow them, that is all. But there is always the same result. Poisons act particularly on some organ or another, one on the stomach, another on the brain, another on the intestines. Well, the poison brings on a cough, the cough an inflammation of the lungs, or some other complaint catalogued in the book of science, which, however, by no means precludes it from being decidedly mortal, and if it were not, would be sure to become so, thanks to the remedies applied by foolish doctors, who are generally bad chemists, and which will act in favor of or against the malady as you please. And then there is a human being killed according to all the rules of art and skill, and of whom justice learns nothing, as was said by a terrible chemist of my acquaintance, the worthy Abbe Adelmont of Taormina in Sicily, who has studied these national phenomena very profoundly. It is quite frightful, but deeply interesting, said the young lady, motionless with attention. I thought I must confess that these tales were inventions of the Middle Ages. Yes, no doubt, but improved upon by ours. What is the use of time, rewards of merit, medals, crosses, Monthian prizes, if they do not lead society towards more complete perfection? Yet man will never be perfect until he learns to create and destroy. He does know how to destroy, and that is half the battle. So, added Madame de Villefort, constantly returning to her object, the poisons of the Borgias, the Medicis, the Rennes, the Rougieres, and later probably that of Baron de Tranc, whose story has been so misused by modern drama and romance, were objects of art, madame, and nothing more, replied the Count. Do you suppose that the real savant addresses himself stupidly to the mere individual? By no means. Science loves eccentricities, leaps and bounds, trials of strength, fancies, if I may be allowed so to term them. Thus, for instance, the excellent Abbe Adelmont, of whom I spoke just now, made in this way some marvelous experiments. Really? Yes, I will mention one to you. He had a remarkably fine garden, full of vegetables, flowers, and fruit. From amongst these vegetables he selected the most simple, a cabbage, for instance. For three days he watered this cabbage with a distillation of arsenic. On the third the cabbage began to droop and turn yellow. At that moment he cut it. In the eyes of everybody it seemed fit for table and preserved its wholesome appearance. It was only poison to the Abbey Adelmont. He then took the cabbage to a room where he had rabbits, for the Abbey Adelmont had a collection of rabbits, cats, and guinea pigs, fully as fine as his collection of vegetables, flowers, and fruit. Well, the Abbey Adelmont took a rabbit and made it eat a leaf of the cabbage. The rabbit died. What magistrate would find or even venture to insinuate anything against this? What procurer has ever ventured to draw up an accusation against Monsieur Magindy or Monsieur Florin in consequence of the rabbits, cats, and guinea pigs they have killed? Not one. So then, the rabbit dies, and justice takes no notice. This rabbit dead, the Abbey Adelmont has its entrails taken out by his cook and thrown on the dunghill. On this dunghill is a hen who, pecking these intestines, is in her turn taken ill, and dies next day. At the moment when she is struggling in the convulsions of death, a vulture is flying by. There are a good many vultures in Adelmont's country. This bird darts on the dead fowl and carries it away to a rock, where it dines off its prey. Three days afterwards, this poor vulture, which has been very much indisposed since that dinner, suddenly feels very giddy while flying aloft in the clouds, and falls heavily into a fish pond. The pikes, eels, and carp eat greedily always, as everybody knows. Well, they feast on the vulture. Now suppose that next day one of these eels or pike or carp, poisoned at the fourth remove, is served up at your table. Well, then, your guest will be poisoned at the fifth remove, and die at the end of eight or ten days of pains in the intestines, sickness, or abscess of the pylorus. The doctors open the body and say with an air of profound learning, The subject has died of a tumor on the liver, or of typhoid fever. But, remarked Madame de Villefort, all these circumstances which you link thus to one another, 
may be broken by the least accident. The vulture may not see the fowl, or may fall a hundred yards from the fish pond. Ah, that is where the art comes in. To be a great chemist in the East, one must direct chance. And this is to be achieved. Madame de Villefort was in deep thought, yet listened attentively. But, she exclaimed suddenly, arsenic is indelible, indestructible. In whatsoever way it is absorbed, it will be found again in the body of the victim, from the moment when it has been taken in sufficient quantity to cause death. Precisely so, cried Monte Cristo, precisely so. And this is what I said to my worthy Adelmont. He reflected, smiled, and replied to me by a Sicilian proverb, which I believe is also a French proverb. My son, the world was not made in a day, but in seven. Return on Sunday. On the Sunday following I did return to him. Instead of having watered his cabbage with arsenic, he had watered it this time with a solution of salts, having their basis in strychnine, strychnos colubrina, as the learned term it. Now the cabbage had not the slightest appearance of disease in the world, and the rabbit had not the smallest distrust, yet five minutes afterwards the rabbit was dead. The fowl pecked at the rabbit, and the next day was a dead hen. This time we were the vultures, so we opened the bird, and this time all special symptoms had disappeared. There were only general symptoms. There was no peculiar indication in any organ, an excitement of the nervous system, that was it. A case of cerebral congestion, nothing more. The fowl had not been poisoned, she had died of apoplexy. Apoplexy is a rare disease among fowls, I believe, but very common among men. Madame de Villefort appeared more and more thoughtful. It is very fortunate, she observed, that such substances could only be prepared by chemists, otherwise all the world would be poisoning each other. By chemists and persons who have a taste for chemistry, said Monte Cristo carelessly. And then, said Madame de Villefort, endeavoring by a struggle and with effort to get away from her thoughts, however skillfully it is prepared, crime is always crime, and if it avoid human scrutiny, it does not escape the eye of God. The Orientals are stronger than we are in cases of conscience, and very prudently have no hell. That is the point. Really, madame, this is a scruple which naturally must occur to a pure mind like yours, but which would easily yield before sound reasoning. The bad side of human thought will always be defined by the paradox of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You remember, the Mandarin who is killed five hundred leagues off by raising the tip of the finger? Man's whole life passes in doing these things, and his intellect is exhausted by reflecting on them. You will find very few persons who will go and brutally thrust a knife in the heart of a fellow creature, or will administer to him in order to remove him from the surface of the globe on which we move with life and animation, that quantity of arsenic of which we just now talked. Such a thing is really out of rule, eccentric or stupid. To attain such a point, the blood must be heated to thirty-six degrees, the pulse be at least at ninety, and the feeling is excited beyond the ordinary limit. But suppose one pass, as is permissible in philology, from the word itself to its softened synonym. Then, instead of committing an ignoble assassination, you make an elimination. You merely and simply remove from your path the individual who is in your way, and that without shock or violence, without the display of sufferings which, in the case of becoming a punishment, make a martyr of the victim and a butcher, in every sense of the word, of him who inflicts them. Then there will be no blood, no groans, no convulsions, and above all, no consciousness of that horrid and compromising moment of accomplishing the act. Then one escapes the clutch of the human law, which says, Do not disturb society. This is the mode in which they manage these things, and succeed in eastern climes where there are grave and phlegmatic persons who care very little for the questions of time and conjunctures of importance. Yet conscience remains, remarked Madame de Villefort in an agitated voice, and with a stifled sigh. Yes, entered Monte Cristo, happily, yes, conscience does remain, and if it did not, how wretched we should be. After every action requiring exertion, it is conscience that saves us, for it supplies us with a thousand good excuses, of which we alone are judges, and these reasons, howsoever excellent in producing sleep, would avail us but very little before a tribunal, when we were tried for our lives. Thus Richard the Third, for instance, was marvelously served by his conscience after the putting away of the two children of Edward the Fourth. In fact, he could say, 
These two children of a cruel and persecuting king, who have inherited the vices of their father, which I alone could perceive in their juvenile propensities, these two children are impediments in my way of promoting the happiness of the English people, whose unhappiness they, the children, would infallibly have caused. Thus was Lady Macbeth served by her conscience, when she sought to give her son, and not her husband, whatever Shakespeare may say, a throne. Ah, maternal love is a great virtue, a powerful motive, so powerful that it excuses a multitude of things, even if, after Duncan's death, Lady Macbeth had been at all pricked by her conscience. Madame de Villefort listened with avidity to these appalling maxims and horrible paradoxes, delivered by the Count with that ironical simplicity which was peculiar to him. After a moment's silence, the lady inquired, "'Do you know, my dear Count,' she said, "'that you are a very terrible reasoner, "'and that you look at the world through a somewhat distempered medium? "'Have you really measured the world by scrutinies, "'or through alembics and crucibles? "'For you must indeed be a great chemist, "'and the elixir you administered to my son, "'which recalled him to life almost instantaneously. "'Oh, do not place any reliance on that, madame. "'One drop of that elixir sufficed to recall life to a dying child.' but three drops would have impelled the blood into his lungs in such a way as to have produced most violent palpitations. Six would have suspended his respiration and caused syncope more serious than that in which he was. Ten would have destroyed him. You know, madame, how suddenly I snatched him from those files at which he so imprudently touched. Is it then so terrible a poison? Oh, no. In the first place, let us agree that the word poison does not exist because in medicine use is made of the most violent poisons which become, according as they are employed, most salutary remedies. What then is it? A skillful preparation of my friends, the worthy Abbe Adelmont, who taught me the use of it. Oh, observed Madame de Villefort, it must be an admirable antispasmodic. Perfect, Madame, as you have seen, replied the Count, and I frequently make use of it, with all possible prudence, though, be it observed, he added with a smile of intelligence. Most assuredly, responded Madame de Villefort, in the same tone. As for me, so nervous and so subject to fainting fits, I should require a Dr. Adelmont to invent for me some means of breathing freely and tranquilizing my mind, in the fear I have of dying some fine day of suffocation. In the meanwhile, as the thing is difficult to find in France, and your abbey is not probably disposed to make a journey to Paris on my account, I must continue to use M. Planche's antispasmodics and mint and Hoffman's drops are among my favorite remedies. Here are some lozenges which I have made up on purpose. They are compounded doubly strong. Monte Cristo opened the tortoise-shell box which the lady presented to him, and inhaled the odor of the lozenges with the air of an amateur who thoroughly appreciated their composition. They are indeed exquisite, he said, but as they are necessarily submitted to the process of deglutition, a function which it is frequently impossible for a fainting person to accomplish, I prefer my own specific. Undoubtedly, and so should I prefer it after the effects I have seen produced, but of course it is a secret, and I am not so indiscreet as to ask it of you. But I, said Monte Cristo, rising as he spoke, I am gallant enough to offer it to you. How kind you are! Only remember one thing. A small dose is a remedy, a large one is poison. One drop will restore life, as you have seen. Five or six will inevitably kill, and in a way the more terrible inasmuch as, poured into a glass of wine, it would not in the slightest degree affect its flavor. But I say no more, madame. It is really as if I were prescribing for you. The clock struck half-past six, and a lady was announced, a friend of Madame de Villefort, who came to dine with her. If I had had the honor of seeing you for the third or fourth time, Count, instead of only for the second, said Madame de Villefort, if I had had the honor of being your friend, instead of only having the happiness of being under an obligation to you, I should insist on detaining you to dinner, and not allow myself to be daunted by a first refusal. A thousand thanks, Madame, replied Monte Cristo, but I have an engagement which I cannot break. I have promised to escort to the Academy a Greek princess of my acquaintance, who has never seen your grand opera, and who relies on me to conduct her thither. Adieu, then, sir, and do not forget the prescription. Ah, in truth, madame, to do that I must forget the hour's conversation I have had with you, which is indeed impossible. 
Monte Cristo bowed and left the house. Madame de Villefort remained immersed in thought. He is a very strange man, she said, and in my opinion is himself the Adelmont he talks about. As to Monte Cristo, the result had surpassed his utmost expectations. Good, said he, as he went away, this is a fruitful soil, and I feel certain that the seed sown will not be cast on barren ground. Next morning, faithful to his promise, he sent the prescription requested. End of chapter 52 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 53 Robert Le Diable. The pretext of an opera engagement was so much the more feasible, as there chanced to be on that very night a more than ordinary attraction at the Académie Royale. Levasseur, who had been suffering under severe illness, made his reappearance in the character of Bertrand, and, as usual, the announcement of the most admired production of the favourite composer of the day had attracted a brilliant and fashionable audience. Morcerf, like most other young men of rank and fortune, had his orchestra stall, with the certainty of always finding a seat in at least a dozen of the principal boxes occupied by persons of his acquaintance. He had, moreover, his right of entry into the omnibus box. Chateau Renaud rented a stall beside his own, while Beauchamp, as a journalist, had unlimited range all over the theatre. It happened that on this particular night the minister's box was placed at the disposal of Lucien de Bray, who offered it to the Comte de Morcerf, who again, upon his mother's rejection of it, sent it to Danglars, with an intimation that he should probably do himself the honour of joining the Baroness and her daughter during the evening, in the event of their accepting the box in question. The ladies received the offer with too much pleasure to dream of a refusal. To no class of persons is the presentation of a gratuitous opera-box more acceptable than to the wealthy millionaire, who still hugs economy while boasting of carrying a king's ransom in his waistcoat pocket. Danglars had, however, protested against showing himself in a ministerial box, declaring that his political principles and his parliamentary position as a member of the opposition party would not permit him so to commit himself. The baroness had, therefore, dispatched a note to Lucien de Bray, bidding him call for them, it being wholly impossible for her to go alone with Eugénie to the opera. There is no gainsaying the fact that a very unfavourable construction would have been put upon the circumstance if the two women had gone without escort, while the addition of a third, in the person of her mother's admitted lover, enabled Mademoiselle Danglars to defy malice and ill-nature. One must take the world as one finds it. The curtain rose, as usual, to an almost empty house, it being one of the absurdities of Parisian fashion never to appear at the opera until after the beginning of the performance, so that the first act is generally played without the slightest attention being paid to it, that part of the audience already assembled being too much occupied in observing the fresh arrivals, while nothing is heard but the noise of opening and shutting doors, and the buzz of conversation. Surely, said Albert, as the door of a box on the first circle opened, that must be the Comtesse G. And who is the Countess G? inquired Chateau Renaud. What a question! Now do you know, Baron, I have a great mind to pick a quarrel with you for asking it, as if all the world did not know who the Countess G was. Ah, to be sure, replied Chateau Renaud, the lovely Venetian, is it not? Herself. At this moment the Countess perceived Albert, and received his salutation with a smile. "'You know her, it seems?' said Chateau Renaud. "'France introduced me to her at Rome,' replied Albert. "'Well, then, will you do as much for me in Paris as France did for you in Rome?' "'With pleasure.' There was a cry of, "'Shut up!' from the audience. This manifestation on the part of the spectators of their wish to be allowed to hear the music produced not the slightest effect on the young men, who continued their conversation. The Countess was present at the races in the Champ de Mars, said Chateau Renaud. Today? Yes. Bless me, I quite forgot the races. Did you bet? Oh, merely a paltry fifty louis. And who was the winner? Nautilus. I staked on him. But there were three races, were there not? Yes, there was the prize given by the jockey club, a gold cup, you know, 
and a very singular circumstance occurred about that race. What was it? Oh, shut up! again interposed some of the audience. Why, it was won by a horse and rider utterly unknown on the course. Is that possible? True as day. The fact was, nobody had observed a horse entered by the name of Vampa, or that of a jockey styled Job, when at the last moment a splendid roan mounted by a jockey about as big as your fist presented themselves at the starting post. They were obliged to stuff at least twenty pounds weight of shot in the small rider's pockets to make him wait, but with all that he outstripped Ariel and Barber, against whom he ran, by at least three whole lengths. And was it not found out at last to whom the horse and jockey belonged? No. You say that the horse was entered under the name of Vampa. Exactly. That was the title. Then, answered Albert, I am better informed than you are, and know who the owner of that horse was. Shut up! cried the pit in chorus. And this time the tone and manner in which the command was given betokened such growing hostility that the two young men perceived, for the first time, that the mandate was addressed to them. Leisurely turning around, they calmly scrutinized the various countenances around them, as though demanding some one person who would take upon himself the responsibility of what they deemed excessive impertinence. But as no one responded to the challenge, the friends turned again to the front of the theatre, and affected to busy themselves with the stage. At this moment the door of the minister's box opened, and Madame Danglars, accompanied by her daughter, entered, escorted by Lucien de Bray, who assiduously conducted them to their seats. "'Ha! ha!' said Chateau Renaud. "'Here come some friends of yours, Viscount. Well, "'What are you looking at there? "'Don't you see they are trying to catch your eye?' Albert turned round, just in time to receive a gracious wave of the fan from the baroness. As for Mademoiselle Eugénie, she scarcely vouchsafed to waste the glances of her large black eyes even upon the business of the stage. "'I tell you what, my dear fellow,' said Chateau Renaud, "'I cannot imagine what objection you can possibly have to Mademoiselle Danglars, that is, setting aside her want of ancestry and somewhat inferior rank, which, by the way, I don't think you care very much about.' Barring all that now, I mean to say, she is a deuced fine girl. Handsome, certainly, replied Albert, but not to my taste, which I confess inclines to something softer, gentler, and more feminine. Ah, well, exclaimed Chateau Renaud, who, because he had seen his thirtieth summer, fancied himself duly warranted in assuming a sort of paternal air with his more youthful friend. You young people are never satisfied. Why, what would you have more? Your parents have chosen you a bride built on the model of Diana the Huntress, and yet you are not content. No, for that very resemblance affrights me. I should have liked something more in the manner of the Venus of Milo or Capua, but this chase-loving Diana, continually surrounded by her nymphs, gives me a sort of alarm, lest she should some day bring on me the fate of Actian. And, indeed, it required but one glance at Mademoiselle Danglars to comprehend the justness of Morcerf's remark. She was beautiful, but her beauty was of too marked and decided a character to please a fastidious taste. Her hair was raven black, but its natural waves seemed somewhat rebellious. Her eyes, of the same color as her hair, were surmounted by well-arched brows, whose great defect, however, consisted in an almost habitual frown, while her whole physiognomy wore that expression of firmness and decision so little in accordance with the gentler attributes of her sex. Her nose was precisely what a sculptor would have chosen for a chiselled Juno. Her mouth, which might have been found fault with as too large, displayed teeth of pearly whiteness, rendered still more conspicuous by the brilliant carmine of her lips, contrasting vividly with her naturally pale complexion. But that which completed the almost masculine look Morcerf found so little to his taste was a dark mole, of much larger dimensions than those freaks of nature generally are, placed just at the corner of her mouth, and the effect tended to increase the expression of self-dependence that characterized her countenance. The rest of Mademoiselle Eugénie's person was in perfect keeping with the head just described. She indeed reminded one of Diana, as Chateau Renaud observed, but her bearing was more haughty and resolute. As regarded her attainments, the only fault to be found with them was the same that a fastidious connoisseur might have found with her beauty, that they were somewhat too erudite and masculine for so young a person. 
She was a perfect linguist, a first-rate artist, wrote poetry, and composed music. To the study of the latter she professed to be entirely devoted, following it with an indefatigable perseverance, assisted by a schoolfellow, a young woman without fortune whose talent promised to develop into remarkable powers as a singer. It was rumoured that she was an object of almost paternal interest to one of the principal composers of the day, who excited her to spare no pains in the cultivation of her voice, which might hereafter prove a source of wealth and independence. But this counsel effectually decided Mademoiselle Danglars never to commit herself by being seen in public with one destined for a theatrical life. And acting upon this principle, the banker's daughter, though perfectly willing to allow Mademoiselle Louise Tarmely, that was the name of the young virtuosa, to practice with her through the day, took especial care not to be seen in her company. Still, though not actually received at the Hôtel d'Anglars in the light of an acknowledged friend, Louise was treated with far more kindness and consideration than is usually bestowed on a governess. The curtain fell almost immediately after the entrance of Madame Danglars into her box. The band quitted the orchestra for the accustomed half-hour's interval allowed between acts, and the audience were left at liberty to promenade the salon or the lobbies, or to pay and receive visits in their respective boxes. Morcerf and Chateau Renaud were among the first to avail themselves of this permission. For an instant the idea struck Madame Danglars that this eagerness on the part of the young Viscount arose from his impatience to join her party, and she whispered her expectations to her daughter, that Albert was hurrying to pay his respects to them. Mademoiselle Eugénie, however, merely returned a dissenting movement of the head, while with a cold smile she directed the attention of her mother to an opposite box on the first circle, in which sat the Countess G., and where Morcerf had just made his appearance. "'So we meet again, my travelling friend, do we?' cried the Countess, extending her hand to him with all the warmth and cordiality of old acquaintance. "'It was really very good of you to recognise me so quickly, and still more to bestow your first visit on me.' "'Be assured,' replied Albert, "'that if I had been aware of your arrival in Paris, and had known your address, I should have paid my respects to you before this.' Allow me to introduce my friend, Baron de Chateau Renaud, one of the few true gentlemen now to be found in France, and from whom I have just learned that you were a spectator of the races in the Champ de Mars yesterday. Chateau Renaud bowed to the Countess. So you were at the races, Baron? inquired the Countess eagerly. Yes, Madame. Well, then, pursued Madame G. with considerable animation, you can probably tell me who won the jockey club stakes. I'm sorry to say I cannot replied the baroness, and I was just asking the same question of Albert. "'Are you very anxious to know, Countess?' asked Albert. "'To know what?' "'The name of the owner of the winning horse.' "'Oh, excessively! Only imagine! But do tell me, Viscount, whether you really are acquainted with it or no.' "'I beg your pardon, madame, but you were about to relate some story, were you not? You said, only imagine, and then paused. Pray continue.' "'Well, then, listen.' You must know I felt so interested in that splendid roan horse, with his elegant little rider, so tastefully dressed in a pink satin jacket and cap, that I could not help praying for their success, with as much earnestness as though the half of my fortune were at stake. And when I saw them outstrip all the others, and come to the winning post in such gallant style, I actually clapped my hands with joy. Imagine my surprise, when, upon returning home, the first object I met on the staircase was the identical jockey in the pink jacket. I concluded that, by some singular chance, the owner of the winning horse must live in the same hotel as myself. But as I entered my apartments, I beheld the very gold cup awarded as a prize to the unknown horse and rider. Inside the cup was a small piece of paper, on which were written these words, from Lord Ruthven to Countess G. Precisely. I was sure of it, said Morcerf. Sure of what? That the owner of the horse was Lord Ruthven himself. What Lord Ruthven do you mean? Why, our Lord Ruthven, the vampire of the Sal Argentino. Is it possible, exclaimed the Countess, is he here in Paris? To be sure. Why not? And you visit him? Meet him at your own house and elsewhere? I assure you, he is my most intimate friend, and Monsieur de Chateau Renaud has also the honour of his acquaintance. But why are you so sure of his being the winner of the Jockey Club prize? Was not the winning horse entered by the name of Vampa? What of that? 
"'Why, do you not recollect the name of the celebrated bandit by whom I was made prisoner?' "'Oh, yes. And from whose hands the Count extricated me in so wonderful a manner? "'Oh, to be sure, I remember it all now.' "'He called himself Vampa. You see, it's evident where the Count got the name. "'But what could have been his motive for sending the cup to me?' In the first place, because I had spoken much of you to him, as you may believe, and in the second, because he delighted to see a countrywoman take so lively an interest in his success. I trust and hope you never repeated to the Count all the foolish remarks we used to make about him. I should not like to affirm under oath that I have not. Besides, his presenting you the cup under the name of Lord Ruthven. Oh, but that is dreadful! Why, the man must owe me a fearful grudge! Does his action appear like that of an enemy? No, certainly not. Well, then. And so he is in Paris? Yes. And what effect does he produce? Why, said Albert, he was talked about for a week, then the coronation of the Queen of England took place, followed by the theft of Mademoiselle Mars's diamonds, and so people talked of something else. My good fellow, said Chateau Renaud, the Count is your friend, and you treat him accordingly. Do not believe what Albert is telling you, Countess. So far from the sensation excited in Parisian circles by the appearance of the Count of Monte Cristo having abated, I take it upon myself to declare that it is as strong as ever. His first astounding act upon coming amongst us was to present a pair of horses worth thirty-two thousand francs to Madame Danglars. His second, the almost miraculous preservation of Madame de Villefort's life. Now it seems that he has carried off the prize awarded by the Jockey Club. I therefore maintain, in spite of Morcerf, that not only is the Count the object of interest at this present moment, but also that he will continue to be so for a month longer if he pleases to exhibit an eccentricity of conduct, which, after all, may be his ordinary mode of existence. "'Perhaps you are right,' said Morcerf. "'Meanwhile, who is in the Russian ambassador's box?' "'Which box do you mean?' asked the Countess. "'The one between the pillars on the first tier. "'It seems to have been fitted up entirely afresh.' "'Did you observe any one during the first act?' asked Chateau Renaud. "'Where?' "'In that box.' "'No,' replied the Countess. "'It was certainly empty during the first act.' "'Then, resuming the subject of their previous conversation, she said, "'And so you really believe that it was your mysterious Count of Monte Cristo that gained the prize?' I am sure of it. And who afterwards sent the cup to me? Undoubtedly. But I don't know him, said the Countess. I have a great mind to return it. Oh, do no such thing, I beg of you. He would only send you another, formed of a magnificent sapphire, or hollowed out of a gigantic ruby. It is his way, and you must take him as you find him. At this moment the bell rang to announce the drawing up of the curtain for the second act. Albert rose to return to his place. "'Shall I see you again?' asked the Countess. "'At the end of the next act, with your permission, "'I will come and inquire whether there is anything I can do for you in Paris.' "'Pray take notice,' said the Countess, "'that my present residence is twenty-two Rue de Rivoli, "'and I am now at home to friends every Saturday evening. "'So now you are both forewarned.' "'The young men bowed, and quitted the box. "'Upon reaching their stalls they found the whole of the audience in the parterre "'standing up, and directing their gaze toward the box formerly possessed by the Russian ambassador. A man of thirty-five to forty years of age, dressed in deep black, had just entered, accompanied by a young woman dressed after the Eastern style. The lady was surpassingly beautiful, while the rich magnificence of her attire drew all eyes upon her. Hello, said Albert. "'It is Monte Cristo and his Greek.' The strangers were indeed no other than the Count and Heidi. In a few moments the young girl had attracted the attention of the whole house, and even the occupants of the boxes leaned forward to scrutinize her magnificent diamonds. The second act passed away during one continued buzz of voices, one deep whisper intimating that some great and universally interesting event had occurred. All eyes, all thoughts, were occupied with the young and beautiful woman, whose gorgeous apparel and splendid jewels made a most extraordinary spectacle. Upon this occasion an unmistakable sign from Madame Danglars intimated her desire to see Albert in her box directly the curtain fell on the second act, 
and neither the politeness nor good taste of Morcerf would permit his neglecting an invitation so unequivocally given. At the close of the act he therefore went to the baroness. Having bowed to the two ladies, he extended his hand to Debray. By the baroness he was most graciously welcomed, while Eugenie received him with her accustomed coldness. "'My dear fellow,' said Debray, "'you've come in the nick of time. There is Madame overwhelming me with questions respecting the Count. She insists upon it that I can tell her his birth, education, and parentage, where he came from, and whither he is going.' Being no disciple of Cagliostro, I was wholly unable to do this. So by way of getting out of the scrape, I said, "'Ask Morcerf. He has got the whole history of his beloved Monte Cristo at his fingers' ends,' whereupon the baroness signified her desire to see you. "'Is it not almost incredible,' said Madame Danglars, "'that a person having at least half a million of secret service money at his command should possess so little information?' "'Let me assure you, madame,' said Lucien, that had I really the sum you mentioned at my disposal, I would employ it more profitably than in troubling myself to obtain particulars respecting the Count of Monte Cristo, whose only merit in my eyes consists in his being twice as rich as a nabob. However, I have turned the business over to Morcerf, so pray settle it with him, as may be most agreeable to you. For my own part I care nothing about the Count or his mysterious doings." I am very sure no nabob would have sent me a pair of horses worth thirty-two thousand francs, wearing on their heads four diamonds, valued at five thousand francs each. He seems to have a mania for diamonds, said Morcerf, smiling, and I verily believe that, like Potemkin, he keeps his pockets filled, for the sake of strewing them along the roads, as Tom Thumb did his flintstones. Perhaps he has discovered some mine, said Madame Danglars. I suppose you know he has an order for unlimited credit on the baron's banking establishment. I was not aware of it, replied Albert, but I can readily believe it. And further, that he stated to Monsieur Danglars his intention of only staying a year in Paris, during which time he proposed to spend six millions. He must be the Shah of Persia, travelling incog. Have you noticed the remarkable beauty of the young woman, Monsieur Lucien? inquired Eugenie. I never really met with one woman so ready to do justice to the charms of another as yourself," responded Lucien, raising his lorgnette to his eye. "'A most lovely creature, upon my soul,' was his verdict. "'Who is this young person, Monsieur de Morcerf? inquired Eugénie. "'Does anybody know?' "'Mademoiselle,' said Albert, replying to this direct appeal, "'I can give you very exact information on that subject, as well as on most points relative to that mysterious person of whom we are now conversing. The young woman is a Greek.' "'So I should suppose by her dress. If you know no more than that, every one here is as well informed as yourself.' "'I am extremely sorry you find me so ignorant a Cicerone,' replied Morcerf. "'But I am reluctantly obliged to confess I have nothing further to communicate.' Yes, stay, I do know one thing more, namely that she is a musician, for one day, when I chanced to be breakfasting with the Count, I heard the sound of a guzla. It is impossible that it could have been touched by any other finger than her own. Then your Count entertains visitors, does he? asked Madame Danglars. Indeed he does, and in a most lavish manner, I can assure you. I must try and persuade Monsieur Danglars to invite him to a ball or a dinner, or something of the sort, that he may be compelled to ask us in return. What, said Debray, laughing, do you really mean you would go to his house? Why not? My husband could accompany me. But do you know, this mysterious Count is a bachelor. You have ample proof to the contrary, if you look opposite, said the Baroness, as she laughingly pointed to the beautiful Greek. No, no, exclaimed Debray, that girl is not his wife. He told us himself she was his slave. Do you not recollect, Morcerf, his telling us so at your breakfast? "'Well, then,' said the baroness, "'if slave she be, she has all the air and manner of a princess.' "'Of the Arabian Nights?' "'If you like. But tell me, my dear Lucian, what is it that constitutes a princess? Why, diamonds, and she is covered with them.' "'To me she seems overloaded,' observed Eugenie. "'She would look far better if she wore fewer, and we should then be able to see her finely formed throat and wrists.' "'See how the artist peeps out!' exclaimed Madame Danglars. "'My poor Eugénie, you must conceal your passion for the fine arts.' "'I admire all that is beautiful,' returned the young lady. 
"'And what do you think of the Count?' inquired Debray. "'He is not much amiss, according to my ideas of good looks.' "'The Count,' repeated Eugenie, as though it had not occurred to her to observe him sooner. "'The Count? Oh, he is so dreadfully pale.' "'I quite agree with you,' said Morcerf. "'And the secret of that very pallor is what we want to find out. "'The Countess G. insists upon it that he is a vampire.' "'Then the Countess G. has returned to Paris, has she?' inquired the Baroness. "'Is that she, Mamma? asked Eugenie, almost opposite to us, with that profusion of beautiful light hair. "'Yes,' said Madame Danglars, "'that is she. Shall I tell you what you ought to do, Morcerf?' "'Command me, Madame.' "'Well, then, you should go and bring your Count of Monte Cristo to us.' "'What for?' asked Eugenie. "'What for? Why, to converse with him, of course.' "'Have you really no desire to meet him?' "'None whatever,' replied Eugenie. "'Strange child,' murmured the baroness. "'He will very probably come of his own accord,' said Morcerf. "'There, do you see, madame? He recognizes you, and bows.' The baroness returned the salute in the most smiling and graceful manner. "'Well,' said Morcerf, "'I may as well be magnanimous, and tear myself away to forward your wishes. Adieu, I will go and try if there are any means of speaking to him.' "'Go straight to his box. That will be the simplest plan. "'But I have never been presented.' "'Presented to whom?' "'To the beautiful Greek.' "'You say she is only a slave. "'While you assert that she is a queen, or at least a princess. "'No, I hope that when he sees me leave you he will come out.' "'That is possible. Now go.' "'I am going,' said Albert, as he made his parting bow. Just as he was passing the Count's box, the door opened, and Monte Cristo came forth. After giving some directions to Ali, who stood in the lobby, the Count took Albert's arm. Carefully closing the box door, Ali placed himself before it, while a crowd of spectators assembled round the Nubian. "'Upon my word,' said Monte Cristo, "'Paris is a strange city, and the Parisians a very singular people.' See that cluster of persons collected around poor Ali, who is as much astonished as themselves. Really, one might suppose he was the only Nubian they had ever beheld. Now I can promise you that a Frenchman might show himself in public, either in Tunis, Constantinople, Baghdad, or Cairo, without being treated in that way. That shows that the Eastern nations have too much good sense to waste their time and attention on objects undeserving of either— However, as far as Ali is concerned, I can assure you, the interest he excites is merely from the circumstance of his being your attendant, you who are at this moment the most celebrated and fashionable person in Paris. Really? And what has procured me so fluttering a distinction? What? Why, yourself, to be sure. You give away horses worth a thousand louis. You save the lives of ladies of high rank and beauty. Under the name of Major Brack you run thoroughbreds, ridden by tiny urchins not larger than marmots. Then, when you've carried off the golden trophy of victory, instead of setting any value on it, you give it to the first handsome woman you think of. And who has filled your head with all this nonsense? Why, in the first place, I heard it from Madame Danglars, who, by the by, is dying to see you in her box, or to have you seen there by others— Secondly, I learned it from Beauchamp's journal, and thirdly, from my own imagination. Why, if you sought concealment, did you call your horse Vampa? That was an oversight, certainly, replied the Count. But tell me, does the Count of Morcerf never visit the opera? I have been looking for him, but without success. He will be here to-night. In what part of the house? In the Baroness's box, I believe. That charming young woman with her is her daughter? Yes. "'I congratulate you,' Morcerf smiled. "'We will discuss that subject at length some future time,' said he. "'But what do you think of the music?' "'What music?' "'Why, the music you have been listening to.' "'Oh, it is well enough as the production of a human composer "'sung by featherless bipeds, to quote the late Diogenes. "'From which it would seem, my dear Count, "'that you can at pleasure enjoy the seraphic strains "'that proceed from the seven choirs of paradise. "'You are right in some degree.' When I wish to listen to sounds more exquisitely attuned to melody than mortal ear ever yet listened to, I go to sleep. Then sleep here, my dear Count. The conditions are favourable. What else was opera invented for? No, thank you. Your opera is too noisy. To sleep after the manner I speak of, absolute calm and silence are necessary, and then a certain preparation. I know, the famous hashish. 
Precisely. So, my dear Viscount, whenever you wish to be regaled with music, come and sup with me. I have already enjoyed that treat when breakfasting with you, said Morcerf. Do you mean at Rome? I do. Ah, then I suppose you heard Haydis Gusla. The poor exile frequently beguiles a weary hour in playing over to me the airs of her native land. Morcerf did not pursue the subject, and Monte Cristo himself fell into a silent reverie. The bell rang at this moment for the rising of the curtain. "'You will excuse my leaving you,' said the Count, turning in the direction of his box. "'What? Are you going?' "'Pray say everything that is kind to Countess G. on the part of her friend the vampire.' "'And what message shall I convey to the Baroness?' "'That with her permission I shall do myself the honour of paying my respects in the course of the evening.' The third act had begun, and during its progress the Count of Morcerf, according to his promise, made his appearance in the box of Madame Danglars. The Count of Morcerf was not a person to excite either interest or curiosity in a place of public amusement. His presence, therefore, was wholly unnoticed, save by the occupants of the box in which he had just seated himself. The quick eye of Monte Cristo, however, marked his coming, and a slight though meaning smile passed over his lips. Heidi, whose soul seemed centred in the business of the stage, like all unsophisticated natures, delighted in whatever addressed itself to the eye or ear. The third act passed off as usual. Mademoiselles Noblette, Julie, and Leroux executed the customary pirouettes. Robert duly challenged the Prince of Granada, and the royal father of the Princess Isabella, taking his daughter by the hand, swept around the stage with majestic strides, the better to display the rich folds of his velvet robe and mantle after which the curtain again fell, and the spectators poured forth from the theatre into the lobbies and salon. The Count left his box, and a moment later was saluting the Baron Danglars, who could not restrain a cry of mingled pleasure and surprise. "'You are welcome, Count,' she exclaimed, as he entered. "'I have been most anxious to see you, that I might repeat orally the thanks writing can so ill express. Surely so trifling a circumstance cannot deserve a place in your remembrance.' Believe me, madame, I had entirely forgotten it. But it is not so easy to forget, monsieur, that the very next day, after your princely gift, you saved the life of my dear friend, madame de Villefort, which was endangered by the very animals your generosity restored to me. This time, at least, I do not deserve your thanks. It was Ali, my Nubian slave, who rendered this service to madame de Villefort. Was it Ali, asked the Count of Morcerf, who rescued my son from the hands of the bandits? "'No, Count,' replied Monte Cristo, taking the hand held out to him by the general. "'In this instance I may fairly and freely accept your thanks. "'But you have already tendered them, and fully discharged your debt, "'if indeed there existed one, "'and I feel almost mortified to find you still reverting to the subject. "'May I beg of you, Baroness, to honour me with an introduction to your daughter?' "'Oh, you are no stranger, at least not by name,' replied Madame Danglars. "'And the last two or three days we have really talked of nothing but you. "'Eugénie,' continued the Baroness, turning toward her daughter, "'this is the Count of Monte Cristo.' "'The Count bowed, while Mademoiselle Danglars bent her head slightly. "'You have a charming young person with you to-night, Count,' said Eugénie. "'Is she your daughter?' "'No, Mademoiselle,' said Monte Cristo, "'astonished at the coolness and freedom of the question.' She is a poor, unfortunate Greek left under my care. And what is her name? Heidi, replied Monte Cristo. A Greek? murmured the Count of Morcerf. Yes, indeed, Count, said Madame Danglars. And tell me, did you ever see at the court of Ali Tepelini, whom you so gloriously and valiantly served, a more exquisite beauty, or a richer costume? Did I hear rightly, monsieur, said Monte Cristo, that you served at Yanina? I was inspector-general of the Pasha's troops, replied Morcerf, and it is no secret that I owe my fortune, such as it is, to the liberality of the illustrious Albanese chief. But look! exclaimed Madame Danglars. Where? stuttered Morcerf. There, said Monte Cristo, placing his arms around the Count, and leaning with him over the front of the box, just as Heidi, whose eyes were occupied in examining the theatre in search of her guardian, perceived his pale features close to Morcerf's face. It was as if the young girl beheld the head of Medusa. She bent forwards as though to assure herself of the reality of what she saw, then uttering a faint cry, threw herself back in her seat. The sound was heard by the people about Ali, who instantly opened the box door. "'Why, Count!' 
exclaimed Eugenie. "'What has happened to your ward? She seems to have been taken suddenly ill.' "'Very probably,' answered the Count. "'But do not be alarmed on her account. Heidi's nervous system is delicately organized, and she is peculiarly susceptible to the odors even of flowers. Nay, there are some which cause her to faint if brought in her presence. However,' continued Monte Cristo, drawing a small phial from his pocket, "'I have an infallible remedy.' So saying, he bowed to the baroness and to her daughter, exchanged a parting shake of the hand with Debray and the Count, and left Madame Danglars' box. Upon his return to Heidi he found her still very pale. As soon as she saw him, she seized his hand. Her own hands were moist and icy cold. "'Who was it you were talking with over there?' she asked. "'With the Count of Morcerf,' answered Monte Cristo. He tells me he served your illustrious father, and that he owes his fortune to him. "'Wretch!' exclaimed Heidi, her eyes flashing with rage. "'He sold my father to the Turks, and the fortune he boasts was the price of his treachery. Did you not know that, my dear lord?' "'Something of this I have heard in Epirus, said Monte Cristo. "'But the particulars are still unknown to me. You shall relate them to me, my child. They are, no doubt, both curious and interesting. "'Oh, yes, yes, but let us go.' I feel as though it would kill me to remain long near that dreadful man. So saying, Heidi arose, and wrapping herself in her burnous of white cashmere, embroidered with pearls and coral, she hastily quitted the box at the moment when the curtain was rising upon the fourth act. "'Do you observe,' said the Countess G. to Albert, who had returned to her side, "'that man does nothing like other people. He listens most devoutly to the third act of Robert Le Diable, and when the fourth begins, takes his departure.' End of chapter 53 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 54 A Flurry in Stocks. Some days after this meeting, Albert de Morcerf visited the Count of Monte Cristo at his house in the Champ Elysee, which had already assumed that palace like appearance which the Count's princely fortune enabled him to give even to his most temporary residences. He came to renew the thanks of Madame Danglars, which had already been conveyed to the Count through the medium of a letter, signed Baron Danglars, nee Hermine de Servio. Albert was accompanied by Lucien de Bray who, joining his friend's conversation, added some passing compliments, the source of which the Count's talent for finesse easily enabled him to guess. He was convinced that Lucien's visit was due to a double feeling of curiosity, the larger half of which sentiment emanated from the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antine. In short, Madame Danglars, not being personally able to examine in detail the domestic economy and household arrangements of a man who gave away horses worth thirty thousand francs, and who went to the opera with a Greek slave wearing diamonds to the amount of a million of money, had deputed these eyes, by which she was accustomed to see, to give her a faithful account of the mode of life of this incomprehensible person. But the Count did not appear to suspect that there could be the slightest connection between Lucien's visit and the curiosity of the Baroness. "'You are in constant communication with the Baron Danglars?' the Count inquired of Albert de Morcerf. "'Yes, Count, you know what I told you.' "'All remains the same, then, in that quarter?' "'It is more than ever a settled thing,' said Lucien, and considering that this remark was all that he was at that time called upon to make, he adjusted the glass to his eye, and, biting the top of his gold-headed cane, began to make a tour of the apartment, examining the arms and the pictures. "'Ah!' said Monte Cristo. "'I did not expect that the affair would be so promptly concluded. "'Oh, things take their course without our assistance. "'While we are forgetting them, they are falling into their appointed order. "'And when again our attention is directed to them, "'we are surprised at the progress they have made toward the proposed end. "'My father and Monsieur Danglars serve together in Spain, "'my father in the army, and Monsieur Danglars in the commissariat department. "'It was there that my father— ruined by the revolution, and M. Danglars, who had never possessed any patrimony, both laid the foundations of their different fortunes. "'Yes,' said Monte Cristo. "'I think M. Danglars mentioned that in a visit which I paid him. And,' continued he, casting a side-glance at Lucien, who was turning over the leaves of an album, 
Mademoiselle Eugenie is pretty. I think I remember that to be her name. Very pretty, replied Albert, or rather very beautiful, but of that style of beauty which I do not appreciate. I am an ungrateful fellow. You speak as if you were already her husband. Ah, returned Albert, in his turn looking around to see what Lucien was doing. Really, said Monte Cristo, lowering his voice, you do not appear to me to be very enthusiastic on the subject of this marriage. Mademoiselle Danglars is too rich for me, replied Morcerf, and that frightens me. Bah! exclaimed Monte Cristo, that's a fine reason to give. Are you not rich yourself? My father's income is about fifty thousand francs per annum, and he will give me perhaps ten or twelve thousand when I marry. That perhaps might not be considered a large sum, in Paris especially, said the Count, but everything does not depend on wealth, and it is a fine thing to have a good name, and to occupy a high station in society. Your name is celebrated, your position magnificent, and then the Comte de Morcerf is a soldier, and it is pleasing to see the integrity of a Bayard united to the poverty of a Duguesclin. Disinterestedness is the brightest ray in which a noble sword can shine. As for me, I consider the union with Mademoiselle Danglars a most suitable one. She will enrich you, and you will ennoble her. Albert shook his head, and looked thoughtful. "'There is still something else,' said he. "'I confess,' observed Monte Cristo, "'that I have some difficulty in comprehending your objection to a young lady who is both rich and beautiful.' "'Oh,' said Morcerf, "'this repugnance, if repugnance it may be called, is not all on my side.' "'Whence can it arise, then? For you told me your father desired the marriage.' "'It is my mother who dissents.' She has a clear and penetrating judgment, and does not smile upon the proposed union. I cannot account for it, but she seems to entertain some prejudice against the Danglars. Ah, said the Count, in a somewhat forced tone, that may be easily explained. The Comtesse de Morcerf, who is aristocracy and refinement itself, does not relish the idea of being allied to your marriage with one of ignoble birth. That is natural enough. I do not know if that is her reason, said Albert. But one thing I do know, that if this marriage be consummated, it will render her quite miserable. There was to have been a meeting six weeks ago in order to talk over and settle the affair, but I had such a sudden attack of indisposition. Real? interrupted the Count, smiling. Oh, real enough, from anxiety, doubtless. At any rate, they postponed the matter for two months. There is no hurry, you know. I am not yet twenty-one, and Eugenie is only seventeen, but the two months expire next week. It must be done. My dear Count, you cannot imagine how my mind is harassed. How happy you are in being exempt from all this! Well, and why should not you be free too? What prevents you from being so? Oh, it will be too great a disappointment to my father if I do not marry Mademoiselle Danglars. Marry her, then, said the Count, with a significant shrug of the shoulders. Yes, replied Morcerf, but that will plunge my mother into positive grief. "'Then do not marry her,' said the Count. "'Well, I shall see. I will try and think over what is the best thing to be done. You will give me your advice, will you not, and, if possible, extricate me from my unpleasant position. I think rather than give pain to my dear mother, I would run the risk of offending the Count.' Monte Cristo turned away. He seemed moved by this last remark. "'Ah!' said he to Debray, who had thrown himself into an easy chair at the furthest extremity of the salon, and who held a pencil in his right hand and an account-book in his left. "'What are you doing there? Are you making a sketch after Poussin?' "'Oh, no!' was the tranquil response. "'I am too fond of art to attempt anything of that sort. I am doing a little sum in arithmetic.' "'In arithmetic?' "'Yes. I am calculating. By the way, Morcerf, that indirectly concerns you.' I am calculating what the house of Danglars must have gained by the last rise in Haiti bonds. From 206 they have risen to 409 in three days, and the prudent banker had purchased at 206. Therefore he must have made 300,000 livres. That is not his biggest scoop, said Morcerf. Did he not make a million in Spaniards this last year? My dear fellow, said Lucien, here is the Count of Monte Cristo, who will say to you, as the Italians do, Money and sanctity, each in a moiety. When they tell me such things, I only shrug my shoulders and say nothing. But you were speaking of Haitians, said Monte Cristo. Ah, Haitians, that is quite another thing. Haitians are the écart of French stock-jobbing. We may like Boulot, delight in whist, be enraptured with Boston, and yet grow tired of them all. 
but we always come back to Eckhart. It is not only a game, it is an hors d'oeuvre. Monsieur Danglars sold yesterday at four hundred five, and pockets three hundred thousand francs. Had he but waited to today, the price would have fallen to two hundred five, and instead of gaining three hundred thousand francs, he would have lost twenty or twenty-five thousand. And what has caused the sudden fall from four hundred nine to two hundred six? asked Monte Cristo. I am profoundly ignorant of all these stock jobbing intrigues. Because, said Albert, laughing, one piece of news follows another, and there is often great dissimilarity between them. Ah, said the Count, I see that Monsieur Danglars is accustomed to play at gaining or losing three hundred thousand francs in a day. He must be enormously rich. It is not he who plays, exclaimed Lucien. It is Madame Danglars. She is indeed daring. But you, who are a reasonable being, Lucien, and who know how little dependence is to be placed on the news, since you are at the fountainhead, surely you ought to prevent it, said Morcerf with a smile. How can I, if her husband fails in controlling her? asked Lucien. You know the character of the baroness. No one has any influence with her, and she does precisely what she pleases. Ah, if I were in your place, said Albert. Well, I would reform her. It would be rendering a service to her future son-in-law. How would you set about it? Ah, that would be easy enough. I would give her a lesson. A lesson? Yes, your position as secretary to the minister renders your authority great on the subject of political news. You never open your mouth, but the stockbrokers immediately stenograph your words. Cause her to lose a hundred thousand francs, and that would teach her prudence. I do not understand, stammered Lucien. It is very clear notwithstanding, replied the young man, with an artlessness wholly free from affectation. Tell her some fine morning an unheard-of piece of intelligence, some telegraphic despatch of which you alone are in possession. For instance, that Henri the Fourth was seen yesterday at Gabrielle's. That would boom the market. She will buy heavily, and she will certainly lose when Beauchamp announces the following day, in his gazette, the reports circulated by some usually well-informed persons that the king was seen yesterday at Gabriel's house is totally without foundation. We can positively assert that his majesty did not quit the Pont Neuf. Lucien half smiled. Monte Cristo, although apparently indifferent, had not lost one word of this conversation, and his penetrating eye had even read a hidden secret in the embarrassed manner of the secretary. This embarrassment had completely escaped Albert, but it caused Lucien to shorten his visit. He was evidently ill at ease. The Count, in taking leave of him, said something in a low voice, to which he answered, "'Willingly, Count, I accept.' The Count returned to young Morcerf. "'Do you not think, on reflection,' he said to him, "'that you have done wrong in speaking thus of your mother-in-law "'in the presence of Monsieur de Bray?' "'My dear Count,' said Mousserf, "'I beg of you not to apply that title so prematurely. "'Now, speaking without any exaggeration, "'is your mother really so very much averse to this marriage? "'So much so that the Baroness very rarely comes to the house, "'and my mother has not, I think, visited Madame Danglars twice in her whole life.' Then, said the Count, I am emboldened to speak openly to you. Monsieur Danglars is my banker. Monsieur de Villefort has overwhelmed me with politeness in return for a service which a casual piece of good fortune enabled me to render him. I predict from all this an avalanche of dinners and routs. Now, in order not to presume on this, and also to be beforehand with them, I have, if agreeable to you, thought of inviting Monsieur and Madame Danglars, and Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, to my country house at Autry. If I were to invite you and the Count and Countess of Morcerf to this dinner, I should give it the appearance of being a matrimonial meeting, or at least Madame de Morcerf would look upon the affair in that light, especially if Baron Danglars did me the honour to bring his daughter. In that case your mother would hold me in aversion, and I do not at all wish that. On the contrary, I desire to stand high in her esteem. Indeed, Count, said Morcerf. I thank you sincerely for having used so much candour toward me, and I gratefully accept the exclusion which you propose. You say you desire my mother's good opinion. I assure you it is already yours to a very unusual extent. Do you think so? said Monte Cristo, with interest. I am sure of it. We talked of you an hour after you left us the other day. But to return to what we were saying, if my mother could know of this attention on your part, and I will venture to tell her, I am sure that she will be most grateful to you. It is true that my father will be equally angry. The Count laughed. 
Well, said he to Morcerf, but I think your father will not be the only angry one. Monsieur and Madame Danglars will think me a very ill-mannered person. They know that I am intimate with you, that you are, in fact, one of the oldest of my Parisian acquaintances, and they will not find you at my house. They will certainly ask me why I did not invite you. Be sure to provide yourself with some previous engagement, which shall have some semblance of probability, and communicate the fact to me by a line in writing. You know that with bankers nothing but a written document will be valid. I wish to do better than that, said Albert. My mother is wishing to go to the seaside. What day is fixed for your dinner? Saturday. This is Tuesday. Well, tomorrow evening we leave, and the day after we shall be at Triport. Really, Count, you have a delightful way of setting people at their ease. Indeed, you give me more credit than I deserve. I only wish to do what will be agreeable to you. That is all. When shall you send your invitations? This very day. Well, I will immediately call on Monsieur Danglars, and tell him that my mother and myself must leave Paris to-morrow. I have not seen you, consequently I know nothing of your dinner. How foolish you are! Have you forgotten that Monsieur de Bray has just seen you at my house? Ah, true. Fix it this way. I have seen you, and invited you without any ceremony, when you instantly answered that it would be impossible for you to accept, as you were going to Triport. Well, then, that is settled. But you will come and call on my mother before to-morrow. Before to-morrow? That will be a difficult matter to arrange. Besides, I shall just be in the way of all the preparations for departure. Well, you can do better. You were only a charming man before, but if you accede to my proposal, you will be adorable. What must I do to obtain such sublimity? You are to-day as free as air. Come and dine with me. We shall be a small party, only yourself, my mother, and I. You have scarcely seen my mother. You shall have an opportunity of observing her more closely. She is a remarkable woman, and I only regret that there does not exist another like her, about twenty years younger. In that case, I assure you, there would very soon be a countess and a viscountess of Morcerf. As to my father, you will not see him. He is officially engaged, and dines with the chief referendary. We will talk over our travels, and you, who have seen the whole world, will relate your adventures. You shall tell us the history of the beautiful Greek who was with you the other night at the opera, and whom you call your slave and yet treat like a princess. We will talk Italian and Spanish. Come, accept my invitation, and my mother will thank you. A thousand thanks, said the Count. Your invitation is most gracious, and I regret exceedingly that it is not in my power to accept it. I am not so much at liberty as you suppose. On the contrary, I have a most important engagement. Ah, take care. You were teaching me just now how, in case of an invitation to dinner, one might creditably make an excuse. I require the proof of a pre-engagement. I am not a banker like Monsieur Danglars, but I am quite as incredulous as he is. I am going to give you a proof, replied the Count, and he rang the bell. Humph, said Morcerf, it is the second time that you have refused to dine with my mother. It is evident that you wish to avoid her. Monte Cristo started. Oh, you do not mean that, said he. Besides, here comes the confirmation of my assertion. Baptistine entered, and remained standing at the door. I had no previous knowledge of your visit, had I? Indeed, you are such an extraordinary person that I would not answer for it. At all events, I could not guess that you would invite me to dinner. Probably not. Well, listen, Baptistine, what did I tell you this morning when I called you into my laboratory? To close the door against visitors as soon as the clock struck five, replied the valet. What then? Ah, my dear Count, said Albert. No, no, I wish to do away with that mysterious reputation that you have given me, my dear Viscount. It is tiresome to be always acting Manfred. I wish my life to be free and open. Go on, Baptistine. Then to admit no one except Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti and his son. You hear? Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti, a man who ranks among the most ancient nobility of Italy, whose name Dante has celebrated in the tenth canto of the Inferno. You remember it, do you not? Then there is his son, Andrea, a charming young man, about your own age, Viscount, bearing the same title as yourself, and who is making his entry into the Parisian world, aided by his father's millions. The major will bring his son with him this evening, the contino, as we say in Italy. He confides him to my care. If he proves himself worthy of it, I will do what I can to advance his interests. You will assist me in the work, will you not? Most undoubtedly. 
"'This Major Cavalcanti is an old friend of yours, then?' "'By no means. He is a perfect nobleman, very polite, modest, and agreeable, such as may be found constantly in Italy, descendants of very ancient families. I have met him several times at Florence, Boulogne, and Lucca, and now he has communicated to me the fact of his arrival in Paris. The acquaintances one makes in travelling have a sort of claim on one. They everywhere expect to receive the same attention which you once paid them by chance, as though the civilities of a passing hour were likely to awaken any lasting interest in favour of the man in whose society you may happen to be thrown in the course of your journey. This good Major Cavalcanti is coming to take a second view of Paris, which he only saw in passing through in the time of the Empire, when he was on his way to Moscow. I shall give him a good dinner, he will confide his son to my care, and I will promise to watch over him. I shall let him follow in whatever path his folly may lead him, and then I shall have done my part. Certainly. I see you are a model mentor, said Albert. Good-bye. We shall return on Sunday. By the way, I have received news of Franz. Have you? Is he still amusing himself in Italy? I believe so. However, he regrets your absence extremely. He says you were the son of Rome, and that without you all appears dark and cloudy. I do not know if he does not even go so far as to say that it rains. His opinion of me is altered for the better, then. No, he still persists in looking upon you as the most incomprehensible and mysterious of beings. He is a charming young man, said Monte Cristo, and I felt a lively interest in him the very first evening of my introduction, when I met him in search of a supper, and prevailed upon him to accept a portion of mine. He is, I think, the son of General Depinay. He is the same who was so shamefully assassinated in 1815. By the Bonapartists. Yes, really I like him extremely. Is there not also a matrimonial engagement contemplated for him? Yes, he is to marry Mademoiselle de Villefort. Indeed. And you know I am to marry Mademoiselle Danglars, said Albert, laughing. You smile. Yes. Why do you do so? I smile because there appears to me to be about as much inclination for the consummation of the engagement in question as there is for my own. But really, my dear Count, we are talking as much of women as they do of us. It is unpardonable. Albert rose. Are you going? Oh, really, that is a good idea. Two hours have I been boring you to death with my company, and then you, with the greatest politeness, ask me if I'm going. Indeed, Count, you are the most polished man in the world and your servants, too. How very well behaved they are! There is quite a style about them. Monsieur Baptistine especially. I never could get such a man as that. My servants seem to imitate those you sometimes see in a play, who, because they have only a word or two to say, acquit themselves in the most awkward manner possible. Therefore, if you part with Monsieur Baptistine, give me the refusal of him. By all means. That is not all. Give my compliments to your illustrious Lucanese, Cavalcante of the Cavalcante, and if by any chance he should be willing to establish his son, find him a wife very rich, very noble, on her mother's side at least, and a baroness in right of her father. I will help you in the search. Ah, you will do as much as that, will you? Yes. Well, really, nothing is certain in this world. Oh, Count, what a service you might render me! I should like you a hundred times better if by your intervention I could remain a bachelor, even if it were only for ten years. Nothing is impossible, gravely replied Monte Cristo, and taking leave of Albert he returned into the house, and struck the gong three times. Bertuccio appeared. Monsieur Bertuccio, you understand that I intend entertaining company on Saturday at Autui. Bertuccio slightly started. I shall require your services to see that all be properly arranged. It is a beautiful house, or at all events may be made so. There must be a good deal done before it can deserve that title, Your Excellency, for the tapestried hangings are very old. Let them all be taken away and changed, then. With the exception of the sleeping chamber, which is hung with red damask, you will leave that exactly as it is. Bertuccio bowed. You will not touch the garden, either. As to the yard, you may do what you please with it. I should prefer that being altered beyond all recognition. I will do everything in my power to carry out your wishes, Your Excellency. I should be glad, however, to receive Your Excellency's commands concerning the dinner. Really, my dear Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count, since you have been in Paris you have become quite nervous, and apparently out of your element. You no longer seem to understand me. 
"'But surely your excellency will be so good as to inform me who are you expecting to receive?' "'I do not yet know myself. Neither is it necessary that you should do so. Lucullus dines with Lucullus. That is quite sufficient.' Bertuccio bowed, and left the room. End of chapter 54 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 55 Major Cavalcante. Both the Count and Baptistine had told the truth when they announced to Morcerf the proposed visit of the Major, which had served Monte Cristo as a pretext for declining Albert's invitation. Seven o'clock had just struck, and Monsieur Bertuccio, according to the command which had been given to him, had two hours before left for Autuy, when a cab stopped at the door, and after depositing its occupant at the gate, immediately hurried away, as if ashamed of its employment. The visitor was about fifty-two years of age, dressed in one of the green surtouts ornamented with black frogs which have so long maintained their popularity all over Europe. He wore trousers of blue cloth, boots tolerably clean but not of the brightest polish, and a little too thick in the soles, buckskin gloves, a hat somewhat resembling in shape those usually worn by the gendarmes, and a black cravat striped with white, which, if the proprietor had not worn it of his own free will, might have passed for a halter, so much did it resemble one. Such was the picturesque costume of the person who rang at the gate, and demanded if it was not at number thirty in the Avenue des Champs-Élysées that the Count of Monte Cristo lived, and who, being answered by the porter in the affirmative, entered, closed the gate after him, and began to ascend the steps. The small and angular head of this man, his white hair and thick grey moustaches, caused him to be easily recognised by Baptistine, who had received an exact description of the expected visitor, and who was awaiting him in the hall. Therefore scarcely had the stranger time to pronounce his name before the Count was apprised of his arrival. He was ushered into a simple and elegant drawing-room, and the Count rose to meet him with a smiling air. "'Ah, my dear sir, you are most welcome. I was expecting you.' "'Indeed,' said the Italian. "'Was your Excellency then aware of my visit?' "'Yes, I had been told that I should see you to-day at seven o'clock.' "'Then you have received full information concerning my arrival?' "'Of course.' "'Ah, so much the better. I feared this little precaution might have been forgotten.' "'What precaution?' "'That of informing you beforehand of my coming.' "'Oh, no, it has not.' "'But you're sure you're not mistaken?' "'Very sure. "'It really was I whom your Excellency expected at seven o'clock this evening.' "'I will prove it to you beyond a doubt.' "'Oh, no, never mind that,' said the Italian. "'It is not worth the trouble.' "'Yes, yes,' said Monte Cristo. "'His visitor appeared slightly uneasy. "'Let me see,' said the Count. "'Are you not the Marquis Bartolomeo Cavalcante?' "'Bartolomeo Cavalcante,' joyfully replied the Italian. "'Yes, I really am he.' ex-major in the Austrian service. "'Was I a major?' timidly asked the old soldier. "'Yes,' said Monte Cristo. "'You were a major. That is the title the French give to the post which you filled in Italy.' "'Very good,' said the major. "'I do not demand more, you understand.' "'Your visit here to-day is not of your own suggestion, is it?' said Monte Cristo. "'No, certainly not.' "'You were sent by some other person?' "'Yes.' "'By the excellent Abbé Busoni. "'Exactly so,' said the delighted Major. "'And you have a letter?' "'Yes, there it is.' "'Give it to me, then.' And Monte Cristo took the letter, which he opened and read. The Major looked at the Count with his large staring eyes, and then took a survey of the apartment, but his gaze almost immediately reverted to the proprietor of the room. "'Yes, yes, I see. Major Cavalcanti, a worthy patrician of Lucca, a descendant of the Cavalcanti of Florence,' continued Monte Cristo, reading aloud, possessing an income of half a million. Monte Cristo raised his eyes from the paper and bowed. "'Half a million,' said he. "'Magnificent.' "'Half a million, is it?' said the Major. "'Yes, in so many words. And it must be so, for the Abbé knows correctly the amount of all the largest fortunes in Europe.' "'Well, be it half a million, then. But on my word of honour I had no idea that it was so much.' "'Because you are robbed by your steward. You must make some reformation in that quarter.' 
"'You have opened my eyes,' said the Italian gravely. "'I will show the gentleman the door.' Monte Cristo resumed the perusal of the letter. "'And who needs only one more thing to make him happy?' "'Yes, indeed, but one,' said the Major, with a sigh. "'Which is to recover a lost and adored son. "'A lost and adored son. "'Stolen away in his infancy, "'either by an enemy of his noble family, "'or by the gypsies.' "'At the age of five years,' said the Major, with a deep sigh, "'and raising his eye to heaven. "'Unhappy father,' said Monte Cristo. "'The Count continued. "'I have given him renewed life and hope, "'in the assurance that you have the power "'of restoring the son whom he has vainly sought "'for fifteen years.' "'The Major looked at the Count "'with an indescribable expression of anxiety. "'I have the power of so doing,' said Monte Cristo. "'The Major recovered his self-possession.' "'So then,' said he, "'the letter was true to the end. "'Did you doubt it, my dear Monsieur Bartolomeo? "'No, indeed, certainly not. "'A good man, a man holding religious office, "'as does the Abbé Busoni, "'could not condescend to deceive or play off a joke. "'But your Excellency has not read all.' "'Ah, true,' said Monte Cristo. "'There is a postscript.' "'Yes, yes,' repeated the Major. "'Yes, there is a postscript.' In order to save Major Cavalcanti the trouble of drawing on his banker, I send him a draft for two thousand francs to defray his travelling expenses, and a credit on you for the further sum of forty-eight thousand francs, which you still owe me. The Major awaited the conclusion of the postscript, apparently with great anxiety. "'Very good,' said the Count. "'He said very good,' muttered the Major. "'Then, sir,' replied he, "'Then what?' asked Monte Cristo. "'Then the postscript. "'Well, what of the postscript? "'Then the postscript is as favourably received by you as the rest of the letter? "'Certainly. "'The Abbé Busoni and myself have a small account open between us. "'I do not remember if it is exactly forty-eight thousand francs which I am still owing him, "'but I dare say we shall not dispute the difference. "'You attached great importance, then, to this postscript, my dear Monsieur Cavalcanti. "'I must explain to you,' said the Major, "'that fully confiding in the signature of the Abbé Busoni, "'I had not provided myself with any other funds, "'so that if this resource had failed me "'I should have found myself very unpleasantly situated in Paris. "'Is it possible that a man of your standing "'should be embarrassed anywhere?' said Monte Cristo. "'Why, really, I know no one,' said the Major. "'But then you yourself are known to others.' "'Yes, I am known, so that—' "'Proceed, my dear Monsieur Cavalcanti. "'So that you will remit to me these forty-eight thousand francs?' "'Certainly, at your first request.' "'The Major's eyes dilated with pleased astonishment. "'But sit down,' said Monte Cristo. "'Really, I do not know what I have been thinking of. "'I have positively kept you standing for the last quarter of an hour.' "'Don't mention it.' "'The Major drew an armchair toward him and proceeded to seat himself. "'Now,' said the Count, "'What will you take? A glass of port, sherry, or alicante?' "'Alicante, if you please. It is my favourite wine. "'I have some that is very good. You will take a biscuit with it, will you not?' "'Yes, I will take a biscuit, as you are so obliging.' Monte Cristo rang. Baptistine appeared. The Count advanced to meet him. "'Well,' said he, in a low voice. "'The young man is here,' said the valet de chambre, in the same tone. "'Into what room did you take him?' "'into the blue drawing-room, according to your Excellency's instructions. "'That's right. Now bring the alicante and some biscuits.' "'Baptistine left the room. "'Really,' said the Major, "'I am quite ashamed of the trouble I am giving you.' "'Pray don't mention such a thing,' said the Count. "'Baptistine re-entered with glasses, wine, and biscuits. "'The Count filled one glass, but in the other he only poured a few drops of the ruby-coloured liquid.' The bottle was covered with spider's webs, and all the other signs which indicate the age of a wine more truly than do wrinkles on a man's face. The Major made a wise choice. He took the full glass and a biscuit. The Count told Baptistine to leave the plate within reach of his guest, who began by sipping the alicante with an expression of great satisfaction, and then delicately steeped his biscuit in the wine. "'So, sir, you lived at Lucca, did you? You were rich, noble, held in great esteem?' "'had all that could render a man happy.' "'All,' said the Major, hastily swallowing his biscuit. "'Positively all.' 
and yet there was one thing wanting in order to complete your happiness. Only one thing, said the Italian, and that one thing your lost child. Ah, said the Major, taking a second biscuit, that consummation of my happiness was indeed wanting. The worthy Major raised his eyes to heaven and sighed. Let me hear, then, said the Count, who this deeply regretted son was, for I always understood you were a bachelor. That was the general opinion, sir, said the Major, and I— Yes, replied the Count, and you confirmed the report. A youthful indiscretion, I suppose, which you were anxious to conceal from the world at large. The Major recovered himself, and resumed his usual calm manner, at the same time casting his eyes down, either to give himself time to compose his countenance, or to assist his imagination, all the while giving an underlook at the Count, the protracted smile on whose lips still announced the same polite curiosity. Yes, said the Major, I did wish this fault to be hidden from every eye. Not on your own account, surely, replied Monte Cristo, for a man is above that sort of thing. Oh, no, certainly not on my account, said the Major, with a smile and a shake of the head. But for the sake of the mother, said the Count. Yes, for the mother's sake, his poor mother, cried the Major, taking a third biscuit. Take some more wine, my dear Cavalcanti, said the Count pouring out for him a second glass of Alicante. Your emotion has quite overcome you. His poor mother, murmured the major, trying to get the lacrimal gland in operation, so as to moisten the corner of his eye with a false tear. She belonged to one of the first families in Italy, I think, did she not? She was of a noble family of Fiesoli, Count. And her name was— Do you desire to know her name? Oh, said Monte Cristo, it would be quite superfluous for you to tell me, for I already know it. The Count knows everything, said the Italian, bowing. Oliva Corsinari, was it not? Oliva Corsinari. A marchioness? A marchioness. And you married her at last, notwithstanding the opposition of her family? Yes, that was the way it ended. And you have doubtless brought all your papers with you, said Monte Cristo. What papers? The certificate of your marriage with Oliva Corsinari, and the register of your child's birth. The register of my child's birth? The register of the birth of Andrea Cavalcante, your son. Is not his name Andrea? I believe so, said the Major. What? You believe so? I dare not positively assert it, as he has been lost for so long a time. Well, then, said Monte Cristo, you have all the documents with you. Your Excellency, I regret to say that, not knowing it was necessary to come provided with these papers, I neglected to bring them. That is unfortunate, returned Monte Cristo. Were they then so necessary? They were indispensable. The Major passed his hand across his brow. Ah, perbacco, indispensable were they? Certainly they were. Supposing there were to be doubts raised as to the validity of your marriage, or the legitimacy of your child— True, said the Major, there might be doubts raised. In that case your son would be very unpleasantly situated. It would be fatal to his interests. It might cause him to fail in some desirable matrimonial alliance. Oh, peccato! You must know that in France they are very particular on these points. It is not sufficient, as in Italy, to go to the priest and say, We love each other, and want you to marry us. Marriage is a civil affair in France, and in order to marry in an orthodox manner you must have papers which undeniably establish your identity. That is the misfortune. You see, I have not these necessary papers. Fortunately, I have them, though, said Monte Cristo. You? Yes. You have them? I have them. Indeed, said the Major, who, seeing the object of his journey frustrated by the absence of the papers, feared also that his forgetfulness might give rise to some difficulty concerning the forty-eight thousand francs. Ah, indeed, that is a fortunate circumstance. Yes, that really is lucky, for it never occurred to me to bring them. I do not at all wonder at it. One cannot think of everything, but happily the Abbe Busoni thought for you. He is an excellent person. He is extremely prudent and thoughtful. He is an admirable man, said the Major, and he sent them to you. Here they are. The Major clasped his hands in token of admiration. You married Oliva Corsinari in the church of San Paolo de Montecatini. Here is the priest's certificate. Yes, indeed, there it is truly, said the Italian, looking on with astonishment. And here is Andrea Cavalcanti's baptismal register, given by the curate of Saravezza. 
all quite correct. Take these documents, then. They do not concern me. You will give them to your son, who will, of course, take great care of them. I should think so, indeed. If he were to lose them— "'Well, and if he were to lose them?' said Monte Cristo. "'In that case,' replied the Major, "'it would be necessary to write to the curate for duplicates, "'and it would be some time before they could be obtained.' "'It would be a difficult matter to arrange,' said Monte Cristo. "'Almost an impossibility,' replied the Major. "'Well, I am very glad to see that you understand the value of these papers. "'I regard them as invaluable.' "'Now,' said Monte Cristo, "'as to the mother of the young man,' "'As to the mother of the young man,' repeated the Italian, with anxiety. "'As regards the Marchesa Corsinari.' "'Really,' said the Major, "'difficulties seem to thicken upon us. "'Will she be wanted in any way?' "'No, sir,' replied Monte Cristo. "'Besides, has she not—' "'Yes, sir,' said the Major, "'she has. "'Paid the last debt of nature?' "'Alas, yes,' returned the Italian. "'I knew that,' said Monte Cristo. "'She has been dead these ten years.' "'And I am still mourning her loss,' exclaimed the Major, drawing from his pocket a checked handkerchief, and alternately wiping first the left and then the right eye. "'What would you have?' said Monte Cristo. "'We are all mortal. Now you understand, my dear Monsieur Cavalcante, that it is useless for you to tell people in France that you have been separated from your son for fifteen years. Stories of gypsies who steal children are not at all in vogue in this part of the world, and would not be believed.' You sent him for his education to a college in one of the provinces, and now you wish him to complete his education in the Parisian world. That is the reason which has induced you to leave Via Reggio, where you have lived since the death of your wife. That will be sufficient. You think so? Certainly. Very well, then. If they should hear of the separation— Ah, yes, what could I say? That an unfaithful tutor brought over by the enemies of your family— By the Corsinari? "'Precisely. Had stolen away this child, in order that your name might become extinct. "'That is reasonable, since he is an only son. "'Well, now that all is arranged, do not let these newly awakened remembrances be forgotten. "'You have doubtless already guessed that I was preparing a surprise for you.' "'An agreeable one?' asked the Italian. "'Ah, I see the eye of a father is no more to be deceived than his heart.' "'Hum,' said the Major.' "'Someone has told you the secret, or perhaps you guessed that he was here.' "'That who was here?' "'Your child, your son, your Andrea.' "'I did guess it,' replied the Major, with the greatest possible coolness. "'Then he is here?' "'He is,' said Monte Cristo. "'When the valet de chambre came in just now, he told me of his arrival.' "'Ah, very well, very well,' said the Major, clutching the buttons of his coat at each exclamation." "'My dear sir,' said Monte Cristo, "'I understand your emotion. "'You must have time to recover yourself. "'I will, in the meantime, go and prepare the young man "'for this much-desired interview, "'for I presume that he is not less impatient for it than yourself.' "'I should quite imagine that to be the case,' said Cavalcante. "'Well, in a quarter of an hour he shall be with you.' "'You will bring him in, then? "'You carry your goodness so far as even to present him to me yourself.' "'No, I do not wish to come between a father and a son. "'Your interview will be private. "'But do not be uneasy. "'Even if the powerful voice of nature should be silent, "'you cannot well mistake him. "'He will enter by this door. "'He is a fine young man, of fair complexion, "'a little too fair, perhaps, pleasing in manners, "'but you will see and judge for yourself.' "'By the way,' said the Major, "'you know I have only the two thousand francs "'which the Abbé Bussoni sent me. "'This sum I have expended upon travelling expenses, and—' "'And you want money? "'That is a matter of course, my dear Monsieur Cavalcante. "'Well, here are eight thousand francs on account.' "'The Major's eyes sparkled brilliantly. "'It is forty thousand francs which I now owe you,' said Monte Cristo. "'Does Your Excellency wish for a receipt?' said the Major, "'at the same time slipping the money into the inner pocket of his coat. "'For what?' said the Count. "'I thought you might want it to show the Abbe Bussoni.' "'Well, when you receive the remaining forty thousand, you shall give me a receipt in full. "'Between honest men such excessive precaution is, I think, quite unnecessary.' "'Yes, so it is, between perfectly upright people.' "'One word more,' said Monte Cristo. "'Say on. "'You will permit me to make one remark.' "'Certainly, pray do so. "'Then I should advise you to leave off wearing that style of dress.' "'Indeed,' said the Major, regarding himself with an air of complete satisfaction. 
Yes, it may be worn at Viareggio, but that costume, however elegant in itself, has long been out of fashion in Paris. That's unfortunate. Oh, if you really are attached to your old mode of dress, you can easily resume it when you leave Paris. But what shall I wear? What you find in your trunks. In my trunks? I have but one portmanteau. I dare say you have nothing else with you. What is the use of boring oneself with so many things? Besides, an old soldier always likes to march with as little baggage as possible. That is just the case. Precisely so. But you are a man of foresight and prudence. Therefore you sent your luggage on before you. It has arrived at the Hôtel de Princes, Rue de Richelieu. It is there you are to take up your quarters. Then in these trunks... I presume you have given orders to your valet de chambre to put in all you are likely to need, your plain clothes and your uniform. On grand occasions you must wear your uniform. That will look very well. Do not forget your crosses. They still laugh at them in France, and yet always wear them for all that. Very well, very well, said the major, who was in ecstasy at the attention paid him by the count. Now, said Monte Cristo, that you have fortified yourself against all painful excitement, prepare yourself, my dear Monsieur Cavalcante, to meet your lost Andrea. Saying which, Monte Cristo bowed, and disappeared behind the tapestry, leaving the major fascinated beyond expression with the delightful reception which he had received at the hands of the Count. End of chapter 55 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ophiliad in New South Wales, Australia, August 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 56. André Cavalcanti. The Count of Monte Cristo entered the adjoining room, which Baptistin had designated as the drawing room, and found there a young man, of graceful demeanour and elegant appearance, who had arrived in a cab about half an hour previously. Baptistin had not found any difficulty in recognising the person who presented himself at the door for admittance. He was certainly the tall young man with light hair, red beard, black eyes and brilliant complexion, whom his master had so particularly described to him. When the Count entered the room, the young man was carelessly stretched on a sofa, tapping his boot with the gold-headed cane which he held in his hand. On perceiving the Count, he rose quickly. "'The Count of Monte Cristo, I believe,' said he. "'Yes, sir, and I think I have the honour of addressing Count Andrea Cavalcanti?' "'Count Andrea Cavalcanti,' repeated the young man, accompanying his words with a bow. "'You are charged with a letter of introduction addressed to me, are you not?' said the Count. "'I did not mention that, because the signature seemed to me so strange. "'The letter signed Sinbad the Sailor, is it not?' "'Exactly so. Now, as I have never known any Sinbad, with the exception of the one celebrated in the Thousand and One Nights. Well, it is one of his descendants, and a great friend of mine. He is a very rich Englishman, eccentric almost to insanity, and his real name is Lord Wilmore. Ah, indeed! Then that explains everything that is extraordinary, said André. He is, then, the same Englishman whom I met at... Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Well, monsieur, I am at your service. If what you say is true, replied the Count, smiling, perhaps you will be kind enough to give me some account of yourself and your family? Certainly I will do so, said the young man, with a quickness which gave proof of his ready invention. I am, as you have said, the Count Andrea Cavalcanti, son of Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti, a descendant of the Cavalcanti whose names are inscribed in the Golden Book at Florence. Our family, although still rich, for my father's income amounts to half a million, has experienced many misfortunes, and I myself was, at the age of five years, taken away by the treachery of my tutor, so that for fifteen years I have not seen the author of my existence. Since I have arrived at years of discretion and become my own master, I have been constantly seeking him, but all in vain. At length I received this letter from your friend, which states that my father is in Paris, and authorises me to address myself to you for information respecting him. "'Really, all you have related to me is exceedingly interesting,' said Monte Cristo, observing the young man with a gloomy satisfaction. "'And you have done well to confirm in everything to the wishes of my friend Sinbad, for your father is indeed here, and is seeking you.' 
The Count, from the moment of first entering the drawing-room, had not once lost sight of the expression of the young man's countenance. He had admired the assurance of his look and the firmness of his voice, but at these words, so natural in themselves, "'Your father is indeed here and is seeking you,' young Andrea started and exclaimed, "'My father? Is my father here?' "'Most undoubtedly,' replied Monte Cristo. "'Your father, Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti.' The expression of terror which for the moment had overspread the features of the young man had now disappeared. "'Ah, yes, that is the name, certainly. Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti. And you really mean to say, monsieur, that my dear father is here?' "'Yes, sir. And I can even add that I have only just left his company. The history which he related to me of his lost son touched me to the quick.' Indeed, his griefs, hopes, and fears on that subject might furnish material for a most touching and pathetic poem. At length he one day received a letter, stating that the abductors of his son now offered to restore him, or at least to give notice where he might be found, on condition of receiving a large sum of money by way of ransom. Your father did not hesitate an instant, and the sum was sent to the frontier of Piedmont, with a passport signed for Italy. You were in the south of France, I think? "'Yes,' replied Andrea, with an embarrassed air. "'I was in the south of France.' "'A carriage was to await you at Nice?' "'Precisely so. "'And it conveyed me from Nice to Genoa, "'from Genoa to Turin, "'and from Turin to Chambéry, "'from Chambéry to Pont de Beauvoisin, "'and from Pont de Beauvoisin to Paris.' "'Indeed. "'Then your father ought to have met with you on the road, "'for it is exactly the same route which he himself took, "'and that is how we have been able to trace your journey to this place.' But, said Andrea, if my father had met me, I doubt if he would have recognised me. I must be somewhat altered since he last saw me. Oh, the voice of nature, said Monte Cristo. True, interrupted the young man, I had not looked upon it in that light. Now, replied Monte Cristo, there is only one source of uneasiness left in your father's mind, which is this. He is anxious to know how you have been employed during your long absence from him, how you have been treated by your persecutors and if they have conducted themselves towards you with all the deference due to your rank. Finally, he is anxious to see if you have been fortunate enough to escape the bad moral influence to which you have been exposed, and which is infinitely more to be dreaded than any physical suffering. He wishes to discover if the fine abilities with which nature has endowed you have been weakened by want of culture, and in short whether you consider yourself capable of resuming and retaining in the world the high position to which your rank entitles you. Sir, exclaimed the young man, quite astounded, I hope no false report. As for myself, I first heard you spoken of by my friend Wilmore, the philanthropist. I believe he found you in some unpleasant position, but do not know of what nature, for I did not ask, not being inquisitive. Your misfortunes engaged his sympathies, so you see you must have been interesting. He told me that he was anxious to restore you to the position which you had lost, and that he would seek your father until he found him. He did seek, and has found him, apparently, since he is here now. And, finally, my friend apprised me of your coming and gave me a few other instructions relative to your future fortune. I am quite aware that my friend Wilmore is peculiar, but he is sincere, and as rich as a gold mine. Consequently, he may indulge his eccentricities without any fear of their ruining him, and I have promised to adhere to his instructions. Now, sir, pray do not be offended at the question I am about to put to you, as it comes in the way of my duty as your patron. I would wish to know if the misfortunes which have happened to you, misfortunes entirely beyond your control, and which in no degree diminish my regard for you, I would wish to know if they have not, in some measure, contributed to render you a stranger to the world in which your fortune and your name entitle you to make a conspicuous figure. Sir, returned the young man, with a reassurance of manner, make your mind easy on this score. Those who took me from my father, and who always intended, sooner or later, to sell me again to my original proprietor, as they have now done, calculated that, in order to make the most of their bargain, it would be politic to leave me in possession of all my personal and hereditary worth, and even to increase the value if possible. I have therefore received a very good education, and have been treated by those kidnappers very much as the slaves were treated in Asia Minor, whose masters made them grammarians, doctors, and philosophers, in order that they might fetch a higher price on the Roman market. Monte Cristo smiled with satisfaction. It appeared as if he had not expected so much from Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. 
besides, continued the young man, if there did appear some defect in education, or offence against the established forms of etiquette, I suppose it would be excused in consideration of the misfortunes which accompanied my birth and followed me through my youth. Well, said Monte Cristo in an indifferent tone, you will do as you please, Count, for you are the master of your own actions, and are the person most concerned in the matter. But if I were you, I would not divulge a word of these adventures. Your history is quite a romance, and the world which delights in romances in yellow covers, strangely mistrusts those which are bound in living parchment, even though they be gilded like yourself. This is the kind of difficulty which I wish to represent to you, my dear Count. You would hardly have recited your touching history before it would go forth to the world and be deemed unlikely and unnatural. You would be no longer a lost child found, but you would be looked upon as an upstart, who had sprung up like a mushroom in the night. You might excite a little curiosity, but it is not everyone who likes to be made the centre of observation and the subject of unpleasant remark. I agree with you, monsieur, said the young man, turning pale and, in spite of himself, trembling beneath the scrutinising look of his companion. Such consequences would be extremely unpleasant. Nevertheless, you must not exaggerate the evil, said Monte Cristo, for by endeavouring to avoid one fault, you will fall into another. You must resolve upon one simple and single line of conduct, and for a man of your intelligence, this plan is as easy as it is necessary. You must form honourable friendships, and by that means counteract the prejudice which may attach to the obscurity of your former life. Andrea visibly changed countenance. I would offer myself as your surety and friendly adviser, said Monte Cristo, did I not possess a moral distrust of my best friends, and a sort of inclination to lead others to doubt them too. Therefore, in departing from this rule, I should, as the actors say, be playing a part quite out of my line, and should therefore run the risk of being hissed, which would be an act of folly. However, your excellency, said Andrea, in consideration of Lord Wilmore, by whom I was recommended to you— Yes, certainly, interrupted Monte Cristo. But Lord Wilmore did not admit to inform me, my dear Monsieur André, that the season of your youth was rather a stormy one. Ah, said the Count, watching Andrea's countenance, I do not demand any confession from you. It is precisely to avoid that necessity that your father was sent for from Lucca. You shall soon see him. He is a little stiff and pompous in his manner, and he is disfigured by his uniform, but when it becomes known that he has been for eighteen years in the Austrian service, all that will be pardoned. We are not generally very severe with the Austrians. In short, you will find your father a very presentable person, I assure you. Ah, sir, you have given me confidence. It is so long since we were separated that I have not the least remembrance of him. And besides, you know that, in the eyes of the world, a large fortune covers all defects. He is a millionaire. His income is five hundred thousand francs. Then, said the young man with anxiety, I shall be sure to be placed in an agreeable position. One of the most agreeable possible, my dear sir. He will allow you an income of fifty thousand livres per annum during the whole time of your stay in Paris. Then in that case I shall always choose to remain there. You cannot control circumstances, my dear sir. Man proposes, and God disposes. Andrea sighed. But, said he, so long as I do remain in Paris, and nothing forces me to quit it, do you mean to tell me that I may rely on receiving the sum you just now mentioned to me? You may. Shall I receive it from my father? asked Andrea, with some uneasiness. Yes, you will receive it from your father personally, but Lord Wilmore will be the security for the money. He has, at the request of your father, opened an account of six thousand francs a month at Monsieur Danglars, which is one of the safest banks in Paris. And does my father mean to remain long in Paris? asked Andrea. Only a few days, replied Monte Cristo. His service does not allow him to absent himself more than two or three weeks together. Ah, oh, my dear father, exclaimed Andrea, evidently charmed with the idea of his speedy departure. Therefore, said Monte Cristo, feigning to mistake his meaning, therefore I will not for another instant retard the pleasure of your meeting. Are you prepared to embrace your worthy father? I hope you do not doubt it. Go then into the drawing-room, my young friend, where you will find your father awaiting you. Andrea made a low bow to the Count and entered the adjoining room. Monte Cristo watched him till he disappeared, and then touched a spring in a panel made to look like a picture, 
which, in sliding partly from the frame, discovered to view a small opening, so cleverly contrived that it revealed all that was passing in the drawing-room, now occupied by Cavalcanti and Andrea. The young man closed the door behind him and advanced towards the major, who had risen when he heard steps approaching him. "'Ah, my dear father,' said André, in a loud voice, in order that the Count might hear him in the next room. "'Is it really you?' "'How do you do, my dear son?' said the major gravely. "'After so many years of painful separation,' said André, in the same tone of voice, and glancing towards the door, "'what a happiness it is to meet again!' "'Indeed it is, after so long a separation.' "'Will you not embrace me, sir?' said André. "'If you wish it, my son.' said the major, and the two men embraced each other after the fashion of actors on the stage, that is to say, each rested his head on the other's shoulder. "'Then we are once more reunited,' said André. "'Once more,' replied the major. "'Never more to be separated?' "'Why, as to that, I think, my dear son, you must be by this time so accustomed to France as to look upon it almost as a second country.' "'The fact is,' said the young man, "'that I should be exceedingly grieved to leave it.' As for me, you must know I cannot possibly live out of Lucca. Therefore, I shall return to Italy as soon as I can. But before you leave France, my dear father, I hope you will put me in possession of the documents which will be necessary to prove my descent. Certainly, I am come expressly on that account. It has cost me much trouble to find you, but I had resolved on giving them into your hands, and, if I had to recommence my search, it would occupy all the few remaining years of my life. Where are these papers, then? Here they are. André seized the certificate of his father's marriage and his own baptismal register, and after having opened them with all the eagerness which might be expected under the circumstances, he read them with a facility which proved that he was accustomed to similar documents, and with an expression which plainly denoted an unusual interest in the contents. When he had perused the documents, an indefinable expression of pleasure lightened up his countenance, and, looking at the Major with a most peculiar smile, he said in very excellent Tuscan, "'Then there is no longer any such thing in Italy as being condemned to the galleys?' The major drew himself up to his full height. "'Why, what do you mean by that question?' "'I mean that if there were, it would be impossible to draw up with impunity two such deeds as these. In France, my dear sir, half such a piece of effrontery as that would cause you to be quickly dispatched to Toulon for five years for change of air.' "'Will you be good enough to explain your meaning?' said the major, endeavouring as much as possible to assume an air of the greatest majesty. "'My dear Monsieur Cavalcanti,' said André, taking the major by the arm in a confidential manner, "'how much are you paid for being my father?' The major was about to speak when André continued in a low voice. "'Nonsense. I am going to set you an example of confidence. They give me fifty thousand francs a year to be your son.' "'Consequently, you can understand that it is not at all likely I shall ever deny my parent.' The major looked anxiously around him. "'Make yourself easy, we are quite alone,' said André. "'Besides, we are conversing in Italian.' "'Well, then,' replied the major, "'they paid me fifty thousand francs down.' "'Monsieur Cavalcanti,' said André, "'do you believe in fairy tales?' "'I used not to do so, but I really feel now almost obliged to have faith in them.' You have then been induced to alter your opinion. You have had some proofs of their truth? The Major drew from his pocket a handful of gold. Most palpable proofs, said he, as you may perceive. You think, then, that I may rely on the Count's promises? Certainly I do. You are sure he will keep his word with me? To the letter, but at the same time, remember, we must continue to play our respective parts. I, as a tender father and I as a dutiful son, as they choose that I shall be descended from you. Whom do you mean by they? Ma foi, I can hardly tell, but I was alluding to those who wrote the letter. You received one, did you not? Yes. From whom? From a certain Abbe Busoni. Have you any knowledge of him? No, I have never seen him. What did he say in the letter? You will promise not to betray me. Rest assured of that, you well know that our interests are the same. Then read for yourself. And the major gave a letter into the young man's hand. André read in a low voice. You are poor. A miserable old age awaits you. Would you like to become rich, or at least independent? Set out immediately for Paris and demand of the Count of Monte Cristo, Avenue des Champs-Élysées, number 30, 
the son whom you had by the Marchesa Corsinari, and who was taken from you at five years of age. This son is named André Cavalcanti. In order that you may not doubt the kind intention of the writer of this letter, you will find enclosed an order for two thousand four hundred francs, payable in Florence, at Signor Gozzi's. Also a letter of introduction to the Count of Monte Cristo, on whom I give you a draft of forty-eight thousand francs. Remember to go to the Count on the twenty-sixth of May, at seven o'clock in the evening. Signed, Abbe Busoni. It is the same. What do you mean? said the Major. I was going to say that I received a letter almost to the same effect. You? Yes. From the Abbe Busoni? No. From whom, then? From an Englishman called Lord Wilmore, who takes the name of Sinbad the Sailor. And of whom you have no more knowledge than I of the Abbe Busoni. You are mistaken. There I am ahead of you. You have seen him, then? Yes, once. Where? Ah, that is just what I cannot tell you. If I did, I should make you as wise as myself, which it is not my intention to do. And what did the letter contain? Read it. You are poor, and your future prospects are dark and gloomy. Do you wish for a name, should you like to be rich and your own master? Ma foi, said the young man, was it possible there could be two answers to such a question? Take the post chairs which you will find waiting at the Porte de Gênes as you enter Nice. Pass through Turin, Chambry, and Pont de Beauvoisin. Go to the Count of Monte Cristo, Avenue des Champs Elysees, on the twenty sixth of May, at seven o'clock in the evening, and demand of him your father. You are the son of the Marchess Cavalcanti and the Marchesa Oliva Corsinari. The Marquis will give you some papers which will certify this fact and authorize you to appear under that name in the Parisian world. As to your rank, an annual income of fifty thousand livres will enable you to support it admirably. I enclose a draft for five thousand livres payable on Monsieur Ferrier, banker at Nice, and also a letter of introduction to the Count of Monte Cristo, whom I have directed to supply all your wants. Sinbad the Sailor. Humph, said the Major, very good. You have seen the Count, you say? I have only just left him. And has he conformed to all that the letter specified? He has. Do you understand it? Not in the least. There is a dupe somewhere. At all events, it is neither you nor I. Certainly not. Well, then. Why, it does not much concern us. Do you think that it does? No, I agree with you there. We must play the game to the end, and consent to be blindfold. Ah, you shall see. I promise you I will sustain my part to admiration. I never once doubted your doing so. Monte Cristo chose this moment for re-entering the drawing-room. On hearing the sound of his footsteps, the two men threw themselves in each other's arms. And, while they were in the midst of this embrace, the Count entered. "'Well, Marquis,' said Monte Cristo, "'you appear to be in no way disappointed in the son whom your good fortune has restored to you. "'Ah, Your Excellency, I am overwhelmed with delight.' "'And what are your feelings?' said Monte Cristo, turning to the young man. "'As for me, my heart is overflowing with happiness.' "'Happy father, happy son,' said the Count. "'There is only one thing which grieves me.' observed the Major, and that is the necessity for my leaving Paris so soon. Ah, my dear Monsieur Cavalcanti, I trust you will not leave before I have had the honour of presenting you to some of my friends. I am at your service, sir, replied the Major. Now, sir, said Monte Cristo, addressing André, make your confession. To whom? Tell Monsieur Cavalcanti something of the state of your finances. Ma foi, monsieur, you have touched upon a tender cord. Do you hear what he says, Major? "'Certainly I do. "'But do you understand?' "'I do. "'Your son says he requires money. "'Well, what would you have me do?' said the Major. "'You should furnish him with some, of course,' replied Monte Cristo. "'I?' "'Yes, you,' said the Count, at the same time advancing towards André and slipping a packet of banknotes into the young man's hand. "'What is this?' "'It is from your father.' "'From my father?' "'Yes. Did you not tell him just now that you wanted money? "'Well, then, he deputes me to give you this. "'Am I to consider this as part of my income on account? "'No, it is for the first expenses of your settling in Paris.' "'Ah, how good my dear father is! "'Silence,' said Monte Cristo. "'He does not wish you to know that it comes from him.' "'I fully appreciate his delicacy,' said André, "'cramming the notes hastily into his pocket.' 
"'And now, gentlemen, I wish you good morning,' said Monte Cristo. "'And when may we have the honour of seeing you again, Your Excellency?' asked Cavalcanti. "'Ah,' said André, "'when may we hope for that pleasure?' "'On Saturday, if you will. "'Yes. "'Let me see. "'Saturday. "'I am to dine at my country house at Auteuil on that day, Rue de la Fontaine, number 28. "'Several persons are invited, and, among others, Monsieur Danglars, your banker. "'I will introduce you to him, for it will be necessary he should know you, as he is to pay your money.' "'Full dress?' said the Major, half aloud. "'Oh, yes, certainly,' said the Count. "'Uniform, cross, knee-breeches. "'And how shall I be dressed?' demanded André. "'Oh, very simply. "'Black trousers, patent leather boots, white waistcoat, "'either a black or blue coat, and a long cravat. "'Go to Blin or Véronique for your clothes. "'Baptistin will tell you where, if you do not know their address. "'The less pretension there is in your attire, "'the better will be the effect, as you are a rich man.' If you mean to buy any horses, get them at Devedot, and if you purchase a phaeton, go to Paptiste for it. At what hour shall we come? asked the young man. About half past six. We will be with you at that time, said the major. The two Cavalcanti bowed to the count and left the house. Monte Cristo went to the window and saw them crossing the street arm in arm. There go two miscreants, said he. It is a pity they are not really related. Then, after an instant of gloomy reflection, "'Come, I will go to see the morals,' said he. "'I think that disgust is even more sickening than hatred.'" End of chapter 56
She presently arose and proceeded quickly to join Maximilian. "'Good evening, Valentine,' said a well-known voice. "'Good evening, Maximilian. I know I have kept you waiting, but you saw the cause of my delay. Yes, I recognized Mademoiselle Danglaire. I was not aware that you were so intimate with her. Who told you we were intimate, Maximilian? No one, but you appeared to be so. From the manner in which you walked and talked together, one would have thought you were two schoolgirls telling your secrets to each other. We were having a confidential conversation, returned Valentine. She was owning to me her repugnance to the marriage with M. de Morcerf, and I, on the other hand, was confessing to her how wretched it made me to think of marrying M. de Penet. Dear Valentine, that will account to you for the unreserved manner which you observed between me and Eugenie, as in speaking of the man whom I could not love, my thoughts involuntarily reverted to him on whom my affections were fixed. Ah, how good you are to say so, Valentine! You possess a quality which can never belong to Mademoiselle Danglaire. It is that indefinable charm which is to a woman what perfume is to the flower, and flavor to the fruit. For the beauty of either is not the only quality we seek. It is your love which makes you look upon everything in that light. No, Valentine, I assure you such is not the case. I was observing you both when you were walking in the garden, and on my honor, without at all wishing to deprecate the beauty of Mademoiselle Danglaire, I cannot understand how any man can really love her. The fact is, Maximilian, that I was there, and my presence had the effect of rendering you unjust in your comparison. No, but tell me. It is a question of simple curiosity, and which was suggested by certain ideas passing in my mind relative to Mademoiselle Danglaire's. I dare say it is something disparaging which you are going to say. It only proves how little indulgence we may expect from your sex, interrupted Valentine. You cannot at least deny that you are very harsh judges of each other. If we are so, it is because we generally judge under the influence of excitement. But return to your question. Does Mademoiselle Danglaire object to this marriage with M. de Morcerf on account of loving another? I told you I was not on terms of strict intimacy with Eugenie. Yes, but girls tell each other secrets without being particularly intimate. Own now that you did question her on the subject. Ah, I see you are smiling. If you are already aware of the conversation that passed, the wooden partition which interposed between us and you has proved but a slight security. Come, what did she say? She told me that she loved no one, said Valentine, that she disliked the idea of being married, that she would infinitely prefer leading an independent and unfettered life, and that she almost wished her father might lose his fortune, that she might become an artist, like her friend, Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly. Ah, you see. Well, what does that prove? asked Valentine. Nothing, replied Maximilian. Then why did you smile? Why, you know very well that you are reflecting on yourself, Valentine. Do you want me to go away? Ah, no, no. But do not let us lose time. You are the subject on which I wish to speak. True, we must be quick, for we have scarcely ten minutes more to pass together. Ma foi, said Maximilian in consternation. Yes, you are right. I am but a poor friend to you. What a life I cause you to lead, poor Maximilian, you who are formed for happiness. I bitterly reproach myself, I assure you. Well, what does it signify, Valentine, so long as I am satisfied? and feel that even this long and painful suspense is amply repaid by five minutes of your society, or two words from your lips. And I have also a deep conviction that heaven would not have created two hearts, harmonizing as ours do, and almost miraculously brought us together to separate us at last. Those are kind and cheering words. You must hope for us both, Maximilian, that you will make me at least partly happy." But why must you leave me so soon? I do not know the particulars. I can only tell you that Madame de Villefort sent to request my presence, as she had a communication to make on which a part of my fortune depended. Let them take my fortune. I am already too rich. And perhaps when they have taken it, they will leave me in peace and quietness. You would love me as much if I were poor, would you not, Maximilian? Oh, I shall always love you. 
What should I care for either riches or poverty if my valentine was near me, and I felt certain that no one could deprive me of her? But do you not fear that this communication may relate to your marriage? I do not think that is the case. However it may be, Valentine, you must not be alarmed. I assure you that as long as I live, I shall never love anyone else. You think to reassure me when you say that, Maximilian. Pardon me, you are right. I am a brute. But I was going to tell you that I met M. de Morcerf the other day. Well? Monsieur Franz is his friend, you know. What then? Monsieur de Morcerf has received a letter from Franz announcing his immediate return. Valentine turned pale and leaned her hand against the gate. Ah, heavens, if I thought it were that. But no, the communication would not come through Madame de Villefort. Why not? Because, I scarcely know why, but it has appeared as if Madame de Villefort secretly objected to the marriage, although she did not choose openly to oppose it. Is it so? Then I feel as if I could adore Madame de Villefort. Do not be in such a hurry to do that, said Valentine, with a sad smile. If she objects to your marrying M. de Penet, she would be all the more likely to listen to any other proposition. No, Maximilian, it is not suitors to which Madame de Villefort objects. It is marriage itself. Marriage? If she dislikes that so much, why did she ever marry herself? You do not understand me, Maximilian. About a year ago I talked of retiring to a convent. Madame de Villefort, in spite of all the remarks which she considered it her duty to make, secretly approved of the proposition. My father consented to it at her instigation, and it was only on account of my poor grandfather that I finally abandoned the project. You can form no idea of the expression of the old man's eye when he looks at me, the only person in the world whom he loves, and, I had almost said, by whom he is beloved in return. When he learned my resolution, I shall never forget the reproachful look which he cast on me, and the tears of utter despair which chased each other down his lifeless cheeks. Ah, Maximilian, I experienced at that moment such remorse for my intention, that throwing myself at his feet I exclaimed, Forgive me, pray forgive me, my dear grandfather. They may do what they will with me. I will never leave you. When I had ceased speaking, he thankfully raised his eyes to heaven, but without uttering a word. Ah, Maximilian, I may have much to suffer, but I feel as if my grandfather's look at that moment could more than compensate for all. Dear Valentine, you are a perfect angel, and I am sure I do not know what I, sabering right and left among the Bedouins, can have done to merit your being revealed to me, unless, indeed, heaven took into consideration the fact that the victims of my sword were infidels, but tell me what interest Madame de Villefort can have in your remaining unmarried. Did I not tell you just now that I was rich, Maximilian? Too rich? I possess nearly fifty thousand livres in right of my mother. My grandfather and my grandmother, the Marquis and Marquise de saint Moran, will leave me as much, and M. Nortier evidently intends to make me his heir. My brother Edward, who inherits nothing from his mother, will therefore be poor in comparison with me. Now if I had taken the veil, all this fortune would have descended to my father, and in reversion to his son. Ah, how strange it seems that such a young and beautiful woman should be so avaricious. It is not for herself that she is so, but for her son. And what you regard as vice becomes almost a virtue when looked at in the light of maternal love. But could you not compromise matters and give up a portion of your fortune to her son? How could I make such a proposition? especially to a woman who always professes to be so entirely disinterested. Valentine, I have always regarded our love the light of something sacred. Consequently, I have covered it with a veil of respect and hid it in the innermost recesses of my soul. No human being, not even my sister, is aware of its existence. Valentine, will you permit me to make a confidant of a friend and reveal to him the love I bear you? Valentine started. A friend, Maximilian? And who is this friend? I tremble to give my permission. Listen, Valentine, have you never experienced for any one that sudden and irresistible sympathy which made you feel as if the object of it had been your old and familiar friend, though in reality it was the first time you had ever met? 
Nay, further, have you never endeavored to recall the time, place, and circumstances of your former intercourse, and failing in this attempt, have almost believed that your spirits must have held converse with each other in some state of being anterior to the present, and that you are only now occupied in a reminiscence of the past? Yes. Well, that is precisely the feeling which I experienced when I first saw that extraordinary man. Extraordinary, did you say? Yes. You have known him for some time, then. Scarcely longer than eight or ten days. And do you call a man your friend whom you have only known for eight or ten days? Ah, oh, Maximilian, I had hoped you set a higher value on the title of friend. Your logic is most powerful, Valentine. But say what you will, I can never renounce the sentiment which has instinctively taken possession of my mind. I feel as if it were ordained that this man should be associated with all the good which the future may have in store for me and sometimes it really seems as if his eye was able to see what was to come, and his hand endowed with the power of directing events according to his own will. He must be a prophet, then, said Valentine, smiling. Indeed, said Maximilian, I have often been almost tempted to attribute to him the gift of prophecy, for at all events he has a wonderful power of foretelling any future good. Ah, said Valentine, in a mournful tone, do let me see this man, Maximilian. He may tell me whether I shall ever be loved sufficiently to make amends for all that I have suffered. My poor girl, you know him already. I know him? Yes, it was he who saved the life of your stepmother and her son. The Count of Monte Cristo? The same. Ah, cried Valentine, he is too much the friend of Madame de Villefort ever to be mine. The friend of Madame de Villefort? It cannot be. Surely, Valentine, you are mistaken. No, indeed, I am not, for I assure you, his power over our household is almost unlimited. Courted by my stepmother, who regards him as the epitome of human wisdom, admired by my father, who says he has never before heard such sublime ideas so eloquently expressed, idolized by Edward, who, notwithstanding his fear of the Count's large black eyes, runs to meet him the moment he arrives, and opens his hand, in which he is sure to find some delightful present. M. de Monte Cristo appears to exert a mysterious and almost uncontrollable influence over all the members of our family. If such be the case, my dear Valentine, you must yourself have felt, or at all events will soon feel, the effects of his presence. He meets Albert de Morcerf in Italy. It is to rescue him from the hands of the banditti. He introduces himself to Madame d'Anglaire. It is that he may give her a royal present. Your stepmother and her son pass before his door. It is that his Nubian may save them from destruction. This man evidently possesses the power of influencing events, both as regards men and things. I never saw more simple tastes united to greater magnificence. His smile is so sweet when he addresses me that I forget it can ever be bitter to others. Ah, Valentine, tell me, if he ever looked upon you with one of those sweet smiles... If so, depend on it. You will be happy. Me, said the young girl, he never even glances at me. On the contrary, if I accidentally cross his path, he appears rather to avoid me. Well, he is not generous, neither does he possess that supernatural penetration which you attribute to him. For if he did, he would have perceived that I was unhappy. And if he had been generous, seeing me sad and solitary, he would have used his influence to my advantage. And since, as you say, he resembles the sun, he would have warmed my heart with one of his life-giving rays. You say he loves you, Maximilian. How do you know that he does? All would pay deference to an officer like you, with a fierce mustache and a long saber. But they think they may crush a poor weeping girl with impunity. Ah, Valentine, I assure you, you are mistaken. If it were otherwise, if he treated me diplomatically... That is to say, like a man who wishes, by some means or other, to obtain a footing in the house, so that he may ultimately gain the power of dictating to its occupants, he would, if it had been but once, have honored me with a smile which you extol so loudly. But no, he saw that I was unhappy, he understood that I could be of no use to him, and therefore paid no attention to me whatever. Who knows but that in order to please Madame de Villefort and my father, he may not persecute me by every means in his power. 
It is not just that he should despise me so, without any reason. Ah, forgive me, said Valentine, perceiving the effect which her words were producing on Maximilian. I have done wrong, for I have given utterance to thoughts concerning that man which I did not even know existed in my heart. I do not deny the influence of which you speak, or that I have not myself experienced it, but with me it has been productive of evil rather than good. Well, Valentine, said Morel with a sigh, we will not discuss the matter further. I will not make a confidant of him. Alas, said Valentine, I see that I have given you pain. I can only say how sincerely I ask pardon for having griefed you. But indeed, I am not prejudiced beyond the power of conviction. Tell me what this Count of Monte Cristo has done for you. I own that your question embarrasses me, Valentine, for I cannot say that the Count has rendered me any ostensible service. Still, as I have already told you, I have an instinctive affection for him, the source of which I cannot explain to you. Has the sun done anything for me? No. He warms me with his rays, and it is by his light that I see you. Nothing more. Has such and such a perfume done anything for me? No. Its odor charms one of my senses. That is all I can say when I am asked why I praise it. My friendship for him is as strange and unaccountable as his for me. A secret voice seems to whisper to me that there must be something more than chance in this unexpected reciprocity of friendship. In his most simple actions, as well as in his most secret thoughts, I find a relation to my own. You will perhaps smile at me when I tell you that, ever since I have known this man, I have involuntarily entertained the idea that all the good fortune which has befallen me originated from him. However, I have managed to live thirty years without this protection, you will say, but I will endeavor a little to illustrate my meaning. He invited me to dine with him on Saturday, which was a very natural thing for him to do. Well, what have I learned since? That your mother and M. de Villefort are both coming to this dinner. I shall meet them there, and who knows what future advantages may result from the interview. This may appear to you to be no unusual combination of circumstances. Nevertheless, I perceive some hidden plot in the arrangement, something, in fact, more than is apparent on a casual view of the subject. I believe that this singular man, who appears to fathom the motives of every one, has purposely arranged for me to meet M. and Madame de Villefort, and sometimes, I confess, I have gone so far as to try to read in his eyes whether he was in possession of the secret of our love. My good friend, said Valentine, I should take you for a visionary, and should tremble for your reason, if I were always to hear you talk in a strain similar to this. Is it possible that you can see anything more than the merest chance in this meeting? Pray reflect a little. My father, who never goes out, has several times been on the point of refusing this invitation. Madame de Villefort, on the contrary, is burning with the desire of seeing this extraordinary nabob in his own house. Therefore she has with great difficulty prevailed on my father to accompany her. No, no, it is as I have said, Maximilian. There is no one in the world of whom I can ask help but yourself and my grandfather, who is little better than a corpse. I see you are right, logically oh. speaking, said Maximilian, but the gentle voice which usually has such power over me fails to convince me today. I feel the same as regards yourself, said Valentine, and I own that if you have no stronger proof to give me. I have another, replied Maximilian but I fear you will deem it even more absurd than the first. So much the worse, said Valentine, smiling. It is, nevertheless, conclusive to my mind. My ten years of service have also confirmed my ideas on the subject of sudden inspirations, for I have several times owed my life to a mysterious impulse which directed me to move at once either to the right or to the left in order to escape the ball which killed the comrade fighting by my side, while it left me unharmed. Dear Maximilian, why not attribute your escape to my constant prayers for your safety? When you are away, I no longer pray for myself, but for you. Yes, since you have known me, said Morel, smiling, but that cannot apply to the time previous to our acquaintance, Valentine. You are very provoking, and will not give me credit for anything, but let me hear this second proof which you yourself own to be absurd. Well, look through this opening, and you will see the beautiful new horse which I rode here. 
Ah, what a beautiful creature, cried Valentine. Why did you not bring him close to the gate so that I could talk to him and pat him? He is, as you see, a very valuable animal, said Maximilian. You know that my means are limited, and that I am what would be designated a man of moderate pretensions. Well, I went to a horse dealer's, where I saw this magnificent horse, which I have named Medea. I asked the price. They told me it was forty-five hundred francs. I was therefore obliged to give it up, as you may imagine, but I own I went away with rather a heavy heart, for the horse had looked at me affectionately, had rubbed his head against me, and, when I mounted him, had pranced in the most delightful way imaginable, so that I was altogether fascinated with him. The same evening some friends of mine visited me, M. de Chateau Renaud, M. de Bray, and five or six other choice spirits whom you do not know, even by name. They proposed a game of boudillot. I never play, for I am not rich enough to afford to lose, or sufficiently poor to desire to gain. But I was at my own house, you understand, so there was nothing to be done but to send for the cards, which I did. Just as they were sitting down to the table, M. de Monte Cristo arrived. He took his seat amongst them. They played, and I won. I am almost ashamed to say that my gains amounted to five thousand francs. We separated at midnight. I could not defer my pleasure, so I took a cabriolet and drove to the horse-dealers. Feverish and excited, I rang at the door. The person who opened it must have taken me for a madman, for I rushed at once to the stable. Medea was standing at the rack, eating his hay. I immediately put on the saddle and the bridle, to which operation he lent himself with the best grace possible. Then, putting the forty-five hundred francs into the hands of the astonished dealer, I proceeded to fulfill my intention of passing the night and riding on the Champs-Élysées. As I rode by the Count's house, I perceived a light in one of the windows, and fancied I saw the shadow of its figure moving behind the curtain. Now, Valentine, I firmly believe that he knew of my wish to possess this horse, and that he lost expressly to give me the means of procuring him. My dear Maximilian, you are really too fanciful. You will not love even me long. A man who accustoms himself to live in such a world of poetry and imagination must find far too little excitement in a common everyday sort of attachment such as ours. But they are calling me, do you hear? Ah, Valentine, said Maximilian, give me but one finger through this opening in the grating, one finger, the littlest finger of all, that I may have the happiness of kissing it. Maximilian, we said we would be to each other as two voices, two shadows. As you will, Valentine. Shall you be happy if I do what you wish? Oh, yes. Valentine mounted on the bench and passed not only her finger, but her whole hand through the opening. Maximilian uttered a cry of delight, and springing forwards, seized the hand extended towards him and imprinted on it a fervent and impassioned kiss. The little hand was then immediately withdrawn, and the young man saw Valentine hurrying towards the house, as though she were almost terrified at her own sensations. End of chapter 57「what was passing in the house of the king's attorney after the departure of Madame Danglars and her daughter, and during the time of the conversation between Maximilian and Valentine, which we have just detailed, Monsieur de Villefort entered his father's room, followed by Madame de Villefort. Both of the visitors, after saluting the old man and speaking to Barras, a faithful servant who had been twenty-five years in his service, took their places on either side of the paralytic. Monsieur Nautier was sitting in an armchair, which moved upon casters, 
in which he was wheeled into the room in the morning and in the same way drawn out again at night. He was placed before a large glass, which reflected the whole apartment, and so, without any attempt to move, which would have been impossible. He could see all who entered the room and everything which was going on around him. Monsieur Nautier, although almost as immovable as a corpse, looked at the newcomers with a quick and intelligent expression, perceiving at once by their ceremonious courtesy that they were come on business of an unexpected and official character. Sight and hearing were the only senses remaining, and they, like two solitary sparks, remained to animate the miserable body which seemed fit for nothing but the grave. It was only, however, by means of one of these senses that he could reveal the thoughts and feelings that still occupied his mind, and the look by which he gave expression to his inner life was like the distant gleam of a candle which a traveller sees by night across some desert place, and knows that a living being dwells beyond the silence and obscurity. Nautia's hair was long and white, and flowed over his shoulders, while in his eyes, shaded by thick black lashes, was concentrated, as it often happens with an organ which is used to the exclusion of the others. All the activity, address, force, and intelligence which were formerly diffused over his whole body, and so, although the movement of the arm, the sound of his voice, and the agility of the body were wanting, the speaking eye sufficed for all. He commanded with it. It was the medium through which his thanks were conveyed. In short, his whole appearance produced on the mind the impression of a corpse with living eyes, and nothing could be more startling than to observe the expression of anger or joy suddenly lighting up these organs, while the rest of the rigid and marble-like features were utterly deprived of the power of participation. Three persons only could understand this language of the poor paralytic, these were Villefort, Valentine, and the old servant of whom we have already spoken. But as Villefort saw his father but seldom, and then only when absolutely obliged, and as he never took any pains to please or gratify him when he was there, all the old man's happiness was centred in his granddaughter. Valentine, by means of her love, her patience, and her devotion, had learned to read in Nautia's look all the varied feelings which were passing in his mind. To this dumb language, which was so unintelligible to others, she answered by throwing her whole soul into the expression of her countenance, and in this manner were the conversations sustained between the blooming girl and the helpless invalid whose body could scarcely be called a living one, but who, nevertheless, possessed a fund of knowledge and penetration, united with a will as powerful as ever, although clogged by a body rendered utterly incapable of obeying its impulses. Valentine had solved the problem, and was able easily to understand his thoughts and to convey her own in return, and, through her untiring and devoted assiduity, it was seldom that. In the ordinary transactions of everyday life, she failed to anticipate the wishes of the living, thinking mind, or the wants of the almost inanimate body. As to the servant, he had, as we have said, been with his master for five and twenty years. Therefore he knew all his habits, and it was seldom that Nautier found it necessary to ask for anything. So prompt was he in administering to all the necessities of the invalid. 
Villefort did not need the help of either Valentine or the domestic in order to carry on with his father the strange conversation which he was about to begin. As we have said, he perfectly understood the old man's vocabulary, and if he did not use it more often, it was only indifference and ennui which prevented him from doing it. He therefore allowed Valentine to go into the garden, sent away Barris, and after having seated himself at his father's right hand, while Madame de Villeport placed herself on the left, he addressed him thus. I trust you will not be displeased, sir, that Valentine has not come with us, or that I dismissed Barris, for our conference will be one which could not with propriety be carried on in the presence of either. Madame de Villefort and I have a communication to make to you. Nortier's face remained perfectly passive during this long preamble, while, on the contrary, Villefort's eye was endeavouring to penetrate into the inmost recess of the old man's heart. This communication continued the procurer, in that cold and decisive tone which seemed at once to preclude all discussion, will, we are sure, meet with your approbation. The eye of the invalid still retained that vacancy of expression which prevented his son from obtaining any knowledge of the feelings which were passing in his mind. He listened, nothing more. Sir, resumed Villefort, we are thinking of marrying Valentine. Had the old man's face been moulded in wax, it could not have shown less emotion at this news than was now to be traced there. The marriage will take place in less than three months, said Villefort. Nortier's eye still retained its intimate expression. Madame de Villefort now took her part in the conversation and added, We thought this news would possess an interest for you, sir, who have always entertained a great affection for Valentine. It therefore only now remains for us to tell you the name of the young man for whom she is destined. It is one of the most desirable connections which could possibly be formed. He possesses fortune, a high rank in society, and every personal qualification likely to render Valentine supremely happy. His name, moreover, cannot be wholly unknown to you. It is Monsieur Frank de Quinzel, Baron d'Epinay. While his wife was speaking, Villefort had narrowly watched the old man's countenance. When Madame de Villefort pronounced the name of France, the pupil of Monsieur Nortier's eye began to dilate, and his eyelids trembled with the same movement that may be perceived on the lips of an individual about to speak and he darted a lightning glance at Madame de Villefort and his son. The procureur, who knew the political hatred which had formerly existed between Monsieur Nortier and the elder d'Epinay, well understood the agitation and anger which the announcement had produced. But, feigning not to perceive either, he immediately resumed the narrative begun by his wife, Sir, said he, you are aware that Valentine is about to enter her nineteenth year, which renders it important that she should lose no time in forming a suitable alliance. Nevertheless, you have not been forgotten in our plans, and we have fully ascertained beforehand that Valentine's future husband will consent not to live in this house for that might not be pleasant for the young people, but that you should live with them, so that you and Valentine, who are so attached to each other, would not be separated, and you would be able to pursue exactly the same course of life 
which you have hitherto done, and thus, instead of losing, you will be a gainer by the change, as it will secure to you two children, instead of one, to watch over and comfort you. Nortia's look was furious. It was very evident that something desperate was passing in the old man's mind, for a cry of anger and grief rose in his throat, and not being able to find vent in utterance, appeared almost to choke him, for his face and lips turned quite purple with the struggle. Villefort quietly opened a window, saying, It is very warm, and the heat affects Monsieur Nautier. He then returned to his place, but did not sit down. This marriage, added Madame de Villefort, is quite agreeable to the wishes of Monsieur de Epinay and his family. Besides, he had no relations nearer than an uncle and aunt, his mother having died at his birth, and his father having been assassinated in 1815, that is to say, when he was but two years old. It was naturally followed that the child was permitted to choose his own pursuits, and he has, therefore, seldom acknowledged any other authority but that of his own will. That assassination was a mysterious affair, said Villefort, and the perpetrators have hitherto escaped detection. Although suspicion has fallen on the head of more than one person, Nautier made such an effort that his lips expanded into a smile. Now, continued Villefort, those to whom the guilt really belongs, by whom the crime was committed, on whose heads the justice of man may probably descend here, and the certain judgment of God hereafter, would rejoice in the opportunity thus afforded of bestowing such a peace offering as Valentine on the son of him whose life they so ruthlessly destroyed. Nautier had succeeded in mastering his emotion more than could have been deemed possible with such an enfeebled and shattered frame. Yes, I understand, was the reply contained in his look, and this look expressed a feeling of strong indignation, mixed with profound contempt. Villefort fully understood his father's meaning, and answered by a slight shrug of his shoulders. He then motioned to his wife to take leave. Now, sir, said Madame de Villefort, I must bid you farewell. Would you like me to send Edward to you for a short time? It had been agreed that the old man should express his approbation by closing his eyes, his refusal by winking them several times and if he had some desire or feeling to express, he raised them to heaven. If he wanted Valentine, he closed his right eye only, and if Barris, the left. At Madame de Villefort's proposition, he instantly winked his eyes. Provoked by a complete refusal, she bit her lip and said, Then shall I send Valentine to you? The old man closed his eyes eagerly, thereby intimating that such was his wish. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort bowed and left the room, giving orders that Valentine should be summoned to her grandfather's presence, and feeling sure that she would have much to do to restore calmness to the perturbed spirit of the invalid. Valentine, with a colour still heightened by the emotion, entered the room just after her parents had quitted it. One look was sufficient to tell her that her grandfather was suffering, and that there was much on his mind which he was wishing to communicate to her. "'Dear Grandpapa,' cried she, "'what has happened? They have vexed you, and you are angry.' The paralytic closed his eyes, in token of assent. Who has displeased you? Is it my father? No. 
Madame de Villefort? No. Me? The former sign was repeated. Are you displeased with me? cried Valentine in astonishment. Monsieur Nautier again closed his eyes. And what have I done, dear grandpapa, that you should be angry with me? cried Valentine. There was no answer, and she continued, I have not seen you all day. Has any one been speaking to you against me? Yes, said the old man's look, with eagerness. Let me think a moment. I do assure you, grandpapa, ah, Monsieur and Madame de Villefort have just left this room, have they not? Yes. And it was they who told you something which made you angry? What was it then? May I go and ask them, that I may have the opportunity of making my peace with you? No, no, said Nautier's look. Ah, you frighten me. What can they have said? And she again tried to think what it could be. Ah, I know, said she, lowering her voice and going close to the old man. They have been speaking of my marriage, have they not? Yes, replied the angry look. I understand you are displeased at the silence I have preserved on the subject. The reason of it was that they had insisted on my keeping the matter a secret and begged me not to tell you anything of it. They did not even acquaint me with their intentions, and I only discovered them by chance. That is why I have been so reserved with you, dear Grandpapa. Pray forgive me. But there was no look calculated to reassure her. All it seemed to say was, It is not only your reserve which afflicts me. What is it? then asked the young girl. Perhaps you think I shall abandon you, dear Grandpapa, and that I shall forget you when I am married? No. They told you, then, that Monsieur d'Epinay consented to our all living together? Yes. Then why are you still vexed and grieved? The old man's eyes beamed with an expression of gentle affection. Yes, I understand, said Valentine. It is because you love me. The old man assented, and you are afraid I shall be unhappy. Yes, you do not like Monsieur France. The eyes repeated several times. No, no, no. Then you are vexed with the engagement? Yes. Well, listen, said Valentine, throwing herself on her knees and putting her arms round her grandfather's neck. I am vexed, too, for I do not love Monsieur Frant d'Epinay. An expression of intense joy illumined the old man's eyes. When I wished to retire into a convent, you remember how angry you were with me? A tear trembled in the eye of the invalid. Well, continued Valentine, the reason of my proposing it was that I might escape this hateful marriage, which drives me to despair. Nautier's breathing came thick and short. Then the idea of this marriage really grieves you too. Ah, if you could but help me, if we could both together defeat their plan, but you are unable to oppose them. You, whose mind is so quick, and whose will is so firm, and nevertheless as weak and unequal to the contest as I am myself. Alas, you, who would have been such a powerful protector to me in the days of your health and strength, can now only sympathize in my joys and sorrows without being able to take any active part in them. However, this is much, and calls for gratitude, and heaven has not taken away all my blessings when it leaves me your sympathy and kindness. At these words there appeared in Nautia's eye an expression of such deep meaning 
that the young girl thought she could read these words there. You are mistaken. I can still do much for you. Do you think you can help me, dear Grandpapa? said Valentine. Yes, Nautier raised his eyes. It was the sign agreed between him and Valentine when he wanted anything. What is it you want, dear Grandpapa? said Valentine, and she endeavoured to recall to mind all the things which he would be likely to need. And as the ideas presented themselves to her mind, she repeated them aloud. Then, finding that all her efforts elicited nothing but a constant no, she said, Come, since this plan does not answer, I will have recourse to another. She then recited all the letters of the alphabet, from A down to N. When she arrived at that letter, the paralytic made her understand that she had spoken the initial letter of the thing he wanted. Ah, said Valentine, the thing you desire begins with the letter N. It is with N that we have to do. Then, well, let me see. What can you want that begins with N? Na, ni, ni, no. Yes, 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 said the old man's eye. Ah, it is no, then. Yes, Valentine fetched a dictionary, which she placed on a desk before Nautier. She opened it, and, seeing that the old man's eye was thoroughly fixed on its pages, she ran her finger quickly up and down the columns. During the six years which had passed since Nautia's first fell into this sad state, Valentine's power of invention had been too often put to the test, not to render her expert in devising expedients for gaining a knowledge of his wishes, and the constant practice had so perfected her in the art that she guessed the old man's meaning as quickly as if he himself had been able to seek for what he wanted. At the word notary, Nautia made a sign to her to stop. Notary, said she, do you want a notary, dear Grandpapa? The old man again signified that it was a notary he desired. You would wish a notary to be sent for, then, said Valentine. Yes. Shall my father be informed of your wish? Yes. Do you wish the notary to be sent for immediately? Yes. Then they shall go for him directly, dear Grandpapa. Is that all you want? Yes. Valentine rang the bell and ordered the servant to tell Monsieur or Madame de Villefort that they were requested to come to Monsieur Nautier's room. Are you satisfied now? inquired Valentine. Yes, I am sure you are. It is not very difficult to discover that. And the young girl smiled on her grandfather, as if he had been a child. Monsieur de Villefort entered followed by Barras. "'What do you want me for, sir?' demanded he of the paralytic. "'Sir,' said Valentine, "'my grandfather wishes for a notary.' At this strange and unexpected demand, Monsieur de Villefort and his father exchanged looks. "'Yes,' motioned the latter, with a firmness which seemed to declare that with the help of Valentine and his old servant, who both knew what his wishes were. He was quite prepared to maintain the contest. "'Do you wish for a notary?' asked Villefort. "'Yes. What to do?' Nautier made no answer. "'What do you want with a notary?' again repeated Villefort. The invalid's eye remained fixed, by which expression he intended to intimate that his resolution was unalterable. Is it to do us some ill turn? Do you think it is worth while? said Villefort. 
Still, said Barros, with the freedom and fidelity of an old servant, if Monsieur asks for a notary, I suppose he really wishes for a notary. Therefore I shall go at once and fetch one. Barris acknowledged no master but Nautier, and never allowed his desires in any way to be contradicted. Yes, I do want a notary, motioned the old man, shutting his eyes with a look of defiance, which seemed to say, and I should like to see the person who dares to refuse my request. You shall have a notary, as you absolutely wish for one, sir, said Villefort, but I shall explain to him your state of health, and make excuses for you, for the scene cannot fail of being a most ridiculous one. Never mind that, said Barris. I shall go and fetch a notary, nevertheless, and the old servant departed triumphantly on his mission. End of chapter 58「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 59 The Will. As soon as Barras had left the room, Nautia looked at Valentine with a malicious expression that said many things. The young girl perfectly understood the look, and so did Villefort, for his countenance became clouded, and he knitted his eyebrows angrily. He took a seat and quietly awaited the arrival of the notary. Nautia saw him seat himself with an appearance of perfect indifference, at the same time giving a side look at Valentine, which made her understand that she also was to remain in the room. Three quarters of an hour after, Barris returned, bringing the notary with him. Sir, said Villefort, after the first solutions were over, you were sent for by Monsieur Nautier, whom you see here. All his limbs have been completely paralyzed. He has lost his voice also, and we ourselves find much trouble in endeavoring to catch some fragments of his meaning. Nautier cast an appealing look on Valentine, which look was at once so earnest and imperative that she answered immediately. Sir, said she, I perfectly understand my grandfather's meaning at all times. That is quite true, said Barris, and that is what I told the gentleman as we walked along. Permit me, said the notary, turning first to Villefort and then to Valentine. Permit me to state that the case in question is just one of those in which a public officer like myself cannot proceed to act without thereby incurring a dangerous responsibility. The first thing necessary to render an act valid is that the notary should be thoroughly convinced that he has faithfully interpreted the will and wishes of the person dictating the act. Now I cannot be sure of the approbation or disapprobation of a client who cannot speak, and as the object of his desire or his repugnance cannot be clearly proved to me on account of his want of speech, my services here would be quite useless and cannot be legally exercised. The notary then prepared to retire, an imperceptible smile of triumph was expressed on the lips of the procurer. Nautia looked at Valentine with an expression so full of grief that she arrested the departure of the notary. Sir, 
said she. The language which I speak with my grandfather may be easily learnt, and I can teach you in a few minutes, to understand it almost as well as I can myself. Will you tell me what you require, in order to set your conscience quite at ease on the subject? In order to render an act valid, I must be certain of the approbation or disapprobation of my client. Illness of body would not affect the validity of the deed, but sanity of mind is absolutely requisite. Well, sir, by the help of two signs, with which I will acquaint you presently, you may ascertain with perfect certainty that my grandfather is still in the full possession of all his mental faculties. Monsieur Nautier, being deprived of voice and motion, is accustomed to convey his meaning by closing his eyes when he wishes to signify yes, and to wink when he means no. You now know quite enough to enable you to converse with Monsieur Nautier. Try. Nautier gave Valentine such a look of tenderness and gratitude that it was comprehended even by the notary himself. You have heard and understood what your granddaughter has been saying, sir, have you? asked the notary. Nautier closed his eyes. And you approve of what she said, that is to say, you declare that the signs which she mentioned are really those by means of which you are accustomed to convey your thoughts? Yes. It was you who sent for me? Yes. To make your will? Yes. And you do not wish me to go away without fulfilling your original intentions? The old man winked violently. Well, sir, said the young girl, do you understand now, and is your conscience perfectly at rest on the subject? But before the notary could answer, Villefort had drawn him aside. Sir, said he, do you suppose for a moment that a man can sustain a physical shock such as Monsieur Nautier has received? without any detriment to his mental faculties? It is not exactly that, sir, said the notary, which makes me uneasy, but the difficulty will be in wording his thoughts and intentions, so as to be able to get his answers. You must see that to be an utter impossibility, said Villefort. Valentine and the old man heard this conversation, and Nautier fixed his eyes so earnestly on Valentine that she felt bound to answer to look. Sir, said she, that need not make you uneasy, however difficult it may at first sight appear to be. I can discover and explain to you my grandfather's thoughts, so as to put an end to all your doubts and fears on the subject. I have been six years with Monsieur Nautier, and let me tell you if ever once, during that time, he has entertained a thought which he was unable to make me understand. No, signed the old man. Let us try what we can do, then, said the notary. You accept this young lady as your interpreter, Monsieur Nautier? Yes. Well, sir... What do you require of me, and what document is it that you wish to be drawn up? Valentine named all the letters of the alphabet, until she came to W. At this letter, the eloquent eye of Nautier gave her notice that she was to stop. It is very evident that it is the letter W, which Monsieur Nautier wants, said the notary. Wait said Valentine, and turning to her grandfather, she repeated, Wa, we, we. The old man stopped her at the last syllable. Valentine then took the dictionary, and the notary watched her while she turned over the pages. 
She passed her finger slowly down the columns, and when she came to the word will, Monsieur Nautier's eye bade her stop. Will, said the notary, it is very evident that Monsieur Nautier is desirous of making his will. Yes, 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 motioned the invalid. Really, sir, you must allow that this is most extraordinary, said the astonished notary, turning to Monsieur de Villefort. Yes, said the procurer, and I think the will promises to be yet more extraordinary, for I cannot see how it is to be drawn up without the intervention of Valentine, and she may, perhaps, be considered as to much interested in its contents, to allow of her being a suitable interpreter of the obscure and ill-defined wishes of her grandfather. No, 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 replied the eye of the paralytic. What, said Villefort, do you mean to say that Valentine is not interested in your will? No. Sir, said the notary, whose interest had been greatly excited, and who had resolved on publishing far and wide the account of this extraordinary and picturesque scene. What appeared so impossible to me an hour ago has now become quite easy and practicable, and this may be a perfectly valid will, provided it be read in the presence of seven witnesses. Approved by the testator, and sealed by the notary in the presence of the witnesses. As to the time, it will not require very much more than the generality of wills. There are certain forms necessary to be gone through, and which are always the same. As to the details, the greater part will be furnished afterwards by the state in which we find the affairs of the testator and by yourself, who, having had the management of them, can doubtless give full information on the subject. But besides all this, in order that the instrument may not be contested, I am anxious to give it the greatest possible authenticity. Therefore, one of my colleagues will help me, and, contrary to custom, will assist in the dictation of the testament. Are you satisfied, sir? Continued the notary, addressing the old man. Yes, looked the invalid, his eye beaming with delight at the ready interpretation of his meaning. What is he going to do, thought Villefort, whose position demanded much reserve, but who was longing to know what his father's intentions were. He left the room to give orders for another notary to be sent. But Barras, who had heard all that passed, had guessed his master's wishes, and had already gone to fetch one. The procureur then told his wife to come up. In the course of a quarter of an hour, every one had assembled in the chamber of the paralytic, the second notary had also arrived. A few words sufficed for a mutual understanding between the two officers of the law. They read to Nautier the formal copy of a will, in order to give him an idea of the terms in which such documents are generally couched. Then, in order to test the capacity of the testator, the first notary said, turning towards him. When an individual makes his will, it is generally in favour or in prejudice of some person. Yes. Have you an exact idea of the amount of your fortune? Yes. I will name to you several sums which will increase by gradation. You will stop me when I reach the one representing the amount of of your own possessions. Yes, there was a kind of solemnity in his interrogation. Never had the struggle between mind and matter 
been more apparent than now, and if it was not a sublime, it was, at least, a curious spectacle. They had formed a circle round the invalid. The second notary was sitting at a table, prepared for writing, and his colleague was standing before the testator, in the act of interrogating him on the subject to which we have alluded. Your fortune exceeds three hundred thousand francs, does it not? asked he. Nautier made a sign that it did. Do you possess four hundred thousand francs? inquired the notary. Nautier's eye remained immovable. Five hundred thousand. The same expression continued. Six hundred thousand. Seven hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand. Nautier stopped him at the last named sum. You are then in possession of nine hundred thousand francs? asked the notary. Yes. In landed property? No. In stock? Yes. The stock is in your hands? The look which Monsieur Nautier cast on Burris showed that there was something wanting which he knew where to find. The old servant left the room, and presently returned, bringing with him a small casket. Do you permit us to open this casket? asked the notary. Nautier gave his assent. They opened it, and found nine hundred thousand francs in bank scrip. The first notary handed over each note, as he examined it, to his colleague. The total amount was found to be, as Monsieur Nautier had stated. It is all as he has said. It is very evident that the mind still retains its full force and vigor. Then, turning towards the paralytic, he said, You possess, then, nine hundred thousand francs of capital, which, according to the manner in which you have invested it, ought to bring in an income of about four hundred livres. Yes. To whom do you desire to leave this fortune? Oh, said Madame de Villefort, there is not much doubt on that subject. Monsieur Nautier tenderly loves his granddaughter, Mademoiselle de Villefort. It is she who has nursed and tended him for six years, and has, by her devoted attention, fully secured the affection, I had almost said the gratitude, of her grandfather. And it is but just that she should reap the fruit of her devotion. The eye of Nautier clearly showed by its expression that he was not deceived by the false assent given by Madame de Villefort's words, and manner to the motives which she supposed him to entertain. Is it, then, to Mademoiselle Valentine de Villefort that you leave these nine hundred thousand francs? demanded the notary, thinking he had only to insert this clause, but waiting first for the assent of Nautier, which it was necessary should be given before all the witnesses of this singular scene. Valentine, when her name was made, the subject of discussion, had stepped back to escape unpleasant observation. Her eyes were cast down, and she was crying. The old man looked at her for an instant, with an expression of the deepest tenderness. Then, turning towards the notary, he significantly winked his eye in token of dissent. What? said the notary. Do you not intend making Mademoiselle Valentine de Villefort your residuary legatee? No. You are not making any mistake, are you? said the notary. You really mean to declare that such is not your intention? No, repeated Nautier. No. Valentine raised her head, 
struck dumb with astonishment. It was not so much the conviction that she was disinherited that caused her grief, but her total inability to account for the feelings which had provoked her grandfather to such an act. But Nautier looked at her with so much affectionate tenderness that she exclaimed, Oh, Grandpapa, I see now that it is only your fortune of which you deprive me. You still leave me the love which I have always enjoyed. Ah, yes, most certainly, said the eyes of the paralytic, for he closed them with an expression which Valentine could not mistake. Thank you, thank you, murmured she. The old man's declaration that Valentine was not the destined inheritor of his fortune had excited the hopes of Madame de Villefort. She gradually approached the invalid and said, Then, doubtless, dear Monsieur Nautier, you intend leaving your fortune to your grandson, Edward de Villefort, the winking of the eyes which answered this speech was most decided and terrible, and expressed a feeling almost amounting to hatred. No, said the notary, then, perhaps, it is to your son, Monsieur de Villefort. No, the two notaries looked at each other in mute astonishment and inquiry as to what were the real intentions of the testator. Villefort and his wife both grew red, one from shame, the other from anger. "'What have we all done, then, dear Grandpapa?' said Valentine. "'You no longer seem to love any of us.' The old man's eyes passed rapidly from Villefort and his wife, and rested on Valentine with a look of unutterable fondness. "'Well,' said she, if you love me, Grandpapa, try and bring that love to bear upon your actions at this present moment. You know me well enough to be quite sure that I have never thought of your fortune. Besides, they say I am already rich in right of my mother. Too rich, even. Explain yourself, then. Nautia fixed his intelligent eyes on Valentine's hand. My hand, said she. Yes, her hand, exclaimed everyone. Oh, gentlemen, you see it is all useless, and that my father's mind is really impaired, said Villefort. Ah, cried Valentine suddenly, I understand. It is my marriage, you mean. Is it not, dear Grandpapa? Yes, 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 signed the paralytic casting on Valentine a look of joyful gratitude for having guessed his meaning. "'You are angry with us all on account of this marriage, are you not?' "'Yes. Really, this is too absurd,' said Villefort. "'Excuse me, sir,' replied the notary. "'On the contrary, the meaning of Monsieur Nautier is quite evident to me.' and I can quite easily connect the train of ideas passing in his mind. You do not wish me to marry Monsieur Fran d'Epinay, observed Valentine. I do not wish it, said the eye of her grandfather. And you disinherit your granddaughter, continued the notary, because she has contracted an engagement contrary to your wishes? Yes so that, but for this marriage, she would have been your heir? Yes. There was a profound silence. The two notaries were holding a consultation as to the best means of proceeding with the affair. Valentine was looking at her grandfather with a smile of intense gratitude, and Villefort was biting his lips with vexation, while Madame de Villefort could not succeed in repressing an inward feeling of joy, which, in spite of herself, appeared in her whole countenance. But, said Villefort, 
who was the first to break the silence. I consider that I am the best judge of the propriety of the marriage in question. I am the only person possessing the right to dispose of my daughter's hand. It is my wish that she should marry Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, and she shall marry him. Valentine sunk weeping into a chair. Sir, said the notary, how do you intend disposing of your fortune in case Mademoiselle de Villefort still determines on marrying Monsieur France? The old man gave no answer. You will, of course, dispose of it in some way or other? Yes, in favor of some member of your family? No. Do you intend devoting it to charitable purposes, then? pursued the notary. Yes. But, said the notary, you are aware that the law does not allow a son to be entirely deprived of his patrimony? Yes. You only intend, then, to dispose of that part of your fortune which the law allows you to subtract from the inheritance of your son? Nortia made no answer. Do you still wish to dispose of all? Yes. But they will contest the will after your death. No. My father knows me, replied Villefort. He is quite sure that his wishes will be held sacred by me. Besides, he understands that in my position I cannot plead against the poor. The eye of Nortio beamed with triumph. What do you decide on, sir? asked the notary of Villaport. Nothing, sir. It is a resolution which my father has taken, and I know he never alters his mind. I am quite resigned. These nine hundred thousand francs will go out of the family in order to enrich some hospital. But it is ridiculous thus to yield to the caprices of an old man, and I shall, therefore, act according to my conscience. Having said this, Villefort quitted the room with his wife, leaving his father at liberty to do as he pleased. The same day the will was made, the witnesses were brought. It was approved by the old man, sealed in the presence of all and given in charge to Monsieur de Champs, the family notary. End of chapter 59「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 60 The Telegraph. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort found on their return that the Count of Monte Cristo, who had come to visit them in their absence, had been ushered into the drawing-room, and was still waiting them there. Madame de Villefort, who had not yet sufficiently recovered from her late emotion to allow of her entertaining visitors so immediately, retired to her bedroom, while the procurer, who could better depend upon himself, proceeded at once to the saloon. Although Monsieur de Villefort flattered himself that, to all outward view, he had completely masked the feelings which were passing in his mind. He did not know that the cloud was still lowering on his brow, so much so that the Count, whose smile was radiant, immediately noticed his somber and thoughtful air. Mafoy, said Monte Cristo, after the first compliments were over, what is the matter with you, Monsieur de Villefort? Have I arrived at the moment when you were drawing up an indictment for a capital crime? Villefort tried to smile. No, Count, he replied. 
I am the only victim in this case. It is I who lose my cause, and it is ill luck, obstinacy, and folly which have caused it to be decided against me. To what do you refer, said Monte Cristo, with well-feigned interest? Have you really met with some great misfortune? Oh, no, monsieur, said Villefort, with a bitter smile. It is only a loss of money which I have sustained. Nothing worth mentioning, I assure you. True, said Monte Cristo. The loss of a sum of money becomes almost immaterial with a fortune such as you possess, and to one of your philosophic spirit. It is not so much the loss of the money that vexes me, said Villefort, though, after all, nine hundred thousand francs are worth regretting, but I am the more annoyed with this fate, chance, or whatever you please to call the power which has destroyed my hopes and my fortune, and may blast the prospects of my child also as it is all occasioned by an old man relapsed into second childhood. What do you say? said the Count. Nine hundred thousand francs? It is indeed a sum which might be regretted even by a philosopher. And who is the cause of all this annoyance? My father, as I told you. Monsieur Nautier, but I thought you told me he had become entirely paralyzed and that all his faculties were completely destroyed. Yes, his bodily faculties, for he can neither move nor speak. Nevertheless, he thinks, acts, and wills in the manner I have described. I left him about five minutes ago, and he is now occupied in dictating his will to two notaries. But to do this he must have spoken... He has done better than that. He has made himself understood. How was such a thing possible? By the help of his eyes, which are still full of life, and, as you perceive, possess the power of inflicting mortal injury. My dear, said Madame de Villefort, who had just entered the room, perhaps you exaggerate the evil. Good morning, Madame said the Count, bowing. Madame de Villefort acknowledged the salutation with one of her most gracious smiles. What is this that Monsieur de Villefort has been telling me? demanded Monte Cristo. And what incomprehensible misfortune! Incomprehensible is not the word, interrupted the procurer, shrugging his shoulders. It is an old man's caprice. And is there no means of making him revoke his decision? Yes, said Madame de Villefort, and it is still entirely in the power of my husband to cause the will, which is now in prejudice of Valentine, to be altered in her favour. The Count, who perceived that Monsieur and Madame de Villefort were beginning to speak in parables, appeared to pay no attention to the conversation, and feigned to be busily engaged in watching Edward, who was mischievously pouring some ink into the bird's water glass. My dear, said Villefort, in answer to his wife, you know I have never been accustomed to play the patriarch in my family, nor have I ever considered that the fate of a universe was to be decided by my nod. Nevertheless, it is necessary that my will should be respected in my family, and that the folly of an old man and the caprice of a child should not be allowed to overturn a project which I have entertained for so many years. The Baron d'Epinay was my friend, as you know, and an alliance with his son is the most suitable thing that could possibly be arranged. Do you think, said Madame de Villefort, that Valentine is in league with him? She has always been opposed to this marriage, and I should not be at all surprised if what we have just seen and heard 
is nothing but the execution of a plan concerted between them. Madam, said Villefort, believe me, a fortune of nine hundred thousand francs is not so easily renounced. She could, nevertheless, make up her mind to renounce the world, sir, since it is only about a year ago that she herself proposed entering a convent. Never mind, replied Villefort. I say that this marriage shall be consummated. Notwithstanding your father's wishes to the contrary, said Madame de Villefort, selecting a new point of attack. That is a serious thing, Monte Cristo, who pretended not to be listening, heard, however, every word that was said. Madam, replied Villefort, I can truly say that I have always entertained a high respect for my father, because to the natural feeling of relationship was added the consciousness of his moral superiority. The name of father is sacred in two senses. He should be reverenced as the author of our being and as a master whom we ought to obey. But, under the present circumstances, I am justified in doubting the wisdom of an old man who, because he hated the father, vents his anger on the son. It would be ridiculous in me to regulate my conduct by such caprices. I shall still continue to preserve the same respect toward Monsieur Nautier. I will suffer, without complaint, the pecuniary deprivation to which he has subjected me, but I shall remain firm in my determination, and the world shall see which party has reason on his side. Consequently, I shall marry my daughter to the Baron Fran d'Epinay, because I consider it would be a proper and eligible match for her to make, and, in short, because I choose to bestow my daughter's hand on whomever I please. What? said the Count, the approbation of whose eye Villefort had frequently solicited during his speech. What? Do you say that Monsieur Nautier disinherits Mademoiselle de Villefort because she is going to marry Monsieur le Baron Franc d'Epinay? Yes, sir. That is the reason, said Villeport, shrugging his shoulders. The apparent reason, at least, said Madame de Villeport. The real reason, Madame, I can assure you, I know my father. But I want to know in what way Monsieur d'Epinay can have displeased your father more than any other person. I believe I know Monsieur Fran d'Epinay, said the Count, is not the son of General de Quenzel, who was created Baron d'Epinay by Charles X? The same, said Villefort. Well, but he is a charming young man, according to my ideas. He is, which makes me believe that it is only an excuse of Monsieur Nautier to prevent his granddaughter marrying. Old men are always so selfish in their affection said Madame de Villefort. But, said Monte Cristo, do you not know any cause for this hatred? Ah, ma foi, who is to know? Perhaps it is some political difference. My father and the Baron d'Epinay lived in the stormy times of which I only saw the ending, said Villefort. Was not your father a Bonapartist? asked Monte Cristo. I think I remember that you told me something of that kind. My father has been a Jacobin more than anything else, said Villefort, carried by his emotion beyond the bounds of prudence, and the senator's robe, which Napoleon cast on his shoulders, only served to disguise the old man without in any degree changing him. When my father conspired, it was not for the emperor, it was against the Bourbons, for Monsieur Nautier possessed this peculiarity. He never projected any utopian schemes which could never be realized, but strove for possibilities. 
and he applied to the realization of these possibilities the terrible theories of the mountain, theories that never shrunk from any means that were deemed necessary to bring about the desired result. Well, said Monte Cristo, it is just as I thought. It was politics which brought Nautier and Monsieur d'Epinay into personal contact. Although General d'Epinay served under Napoleon, did he not still retain royalists' sentiments? And was he not the person who was assassinated one evening on leaving a Bonapartist meeting to which he had been invited on the supposition that he favoured the cause of the emperor? Villefort looked at the count almost with terror. Am I mistaken, then, said Monte Cristo? No, sir. The facts were precisely what you have stated, said Madame de Villefort, and it was to prevent the renewal of old feuds that Monsieur de Villefort formed the idea of uniting in the bonds of affection the two children of these inveterate enemies. It was a sublime and charitable thought, said Monte Cristo, and the whole world should applaud it. It would be noble to see Mademoiselle Nautier de Villefort assuming the title of Madame Fran d'Epinay. Villefort shuddered and looked at Monte Cristo as if he wished to read in his countenance the real feelings which had dictated the words he had just uttered. But the Count completely baffled the procurer and prevented him from discovering anything beneath the never-varying smile he was so constantly in the habit of assuming. Although, said Villefort, it will be a serious thing for Valentine to lose her grandfather's fortune. I do not think that Monsieur d'Epinay will be frightened at this pecuniary loss. He will, perhaps, hold me in greater esteem than the money itself, seeing that I sacrifice everything in order to keep my word with him. Besides, he knows that Valentine is rich in right of her mother, and that she will, in all probability, inherit the fortune of Monsieur and Madame de saint Moran, her mother's parents, who both love her tenderly, and who are fully as well worth loving and tending as Monsieur Nautier, said Madame de Villefort. Besides, they are to come to Paris in about a month, and Valentine, after the affront she has received, need not consider it necessary to continue to bury herself alive by being shut up with Monsieur Nautier. The Count listened with satisfaction to this tale of wounded self-love and defeated ambition. But it seems to me, said Monte Cristo, and I must begin by asking your pardon for what I am about to say, that if Monsieur Nautier disinherits Mademoiselle de Villefort because she is going to marry a man whose father he detested, he cannot have the same cause of complaint against this dear Edward. True, said Madame de Villefort, with an intonation of voice, which it is impossible to describe, it is not unjust, shamefully unjust. Poor Edward is as much Monsieur Nautier's grandchild as Valentine, and yet, if she had not been going to marry Monsieur France, Monsieur Nautier would have left her all his money. And supposing Valentine to be disinherited by her grandfather, she will still be three times richer than he. The Count listened and said no more. Count, said Villefort, we will not entertain you any longer with our family misfortunes. It is true that my patrimony will go to endow charitable institutions, and my father will have deprived me of my lawful inheritance without any reason for doing so. But I shall have the satisfaction of knowing that I have acted like a man of sense and feeling. Monsieur d'Epinay, to whom I had promised the interest of this sum, shall receive it, even if I endure the most cruel privations. 
However, said Madame de Villefort, returning to the one idea which incessantly occupied her mind, perhaps it would be better to explain this unlucky affair to Monsieur d'Epinay, in order to give him the opportunity of himself renouncing his claim to the hand of Mademoiselle de Villefort. Ah, that would be a great pity, said Villefort. A great pity, said Monte Cristo. Undoubtedly, said Villefort, moderating the tones of his voice. A marriage once concerted and then broken off throws a sort of discredit on a young lady. Then again, the old reports, which I was so anxious to put an end to, will instantly gain ground. No, it will all go well. Monsieur d'Epinay, if he is an honourable man, will consider himself more than ever pledged to Mademoiselle de Villefort, unless he were actuated by a decided feeling of avarice. But that is impossible. I agree with Monsieur de Villefort, said Monte Cristo, fixing his eyes on Madame de Villefort and if I were sufficiently intimate with him to allow of giving my advice, I would persuade him, since I have been told Monsieur d'Epinay is coming back, to settle this affair at once, beyond all possibility of revocation. I will answer for the success of a project which will reflect so much honour on Monsieur de Villefort. This procurer arose, delighted with the preposition, but his wife slightly changed colour. Well, that is all that I wanted, and I will be guided by a counsellor such as you are, said he, extending his hand to Monte Cristo. Therefore let everyone here look upon what has passed today, as if it had not happened, and as though we had never thought of such a thing as a change in our original plans. Sir, said the Count, the world, unjust as it is, will be pleased with your resolution. Your friends will be proud of you. And Monsieur d'Epinay, even if he took Mademoiselle de Villefort without any dowry, which he will not do, would be delighted with the idea of entering a family which could make such sacrifices in order to keep a promise and fulfil a duty. At the conclusion of these words, the Count rose to depart. Are you going to leave us, Count? said Madame de Villefort. I am sorry to say I must do so, Madame. I only came to remind you of your promise for Saturday. Did you fear that we should forget it? You are very good, Madame, but Monsieur de Villefort has so many important and urgent occupations. My husband has given me his word, sir, said Madame de Villefort. You have just seen him resolve to keep it when he has everything to lose, and surely there is more reason for his doing so where he has everything to gain. And, said Villefort, is it at your house in the Sham Elysees that you receive your visitors? No, said Monte Cristo which is precisely the reason which renders your kindness more meritorious. It is in the country. In the country? Yes. Where is it, then? Near Paris, is it not? Very near. Only half a league from the barriers. It is at Autour. At Autour, said Villefort. True, Madame de Villefort told me you lived at Autour since it was to your house that she was taken. And at what part of Autour do you reside? Rue de la Fontaine. Rue de la Fontaine, exclaimed Villefort, in an agitated tone. At what number? Number 28. Then, cried Villefort, was it you who bought Monsieur de saint Meran's house? Did it belong to Monsieur de saint Meran? demanded Monte Cristo. Yes, replied Madame de Villefort. And would you believe it, Count? Believe what? You think this house pretty, do you not? I think it charming. Well, my husband would never live in it. 
Indeed, returned Monte Cristo, that is a prejudice on your part, Monsieur de Villeport, for which I am quite at a loss to account. I do not like Ortul, sir, said the procurer, making an evident effort to appear calm but I hope you will not carry your antipathy so far as to deprive me of the pleasure of your company, sir, said Monte Cristo. No, Count, I hope, I assure you, I shall do my best, stammered Villefort. Oh, said Monte Cristo, I allow of no excuse. On Saturday, at six o'clock, I shall be expecting you, and if you fail to come... I shall think, for how do I know to the contrary, that this house, which has remained uninhabited for twenty years, must have some gloomy tradition or dreadful legend connected with it. I will come, Count. I will be sure to come, said Villefort eagerly. Thank you, said Monte Cristo. Now you must permit me to take my leave of you. You said before that you were obliged to leave us, Monsieur, said Madame de Villefort, and you were about to tell us why when your attention was called to some other subject. Indeed, Madame, said Monte Cristo, I scarcely know if I dare tell you where I am going. Nonsense, say on. Well, then, it is to see a thing on which I have sometimes mused for hours together. What is it? A telegraph. So now I have told my secret. A telegraph? repeated Madame de Villefort. Yes, a telegraph. I had often seen one placed at the end of a road on a hillock, and in the light of the sun its black arms, bending in every direction, always reminded me of the claws of an immense beetle and I assure you it was never without emotion that I gazed on it, for I could not help thinking how wonderful it was that these various signs should be made to cleave the air with such precision as to convey to the distance of three hundred leagues the ideas and wishes of a man sitting at a table at one end of the line to another man similarly placed at the opposite extremity and all this effected by a simple act of volition on the part of the sender of the message. I began to think of genie, sylphs, gnomes, in short, of all the ministers of the occult sciences, until I laughed aloud at the freaks of my own imagination. Now, it never occurred to me to wish for a nearer inspection of these large insects, with their long black claws, for I always feared to find under their stone wings some little human genius fagged to death with cabals, factions, and government intrigues. But one fine day I learned that the mover of this telegraph was only a poor wretch, hired for twelve hundred francs a year, and employed all day, not in studying the heavens like an astronomer, or in gazing on the water like an angler, or even in enjoying the privilege of observing the country around him, but all his monotonous life was passed in watching his white-bellied, black-clawed fellow insect, four or five leagues distant from him. At length I felt a desire to study this living chrysalis more closely, and to endeavour to understand the secret part played by these insect actors when they occupy themselves simply with pulling different pieces of string. And are you going there? I am. What telegraph do you intend visiting? That of the home department or of the observatory? Oh, no, I should find there people who would force me to understand things of which I would prefer to remain ignorant and who would try to explain to me, in spite of myself, a mystery which even they do not understand. Ma foi, I should wish to keep my illusions concerning insects unimpaired. It is quite enough to have those dissipated which I had formed of my fellow creatures. I shall, therefore, 
not visit either of these telegraphs, but one in the open country where I shall find a good-natured simpleton, who knows no more than the machine he is employed to work. You are a singular man, said Villefort. What line would you advise me to study? The one that is most in use just at this time. The Spanish one, you mean, I suppose. Yes, should you like a letter to the minister that they might explain to you? No, said Monte Cristo, since, as I told you before, I do not wish to comprehend it. The moment I understand it, there will no longer exist a telegraph for me. It will be nothing more than a sign from Monsieur de Chatel, or from Monsieur Montalivet, transmitted to the perfect of Bayonne. Mystified by two Greek words, Tala, Graphene. It is the insect with black claws, and the awful word which I wish to retain in my imagination in all its purity and all its importance. Go then, for in the course of two hours it will be dark, and you will not be able to see anything. Ma foi, you frighten me. Which is the nearest way? Bayonne? Yes, the road to Bayonne. And afterwards the road to Chatillon? Yes. By the tower of Montalieri, you mean? Yes. Thank you. Good-bye. On Saturday I will tell you my impressions concerning the telegraph. At the door the Count was met by the two notaries, who had just completed the act which was to disinherit Valentine, and who were leaving under the conviction of having done a thing which could not fail of redounding considerably to their credit. End of chapter 60「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by West Winds 12. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 61. How a Gardener May Get Rid of the Dormice That Eat His Peaches. Not on the same night as he had intended, but the next morning, the Count of Monte Cristo went out by the Barrier de Enfer, taking the road to Orleans, leaving the village of Linus, without stopping at the telegraph, which flourished its great bony arms as he passed. The Count reached the tower of Montalheri, situated, as everyone knows, upon the highest point of the plain of that name. At the foot of the hill the Count dismounted and began to ascend by a little winding path, about eighteen inches wide. When he had reached the summit he found himself stopped by a hedge, upon which green fruit had seceded to red and white flowers. Monte Cristo looked for the entrance to the enclosure, and was not long in finding a little wooden gate, working on willow hinges, and fastened with a nail and string. The Count soon mastered the mechanism, the gate opened, and he then found himself in a little garden, about twenty feet long by twelve wide, bounded on one side by part of the hedge, which contained the ingenious contrivance we have called a gate, on the other by the old tower, covered with ivy and studded with wallflowers, no one would have thought in looking at this old, weather-beaten, floral-decked tower, which might be likened to an elderly dame dressed up to receive her grandchildren at a birthday feast, that it would have been capable of telling strange things, if, in addition to the menacing ears which the proverbs say all walls are provided with, it had also a voice. The garden was crossed by a path of red gravel, edged by a border of thick box, of many years' growth, and of a tone and color that would have delighted the heart of Delacroix our modern Rubens. This path was formed in the shape of the figure of eight, thus, in its windings, making a walk of sixty feet in a garden of only twenty. Never had Flora, the fresh and smiling goddess of gardeners, been honored with a purer or more scrupulous worship than that which was paid to her in this little enclosure. In fact, 
Of the twenty rose trees which formed the parterre, not one bore the mark of the slug, nor were there evidences anywhere of the clustering aphis which is so destructive to plants growing in a damp soil. And yet it was not because the damp had been excluded from the garden. The earth, black as soot, the thick foliage of the trees betrayed its presence. Besides, had natural humidity been wanting, it could have been immediately supplied by artificial means, thanks to a tank of water sunk in one of the corners of the garden, and upon which were stationed a frog and a toad, who, from antipathy, no doubt, always remained on the two opposite sides of the basin. There was not a blade of grass to be seen in the paths, or a weed in the flower-beds. No fine lady ever trained and watered her geraniums, her cacti, and her rhododendrons with more pains than this hitherto unseen gardener bestowed upon his little enclosure. Monte Cristo stopped after having closed the gate and fastened the string to the nail, and cast a look around. The man at the telegraph, said he, must either engage a gardener or devote himself passionately to agriculture. Suddenly he struck against something crouching behind a wheelbarrow filled with leaves. The something rose, uttering an exclamation of astonishment, and Monte Cristo found himself facing a man about fifty years old, who was plucking strawberries, which he was placing upon grape leaves. He had twelve leaves and about as many strawberries, which, on rising suddenly, he let fall from his hand. "'You are gathering your crop, sir?' said Monte Cristo, smiling. "'Excuse me, sir,' replied the man, raising his hand to his cap. "'I am not up there, I know, but I have only just come down.' "'Do not let me interfere with you in anything, my friend,' said the Count. "'Gather your strawberries, if, indeed, there are any left.' "'I have ten left,' said the man, "'for here are eleven, and I had twenty-one, five more than last year. "'But I am not surprised the spring has been warm this year.' and strawberries require heat, sir. This is the reason that, instead of the sixteen I had last year, I have this year, you see, eleven, already plucked, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Ah, I missed three. They were here last night. Sir, I am sure they were here. I counted them. It must be the Mary Simon's son who has stolen them. I saw him strolling about here this morning. Ah, the young rascal, stealing in a garden. He does not know where that may lead him to. Certainly it is wrong, said Monte Cristo, but you should take into consideration the youth and greediness of the delinquent. Of course, said the gardener, but that does not make it the less unpleasant. But, sir, once more I beg pardon. Perhaps you are an officer that I am detained here? and he glanced timidly at the Count's blue coat. "'Calm yourself, my friend,' said the Count, with the smile which he made at will, either terrible or benevolent, and which now expressed only the kindliest feeling. I am not an inspector, but a traveller, brought here by a curiosity he half repents of, since he causes you to lose your time.' "'Ah, my time is not valuable,' replied the man, with a melancholy smile. Still, it belongs to the government, and I ought not to waste it, but, having received the signal that I might rest for an hour, here he glanced at the sundial, for there was everything in the enclosure of Montalhenre, even a sundial, and having ten minutes before me, and my strawberries being ripe, when, a day longer, by the by, sir, do you think dormice eat them? Indeed, I should think not, replied Monte Cristo. Dormice are bad neighbors for us who do not eat them preserved, as the Romans did. What? Did the Romans eat them? said the gardener. Eight dormice? But I this have read year, so continued in Petronius, the said the Count. I'll take care. Really? It shall not happen. They can't be nice, though they do say, as fat as a dormouse. It is not a wonder they are fat, sleeping all day, and only waking to eat all night. Listen, last year I had four apricots. They stole one. I had one nectarine. Only one. Well, sir, they ate half of it on the wall. 
a splendid nectarine. I never ate a better. You ate it? That is to say, the half that was left, you understand. It was exquisite, sir. Ah, those gentlemen never choose the worst morsels, like Murray Simon's son, who has not chosen the worst strawberries. But this year, continued the horticulturist, I'll take care it shall not happen, even if I should be forced to sit by the whole night to watch when the strawberries are ripe. Monte Cristo had seen enough. Every man has a devouring passion in his heart, as every fruit has its worm. That of the telegraph man was horticulture. He began gathering the grape leaves, which screened the sun from the grapes, and won the heart of the gardener. Did you come here, sir, to see the telegraph? he said. Yes. If it isn't contrary to the rules. Oh, no, said the gardener, not in the least, since there is no danger that anyone can possibly understand what we are saying. I have been told, said the Count, that you do not always yourselves understand the signals you repeat. That is true, sir, and that is what I like best, said the man, smiling. Why do you like that best? Because then I have no responsibility. I am a machine, then and nothing else, and so long as I work, nothing more is required of me. Is it possible, said Monte Cristo to himself, that I can have met with a man that has no ambition, that would spoil my plans? Sir, said the gardener, glancing at the sundial, the ten minutes are almost up. I must return to my post. Will you go up with me? I follow you. Monte Cristo entered the tower, which was divided into three stories. The tower contained implements such as spades, rakes, watering pots, hung against the wall. This was all the furniture. The second was the man's conventional abode, or rather sleeping place. It contained a few poor articles of household furniture, a bed, a table, two chairs, a stone pitcher, and some dry herbs hung up to the ceiling, which the Count recognized as sweet peas, and of which the good man was preserving the seeds. He had labeled them with as much care as if he had been master botanist in the Jardin des Plantes. "'Does it require much study to learn the art of telegraphing?' asked Monte Cristo. "'The study does not take long. It was acting as a supernumerary that was so tedious.' And what is the pay? A thousand francs, sir. It is nothing. No, but then we are lodged, as you perceive. Monte Cristo looked at the room. They passed to the third story. It was the telegraph room. Monte Cristo looked, in turn, at the two iron handles by which the machine was worked. It is very interesting, he said, but it must be very tedious for a lifetime. Yes. At first my neck was cramped with looking at it, but at the end of a year I became used to it, and then we have our hours of recreation, and our holidays. Holidays? Yes. When? When we have a fog. Ah, to be sure. Those are indeed holidays to me. I go into the garden, I plant, I prune, I trim, I kill the insects all day long. How long have you been here? Ten years, and five as a supernumerary, make fifteen. You are fifty-five years old. How long must you have served to claim the pension? Oh, sir, twenty-five years. And how much is the pension? A hundred crowns. Poor humanity, murmured Count Monte Cristo. What did you say, sir? asked the man. I was saying it was very interesting. What was? all you were showing me, and you really understand none of these signals? None at all. And have you ever tried to understand them? Never. Why should I? But still there are some signals only addressed to you. Certainly. And do you understand them? They are always the same. And they mean nothing new. You have an hour, or tomorrow. This is simple enough, said the Count, but look, is not your correspondent putting itself in motion? Ah, yes. Thank you, sir. And what is it saying? Anything you understand? Yes, it asks if I am ready. 
and you reply? By the same sign, which, at the same time, tells my right-hand correspondent that I am ready, while it gives notice to my left-hand correspondent to prepare in his turn. It is very ingenious, said the Count. You see, said the man proudly, in five minutes he will speak. I have, then, five minutes, said Monte Cristo to himself. It is more time than I require. My dear sir, will you allow me to ask you a question? What is it, sir? You are fond of gardening? Passionately. And you would be pleased to have, instead of this terrace of twenty feet, an enclosure of two acres? Sir, I should make a terrestrial paradise of it. You live badly on your thousand francs? Badly enough, but yet I do live. Yes, but you have a wretchedly small garden. True, the garden is not large. And then, such as it is, it is filled with dormice who eat everything. Ah, they are my scourges. Tell me, should you have the misfortune to turn your head while your right-hand correspondent is telegraphing, I should not see him. Then what would happen? I could not repeat the signals. And then, not having repeated them, through negligence, I should be fined. How much? A hundred francs. The tenth of your income. That would be fine work. Ah, uh, said the man. Has it ever happened to you? said Monte Cristo. Once, sir, when I was grafting a rose tree. Well, suppose you were to alter a signal, and substitute another. Ah, that is another case. I should be turned off, and lose my pension. Three hundred francs? A hundred crowns, yes, sir. So you see that I am not likely to do any of these things. Not even for fifteen years' wages? Come, it is worth thinking about. For fifteen thousand francs? Yes. Sir, you alarm me. Nonsense. Sir, are you tempting me? Just so. Fifteen thousand francs. Do you understand? Sir, let me see my right-hand correspondent. On the contrary, do not look at him, but at this. What is it? What? Do you not know these bits of paper? Bank notes? Exactly. There are fifteen of them. And whose are they? Yours, if you like. Mine? exclaimed the man, half suffocated. Yes, yours. Your own property. Sir, my right-hand correspondent is signaling. Let him signal. Sir, you have distracted me. I shall be fined. That will cost you a hundred francs. You see, it is your interest to take my banknotes. Sir, my right-hand correspondent redoubles his signals. He is impatient. Never mind. Take these. And the Count placed the packet in the man's hands. Now this is not all, he said. You cannot live upon your fifteen thousand francs. I shall still have my place. No, you will lose it, for you are going to alter your correspondent's message. Oh, sir, what are you proposing? A jest. Sir, unless you force me... I think I can effectually force you, and Monte Cristo drew another packet from his pocket. Here are ten thousand more francs, he said. With the fifteen thousand already in your pocket, they will make twenty-five thousand. With five thousand you can buy a pretty little house with two acres of land, and remaining twenty thousand will bring you in a thousand francs a year. A garden with two acres of land? and a thousand francs a year. Oh, heavens! Come, take them! And Monte Cristo forced the bank notes into his hand. What am I to do? Nothing very difficult. But what is it? To repeat these signs. Monte Cristo took a paper from his pocket, upon which were drawn three signs, with numbers to indicate the order in which they were to be worked. There, you see, it will not take long. Yes, but... Do this, and you will have nectarines and all the rest. The shot told. Red with fever, 
while the large drops fell from his brow, the man executed, one after the other, the three signs given by the Count, in spite of the frightful contortions of the right-hand correspondent, who, not understanding the change, began to think the gardener had gone mad. As to the left-hand one, he conscientiously repeated the same signals, which were finally transmitted to the Minister of the Interior. "'Now you are rich,' said Monte Cristo. "'Yes,' replied the man, "'but at what price?' "'Listen, friend,' said Monte Cristo, "'I do not wish to cause you any remorse. "'Believe me, then, when I swear to you "'that you have wronged no man, "'but on the contrary have benefited mankind.' The man looked at the banknotes, felt them, counted them, turned pale, then read, then rushed into his room to drink a glass of water. But he had no time to reach the water jug, and fainted in the midst of his dried herbs. Five minutes after the new telegram reached the minister, Debray had his horse put to his carriage and drove to the dangler's house. "'Has your husband any Spanish bonds?' he asked the baroness. "'I think so.' Indeed, he has six millions worth. He must sell them at whatever price. Why? Because Don Carlos has fled from Borges, and has returned to Spain. How do you know? Debray shrugged his shoulders. The idea of asking how I hear the news, he said. The baroness did not wait for a repetition. She ran to her husband, who immediately hastened to his agent, and ordered him to sell at any price. When it was seen the danglers sold the spanish funds fell directly danglers lost five hundred thousand francs but he rid himself of all his spanish shares the same evening the following was read in le messenger by the telegraph the king don carlos has escaped the vigilance of his guardians at borges and has returned to spain by the catalonian frontier barcelona has risen in his favour all that evening nothing was spoken of but the foresight of Danglars, who had sold his shares, and of the luck of the stock-jobber, who only lost five hundred thousand francs by such a blow. Those who had kept their shares, or bought those of Danglars, looked upon themselves as ruined, and passed a very bad night. Next morning, Le Monteur contained the following. It was without any foundation that Le Messenger yesterday announced the flight of Don Carlos and the revolt of Barcelona. The king, Don Carlos, has not left Borges, and the peninsula is in the enjoyment of profound peace. A telegraphic signal, improperly interpreted, owed to the fog, was the cause of this error. The funds rose one per cent higher than before they had fallen. This, reckoning his loss, and what he had missed gaining, made the difference of a million to Danglars. Good, said Monte Cristo to Morel, who was at his house when the news arrived of the strange reverse of fortune of which Danglars had been the victim. I have just made a discovery for twenty-five thousand francs, for which I would have paid a hundred thousand. What have you discovered? asked Morel. I have just discovered how a gardener may get rid of the dormice that eat his peaches. End of chapter 61This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by West Winds 12, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 62 Ghosts At first sight, the exterior of the house it ought to will gave no indications of splendor, nothing one would expect from the destined resonance of the magnificent Count of Monte Cristo. But this simplicity was according to the will of its master, who positively ordered nothing to be altered outside. The splendor was within. Indeed, almost before the door opened, the scene changed. Monsieur Bertuccio had outdone himself in the taste displayed in furnishing and in the rapidity with which it was executed. It is told that the Duc de Antin, 
removed in a single night a whole avenue of trees that annoyed Louis the Fourteenth. In three days, Monsieur Bertuccio planted an entirely bare court with poplars, large spreading sycamores, to shade the different parts of the house, and in the foreground, instead of the usual paving stones, half hidden by the grass, there extended a lawn, but that morning lay down, and upon which the water was yet glistening. For the rest, the orders had been issued by the Count. He himself had given a plan to Bertuccio, marking the spot where each tree was to be planted, and the shape and extent of the lawn which was to take the place of the paving stones. Thus the house had become unrecognizable, and Bertuccio himself declared that he scarcely knew it, encircled as it was by a framework of trees. The overseer would not have objected, while he was about it, to have made some improvements in the garden, but the Count had positively forbidden it to be touched. Bertruccio made amends, however, by loading the antechambers, staircases, and mantelpieces with flowers. What, above all, manifested the shrewdness of the steward, and the profound science of the master, the one in carrying out the ideas of the other, was that this house, which appeared only the night before so sad and gloomy, impregnated with that sickly smell one can almost fancy to be the smell of time, had in a single day acquired the aspect of life, was scented with its master's favorite perfumes, and had the very light regulated according to his wish. When the Count arrived, he had under his touch his books and arms. His eyes rested upon his favorite pictures. His dogs, whose caresses he loved, welcomed him in the antechamber. The birds, whose songs delighted him, cheered him with their music, and the house, awakened from its long sleep, like a sleeping beauty in the woods, lived, sang, and bloomed like the houses we have long cherished, and in which, when we are forced to leave them, we leave a part of our souls. The servants passed gaily along the fine courtyard. Some, belonging to the kitchens, glided down the stairs, restored but the previous day, as if they had always inhabited the house. Others, filling the coach-houses, where the equipages, encased and numbered, appeared to have been installed for the last fifty years, and in the stables the horses replied with neighs to the grooms, who spoke to them with much more respect than many servants pay their masters. The library was divided into two parts on either side of the wall, and contained upwards of two thousand volumes. One division was entirely devoted to novels, and even the volume which had been published but the day before was to be seen in its place in all the dignity of its red and gold binding. On the other side of the house, to match with the library, was the conservatory, ornamented with rare flowers that bloomed in china jars, and in the midst of the greenhouse, marvelous alike to sight and smell, was a billiard-table, which looked as if it had been abandoned during the past hour by players who had left the balls on the cloth. One chamber alone had been respected by the magnificent Bertruccio. Before this room, to which you could ascend by the grand, and go out by the back staircase, the servants passed with curiosity, and Bertruccio with terror. At five o'clock precisely the Count arrived before the house at Auteuil, followed by Ali. Bertruccio was awaiting this arrival with impatience, mingled with uneasiness. He hoped for some compliments, while at the same time he feared to have frowns. Monte Cristo descended into the courtyard, walked all over the house, without giving any sign of approbation or pleasure, until he entered his bedroom, situated on the opposite side to the closed room. Then he approached a little piece of furniture, made of rosewood, which he had noticed at a previous visit. That can only be to hold gloves, he said. Will your excellency deign to open it? said the delighted Pertuccio, and you will find gloves in it. Elsewhere the Count found everything he required, smelling bottles, cigars, knick-knacks. Good, he said, and Monsieur Bertuccio left enraptured. 
So great, so powerful, and real was the influence exercised by this man over all who surrounded him. At precisely six o'clock, the clatter of horses' hoofs was heard at the entrance door. It was our captain of Spahis, who had arrived on Medea. "'I am sure I am the first, cried Morel. "'I did it on purpose to have you a minute to myself, before every one came. "'Julie and Emmanuel have a thousand things to tell you. "'Ah, really, this is magnificent. "'But tell me, Count, will your people take care of my horse?' "'Do not alarm yourself, my dear Maximilian. "'They understand. "'I mean, because he wants petting. "'If you had seen at what a pace he came, like the wind. <laughs> I should think so. A horse that costs five thousand francs, said Monte Cristo, in a tone which a father would use towards a son. Do you regret them? asked Morel, with his open laugh. I certainly not, replied the Count. No, I should only regret if the horse had not proved good. It is so good that I have distanced Monsieur de Chateaurino, one of the best riders in France, and Monsieur de Bray, who both mount the minister's Arabians. And close on their heels are the horses of Madame Danglars, who always go at six leagues an hour. Then they follow you? asked Monte Cristo. See, they are here. And at the same minute a carriage with smoking horses, accompanied by two mounted gentlemen arrived at the gate, which opened before them. The carriage drove around and stopped at the steps, followed by the horsemen. The instant de Bray had touched the ground, he was at the carriage door. He offered his hand to the baroness, who, descending, took it with a peculiarity of manner imperceptible to every one but Monte Cristo. But nothing escaped the Count's notice and he observed a little note, passed with the facility that indicates frequent practice, from the hand of Madame Danglars to that of the minister's secretary. After his wife, the banker descended, as pale as though he had issued from his tomb instead of his carriage. Madame Danglars threw a rapid and inquiring glance, which could only be interpreted by Monte Cristo, around the courtyard, over the peristyle, and across the front of the house. Then, repressing a slight emotion which must have been seen on her countenance if she had not kept her color, she ascended the steps, saying to Morel, Sir, if you were a friend of mine, I should ask you if you would sell your horse. Morel smiled with an expression very like a grimace, and then turned around to Monte Cristo, as if to ask him to extricate him from this embarrassment. The Count understood him. Ah, madame, he said, why did you not make that request of me? With you, sir, replied the baroness, one can wish for nothing. One is so sure to obtain it. If it were so with Monsieur Morel... Unfortunately, replied the Count, I am witness that Monsieur Morel cannot give up his horse, his honor being engaged in keeping it. How so? He laid a wager he would tame Medea in the space of six months. You understand now that if he were to get rid of the animal before the time named, he would not only lose his bet, but people would say he was afraid. And a brave captain of Spahis cannot risk this, even to gratify a pretty woman, which is, in my opinion, one of the most sacred obligations in the world. You see my position, madame, said Morel, bestowing a grateful smile on Monte Cristo. It seems to me, said Danglars, in his coarse tone, ill-concealed by a forced smile, that you have already got horses enough. Madame Danglars seldom allowed remarks of this kind to pass unnoticed, but, to the surprise of the young people, she pretended not to hear it, and said nothing. Monte Cristo smiled at her unusual humility, and showed her two immense porcelain jars, over which wound marine plants, of a size and delicacy that nature alone could produce. The baroness was astonished. Why, said she, you could plant one of the chestnut trees in the Tuileries inside. How can such enormous jars have been manufactured? 
"'Ah, madame,' replied Monte Cristo, "'you must not ask of us, the manufacturers of fine porcelain, such a question. "'It is the work of another age, constructed by the genie of earth and water. "'How so? At what period can that have been? "'I do not know. I have only heard that an emperor of China had an oven built expressly, "'and that in this oven twelve jars like this were successfully baked.' Two broke from the heat of the fire. The other ten were sunk three hundred fathoms deep into the sea. The sea, knowing what was required of her, threw over them her weeds, encircling them with coral, and encrusted them with shells. The whole was cemented by two hundred years beneath these almost impervious depths. For a revolution carried away the emperor who wished to make the trial, and only left the documents proving the manufacture of the jars and their descent into the sea. At the end of two hundred years the documents were found, and they thought of bringing up the jars. Divers descended in machines, made expressly on the discovery, into the bay where they were thrown, but of ten, three only remained, the rest having been broken by the waves. I am fond of these jars, upon which, perhaps, misshapen, frightful monsters have fixed their cold, dull eyes, and in which myriads of small fish have slept, seeking a refuge from the pursuit of their enemies. Meanwhile, Donglers, who had cared little of curiosities, was mechanically tearing off the blossoms of a splendid orange tree, one after another. When he had finished with the orange tree, he began at the cactus, but this, not being so easily plucked as the orange tree, pricked him dreadfully. He shuddered, and rubbed his eyes as though awaking from a dream. Sir, said Monte Cristo to him, I do not recommend my pictures to you, who possess such splendid paintings, but nevertheless, here are two Hobina, a Paul Potter, a Miris, two Bargerard Dow, a Raphael, a Van Dyck, a Zubaran, and two or three by Murillo worth looking at. Stay, said Debray, I recognize this Hobima. Ah, indeed. Yes, it was proposed for the museum, which, I believe, does not contain one, said Monte Cristo. No, and yet they refused to buy it. Why, said Chateau Renaud, you pretend not to know, because the government was not rich enough. Ah, pardon me, said Chateau Renaud. I have heard of these things every day during the last eight years, and I cannot understand them yet. You will, by and by, said Debray. I think not, replied Chateau Renaud. Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti and Count Andrea Cavalcanti, announced Baptistine. A black satin stock, fresh from the maker's hands, gray moustaches, a bold eye, a major's uniform, ornamented with three medals and five crosses, in fact the thorough bearing of an old soldier, such was the appearance of Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti, that tender father with whom we are already acquainted. Close to him, dressed in entirely new clothes, advanced, smiling, Count Andrea Cavalcanti, the dutiful son, whom we also know. The three young people were talking together. On the entrance of the newcomers, their eyes glanced from father to son, and then, naturally enough, rested on the latter, whom they began criticizing. Cavalcanti, said Debray. A fine name, said Morel. Yes, said Chateau Renaud. These Italians are well named, and badly dressed. You are fastidious, Chateau Renaud, replied Debray. Those clothes are well cut and quite new. That is just what I find fault with. That gentleman appears to be well dressed for the first time in his life. Who are those gentlemen? asked Danglars of Monte Cristo. You heard Cavalcanti. That tells me their name, and nothing else. Ah, true. You do not know the Italian nobility. The Cavalcanti are all descended from princes. Have they any fortune? 
an enormous one. What do they do? Try to spend it all. They have some business with you, I think, from what they told me the day before yesterday. I, indeed, invited them here today on your account. I will introduce you to them. But they appear to speak French with a very pure accent, said Danglers. The son has been educated in a college in the south, I believe near Marseilles. You will find him quite enthusiastic. Upon what subject? asked Madame Danglers. The French ladies, madame. He has made up his mind to take a wife from Paris. A fine idea, that, of his, said Danglers, shrugging his shoulders. Madame Danglers looked at her husband with an expression which, at any other time, would have indicated a storm, but for the second time she controlled herself. The baron appears thoughtful today, said Monte Cristo to her. Are they going to put him in the ministry? Not yet, I think. More likely he has been speculating on the Bourges and has lost money. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, cried Baptistine. They entered. Monsieur de Villefort, notwithstanding his self-control, was visibly affected, and when Monte Cristo touched his hand, he felt it tremble. Certainly women alone know how to dissimulate, said Monte Cristo to himself, glancing at Madame Danglars, who was smiling on the procureur and embracing his wife. After a short time, the Count saw Petruchio, who, until then, had been occupied on the other side of the house, glide into an adjoining room. He went to him. "'What do you want, Monsieur Bertruccio? said he. "'Your Excellency has not stated the number of guests.' "'Ah, true. How many covers? Count for yourself. Is everyone here, Your Excellency?' "'Yes.' Bertruccio glanced through the door which was ajar. The Count watched him. "'Good heavens!' he exclaimed. "'What is the matter?' said the Count. "'That woman! That woman! Which? The one with the white dress, and so many diamonds, the fair one, Madame Danglars? I do not know her name, but it is she, sir, it is she. Whom do you mean?' "'The woman of the garden, she that was in Siente. She who was walking while she waited for... Petruchio stood at the open door, with his eyes starting and his hair on end. Waiting for whom? Petruchio, without answering, pointed to Villefort with something of the gesture Macbeth uses to point to Banquo. Oh, oh! He at length muttered, Do you see? What? Who? Him! Him? Monsieur de Villefort? The king's attorney? Certainly I see him. Then I did not kill him. Really, I think you are going mad, good Petruchio, said the Count. Then he is not dead? No, you see plainly he is not dead. Instead of striking between the sixth and seventh left ribs, as your countrymen do, you must have struck higher or lower, and the life is very tenuous in these lawyers. Or rather, there is no truth in anything you have told me. It was a fright of the imagination, a dream of your fancy. You went to sleep full of thoughts of vengeance. They weighed heavily upon your stomach. You had the nightmare. That is all. Come, calm yourself, and reckon them up. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, two. Monsieur and Madame d'Anglers, four. Monsieur de Chateau Renault, Monsieur de Bray, Monsieur Morel, seven. Major Bartolome Cavalcanti, eight. Eight, repeated Petruchio. Stop, you are in a shocking hurry to be off. You forget one of my guests. Lean a little to the left. Stay. Look at Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti, the young man in a black coat, looking at Murillo's Madonna. Now he is turning. This time Bertruccio would have uttered an exclamation had not a look from Monte Cristo silenced him. Benedetto? he muttered. Fatality? Half past six o'clock has just struck, Monsieur Bertruccio, said the Count severely. 
I ordered dinner at that hour, and I do not like to wait. And he returned to his guests, while Bertruccio, leaning against the wall, succeeded in reaching the dining room. Five minutes afterwards the doors of the drawing room were thrown open, and Bertuccio, appearing, said, with a violent effort, The dinner awaits. The Count of Monte Cristo offered his arm to Madame de Villefort. Monsieur de Villefort, he said, will you conduct the Baroness Danglars? Villefort complied, and they passed on to the dining room. End of chapter 62「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by George Coots, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 63. The Dinner. It was evident that one sentiment affected all the guests on entering the dining room. Each one asked what strange influence had brought them to this house, and yet astonished, even uneasy though they were, they still felt that they would not like to be absent. The recent events, the solitary and eccentric position of the Count, his enormous, nay, almost incredible fortune, should have made men cautious, and have altogether prevented ladies visiting a house where there was no one of their own sex to receive them. And yet curiosity had been enough to lead them to overleap the bounds of prudence and decorum, and all present, even including Cavalcanti and his son, notwithstanding the stiffness of the one and the carelessness of the other, were thoughtful on finding themselves assembled at the house of this incomprehensible man. Madame d'Anglaire had started when Villefort, on the Count's invitation, offered his arm, and Villefort felt that his glance was uneasy beneath his gold spectacles when he felt the arm of the Baroness press upon his own. None of this had escaped the Count, and even by this mere contact of individuals the scene had already acquired considerable interest for an observer. M. de Villefort had on the right hand Madame d'Anglaire, and on his left, Morel. The Count was seated between Madame de Villefort and d'Anglaire. The other seats were filled by Debray, who was placed between the two Cavalcanti, and by Chateau Renaud, seated between Madame de Villefort and Morel. The repast was magnificent. Monte Cristo had endeavored completely to overturn the Parisian ideas, and to feed the curiosity as much as the appetite of his guests. It was an oriental feast that he offered to them, but of such a kind as the Arabian fairies might be supposed to prepare. Every delicious fruit that the four quarters of the globe could provide was heaped in vases from China and jars from Japan. Rare birds retaining their most brilliant plumage, enormous fish spread upon massive silver dishes, together with every wine produced in the archipelago, Asia Minor, or the Cape, sparkling in bottles, whose grotesque shape seemed to give an additional flavor to the draught. All these, like one of the displays with which Apicius of old gratified his guests, passed in review before the eyes of the astonished Parisians, who understood that it was possible to expend a thousand louis upon a dinner for ten persons, but only on the condition of eating pearls, like Cleopatra, or drinking refined gold, like Lorenzo de' Medici. Monte Cristo noticed the general astonishment, and began laughing and joking about it. Gentlemen, he said, you will admit that, when arrived at a certain degree of fortune, the superfluities of life are all that can be desired, and the ladies will allow that, after having risen to a certain eminence of position, the ideal alone can be more exalted. Now to follow out this reasoning, what is the marvelous? That which we do not understand. What is it that we really desire? That which we cannot obtain. Now, to see things which I cannot understand, to procure impossibilities, these are the study of my life. I gratify my wishes by two means, my will and my money. I take as much interest in the pursuit of some whim as you do, M. d'Anglaire, in promoting a new railway line, 
You, M. de Villefort, in condemning a culprit to death. You, M. de Bray, in pacifying a kingdom. You, de Chateau Renaud, in pleasing a woman. And you, Morel, in breaking a horse that no one can ride. For example, you see these two fish, one brought fifty leagues beyond St. Petersburg, the other five leagues from Naples. Is it not amusing to see them both on the same table? What are the two fish? asked Anglaire. M. Chateau Renaud, who has lived in Russia, will tell you the name of one, and Major Cavalcanti, who is an Italian, will tell you the name of the other. This one is, I think, a sterlet, said Chateau Renaud, and that one, if I mistake not, a lamprey. Just so. Now, M. Danglaire, ask these gentlemen where they are caught. Starlet, said Chateau Renaud, are only found in the Volga. And, said Cavalcanti, I know that Lake Fusaro alone supplies lampreys of that size. Exactly. One comes from the Volga, and the other from Lake Fusaro. Impossible, cried all the guests simultaneously. Well, this is just what amuses me, said Monte Cristo. I am like Nero, cupitur impossibilium and that is what is amusing you at this moment. This fish, which seems so exquisite to you, is very likely no better than perch or salmon, but it seemed impossible to procure it, and here it is. But how could you have these fish brought to France? Oh, nothing more easy. Each fish was brought over in a cask, one filled with river herbs and weeds, the other with rushes and lake plants. They were placed in a wagon built on purpose, and thus the sterlet lived twelve days, the lamprey ate, and both were alive when my cook seized them, killing one with milk and the other with wine. You did not believe me, M. Danglaire. I cannot help doubting, answered Danglaire, with his stupid smile. Baptiston, said the Count, have the other fish brought in, the sterlet and the lamprey, which came in the other casks, and which are yet alive. Danglaire opened his bewildered eyes. The company clapped their hands. Four servants carried in two casks covered with aquatic plants, and in each of which was breathing a fish similar to those on the table. But why have two of each sort? asked Anglaire. Merely because one might have died, carelessly answered Monte Cristo. You are certainly an extraordinary man, said Anglaire, and philosophers may well say it is a fine thing to be rich. And to have ideas, added Madame Anglaire. Oh, do not give me credit for this, madame. It was done by the Romans, who much esteemed them. And Pliny relates that they sent slaves from Ostia to Rome, who carried on their heads fish which he calls the mollus, and which from the description must probably be the goldfish. It was also considered a luxury to have them alive, it being an amusing sight to see them die. For when dying, they change color three or four times, and like the rainbow when it disappears, passed through all the prismatic shades, after which they were sent to the kitchen. Their agony formed part of their merit. If they were not seen alive, they were despised when dead. Yes, said Debray, but then Ostia is only a few leagues from Rome. True, said Monte Cristo, but what would be the use of living eighteen hundred years after Lucullus if we can do no better than he could? The two Cavalcanti opened their enormous eyes, but had the good sense not to say anything. All this is very extraordinary, said Chateau Renaud. Still, what I admire the most, I confess, is the marvelous promptitude with which your orders are executed. Is it not true that you only bought this house five or six days ago? Certainly not longer. Well, I am sure it is quite transformed since last week. If I remember rightly, it had another entrance, and the courtyard was paved and empty, while today we have a splendid lawn bordered by trees which appear to be a hundred years old. Why not? I am fond of grass and shade, said Monte Cristo. Yes, said Madame de Villefort. The door was towards the road before, and on the day of my miraculous escape you brought me into the house from the road, I remember. Yes, Madame, said Monte Cristo, but I preferred having an entrance which would allow me to see the Bois de Boulogne over my garden. In four days, said Morel, it is extraordinary. Indeed, said Chateau Renaud. It seems quite miraculous to make a new house out of an old one, for it was very old and dull, too. I recollect coming for my mother to look at it when M. de saint Morin advertised it for sale two or three years ago. M. de saint Morin said Madame de Villefort, 
Then this house belonged to M. de Saint Morin before you bought it? It appears so, replied Monte Cristo. Is it possible that you do not know of whom you purchased it? Quite so. My steward transacts all this business for me. It is certainly ten years since the house had been occupied, said Chateau Renaud, and it was quite melancholy to look at, with the blinds closed, the doors locked, and the weeds in the court. Really, if the house had not belonged to the father-in-law of the procurer, one might have thought it some accursed place where a horrible crime had been committed. Villefort, who had hitherto not tasted the three or four glasses of rare wine which were placed before him, here took one and drank it off. Monte Cristo allowed a short time to elapse, and then said, It is singular, Baron, but the same idea came across me the first time I came here. It looked so gloomy I should never have bought it if my steward had not taken the matter into his own hands. Perhaps the fellow had been bribed by the notary. It is probable, stammered out Villefort, trying to smile, but I can assure you that I had nothing to do with any such proceeding. This house is part of Valentine's marriage portion, and M. de saint Morin wished to sell it, for if it had remained another year or two uninhabited, it would have fallen to ruin. It was Morel's turn to become pale. There was, above all, one room, continued Monte Cristo, very plain in appearance, hung with red damask, which I know not why, appeared to be quite dramatic. Why so, said Danglars? Why dramatic? Can we account for instinct, said Monte Cristo? Are there not some places where we seem to breathe sadness? Why we cannot tell. It is a chain of recollections, an idea which carries you back to other times, to other places, which very likely have no connection with the present time and place, and there is something in this room which reminds me forcibly of the chamber of the Marquise de Gange, or Desdemona. Footnote. Elizabeth de Rosan, Marquise de Gange, was one of the famous women of the court of Louis the Fourteenth, where she was known as La Belle Provençale. She was the widow of the Marquise de Castellan when she married de Gange, and having the misfortune to excite the enmity of her new brothers-in-law, was forced by them to take poison and they finished her off with pistol and dagger. End footnote. Stay. Since we have finished dinner, I will show it to you, and then we will take coffee in the garden. After dinner, the play. Monte Cristo looked inquiringly at his guests. Madame de Villefort rose. Monte Cristo did the same, and the rest followed their example. Villefort and Madame d'Anglaire remained for a moment, as if rooted to their seats. They questioned each other with vague and stupid glances. Did you hear, said Madame d'Anglaire? We must go, replied Villefort, offering his arm. The others, attracted by curiosity, were already scattered in different parts of the house, for they thought the visit would not be limited to the one room, and that at the same time they would obtain a view of the rest of the building, of which Monte Cristo had created a palace. Each one went out by the open doors. Monte Cristo waited for the two who remained. Then, when they had passed, he brought up the rear, and on his face was a smile which, if they would have understood it, would have alarmed them much more than a visit to the room they were about to enter. They began by walking through the apartments, many of which were fitted up in the eastern style, with cushions and divans instead of beds, and pipes instead of furniture. The drawing rooms were decorated with the rarest pictures by the old masters, the boudoirs hung with draperies from China, of fanciful colors, fantastic design, and wonderful texture. At length they arrived at the famous room. There was nothing particular about it, excepting that, although daylight had disappeared, it was not lighted, and everything in it was old-fashioned, while the rest of the rooms had been redecorated. These two causes were enough to give it a gloomy aspect. Oh, cried Madame de Villefort, it is really frightful. Madame d'Anglaire tried to utter a few words, but was not heard. Many observations were made, the import of which was a unanimous opinion that there was something sinister about the room. "'Is it not so?' asked Monte Cristo. "'Look at that large, clumsy bed, hung with such gloomy, blood-colored drapery, and those two crayon portraits that have faded from the dampness. Do they not seem to say, with their pale lips and staring eyes, we have seen?' Villefort became livid. 
Madame d'Anglaire fell into a long seat placed near the chimney. Oh, said Madame de Villefort, smiling, are you courageous enough to sit down upon the very seat, perhaps upon which the crime was committed? Madame d'Anglaire rose suddenly. And then, said Monte Cristo, this is not all. What is there more, said Debray, who had not failed to notice the agitation of Madame d'Anglaire? Ah, what else is there, said d'Anglaire, for at present I cannot say that I have seen anything extraordinary. What do you say, M. Cavalcanti? Ah, he said, we have at Pisa Ugolino's tower, at Ferrara Tasso's prison, at Rimini the room of Francesca and Paolo. Yes, but you have not this little staircase, said Monte Cristo, opening a door concealed by the drapery. Look at it and tell me what you think of it. What a wicked-looking, crooked staircase, said Chateau Renaud with a smile. I do not know whether the wine of Chios produces melancholy, but certainly everything appears to me black in this house, said Debray. Ever since Valentine's dowry had been mentioned, Morel had been silent and sad. Can you imagine, said Monte Cristo, some Othello or Abbe de Gange, one stormy dark night descending these stairs step by step, carrying a load which he wishes to hide from the sight of man, if not from God. Madame d'Anglaire half fainted on the arm of Villefort, who was obliged to support himself against the wall. Ah, madame, cried Debray, what is the matter with you? How pale you look! It is very evident what is the matter with her, said Madame de Villefort. M. de Monte Cristo is relating horrible stories to us, doubtless intending to frighten us to death. Yes, said Villefort. Really, Count, you frighten the ladies. What is the matter? asked Debray, in a whisper of Madame d'Anglaire. Nothing, she replied with a violent effort. I want air, that is all. Will you come into the garden? said Debray, advancing toward the back staircase. No, no, she answered. I would rather remain here. Are you really frightened, Madame? said Monte Cristo. Oh, no, sir, said Madame d'Anglaire. But you suppose scenes in a manner which gives them the appearance of reality. Ah, yes, said Monte Cristo, smiling. It is all a matter of imagination. Why should we not imagine this the apartment of an honest mother, and this bed with red hangings, a bed visited by the goddess Luciana, and that mysterious staircase, the passage through which, not to disturb their sleep, the doctor and nurse pass, or even the father carrying the sleeping child? Here Madame d'Anglaire, instead of being calmed by the soft picture, uttered a groan and fainted. Madame d'Anglaire is ill, said Villefort. It would be better to take her to her carriage. Oh, mon Dieu, said Monte Cristo, I have forgotten my smelling bottle. I have mine, said Madame de Villefort, and she passed over to Monte Cristo a bottle full of the same kind of red liquid whose good properties the Count had tested on Edward. Ah, said Monte Cristo, taking it from her hand. Yes, she said, at your advice I have made the trial. And have you succeeded? I think so. Madame d'Anglaire was carried into the adjoining room. Monte Cristo dropped a very small portion of the red liquid upon her lips. She returned to consciousness. Ah, she cried, what a frightful dream. Villefort pressed her hand to let her know it was not a dream. They looked for M. d'Anglaire, but as he was not especially interested in poetical ideas, he had gone into the garden and was talking with Major Cavalcanti on the projected railway from Leghorn to Florence. Monte Cristo seemed in despair. He took the arm of Madame d'Anglaire and conducted her into the garden, where they found d'Anglaire taking coffee between the Cavalcanti. Really, Madame, he said, did I alarm you much? Oh, no, sir, she answered. But you know, things impress us differently, according to the mood of our minds. Villefort forced a laugh. And then, you know, he said, an idea, a supposition, is sufficient. Well, said Monte Cristo, you may believe me if you like, but it is my opinion that a crime has been committed in this house. Take care, said Madame de Villefort, the king's attorney is here. Ah, replied Monte Cristo, since that is the case, I will take advantage of his presence to make my declaration. Your declaration, said Villefort? Yes, before witnesses. Oh, this is very interesting, said Debray. If there really has been a crime, we will investigate it. There has been a crime, said Monte Cristo. Come this way, gentlemen. Come, and Villefort, for a declaration to be available should be made before the competent authorities. He then took Villefort's arm, 
and at the same time holding that of Madame d'Anglaire under his own, he dragged the procureur to the plantain tree, where the shade was thickest. All the other guests followed. Stay, said Monte Cristo, here, in this very spot, and he stamped upon the ground. I had the earth dug up and fresh mold put in, to refresh these old trees. Well, my man digging found a box, or rather the ironwork of a box, in the midst of which was the skeleton of a newly born infant. Monte Cristo felt the arm of Madame d'Anglaire stiffen, while that of Villefort trembled. A newly born infant, repeated Debray. This affair becomes serious. Well, said Chateau Renaud, I was not wrong just now then, when I said that houses had souls and faces like men, and that their exteriors carried the impress of their characters. This house was gloomy because it was remorseful. It was remorseful because it concealed a crime. Who said it was a crime? asked Villefort with a last effort. How? Is it not a crime to bury a living child in a garden? cried Monte Cristo. And pray, what do you call such an action? But who said it was buried alive? Why bury it there if it were dead? This garden has never been a cemetery. What is done to infanticides in this country? asked Major Cavalcanti innocently. All oh, their heads are soon cut off, said Danglaire. Ah, indeed, said Cavalcanti. I think so. Am I not right, M. de Villefort? asked Monte Cristo. Yes, Count, replied Villefort, in a voice now scarcely human. Monte Cristo, seeing that the two persons for whom he had prepared this scene could scarcely endure it, and not wishing to carry it too far, said, Come, gentlemen, some coffee. We seem to have forgotten it. And he conducted the guests back to the table on the lawn. Indeed, Count, said Madame d'Anglaire, I am ashamed to own it, but all your frightful stories have so upset me that I must beg you to let me sit down. And she fell into the chair. Monte Cristo bowed and went to Madame de Villefort. I think Madame d'Anglaire again requires your bottle, he said. But before Madame de Villefort could reach her friend, the procureur had found time to whisper to Madame d'Anglaire, I must speak with you. When? Tomorrow. Where? In my office, or in the court, if you like. That is the surest place. I will be there. At this moment, Madame de Villefort approached. Thanks, my dear friend, said Madame d'Anglaire, trying to smile. It is over now, and I am much better. End of chapter 63「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by CBW Simon, www.CanadianBlackWatch.com. September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 64 the beggar. The evening passed on. Madame de Villefort expressed a desire to return to Paris, which Madame Danglars had not dared to do, notwithstanding the uneasiness she experienced. On his wife's request, M. de Villefort was the first to give the signal of departure. He offered his seat in his landau to Madame Danglars that she might be under the care of his wife. As for M. Danglar, absorbed in an interesting conversation with M. Cavalcanti, he paid no attention to anything that was passing. While Monte Cristo had begged the smelling bottle from Madame de Villefort, he had noticed the approach of Villefort to Madame Danglar, and he soon guessed all that had passed between them, though the words had been uttered in so low a voice as to hardly be heard by Madame Danglar. Without opposing their arrangements, he allowed Morel, Chateau Renault, and Debray to leave on horseback, and the ladies in M. de Villefort's carriage. Danglars, more and more delighted with Major Cavalcanti, had offered him a seat in his carriage. Andrea Cavalcanti found his tilbury waiting at the door. The groom, in every respect a caricature of the English fashion, was standing on tiptoe to hold a large, iron-gray horse. Andrea had spoken very little during dinner. He was an intelligent lad, and he feared to utter some absurdity before so many grand people, amongst whom, with dilating eyes, he saw the king's attorney. 
Then he had been seized upon by Danglar, who, with a rapid glance at the stiff-necked old major and his modest son, and taking into consideration the hospitality of the count, made up his mind that he was in the society of some nabob come to Paris to finish the worldly education of his heir. He contemplated with unspeakable delight the large diamond which shone on the major's little finger, for the major, like a prudent man, in case of any accident happening to his banknotes, had immediately converted them into an available asset. Then, after dinner, on the pretext of business, he questioned the father and son upon their mode of living, and the father and son, previously informed that it was through Danglars the one was to receive his forty-eight thousand francs, and the other fifty thousand livres annually, were so full of affability that they would have shaken hands even with the banker's servants. So much did their gratitude need an object to expend itself upon. One thing above all the rest heightened the respect, nay, almost the veneration of Danglars for Cavalcanti. The latter, faithful to the principle of Horace Nil Admirari, had contented himself with showing his knowledge by declaring in what lake the best lampreys were caught. Then he had eaten some without saying a word more. Danglars, therefore, concluded that such luxuries were common at the table of the illustrious descendant of the Cavalcanti, who most likely in Lucca fed upon trout brought from Switzerland and lobsters sent from England by the same means used by the Count to bring the lampreys from Lake Fusaro and the Stirlet from the Volga. Thus it was with much politeness of manner that he heard Cavalcanti pronounce these words. "'Tomorrow, sir, I shall have the honor of waiting upon you on business.' "'And I, sir,' said Danglar, "'shall be most happy to receive you.' Upon which he offered to take Cavalcanti in his carriage to the Hotel des Princes, if it would not be depriving him of the company of his son. To this Cavalcanti replied by saying that for some time past his son had lived independently of him, that he had his own horses and carriages, and that not having come together it would not be difficult for them to leave separately. The major seated himself, therefore, by the side of Danglars, who was more and more charmed with the ideas of order and economy which ruled this man, and yet who, being able to allow his son sixty thousand francs a year, might be supposed to possess a fortune of five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand livres. As for Andrea, he began, by way of showing off, to scold his groom, who, instead of bringing the tilbury to the steps of the house, had taken it to the outer door, thus giving him the trouble of walking thirty steps to reach it. The groom heard him with humility, took the bit of the impatient animal with his left hand, and with the right held out the reins to Andrea, who, taking them from him, rested his polished boot lightly on the step. At that moment a hand touched his shoulder. The young man turned round, thinking that Danglars or Monte Cristo had forgotten something they wished to tell him, and had returned just as they were starting. But instead of either of these, he saw nothing but a strange face, sunburnt and encircled by a beard, with eyes brilliant as carbuncles, and a smile upon the mouth which displayed a perfect set of white teeth, pointed and sharp as the wolf's or jackal's. A red handkerchief encircled his gray head. Torn and filthy garments covered his large bony limbs, which seemed as though like those of a skeleton, they would rattle as he walked. And the hand with which he leaned upon the young man's shoulder, and which was the first thing Andrea saw, seemed of gigantic size. Did the young man recognize that face by the light of the lantern in his tilbury, or was he merely struck with the horrible appearance of his interrogator? We cannot say but only relate the fact that he shuddered and stepped back suddenly. "'What do you want of me?' he asked. 
pardon me, my friend, if I disturb you, said the man with the red handkerchief, but I want to speak to you. You have no right to beg at night, said the groom, endeavoring to rid his master of the troublesome intruder. I am not begging, my fine fellow, said the unknown to the servant, with so ironical an expression of the eye and so frightful a smile that he withdrew. I only wish to say two or three words to your master, who gave me a commission to execute about a fortnight ago. Come, said Andrea, with sufficient nerve for his servant not to perceive his agitation. What do you want? Speak quickly, friend. The man said in a low voice, I wish, I wish you to spare me the walk back to Paris. I am very tired, and as I have not eaten so good a dinner as you, I can scarcely stand. The young man shuddered at this strange familiarity. Tell me, he said, tell me what you want. Well then, I want you to take me up in your fine carriage and carry me back. Andrea turned pale, but said nothing. Yes, said the man, thrusting his hands into his pockets and looking impudently at the youth. I have taken the whim into my head. Do you understand, Master Benedetto? At this name, no doubt, the young man reflected a little, for he went towards his groom, saying, This man is right. I did indeed charge him with a commission, the result of which he must tell me. Walk to the barrier. There, take a cab, that you may not be too late. The surprised groom retired. Let me at least reach a shady spot, said Andrea. Oh, as for that, I'll take you to a splendid place, said the man with the handkerchief. And taking the horse's bit, he led the tilbury, where it was certainly impossible for any one to witness the honor that Andrea conferred upon him. Don't think I want the glory of riding in your fine carriage, said he. Oh, no, it's only because I am tired, and also because I have a little business to talk over with you. Come, step in, said the young man. It was a pity this scene had not occurred in daylight, for it was curious to see this rascal throwing himself heavily down on the cushion beside the young and elegant driver of the Tilbury. Andrea drove past the last house in the village without saying a word to his companion, who smiled complacently, as though well pleased to find himself traveling in so comfortable a vehicle. Once out of Otoy, Andrea looked around in order to assure himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and then, stopping the horse and crossing his arms before the man, he asked, Now, tell me why you have come to disturb my tranquillity. Let me ask you why you deceived me. How have I deceived you? How, do you ask? When we parted at the Pont du Var, you told me you were going to travel through Piedmont and Tuscany. But instead of that, you come to Paris. How does that annoy you? It does not. On the contrary, I think it will answer my purpose. So, said Andrea, you are speculating upon me? What fine words he uses. I warn you, Master Carteruse, that you are mistaken. Well, well, don't be angry, my boy. You know well enough what it is to be unfortunate, and misfortunes make us jealous. I thought you were earning a living in Tuscany or Piedmont by acting as Facchino or Cicerone, and I pitied you sincerely, as I would a child of my own. You know, I always did call you my child. Come, come. What then? Patience. Patience. I am patient, but go on. All at once I see you pass through the barrier with a groom, a tilbury, and fine new clothes. 
You must have discovered a mine, or else become a stockbroker. So that, as you confess, you are jealous? No, I am pleased. So pleased that I wish to congratulate you. But I am not quite properly dressed. I chose my opportunity that I might not compromise you. Yes, and a fine opportunity you have chosen, exclaimed Andrea. You speak to me before my servant. How can I help that, my boy? I speak to you when I can catch you. You have a quick horse, a light tilbury. You are naturally as slippery as an eel. If I had missed you tonight, I might not have had another chance. You see, I did not conceal myself. You are lucky. I wish I could say as much, for I do conceal myself, and then I was afraid you would not recognize me. But you did, added Caruse, with his unpleasant smile. It was very polite of you. Come, said Andrea. What do you want? You do not speak affectionately to me, Benedetto, my old friend. That is not right. Take care, or I may become troublesome. This menace smothered the young man's passion. He urged the horse again into a trot. You should not speak so to an old friend like me, Caderousse, as you say just now. You are a native of Marseille. I am... Do you know then now what you are? No, but I was brought up in Corsica. You are old and obstinate. I am young and willful. Between people like us, threats are out of place. Everything should be amicably arranged. Is it my fault if fortune, which is frowned upon you, has been kind to me? Fortune has been kind to you, then. Your tilbury, your groom, your clothes are not then hired? Good. So much the better said Caderousse, his eyes sparkling with avarice. Oh, you knew that well enough before speaking to me, said Andrea, becoming more and more excited. If I had been wearing a handkerchief like yours on my head, rags on my back, and worn-out shoes on my feet, you would not have known me. You wrong me, my boy. Now I have found you. Nothing prevents my being as well-dressed as anyone knowing, as I do, the goodness of your heart. If you have two coats, you will give me one of them. I used to divide my soup and beans with you when you were hungry. True, said Andrea. What an appetite you used to have. Is it as good now? Oh, yes, replied Andrea, laughing. How did you come to be dining with that prince whose house you have just left? He is not a prince, simply a count. A count? And a rich one too, eh? Yes. But you had better not have anything to say to him, for he is not a very good-tempered gentleman. Oh, be easy. I have no design upon your count, and you shall have him all to yourself. But, said Caderousse, again smiling with the disagreeable expression he had before assumed, you must pay for it. You understand. Well, what do you want? I think that with a hundred francs a month. Well? I could live... Upon a hundred francs? Come, you understand me. But that with... With? With a hundred and fifty francs, I should be quite happy. Here are two hundred, said Andrea, as he placed ten gold louis in the hand of Caderousse. Good, said Caderousse. Apply to the steward on the first day of every month, and you will receive the same sum. There now, again you degrade me. How so? By making me apply to the servants, when I want to transact business with you alone. Well... Be it so, then. Take it from me, then, and so long at least as I receive my income, 
you shall be paid yours. Come, come, I always said you were a fine fellow, and it is a blessing when good fortune happens to such as you. But tell me all about it. Why do you wish to know? asked Cavalcanti. What? Do you again defy me? No. The fact is, I have found my father. What? A real father? Yes, so long as he pays me. You'll honor and believe him. That's right. What is his name? Major Cavalcanti. Is he pleased with you? So far, I have appeared to answer his purpose. And who found this father for you? The Count of Monte Cristo. The man whose house you have just left? Yes. I wish you would try to find me a situation with him as grandfather, since he holds the money chest. Well, I will mention you to him. Meanwhile, what are you going to do? I? Yes, you. It is very kind of you to trouble yourself about me. Since you interest yourself in my affairs, I think it is now my turn to ask you some questions. Ah, true. Well, I shall rent a room in some respectable house, wear a decent coat, shave every day, and go and read the paper in the café. Then, in the evening, I shall go to the theatre. I shall look like some retired baker. That is what I want. Come, if you will only put this scheme into execution and be steady, nothing could be better. Do you think so, M. Bosset? And you, what will become? A peer of France? Ah, said Andrea, who knows? Major Cavalcanti is already one, perhaps. But then, hereditary rank is abolished. No politics, Caderousse. And now that you have all you want, and that we understand each other, jump down from the Tilbury and disappear. Not at all, my good friend. How? Not at all? Why, just think for a moment. With this red handkerchief on my head, with scarcely any shoes, no papers, and ten gold Napoleons in my pocket, without reckoning what was there before, making in all about two hundred francs, why, I should certainly be arrested at the barriers. Then, to justify myself, I should say that you gave me the money. This would cause inquiries. It would be found that I left Toulon without giving due notice, and that I should then be escorted back to the shores of the Mediterranean. Then I should become simply number 106, and goodbye to my dream of resembling the retired baker. No, no, my boy, I prefer remaining honorably in the capital. Andrea scowled. Certainly, as he had himself owned, the reputed son of Major Cavalcanti was a willful fellow. He drew up for a minute, threw a rapid glance around him, and then his hand fell instantly into his pocket where it began playing with a pistol. But, meanwhile, Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off his companion, passed his hand behind his back and opened a long Spanish knife which he always carried with him to be ready in case of need. The two friends, as we see, were worthy of and understood one another. Andrea's hand left his pocket inoffensively and was carried up to the red moustache, which it played with for some time. Good, Caderousse, he said. How happy you will be. I will do my best said the innkeeper of the Pont du Gard, shutting up his knife. Well, then, we will go to Paris. But how will you pass through the barrier without exciting suspicion? It seems to me that you are in more danger riding than on foot. Wait, said Caderousse. 
we shall see. He then took the great coat with the large collar which the groom had left behind in the tilbury and put it on his back. Then he took off Cavalcanti's hat which he placed upon his own head. And finally he assumed the careless attitude of a servant whose master drives himself. But tell me, said Andrea, am I to remain bareheaded? Pooh, said Caderousse, it is so windy that your hat can easily appear to have blown off. Come, come, enough of this, said Cavalcanti. What are you waiting for? said Caderousse. I hope I am not the cause. Hush, said Andrea. They passed the barrier without accident. At the first cross street, Andrea stopped his horse, and Caderousse leapt out. Well, said Andrea, my servant's coat and hat? Ah, said Caderousse, you would not like me to risk taking cold. But what am I to do? You? Oh, you are young, while I am beginning to get old. Au revoir, Benedetto. And running into a court, he disappeared. Alas, said Andrea, sighing, one cannot be completely happy in this world. End of chapter 64 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Paul Gabriel Weiner, East Brunswick, New Jersey, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 65 A Conjugal Scene At the Place Louis the Fifteenth, the three young people separated. That is to say, Morel went to the boulevards, Chateau Renault to the Pont de la Révolution, and Debray to the Quai. Most probably Morel and Chateau Renault returned to their domestic hearths, as they say in the gallery of the chamber in well-turned speeches, and in the theatre of the Rue Richelieu in well-written pieces. But it was not the case with Debray. When he reached the wicket of the Louvre, he turned to the left, galloped across the carousel, passed through the Rue Saint-Roche, and, issuing from the Rue de la Michaudière, he arrived at Monsieur Danglars' door just at the same time that Villefort's Landau, after having deposited him and his wife at the Fraubourg Saint-Honneur, stopped to leave the Baroness at her own house. Debray, with the air of a man familiar with the house, entered first into the court, threw his bridle into the hands of a footman, and returned to the door to receive Madame Danglars, to whom he offered his arm to conduct her to her apartments. The gate once closed, and Debray and the Baroness alone in the court, he asked, What was the matter with you, Hermine, and why were you so affected at that story, or rather fable, which the Count related? Because I have been in such shocking spirits all the evening, my friend, said the Baroness. No, Hermine, replied Debray, you cannot make me believe that. On the contrary, you were in excellent spirits when you arrived at the Count's. Monsieur Danglars was disagreeable, certainly, but I know how much you care for his ill humor. Someone has vexed you. I will allow no one to annoy you. You are deceived, Lucien, I assure you, replied Madame Danglars, and what I have told you is really the case, added to the ill humor you remarked, but which I did not think it worth while to allude to. It was evident that Madame Danglars was suffering from that nervous irritability which women frequently cannot account for even to themselves, or that, as Debray had guessed, she had experienced some secret agitation that she would not acknowledge to any one. Being a man who knew that the former of these symptoms was one of the inherent penalties of womanhood, he did not then press his inquiries, but waited for a more appropriate opportunity when he should again interrogate her, or receive an avowal proprio motu. At the door of her apartment, the Baroness met Mademoiselle Cornelie, her confidential maid. "'What is my daughter doing?' asked Madame Danglars. "'She practiced all the evening and then went to bed,' replied Mademoiselle Cornelie. "'Yet I think I hear her piano. "'It is Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly, who is playing while Mademoiselle Danglars is in bed.' "'Well,' said Madame Danglars, "'come and undress me.' They entered the bedroom. 
De Bray stretched himself upon a large couch, and Madame Danglars passed into her dressing room with Mademoiselle Cornelie. "'My dear Monsieur Lucien,' said Madame Danglars through the door, "'you are always complaining that Eugénie will not address a word to you.' "'Madame,' said Lucien, playing with the little dog, who, recognizing him as a friend of the house, expected to be caressed, "'I am not the only one who makes similar complaints. I think I heard Morcef say that he could not extract a word from his betrothed.' "'True,' said Madame Danglars, "'yet I think this will all pass off, and that you will one day see her enter your study.' "'My study?' "'At least that of the minister. Why so?' "'To ask for an engagement at the opera. Really, I never saw such an infatuation for music. It is quite ridiculous for a young lady of fashion.' Debray smiled. "'Well,' said he, "'let her come, with your consent and that of the baron, and we will try to give her an engagement, though we are very poor to pay such talent as hers.' "'Go, Cornelie,' said Madame Danglars. "'I do not require you any longer.' Cornelie obeyed, and the next minute Madame Danglars left her room in a charming loose dress, and came and sat down close to Debray. Then she began thoughtfully to caress the little spaniel. Lucien looked at her for a moment in silence. "'Come, Hermine,' he said after a short time. "'Answer candidly. Something vexes you. Is it not so?' "'Nothing,' answered the baroness. And yet, as she could scarcely breathe, she rose and went towards a looking-glass. I am frightful tonight, she said. Debray rose, smiling, and was about to contradict the baroness upon this latter point, when the door opened suddenly. Monsieur Danglars appeared. Debray reseated himself. At the noise of the door, Madame Danglars turned round and looked upon her husband with an astonishment she took no trouble to conceal. Good evening, madame, said the banker. Good evening, Monsieur Debray. Probably the baroness thought this unexpected visit signified a desire to make up for the sharp words he had uttered during the day. Assuming a dignified air, she turned round to Debray, without answering her husband. "'Read me something, Monsieur Debray,' she said. Debray, who was slightly disturbed at this visit, recovered himself when he saw the calmness of the baroness, and took up a book marked by a mother-of-pearl knife inlaid with gold. "'Excuse me,' said the banker. But you will tire yourself, Baroness, by such late hours, and Monsieur Debray lives some distance from here. Debray was petrified, not only to hear Danglars speak so calmly and politely, but because it was apparent that beneath outward politeness there really lurked a determined spirit of opposition to anything his wife might wish to do. The Baroness was also surprised, and showed her astonishment by a look which would doubtless have had some effect upon her husband if he had not been intently occupied with the paper, where he was looking to see the closing stock quotations. The result was that the proud look entirely failed of its purpose. "'Monsieur Lucien,' said the Baroness, "'I assure you I have no desire to sleep, and that I have a thousand things to tell you this evening, which you must listen to, even though you slept while hearing me.' "'I am at your service, madam,' replied Lucien coldly. "'My dear Monsieur Dupre,' said the banker, "'do not kill yourself tonight listening to the follies of Madame Danglars, "'for you can hear them as well tomorrow. "'But I claim tonight, and will devote it, if you will allow me, "'to talk over some serious matters with my wife.' "'This time the blow was so well aimed, and hit so directly, "'that Lucien and the Baroness were staggered, and they interrogated each other with their eyes, as if to seek help against this aggression. But the irresistible will of the master of the house prevailed, and the husband was victorious. "'Do not think I wish to turn you out, my dear Debray,' continued Danglars. "'Oh, no, not at all. An unexpected occurrence forces me to ask my wife to have a little conversation with me. It is so rarely I make such a request, I am sure you cannot grudge it to me. Debray muttered something, bowed, and went out, knocking himself against the edge of the door like Nathan and Athalie. "'It is extraordinary,' he said, when the door was closed behind him, "'how easily these husbands whom we ridicule gain an advantage over us.' Lucien having left, Danglars took his place on the sofa, closed the open book, and placing himself in a dreadfully dictatorial attitude, he began playing with the dog but the animal, not liking him as well as Debray, and attempting to bite him, 
Danglar seized him by the skin of his neck and threw him upon the couch on the other side of the room. The animal uttered a cry during the transit, but, arrived at its destination, it crouched behind the cushions, and stupefied at such unusual treatment, remained silent and motionless. "'Do you know, sir,' asked the baroness, "'that you are improving? Generally you are only rude, but to-night you are brutal.' "'It is because I am in worse humor than usual,' replied Danglars. Hermine looked at the banker with supreme disdain. These glances frequently exasperate the pride of Danglars, but this evening he took no notice of them. "'And what have I to do with your ill-humor?' said the baroness, irritated at the impassibility of her husband. "'Do these things concern me? Keep your ill-humor at home in your money-boxes, or, since you have clerks whom you pay, vent it upon them.' "'Not so,' replied Danglars. "'Your advice is wrong, so I shall not follow it. "'My money-boxes are my pactolus, as I think Monsieur de Mustier says, "'and I will not retard its course or disturb its calm. "'My clerks are honest men who earn my fortune, "'whom I pay much below their deserts, "'if I may value them according to what they bring in. "'Therefore I shall not get into a passion with them, those with whom I will be in a passion are those who eat my dinners, mount my horses, and exhaust my fortune. And pray, who are the persons who exhaust your fortune? Explain yourself more clearly, I beg, sir. Oh, make yourself easy. I am not speaking in riddles, and you will soon know what I mean. The people who exhaust my fortune are those who draw out seven hundred thousand francs in the course of an hour. I do not understand you, sir, said the baroness, trying to disguise the agitation of her voice and the flush of her face. You understand me perfectly, on the contrary, said Danglars. But, if you will persist, I will tell you that I have just lost seven hundred thousand francs upon the Spanish loan. "'And pray,' asked the baroness, "'am I responsible for this loss?' "'Why not? "'Is it my fault that you have lost seven hundred thousand francs?' "'Certainly it is not mine.' "'Once for all, sir,' replied the baroness sharply, "'I tell you I will not hear cash named. "'It is a style of language I never heard in the house of my parents, "'or in that of my first husband.' "'Oh, I can believe that.' for neither of them was worth a penny. The better reason for my not being conversant with the slang of the bank, which is here dinning in my ears from morning to night, that noise of jingling crowns, which are constantly being counted and recounted, is odious to me. I know only one thing I dislike more, which is the sound of your voice. Really, said Danglars, well, this surprises me, for I thought you took the liveliest interest in all my affairs. I? What could put such an idea into your head? Yourself. Ah? Uh, what next? Most assuredly. I should like to know upon what occasion. Oh, mon Dieu, that is very easily done. Last February you were the first who told me of the Haitian funds. You had dreamed that a ship had entered the harbor at Havre, that this ship brought news that a payment we had looked upon as lost was going to be made. I know how clear-sighted your dreams are. I therefore purchased immediately as many shares as I could of the Haitian debt, and I gained four hundred thousand francs by it, of which one hundred thousand have been honestly paid to you. You spent it as you pleased. That was your business." In March there was a question about a grant to a railway. Three companies presented themselves, each offering equal securities. You told me that your instinct, and although you pretend to know nothing about speculations, I think on the contrary that your comprehension is very clear upon certain affairs. Well, you told me that your instinct led you to believe that the grant would be given to the company called the Southern. I bought two-thirds of the shares of the company. As you had foreseen, the shares trebled in value, and I picked up a million, from which two hundred and fifty thousand francs were paid to you for pin money. Have you spent this two hundred and fifty thousand francs? It is no business of mine. 
"'When are you coming to the point?' cried the baroness, shivering with anger and impatience. "'Patience, madam, I am coming to it. That's fortunate. "'In April you went to dine at the minister's. "'You heard a private conversation respecting Spanish affairs, "'on the expulsion of Don Carlos. "'I bought some Spanish shares. "'The expulsion took place, and I pocketed 600,000 francs "'the day Charles V repassed the Bidosa. "'Of those 600,000 francs, you took 50,000 crowns. "'They were yours. "'You disposed of them according to your fancy, "'and I ask no questions.' but it is not the less true that you have this year received five hundred thousand livres. Well, sir, and what then? Ah, yes, it was just after this that you spoiled everything. Really, your manner of speaking. It expresses my meaning, and that is all I want. Well, three days after you talked politics with Monsieur de Bray, and you fancied from his words that Don Carlos had returned to Spain. Well, I sold my shares. The news got out, and I no longer sold. I gave them away. Next day I find the news was false, and by this report I have lost seven hundred thousand francs. Well? Well, since I gave you a fourth of my gains, I think you owe me a fourth of my losses. The fourth of seven hundred thousand francs is one hundred and seventy-five thousand francs. What you say is absurd, and I cannot see why Monsieur de Bray's name is mixed up in this affair. Because if you do not possess the hundred and seventy-five thousand francs I reclaim, you must have lent them to your friends, and Monsieur de Bray is one of your friends. For shame! exclaimed the Baroness. Oh, let us have no gestures, no screams, no modern drama, or you will oblige me to tell you that I see Debray leave here, pocketing the whole of the five hundred thousand livres you have handed over to him this year, while he smiles to himself, saying that he has found what the most skillful players have never discovered, that is, a roulette wheel where he wins without paying, and is no loser when he loses. The Baroness became enraged. Wretch! she cried. Will you dare to tell me that you did not know what you now reproach me with? I do not say that I did know it, and I do not say that I did not know it. I merely tell you to look into my conduct during the last four years that we have ceased to be husband and wife, and see whether it has not always been consistent. Some time after our rupture you wished to study music under the celebrated baritone who made such a successful appearance at the Théâtre Italien. At the same time, I felt inclined to learn dancing of the danseuses who acquired such a reputation in London. This cost me, on your account and mine, a hundred thousand francs. I said nothing, for we must have peace in the house, and a hundred thousand francs for a lady and gentleman to be properly instructed in music and dancing are not too much. Well, you soon became tired of singing and you take a fancy to study diplomacy with the minister's secretary. You understand, it signifies nothing to me so long as you pay for your lessons out of your own cash-box. But today I find you are drawing on mine, and that your apprenticeship may cost me seven hundred thousand francs per month. Stop there, madam, for this cannot last. Either the diplomatist must give his lessons gratis, and I will tolerate him, or he must never set his foot again in my house. Do you understand, madame? Oh, this is too much, cried Hermine, choking. You are worse than despicable. But, continued Danglars, I find you do not even pause there. Insults! You are right. Let us leave these facts alone and reason coolly. I have never interfered in your affairs excepting for your good, treat me in the same way. You say you have nothing to do with my cash-box? Be it so. Do as you like with your own, but do not fill or empty mine. Besides, how do I know that this was not a political trick, that the minister, enraged at seeing me in the opposition, and jealous of the popular sympathy I excite, has not concerted with Monsieur de Bray to ruin me? A probable thing. Why not? 
Who ever heard of such an occurrence as this? A false telegraphic dispatch. It is almost impossible for wrong signals to be made as they were in the last two telegrams. It was done on purpose for me. I am sure of it. Sir, said the baroness humbly, are you not aware that the man employed there was dismissed, that they talked of going to law with him, that orders were issued to arrest him, and that this order would have been put into execution if he had not escaped by flight, which proves that he was either mad or guilty? It was a mistake. Yes, which made fools laugh, which caused the minister to have a sleepless night, which has caused the minister's secretaries to blacken several sheets of paper, but which has cost me seven hundred thousand francs. But, sir, Hermine said suddenly, if all this is, as you say, caused by Monsieur Dupre, why, instead of going direct to him, do you come to me and tell me of it? Why, to accuse the man, do you address the woman? Do I know Monsieur Dubre? Do I wish to know him? Do I wish to know that he gives advice? Do I wish to follow it? Do I speculate? No, you do all this, not I. Still, it seems to me that as you profit by it... Danglars shrugged his shoulders. Foolish creature, he exclaimed. Women fancy they have talent because they have managed two or three intrigues without being the talk of Paris. But know that if you had even hidden your irregularities from your husband, who has but the commencement of the art, for generally husbands will not see, you would then have been but a faint imitation of most of your friends among the women of the world. But it has not been so with me. I see, and have always seen, during the last sixteen years. You may, perhaps, have hidden a thought, but not a step, not an action, not a fault has escaped me, while you flattered yourself upon your address, and firmly believe you had deceived me. What has been the result? That, thanks to my pretended ignorance, there is none of your friends, from Monsieur de Villefort to Monsieur de Pre, who has not trembled before me. There is not one who has not treated me as master of the house the only title I desire with respect to you. There is not one, in fact, who would have dared to speak of me as I have spoken of them this day. I will allow you to make me hateful, but I will prevent your rendering me ridiculous, and, above all, I forbid you to ruin me. The Baroness had been tolerably composed until the name of Villefort had been pronounced, but then she became pale and, Rising as if touched by a spring, she stretched out her hands as though conjuring an apparition. She then took two or three steps towards her husband, as though to tear the secret from him, of which he was ignorant, or which he withheld from some odious calculation, odious as all his calculations were. Monsieur de Villefort, what do you mean? I mean that Monsieur de Nargent, your first husband, being neither a philosopher nor a banker, or perhaps being both, and seeing there was nothing to be got out of a king's attorney, died of grief or anger at finding, after an absence of nine months, that you had been on Siet six. I am brutal. I not only allow it, but boast of it. It is one of the reasons of my success in the commercial business. Why did he kill himself instead of you? Because he had no cash to save. My life belongs to my cash. Monsieur de Bray has made me lose seven hundred thousand francs. Let him bear his share of the loss, and we will go on as before. If not, let him become bankrupt for the two hundred and fifty thousand livres, and do as all bankrupts do, disappear. He is a charming fellow, I allow, when his news is correct. But when it is not, there are fifty others in the world who would do better than he. Madame Danglars was rooted to the spot. She made a violent effort to reply to this last attack, but she fell upon a chair thinking of Villefort, of the dinner scene, of the strange series of misfortunes which had taken place in her house during the last few days, and changed the usual calm of her establishment to a scene of scandalous debate. Danglars did not even look at her, though she did her best to faint. He shut the bedroom door after him, without adding another word, and returned to his apartments. 
and when Madame Danglars recovered from her half-fainting condition, she could almost believe that she had had a disagreeable dream. End of chapter 65「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 66 Matrimonial Projects The day following this scene, at the hour the banker usually chose to pay a visit to Madame Danglars on his way to his office, his coupé did not appear. At this time, that is, about half-past twelve, Madame Danglars ordered her carriage and went out. Danglars, hidden behind a curtain, watched the departure he had been waiting for. He gave orders that he should be informed as soon as Madame Danglars appeared. But at two o'clock she had not returned. He then called for his horses, drove to the chamber, and inscribed his name to speak against the budget. From twelve to two o'clock, Danglars had remained in his study, unsealing his dispatches, and becoming more and more sad every minute, heaping figure upon figure, and receiving, among other visits, one from Mayor Cavalcanti, who, as stiff and exact as ever, presented himself precisely at the hour named the night before to terminate his business with the banker. On leaving the chamber, Danglars, who had shown violent marks of agitation during the sitting, and been more bitter than ever against the ministry, re-entered his carriage, and told the coachman to drive to the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, number 30. Monte Cristo was at home. Only he was engaged with someone, and begged Danglars to wait for a moment in the drawing-room. While the banker was waiting in the anteroom, the door opened and a man dressed as an abbé, and doubtless more familiar with the house than he was, came in and, instead of waiting, merely bowed, passed on to the further apartments, and disappeared. A minute after, the door by which the priest had entered reopened, and Monte Cristo appeared. "'Pardon me,' he said, "'my dear baron, but one of my friends, the Abbé Busoni, whom you perhaps saw pass by, has just arrived in Paris. Not having seen him for a long time, I could not make up my mind to leave him sooner, so I hope this will be sufficient reason for my having made you wait. Nay, said Danglars, it is my fault. I have chosen my visit at a wrong time, and I will retire. Not at all. On the contrary, be seated. But what is the matter with you? You look careworn. Really, you alarm me. Melancholy is a capitalist, like the appearance of a comet, presages some misfortune to the world. I have been in ill luck for several days, said Danglars, and I have heard nothing but bad news. Ah, indeed, said Monte Cristo. Have you had another fall at the Bourse? No, I am safe for a few days at least. I am only annoyed about a bankrupt of Trieste. Really? Does it happen to be Jacopo Manfredi? Exactly so. Imagine a man who has transacted business with me for I don't know how long, to the amount of 800,000 or 900,000 francs during the year, never a mistake or delay. A fellow who paid like a prince. Well, I was a million in advance with him, and now my fine Jacopo Manfredi suspends payment. Really? It is an unheard of fatality. I draw upon him for 600,000 francs. My bills are returned and paid. I hold bills of exchange signed by him to the value of 400,000 francs, payable at his correspondence in Paris at the end of this month. Today is the 30th. I present them, but my correspondent has disappeared. This, with my Spanish affairs, made a pretty end to the month. Then you really lost by that affair in Spain? Yes, only 700,000 francs out of my cash box, nothing more. Why, how could you make such a mistake, such an old stagger? Oh, it's all my wife's fault. She dreamed Don Carlos had returned to Spain. She believes in dreams. It is magnetism, she says. And when she dreams a thing, it is true to happen, she assures me. 
On this conviction, I allow her to speculate. She have in her bank and her stockbrokers, she speculated and lost. It is true she speculates with her own money, not mine. Nevertheless, you can understand that when 700,000 francs leave the wife's pocket, the husband always find it out. But do you mean to say you have not heard of this? Why, the thing has made a tremendous noise. Yes, I heard it spoken of, but I did not know the details. And then, no one can be more ignorant than I am of the affairs in the bourse. Then you do not speculate? I? How could I speculate when I already have so much trouble in regulating my income? I should be obliged, besides my steward, to keep a clerk and a boy. But touching these Spanish affairs, I think that the Baroness did not dream the whole of the Don Carlos matter. The papers said something about it, did they not? Then you believe the papers? Aye, not the least in the world. Only I fancied that the honest messenger was an exception to the rule, and that it only announced telegraphic dispatches. Well, that's what puzzles me, replied Dongla. The news of the return of Don Carlo was brought by telegraph. So that, said Monte Cristo, you have lost nearly one million seven hundred thousand francs this month. Not nearly, indeed. That is exactly my loss. Diable, said Monte Cristo compassionately. It is a hard blow for a third-rate fortune. Third-rate, said Danglars, rather humble. What do you mean by that? Certainly, continued Monte Cristo. I make three assortments of fortune. First-rate, second-rate, and third-rate fortunes. I call those first-rate, which are composed of treasures one possesses under one's hand, such as mines, lands, and funded property, in such states as France, Austria, and England, provided these treasures and property form a total of about a hundred millions. I call those second-rate fortunes that are gained by manufacturing enterprises, joint stock companies, vice-royalties, and principalities. Not drawing more than 1,500,000 francs, the whole forming a capital of about 50 millions. Finally, I call those third-rate fortunes, which are composed of a fluctuating capital, dependent upon the will of others, or upon changes which a bankruptcy involves, or a false telegram shakes, such as banks, speculations of the day. In fact, all operations under the influence of greater or less mischances the whole bringing in a real or fictitious capital of about fifteen millions. I think this is about your position, is it not? Confound it, yes, replied Danglars. The result, then, of six more such months as this would be to reduce the third-rate house to despair. Oh, said Danglars, becoming very pale, how you are right running on. Let us imagine seven such months continued monte cristo in the same tone tell me have you ever thought that seven times one million seven hundred thousand francs make nearly twelve millions no you have not well you are right for if you indulged in such reflections you would never risk your principle which is to the speculator what the skin is to civilized men we have our clothes, some more splendid than others. This is our credit. But when a man dies, he has only his skin. In the same way, on retiring from business, you have nothing but your real principle, of about five or six millions at the most, for third-rate fortunes are never more than a fourth of what they appear to be. Like the locomotive of a railway, the size of which is magnified by the smoke and steam surrounding it. Well, out of the five or six millions which form your real capital, you have just lost nearly two millions, which must, of course, in the same degree diminish your credit and fictitious fortune. To follow out my simile, your skin has been opened by bleeding, and this, if repeated three or four times, will cause death. So pay attention to it, my dear Monsieur Danglars. Do you want money? Do you wish me to lend you some? What a bad calculator you are! exclaimed Danglars, calling to his assistance all his philosophy and dissimulation. 
I have made money at the same time by speculations which have succeeded. I have made up the loss of blood by nutrition. I lost a battle in Spain. I have been defeated in Trieste. But my naval army in India will have taken some galleons. And my Mexican pioneers will have discovered some mine. Very good, very good. But the wound remains and will reopen at the first loss. No, for I am only embarked in certainties, replied Danglars, with the air of a mountebank sounding his own praises. To involve me, three governments must crumble to dust. Well, such things have been. That there should be a famine. Recollect the seven fat and the seven lean kine. Or that the sea should become dry, as the day of Pharaoh, and even then my vessels would become caravans. So much the better. I congratulate you, my dear Monsieur Danglars, said Monte Cristo. I see I was deceived, and that you belong to the class of second-rate fortunes. I think I may aspire to that honor, said Danglars with a smile which reminded Monte Cristo of the sickly moons which bad artists are so fond of daubing into their pictures of ruins. But while we are speaking of business, Danglars added, pleased to find an opportunity of changing the subject, tell me, what am I to do for Monsieur Cavalcanti? Give him money if he is recommended to you, and the recommendation seems good. Excellent. He presented himself this morning with a bound of 40,000 francs, payable at sight on you, signed by Busoni, and returned by you to me, with your endorsement. Of course, I immediately counted him over the 40 banknotes. Monte Cristo nodded his head in token of assent. But that is not all, continued Danglars. He has opened an account with my house for his son. May I ask how much he allows the young man? Five thousand francs per month. Sixty thousand francs per year. I thought I was right in believing that Cavalcanti to be a stingy fellow. How can a young man live upon five thousand francs a month? But you understand that if the young man should want a few thousands more... Do not advance it. The father will never repay it. You do not know these ultramontane millionaires. They are regular misers. And by whom were they recommended to you? Oh, by the house of Fenzi, one of the best in Florence. I do not mean to say you will lose, but nevertheless, mind you hold to the terms of the agreement. Would you not trust the Cavalcanti? I? Oh, I would advance six millions on his signature. I was only speaking in reference to the second-rate fortunes we were mentioning just now. And with all this, how unassuming he is! I should never have taken him for anything more than a mere mayor. And you would have flattered him, for certainly, as you say, he has no manner. The first time I saw him, he appeared to me like an old lieutenant who had grown mildly under his epaulets. But all the Italians are the same. They are like all Jews when they are not glittering in oriental splendor. The young man is better, said Danglars. Yes, a little nervous, perhaps, but upon the whole, he appeared tolerable. I was uneasy about him. Why? Because you met him at my house, just after his introduction into the world, as they told me. He has been travelling with a very severe tutor, and had never been to Paris before. Ah... Uh, I believe noblemen marry amongst themselves. Do they not? asked Tongla carelessly. They like to unite their fortunes. It is usual, certainly. But Cavalcanti is an original who does nothing like other people. I cannot help thinking that he had brought his son to France to choose a wife. Do you think so? I am sure of it. And you have heard his fortune mentioned? Nothing else was talked of. Only some said he was worth millions, and others that he did not possess a farting. And what is your opinion? I owe not to influence you, because it is only my own personal impression. Well, and it is that? My opinion is, 
that all these old podestas, these ancient condottieri, for the Cavalcanti have commanded armies and governed provinces, my opinion, I say, is that they have buried their millions in corners, the secret of which they have transmitted only to their eldest sons, who have done the same from generation to generation, and the proof of this is seen in their yellow and dry appearance, like the florins of the Republic, which from being constantly gazed upon have become reflected in them. Certainly, said Danglars, and this is further supported by the fact of their not possessing an inch of land. Very little at least. I know of none which Cavalcanti possesses, except in his palace in Lucha. Ah, he has a palace, said Danglars, laughing. Come, that is something. Yes, and more than that, he lets it to the minister of finance, while he lives in the simple house. Oh, as I told you before, I think the old fellow is very close. Come, you do not flatter him. I scarcely know him. I think I have seen him three times in my life. All I know relating to him is through Busoni and himself. He was telling me this morning that, tired of letting his property lie dormant in Italy, which is a dead nation, he wished to find the method, either in France or England, of multiplying his millions. What to remember, that though I place great confidence in Busoni, I am not responsible for this. Never mind. Accept my thanks for the client you have sent me. It is a fine name to inscribe on my ledgers, and my cashier was quite proud of it when I explained to him who the Cavalcanti were. By the way, this is merely a simple question. When this sort of people marry their sons, do they give them any fortune? Ah, oh, that depends upon circumstances. I know an Italian prince, rich as a gold mine, one of the noblest families in Tuscany, who, when his sons married according to his wish, gave them millions, and when they married against his consent, merely allowed them thirty crowns a month. Should André marry according to his father's views, he will perhaps give him one, two, or three millions. For example, supposing it were the daughter of a banker, he might take an interest in the house of the father-in-law of his son. Then again, if he dislikes his choice, the mayor takes the key, double locks his coffer, and Master Andrea would be obliged to live like the sons of a Parisian family, by shuffling cards or rattling the dice. Oh, that boy will find out some Bavarian or Peruvian princess. He will want a crown and an immense fortune. No, these grand lords of the other side of the Alps frequently marry into plain families. Like Jupiter, they like to cross the race. But do you wish to marry Andrea, my dear Monsieur Danglars, that you are asking so many questions? Ma foi, said Danglars. It would not be a bad speculation, I fancy, and you know I'm a speculator. You are not thinking of Mademoiselle Danglars, I hope. You would not like poor Andrea to have his throat cut by Albert. Albert, repeated Danglars, shrugging his shoulders. Ah, well, he would care very little about it, I think. But he is betrothed to your daughter, I believe. Well, Monsieur de Morcerf and I have talked about this marriage, but Madame de Morcer and Albert... You do not mean to say that it would not be a good match. Indeed, I imagine that Mademoiselle Danglars is as good as Monsieur de Morcerf. Mademoiselle Danglars' fortune would be great, no doubt, especially if the telegraph should not make any more mistakes. Oh, I do not mean her fortune only, but tell me. What? Why did you not invite Monsieur and Madame de Morcerf to your dinner? I did so, but he excused himself on account of Madame de Morcerf being obliged to go to Dieppe for the benefit of sea air. Yes, yes, <laughs> said Danglars, laughing. It would do her a great deal of good. Why so? Because it is the air she always breathed in her youth. Monte Cristo took no notice of this ill-natured remark. But still, if Albert is not so rich as Mademoiselle Danglars, said the Count, you must allow 
that he has a fine name. So he has, but I like mine as well. Certainly, your name is popular, and does honor to the title they have adorned it with. But you are too intelligent not to know that according to a prejudice too firmly rooted to be exterminated, a nobility which dates back five centuries is worth more than one that can only recon twenty years. And for this very reason, said Danglars with a smile, which he tried to make sardonic, I prefer Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti to Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Still, I should not think de Morcerf would yield to the Cavalcanti. De Morcerf, stay, my dear Count, said Danglars. You are a man of the world, are you not? I think so. And you understand heraldry? A little. Well, look at my coat of arms. It is worth more than Morcerf's. Why so? Because, though I am not a baron by birth, my real name is at least Danglars. Well, what then? While his name is not Morcerf. How? Not Morcerf? Not the least in the world. Go on. I have been made a baron, so that I actually am one. He made himself a count, so that he is not one at all. Impossible. Listen, my dear Count, Monsieur de Morcerf has been my friend, or rather my acquaintance, during the last thirty years. You know I have made the most of my arms, though I never forgot my origin. A proof of great humility, or great pride, said Monte Cristo. Well, when I was a clerk, Morcerf was a mere fisherman. And then he was called Fernand. Only Fernand? Fernand Mondego. You are sure? Pardieu, I have bought enough fish of him to know his name. Then why did you think of giving your daughter to him? Because Fernand and Danglars, being both parvenus, both having become noble, both rich, are about equal in worth, excepting that there have been certain things mentioned of him that were never said of me. What? Oh, nothing. Ah, yes. What you tell me recalled to mind something about the name of Fernand Mondego. I have heard that name in Greece. In conjecture with the affairs of Ali Pasha? Exactly so. This is the mystery, said Danglars. I acknowledge I would have given anything to find it out. It would be very easy if you much wished it. How so? Probably you have some correspondent in Greece. I should think so. At Yanina? Everywhere. Well, write to your correspondent in Yanina, and ask him what part was played by a Frenchman named Fernand Mondego in the catastrophe of Ali Tepelini. You are right, exclaimed Danglars, rising quickly. I will write today. Do so. I will. And if you should hear of anything very scandalous, I will communicate it to you. You will oblige me. Danglars rushed out of the room and made but one leap into his coupé. End of chapter 66「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Dan Three Trees. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 67. At the Office of the King's Attorney. Let us leave the banker driving his horses at their fullest speed and follow Madame Danglars in her morning excursion. We have said that at half past twelve o'clock Madame Danglars had ordered her horses and had left home in the carriage. She directed her course toward the Faubourg Saint-Germain, went down the Rue Mazarine, and stopped at the Passage du Pont Neuf. She descended, and went through the passage. She was very plainly dressed, as would be the case with a woman of taste walking in the morning. At the Rue Gunagod she called a cab, and directed the driver to go to the Rue de Harlay. As soon as she was seated in the vehicle, she drew from her pocket a very thick black veil, 
which she tied on to her straw bonnet. She then replaced the bonnet and saw with pleasure in a little pocket mirror that her white complexion and brilliant eyes were alone visible. The cab crossed the Pont Neuf and entered the Rue de Harlay by the Place Dauphine. The driver was paid as the door opened, and stepping lightly up the stairs, Madame Danglars soon reached the Salle de Pas Perdu. There was a great deal going on that morning, and many business-like persons at the Palais. Business-like persons pay very little attention to women, and Madame Danglars crossed the hall without exciting any more attention than any other woman calling upon her lawyer. There was a great press of people in Monsieur de Villefort's antechamber, but Madame Danglars had no occasion even to pronounce her name. The instant she appeared, the doorkeeper rose, came to her, and asked her whether she was not the person with whom the procureur had made an appointment, and on her affirmative answer being given, he conducted her by a private passage to Monsieur de Villefort's office. The magistrate was seated in an armchair, writing, with his back towards the door. He did not move as he heard it open, and the doorkeeper pronounced the words, Walk in, madame, and then reclose it. But no sooner had the man's footsteps ceased than he started up, drew the bolts, closed the curtains, and examined every corner of the room. Then, when he had assured himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and was consequently relieved of doubts, he said, Thanks, madame, thanks for your punctuality. And he offered a chair to madame Danglars, which she accepted, for her heart beat so violently that she felt nearly suffocated. It is a long time, madame, said the procureur, describing a half-circle with his chair so as to place himself exactly opposite to Madame Danglars. It is a long time since I had the pleasure of speaking alone with you, and I regret that we have only now met to enter upon a painful conversation. Nevertheless, sir, you see I have answered your first appeal, although certainly the conversation must be much more painful for me than for you. Villefort smiled bitterly. It is true, then, he said, rather uttering his thoughts aloud than addressing his companion. It is true, then, that all our actions leave their traces, some sad, some bright, on our paths. It is true that every step in our lives is like the course of an insect on the sands. It leaves its track. Alas, to many the path is traced by tears. Sir, said Madame Danglars, you can feel for my emotion, can you not? Spare me, then, I beseech you. When I look at this room, whence so many guilty creatures have departed, trembling and ashamed, when I look at that chair before which I now sit trembling and ashamed, oh, it requires all my reason to convince me that I am not a very guilty woman and you a menacing judge. Villefort dropped his head and sighed, and I, he said, I feel that my place is not in the judge's seat, but on the prisoner's stool. You? said Madame Danglars. Yes, I. I think, sir, you exaggerate your situation, said Madame Danglars, whose beautiful eyes sparkled for a moment. The paths of which you were just speaking have been traced by all young men of ardent imaginations. Besides the pleasure, there is always remorse from the indulgence of our passions, and after all, what have you men to fear from all this? The world excuses and notoriety ennobles you. Madame, replied Villefort, you know that I am no hypocrite, or at least that I never deceive without a reason. If my brow be severe, it is because many misfortunes have clouded it. If my heart be petrified, it is that it might sustain the blows it has received. I was not so in my youth. I was not so on the night of the betrothal, when we were all seated around a table in the Rue de Cœur at Marseilles. But since then, everything has changed in and about me. I am accustomed to brave difficulties, and in the conflict to crush those who, by their own free will, or by chance, voluntarily or involuntarily, interfere with me in my career. It is generally the case that what we most ardently desire is as ardently withheld from us by those who wish to obtain it, or from whom we attempt to snatch it. Thus, the greater number of a man's errors come before him disguised under the specious form of necessity. Then, after error has been committed in a moment of excitement, of delirium, or of fear, we see that we might have avoided and escaped it. The means we might have used, which we in our blindness could not see, then seem simple and easy, and we say, why did I not do this instead of that? Women, on the contrary, are rarely tormented with remorse, for the decision does not come from you. Your misfortunes are generally imposed upon you, and your faults the results of others' crimes. In any case, sir, you will allow, replied Madame Danglars, 
that even if the fault were mine alone, I last night received a severe punishment for it. Poor thing, said Villefort, pressing her hand. It was too severe for your strength, for you were twice overwhelmed, and yet... Well? Well, I must tell you, collect all your courage, for you have not yet heard all. Ah! exclaimed Madame d'Aglar, alarmed. What is there more to hear? You only look back to the past, and it is indeed bad enough. Well, picture to yourself a future more gloomy still, certainly frightful, perhaps sanguinary. The Baroness knew how calm Villefort naturally was, and his present excitement frightened her so much that she opened her mouth to scream, but the sound died in her throat. How has this terrible past been recalled? cried Villefort. How is it that it has escaped from the depths of the tomb and the recesses of our hearts where it was buried to visit us now like a phantom, whitening our cheeks and flushing our brows with shame? Alas, said Hermine, doubtless it is chance. Chance, replied Villefort. No, no, madame, there is no such thing as chance. Oh, yes. Has not a fatal chance revealed all this? Was it not by chance the Count of Monte Cristo bought that house? Was it not by chance he caused the earth to be dug up? Is it not by chance that the unfortunate child was disinterred under the trees, that poor innocent offspring of mine which I never even kissed, but for whom I wept many, many tears? Ah, my heart clung to the Count when he mentioned the dear spoil found beneath the flowers. Well, no, madame. This is the terrible news I have to tell you, said Villefort in a hollow voice. No, nothing was found beneath the flowers. There was no child disinterred. No, you must not weep. No, you must not groan. You must tremble. What can you mean? asked Madame Danglars, shuddering. I mean that Monsieur de Monte Cristo, digging underneath these trees, found neither skeleton nor chest, because neither of them was there. Neither of them there, repeated Madame Danglars, her staring wide open eyes expressing her alarm. Neither of them there, she said again, as though striving to impress herself with the meaning of the words which escaped her. No, said Villefort, burying his face in his hands. No, a hundred times no. Then you did not bury the poor child there, sir? Why did you deceive me? Where did you place it? Tell me where. There. But listen to me, listen, and you will pity me who has for twenty years alone borne the heavy burden of grief I am about to reveal, without casting the least portion upon you. Oh, you frighten me, but speak, I will listen. You recollect that sad night, when you were half expiring on that bed in the red damask room, while I, scarcely less agitated than you, awaited your delivery. The child was born, was given to me, motionless, breathless, voiceless. We thought it dead. Madame Danglars moved rapidly, as though she would spring from her chair, but Villefort stopped and clasped his hands as if to implore her attention. We thought it dead, he repeated. I placed it in the chest, which was to take the place of a coffin. I descended to the garden, I dug a hole, and then flung it down in haste. Scarcely had I covered it with earth, when the arm of the Corsican was stretched towards me. I saw a shadow rise, and at the same time a flash of light. I felt pain. I wished to cry out, but an icy shiver ran through my veins and stifled my voice. I felt lifeless, and fancied myself killed. Never shall I forget your sublime courage when, having returned to consciousness, I dragged myself to the foot of the stairs, and you, almost dying yourself, came to meet me. We were obliged to keep silent upon the dreadful catastrophe. You had the fortitude to regain the house, assisted by your nurse. A duel was the pretext for my wound. Though we scarcely expected it, our secret remained in our own keeping alone. I was taken to Versailles. For three months I struggled with death. At last, as I seemed to cling to life, I was ordered to the south. Four men carried me from Paris to Chalons, walking six leagues a day. Madame de Villefort followed the litter in her carriage. At Chalons I was put upon the Seine. Thence I passed on to the Rhone, whence I descended, merely with the current, to Arles. At Arles, I was again placed on my litter, and continued my journey to Marseilles. My recovery lasted six months. I never heard you mentioned, and I did not dare inquire for you. When I returned to Paris, I learned that you, the widow of Monsieur de Nargonne, had married Monsieur Danglars. 
What was the subject of my thoughts from the time consciousness returned to me? Always the same, always the child's corpse, coming every night in my dreams, rising from the earth, and hovering over the grave with menacing look and gesture. I inquired immediately on my return to Paris. The house had not been inhabited since we left it, but it had just been let for nine years. I found the tenant. I pretended that I disliked the idea that a house belonging to my wife's father and mother should pass into the hands of strangers. I offered to pay them for cancelling the lease. They demanded six thousand francs. I would have given ten thousand. I would have given twenty thousand. I had the money with me. I made the tenant sign the deed of resolution, and when I had obtained what I so much wanted, I galloped to Ote. No one had entered the house since I had left it. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. I ascended into the red room and waited for night. There all the thoughts which had disturbed me during my year of constant agony came back with double force. The Corsican, who had declared the vendetta against me, who had followed me from Nîmes to Paris, who had hid himself in the garden, who had struck me, had seen me dig the grave, had seen me inter the child. He might become acquainted with your person, nay, he might even then have known it. Would he not one day make you pay for keeping this terrible secret? Would it not be a sweet revenge for him when he found that I had not died from the blow of his dagger? It was therefore necessary, before everything else, and at all risks, that I should cause all traces of the past to disappear, that I should destroy every material vestige. Too much reality would always remain in my recollection. It was for this I had annulled the lease. It was for this I had come. It was for this I was waiting. Night arrived. I allowed it to become quite dark. I was without a light in that room. When the wind shook all the doors, behind which I continually expected to see some spy concealed, I trembled. I seemed everywhere to hear your moans behind me in the bed, and I dared not turn around. My heart beat so violently that I feared my wound would open. At length, one by one, all the noises in the neighborhood ceased. I understood that I had nothing to fear, that I should neither be seen nor heard so I decided upon descending to the garden. Listen, Hermine, I consider myself as brave as most men, but when I drew from my breast the little key of the staircase, which I had found in my coat, that little key we both used to cherish so much, which you wished to have fastened to a golden ring, when I opened the door and saw the pale moon shedding a long stream of white light on the spiral staircase like a specter, I leaned against the wall and nearly shrieked, I seemed to be going mad. At last I mastered my agitation. I descended the staircase step by step. The only thing I could not conquer was a strange trembling in my knees. I grasped the railings. If I had relaxed my hold for a moment, I should have fallen. I reached the lower door. Outside this door, a spade was placed against the wall. I took it and advanced towards the thicket. I had provided myself with a dark lantern. In the middle of the lawn, I stopped to light it and I continued my path. It was the end of November. All the verdure of the garden had disappeared. The trees were nothing more than skeletons with their long bony arms, and the dead leaves sounded on the gravel under my feet. My terror overcame me to such a degree as I approached the thicket that I took a pistol from my pocket and armed myself. I fancied continually that I saw the figure of the Corsican between the branches. I examined the thicket with my dark lantern. It was empty. I looked carefully around. I was indeed alone. No noise disturbed the silence but an owl, whose piercing cry seemed to be calling up the phantoms of the night. I tied my lantern to a forked branch I had noticed a year before at the precise spot where I had stopped to dig the hole. The grass had grown very thickly there during the summer, and when autumn arrived no one had been there to mow it. Still, one place where the grass was thin attracted my attention. It evidently was there I had turned up the ground. I went to work. The hour then, for which I had been waiting during the last year, had at length arrived. How I worked, how I hoped, how I struck every piece of turf, thinking to find some resistance to my spade. But no, I found nothing, though I had made a hole twice as large as the first. I thought I had been deceived, had mistaken the spot. I turned around, I looked at the trees, I tried to recall the details which had struck me at the time. A cold, sharp wind whistled through the leafless branches, and yet the drops fell from my forehead. I recollected that I was stabbed just as I was trampling the ground to fill up the hole, 
While doing so, I had leaned against a laburnum. Behind me was an artificial rockery intended to serve as a resting place for persons walking in the garden. In falling, my hand, relaxing its hold of the laburnum, felt the coldness of the stone. On my right I saw the tree, behind me the rock. I stood in the same attitude and threw myself down. I rose, and again began digging and enlarging the hole. Still I found nothing, nothing. The chest was no longer there. The chest no longer there, murmured Madame Danglars, choking with fear. Think not I contented myself with this one effort, continued Villefort. No, I searched the whole thicket. I thought the assassin, having discovered the chest and supposing it to be a treasure, had intended carrying it off, but, perceiving his error, had dug another hole and deposited it there, but I could find nothing. Then the idea struck me that he had not taken these precautions and had simply thrown it in a corner. In the last case I must wait for daylight to renew my search. I remained in the room and waited. Oh, heavens! When daylight dawned I went down again. My first visit was to the thicket. I hoped to find some traces which had escaped me in the darkness. I had turned up the earth over a surface of more than twenty feet square and a depth of two feet. A laborer would not have done in a day what occupied me an hour, but I could find nothing, absolutely nothing. Then I renewed the search, supposing it had been thrown aside. It would probably be on the path which led to the little gate, but this examination was as useless as the first, and with a bursting heart I returned to the thicket, which now contained no hope for me. Oh, cried Madame Danglars, it was enough to drive you mad. I hoped for a moment that it might, said Villefort, but that happiness was denied me. However, recovering my strength and my ideas, why, said I, should that man have carried away the corpse? But you said, replied Madame Danglars, he would require it as a proof. Ah, no, Madame, that could not be. Dead bodies are not kept a year. They are shown to a magistrate, and the evidence is taken. Now nothing of the kind has happened. What then? asked Hermine, trembling violently. Something more terrible, more fatal, more alarming for us. The child was, perhaps, alive, and the assassin may have saved it. Madame Danglars uttered a piercing cry, and, seizing Villefort's hands, exclaimed, "'My child was alive?' said she. "'You buried my child alive? "'You were not certain my child was dead, and you buried it? "'Ah!' Madame Danglars had risen, and stood before the procureur, whose hands she wrung in her feeble grasp. "'I know not. I merely suppose so, as I might suppose anything else,' replied Villefort, with a look so fixed it indicated that his powerful mind was on the verge of despair and madness. "'Ah, my child, my poor child!' cried the baroness, falling on her chair and stifling her sobs in her handkerchief. Villefort, becoming somewhat reassured, perceived that to avert the maternal storm gathering over his head, he must inspire Madame Danglars with the terror he felt. "'You understand, then, that if it were so,' said he, rising in his turn and approaching the baroness to speak to her in a lower tone. We are lost. This child lives, and someone knows it lives. Someone is in possession of our secret. And since Monte Cristo speaks before us of a child disinterred, when that child could not be found, it is he who is in possession of our secret. Just God, avenging God, murmured Madame Danglars. Villefort's only answer was a stifled groan. "'But the child, the child, sir?' repeated the agitated mother. "'How I have searched for him,' replied Villefort, wringing his hands. "'How I have called him in my long sleepless nights. "'How I have longed for royal wealth to purchase a million of secrets from a million of men, "'and to find mine among them. "'At last, one day, when for the hundredth time I took up my spade, "'I asked myself again and again what the Corsican could have done with the child.' A child encumbers a fugitive. Perhaps, on perceiving it was still alive, he had thrown it into the river. Impossible, cried Madame Danglars. A man may murder another out of revenge, but he would not deliberately drown a child. Perhaps, continued Villefort, he had put it in the foundling hospital. Oh, yes, yes, cried the baroness. My child is there. I ran to the hospital and learned that the same night, the night of the 20th of September, a child had been brought there, 
wrapped in part of a fine linen napkin, purposely torn in half. This portion of the napkin was marked with half a baron's crown and the letter H. Truly, truly, said Madame Danglars, all my linen is marked thus. Monsieur de Nargonne was a baronet, and my name is Hermine. Thank God my child was not then dead. No, it was not dead. And can you tell me so without fearing to make me die of joy? Where is the child? Villefort shrugged his shoulders. Do I know, said he, and do you believe that if I knew, I would relate to you all its trials and all its adventures, as would a dramatist or a novel writer? Alas, no, I know not. A woman, about six months after, came to claim it with the other half of the napkin. This woman gave all the requisite particulars, and it was entrusted to her. But you should have inquired for the woman, you should have traced her. And what do you think I did? I feigned a criminal process and employed all the most acute bloodhounds and skillful agents in search of her. They traced her to Chalon, and there they lost her. They lost her? Yes, forever. Madame Danglars had listened to this recital with a sigh, a tear, or a shriek for every detail. And this is all? said she. And you stopped there? Oh, no, said Villefort. I never ceased to search and to inquire. However, the last two or three years I had allowed myself some respite, but now I will begin with more perseverance and fury than ever, since fear urges me not my conscience. But, replied Madame Danglars, the Count of Monte Cristo can know nothing, or he would not seek out our society as he does. Oh, the wickedness of man is very great, said Villefort, since it surpasses the goodness of God. Did you observe that man's eyes while he was speaking to us? No. But have you ever watched him carefully? Doubtless he is capricious, but that is all. One thing alone struck me of all the exquisite things he placed before us. He touched nothing. I might have suspected he was poisoning us. And you see you would have been deceived. Yes, doubtless. But believe me, that man has other projects. For that reason I wish to see you, to speak to you, to warn you against everyone, but especially against him. Tell me, cried Villefort, fixing his eyes more steadfastly on her than he had ever done before. Did you ever reveal to anyone our connection? Never to anyone. You understand me, replied Villefort affectionately. When I say anyone, pardon my urgency, to anyone living, I mean. Yes, yes, I understand very well, ejaculated the baroness. Never, I swear to you. Were you ever in the habit of writing in the evening what had transpired in the morning? Do you keep a journal? No, my life has been passed in frivolity. I wish to forget it myself. Do you talk in your sleep? I sleep soundly, like a child. Do you not remember? The color mounted to the baroness's face, and Villefort turned awfully pale. It is true, said he, in so low a tone that he could hardly be heard. Well, said the baroness. Well, I understand what I now have to do, replied Villefort. In less than one week from this time, I will ascertain who this Monsieur de Monte Cristo is, whence he comes, where he goes, and why he speaks in our presence of children that have been disinterred in a garden. Villefort pronounced these words with an accent, which would have made the Count shudder had he heard him. Then he pressed the hand the Baroness reluctantly gave him, and led her respectfully back to the door. Madame Danglars returned in another cab to the passage, on the other side of which she found her carriage and her coachman sleeping peacefully on the box while waiting for her. End of chapter 67This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 68 A Summer Ball. The same day, during the interview between Madame Danglars and the procurer, a travelling carriage entered the Rue de Helder, passed through the gateway of number 27, and stopped in the yard. In a moment 
the door was opened, and Madame de Morcerf alighted, leaning on her son's arm. Albert soon left her, ordered his horses, and having arranged his toilette, drove to the Champs-Élysées, to the house of Monte Cristo. The Count received him with his habitual smile. It was a strange thing that no one ever appeared to advance a step in that man's favor. Those who would, as it were, force a passage to his heart, found an impassable barrier. Morcef, who ran towards him with open arms, was chilled as he drew near, in spite of the friendly smile, and simply held out his hand. Monte Cristo shook it coldly, according to his invariable practice. "'Here I am, dear Count. Welcome home again. I arrived an hour since. From Dieppe? No, from Trépour. Indeed.' "'And I have come at once to see you.' "'That is extremely kind of you,' said Monte Cristo, with a tone of perfect indifference. "'And what is the news?' "'You should not ask a stranger, a foreigner, for news.' "'I know it, but in asking for news, I mean, have you done anything for me?' "'Had you commissioned me?' said Monte Cristo, feigning uneasiness. "'Come, come!' said Albert. Do not assume so much indifference. It is said sympathy travels rapidly, and when at Trépour I felt the electric shock, you have either been working for me, or thinking of me. Possibly, said Monte Cristo. I have indeed thought of you, but the magnetic wire I was guiding acted, indeed, without my knowledge. Indeed? Pray tell me how it happened." Willingly. Monsieur Danglars dined with me. I know it. To avoid meeting him, my mother and I left town. But he met here Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Your Italian prince? Not so fast. Monsieur Andrea only calls himself Count. Calls himself, do you say? Yes, calls himself. Is he not a Count? "'What can I know of him? "'He calls himself so. "'I, of course, give him the same title, "'and everyone else does likewise. "'What a strange man you are! "'What next? "'You say Monsieur Danglars dined here?' "'Yes, with Count Cavalcanti, "'the Marquis, his father, "'Madame Danglars, "'Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, "'charming people, "'Monsieur de Bray, "'Maximilien Morel, and Monsieur de Chateau Renault. Did they speak of me? Not a word. So much the worse. Why so? I thought you wished them to forget you. If they did not speak of me, I am sure they thought about me, and I am in despair. How will that affect you, since Mademoiselle Danglas was not among the number here who thought of you? Truly, she might have thought of you at home. I have no fear of that, or... If she did, it was only in the same way in which I think of her. Touching sympathy. So you hate each other? said the Count. Listen, said Morcerf. If Mademoiselle Danglas were disposed to take pity on my supposed martyrdom on her account, and would dispense with all matrimonial formalities between our two families, I am ready to agree to the arrangement. In a word, Mademoiselle Danglars would make a charming mistress— but a wife? Diable! And this, said Monte Cristo, is your opinion of your intended spouse? Yes. It is rather unkind, I acknowledge, but it is true. But as this dream cannot be realized, since Mademoiselle Danglas must become my lawful wife, live perpetually with me, sing to me, compose verses and music within ten paces of me, and that for my whole life it frightens me. One may forsake a mistress, but a wife? Good heavens! There she must always be, and to marry Mademoiselle Danglas would be awful. You are difficult to please, Viscount. Yes, for I often wish for what is impossible. What is that? To find such a wife as my father found. 
Monte Cristo turned pale and looked at Albert while playing with some magnificent pistols. Your father was fortunate then, said he. You know my opinion of my mother, Count. Look at her, still beautiful, witty, more charming than ever. For any other son to have stayed with his mother for four days at Trepour, it would have been a condescension or a martyrdom. Will I return more contented, more peaceful, shall I say more poetic, than if I had taken Queen Mab or Titania as my companion? That is an overwhelming demonstration, and you would make every one vow to live a single life. Such are my reasons for not liking to marry Mademoiselle Danglars. Have you ever noticed how much a thing is heightened in value when we obtain possession of it? The diamond which glittered in the window at Marles or Fossens shines with more splendor when it is our own. But if we are compelled to acknowledge the superiority of another, and still must retain the one that is inferior, do you not know what we have to endure? Worldling, murmured the Count. Thus I shall rejoice when Mademoiselle Eugenie perceives I am but a pitiful atom. With scarcely as many hundred thousand francs as she has millions. Monte Cristo smiled. One plan occurred to me, continued Albert. Franz likes all that is eccentric. I tried to make him fall in love with Mademoiselle Danglas, but in spite of four letters, written in the most alluring style, he invariably answered, My eccentricity may be great, but it will not make me break my promise. That is what I call devoted friendship, to recommend to another whom you would not marry yourself. Albert smiled. Apropos, continued he, Franz is coming soon, but it will not interest you. You dislike him, I think. I? said Monte Cristo. My dear Viscount, how have you discovered that I did not like Monsieur Franz? I like every one. And you include me in the expression every one. Many thanks. Let us not mistake, said Monte Cristo. I love every one as God commands us to love our neighbor, as Christians. But I thoroughly hate but a few. Let us return to Monsieur Franz de Pinay. Did you say he was coming? Yes, summoned by Monsieur de Villefort, who is apparently as anxious to get Mademoiselle Valentine married as Monsieur Danglars is to see Mademoiselle Eugenie settled. It must be a very irksome office to be the father of a grown-up daughter. It seems to make one feverish, and to raise one's pulse to ninety beats a minute until the deed is done. But Monsieur de Pinay, unlike you, bears his misfortune patiently. Still more, he talks seriously about the matter, puts on a white tie, and speaks of his family. He entertains a very high opinion of Monsieur and Madame de Villefort. Which they deserve, do they not? I believe they do. Monsieur de Villefort has always passed for a severe but a just man. There is then one, said Monte Cristo, whom you do not condemn like poor Danglars. Because I am not compelled to marry his daughter, perhaps, replied Albert, laughing. Indeed, my dear sir, said Monte Cristo, you are revoltingly foppish. I, foppish? How do you mean? Yes, pray take a cigar, and cease to defend yourself, and to struggle to escape marrying Mademoiselle Danglars. Let things take their course. Perhaps you may not have to retract. Bah! said Albert, staring. Doubtless, my dear Viscount, you will not be taken by force. And seriously, do you wish to break off your engagement? I would give a hundred thousand francs to be able to do so. Then make yourself quite easy. Monsieur Danglars would give double that sum to attain the same end. Am I indeed so happy? said Albert, who still could not prevent an almost imperceptible cloud passing across his brow. But, my dear Count, has Monsieur Danglars any reason? Ah, there is your proud and selfish nature. You would expose the self-love of another with a hatchet, 
but you shrink if your own is attacked with a needle. But yet Monsieur Danglars appeared delighted with you, was he not? Well, he is a man of bad taste, and is still more enchanted with another. I know not whom. Look and judge for yourself. Thank you. I understand. But my mother— No, not my mother. I mistake. My father intends giving a ball. A ball at this season? Summer balls are fashionable. If they were not, the Countess has only to wish it, and they would become so. You are right. You know they are select affairs. Those who remain in Paris in July must be true Parisians. Will you take charge of our invitation to Messieurs Cavalcanti? When will it take place? On Saturday. Monsieur Cavalcanti's father will be gone. But the son will be here. Will you invite young Monsieur Cavalcanti? I do not know him, Viscount. You do not know him? No, I never saw him until a few days since, and am not responsible for him. But you receive him at your house. That is another thing. He was recommended to me by a good abbe, who may be deceived. Give him a direct invitation, but do not ask me to present him. If he were afterwards to marry Mademoiselle Danglars, you would accuse me of intrigue, and would be challenging me. Besides, I may not be there myself. Where? At your ball. Why should you not be there? Because you have not yet invited me. But I come expressly for that purpose. You are very kind, but I may be prevented. If I tell you one thing, you will be so amiable as to set aside all impediments. Tell me what it is. My mother begs you to come. The Comtesse de Morcerf, said Monte Cristo, starting. Ah, Count, said Albert, I assure you Madame de Morcerf speaks freely to me, and if you have not felt the sympathetic fibres of which I spoke just now thrill within you, you must be entirely devoid of them, for during the last four days we have spoken of no one else. You have talked of me? Yes, that is the penalty of being a living puzzle. Then I am also a puzzle to your mother? I should have thought her too reasonable to be led by imagination. A problem, my dear Count, for every one, for my mother as well as others. Much studied, but not solved, you still remain an enigma. Do not fear. My mother is only astonished that you remain so long unsolved. I believe, while the Countess G takes you for Lord Ruthven, my mother imagines you to be Cagliostro, or the Count St. Germain. The first opportunity you have, confirm her in her opinion. It will be easy for you, as you have the philosophy of the one, and the wit of the other. I thank you for the warning, said the Count. I shall endeavor to be prepared for all suppositions. You will, then, come on Saturday? Yes, since Madame de Morcerf invites me. You are very kind. Will Monsieur Danglas be there? He has already been invited by my father. We shall try to persuade the great d'Aguisseau, Monsieur de Villefort, to come, but have not much hope of seeing him. Never despair of anything, says the proverb. Do you dance, Count? I dance? Yes, you. It would not be astonishing. That is very well before one is over forty. No, I do not dance. But I like to see others do so. Does Madame de Morcerf dance? Never. You can talk to her. She so delights in your conversation. Indeed? Yes, truly. And I assure you, you are the only man of whom I have heard her speak with interest. Albert rose and took his hat. The Count conducted him to the door. I have one thing to reproach myself with, said he, stopping Albert on the steps. What is it? I have spoken to you indiscreetly about Danglars. On the contrary, speak to me always in the same strain about him. I am glad to be reassured on that point. Apropos, when do you expect Monsieur de Epinay? Five or six days hence, at the latest. And when is he to be married? 
immediately on the arrival of Monsieur and Madame de Saint Marin. Bring him to see me. Although you say I do not like him, I assure you I shall be happy to see him. I will obey your orders, my lord. Good-bye. Until Saturday, when I may expect you, may I not? Yes, I promised you. The Count watched Albert, waving his hand to him. When he had mounted his phaeton, Monte Cristo turned, and seeing Bertuccio, "'What news?' said he. "'She went to the palais,' replied the steward. "'Did she stay long there?' "'An hour and a half.' "'Did she return home?' "'Directly.' "'Well, my dear Bertuccio,' said the Count, "'I now advise you to go in quest of the little estate I spoke to you of in Normandy.' Bertuccio bowed and as his wishes were in perfect harmony with the order he had received, he started the same evening. End of chapter 68《This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 69 the inquiry. Monsieur de Villefort kept the promise he had made to Madame Danglars to endeavour to find out how the Count of Monte Cristo had discovered the history of the house at Auteuil. He wrote the same day for the required information to Monsieur de Beauville, who, from having been an inspector of prisons, was promoted to a high office in the police and the latter begged for two days' time to ascertain exactly who would be most likely to give him full particulars. At the end of the second day, M. de Villefort received the following note. The person called the Count of Monte Cristo is an intimate acquaintance of Lord Wilmore, a rich foreigner, who is sometimes seen in Paris, and who is there at this moment, he is also known to the Abbe Busoni, a Sicilian priest, of high repute in the East, where he has done much good. M. de Villefort replied by ordering the strictest inquiries to be made respecting these two persons. His orders were executed, and the following evening he received these details. The Abbe, who was in Paris only for a month, inhabited a small, two-storied house behind Saint-Sulpice. There were two rooms on each floor, and he was the only tenant. The two lower rooms consisted of a dining-room, with a table, chairs, and sideboard of walnut, and a wainscoted parlour, without ornaments, carpet, or timepiece. It was evident that the abbe limited himself to objects of strict necessity. He preferred to use the sitting-room upstairs, which was more library than parlour, and was furnished with theological books and parchments, in which he delighted to bury himself for months at a time, according to his valet de chambre. His valet looked at the visitors through a sort of wicket, and if their faces were unknown to him or displeased him, he replied that the abbe was not in Paris, an answer which satisfied most persons because the abbé was known to be a great traveller. Besides, whether at home or not, whether in Paris or Cairo, the abbé always left something to give away, which the valet distributed through this wicket in his master's name. The other room near the library was a bedroom, a bed without curtains, four armchairs and a couch, covered with yellow Utrecht velvet, composed with a prie dieu all its furniture. Lord Wilmar resided in Rue Fontaine, Saint-Georges. He was one of those English tourists who consume a large fortune in travelling. 
he hired the apartment in which he lived furnished, passed only a few hours in the day there, and rarely slept there. One of his peculiarities was never to speak a word of French, which he, however, wrote with great facility. The day after this important information had been given to the king's attorney, a man alighted from a carriage at the corner of the Rue Ferru, and rapping at an olive-green door, asked if the Abbe Busoni were within. "'No, he went out early this morning,' replied the valet. "'I might not always be content with that answer,' replied the visitor, "'for I come from one to whom everyone must be at home. "'But have the kindness to give the Abbe Busoni. "'I told you he was not at home,' repeated the valet. "'Then on his return give him that card and this sealed paper. "'Will he be home at eight o'clock this evening?' "'Doubtless, unless he is at work.' "'which is the same as if he were out. "'I will come again at that time,' replied the visitor, "'who then retired. "'At the appointed hour the same man returned in the same carriage, "'which, instead of stopping this time, at the end of the Rue Ferru, "'drove up to the green door. "'He knocked, and it opened immediately to admit him. "'From the signs of respect the valet paid him, "'he saw that his note had produced a good effect.' "'Is the abbé at home?' he asked. "'Yes. He is at work in his library. "'But he expects you, sir,' replied the valet. "'The stranger ascended a rough staircase, "'and before a table, illumined by a lamp "'whose light was concentrated by a large shade "'while the rest of the apartment was in partial darkness, "'he perceived the abbé in a monk's dress, "'with a cowl on his head, "'such as was used by learned men of the Middle Ages.' "'Have I the honour of addressing the Abbe Busoni? asked the visitor. "'Yes, sir,' replied the Abbe. "'And you are the person whom Monsieur de Beauville, formerly an inspector of prisons, sends to me from the Prefect of Police?' "'Exactly, sir.' "'One of the agents appointed to secure the safety of Paris?' "'Yes, sir,' replied the stranger, with a slight hesitation and blushing. The Abbe replaced the large spectacles— which covered not only his eyes, but his temples, and sitting down motioned to his visitor to do the same. "'I am at your service, sir,' said the abbé, with a marked Italian accent. "'The mission with which I am charged, sir,' replied the visitor, speaking with hesitation, "'is a confidential one on the part of him who fulfills it, and him by whom he is employed.' The abbé bowed. "'Your probity,' replied the stranger, is so well known to the prefect that he wishes as a magistrate to ascertain from you some particulars connected with the public safety, to ascertain which I am deputed to see you. It is hoped that no ties of friendship or humane consideration will induce you to conceal the truth. Provided, sir, the particulars you wish for do not interfere with my scruples or my conscience, I am a priest, sir, and the secrets of confession, for instance, must remain between me and God, and not between me and human justice. Do not alarm yourself, monsieur. We will duly respect your conscience. At this moment the abbe pressed down his side of the shade, and so raised it on the other, throwing a bright light on the stranger's face, while his own remained obscured. Excuse me, abbe said the envoy of the prefect of the police, but the light tries my eyes very much. The abbé lowered the shade. Now, sir, I am listening. Go on. I will come at once to the point. Do you know the Count of Monte Cristo? You mean Monsieur Zaccone, I presume. Zaccone? Is not his name Monte Cristo? Monte Cristo is the name of an estate, or rather of a rock, and not a family name. Well, be it so, let us not dispute about words, and since Monsieur de Monte Cristo and Monsieur Zaccone are the same, absolutely the same, let us speak of Monsieur Zaccone. Agreed. I asked you if you knew him? Extremely well. Who is he? The son of a rich shipbuilder in Malta. 
I know that is the report, but as you are aware, the police does not content itself with vague reports. However, replied the abbe, with an affable smile, when that report is in accordance with the truth, everybody must believe it, the police as well as all the rest. Are you sure of what you assert? What do you mean by that question? Understand, sir, I do not in the least suspect your veracity. I ask if you are certain of it. I knew his father, Monsieur Zaccone. Ah, indeed? And when a child, I often played with the son in the timber yard. But whence does he derive the title of Count? You are aware that may be bought. In Italy? Everywhere. And his immense riches, whence does he procure them? They may not be so very great. How much do you suppose he possesses? From one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand livres per annum. That is reasonable, said the visitor. I have heard he had three or four millions. Two hundred thousand per annum would make four millions of capital. But I was told he had four millions per annum. That is not probable. Do you know this island of Monte Cristo? Certainly. Every one who has come from Palermo, Naples, or Rome to France by sea must know it, since he has passed close to it and must have seen it. I'm told it is a delightful place. It is a rock. And why has the Count bought a rock? For the sake of being a Count. In Italy, one must have territorial possessions to be a Count. You have doubtless heard the adventures of Monsieur Zaccone's youth. The fathers? No, the sons. I know nothing certain. At that period of his life, I lost sight of my young comrade. Was he in the wars? I think he entered the service. In what branch? In the navy. Are you not his confessor? No, sir. I believe he is a Lutheran. A Lutheran? I say, I believe such is the case. I do not affirm it. Besides, liberty of conscience is established in France. Doubtless, and we are not now inquiring into his creed, but his actions. In the name of the prefect of police, I ask you what you know of him. He passes for a very charitable man. Our Holy Father, the Pope, has made him a knight of Jesus Christ for the services he rendered to the Christians in the East. He has five or six rings as testimonials from Eastern monarchs of his services. Does he wear them? No, but he is proud of them. He is better pleased with rewards given to the benefactors of man than to his destroyers. He is a Quaker, then? Exactly. He is a Quaker, with the exception of the peculiar dress. Has he any friends? Yes, every one who knows him is his friend. But has he any enemies? One only. What is his name? Lord Wilmore. Where is he? He is in Paris just now. Can he give me any particulars? Important ones. He was in India with Sacone. Do you know his abode? It's somewhere in the Chaussee d'Antin, but I know neither the street nor the number. Are you at variance with the Englishman? I love Zaccone, and he hates him. We are consequently not friends. Do you think the Count of Monte Cristo had ever been in France before he made this visit to Paris? To that question I can answer positively. No, sir, he had not, because he applied to me six months ago for the particulars he required, and as I did not know when I might again come to Paris, I recommended Monsieur Cavalcanti to him. Andrea? No, Bartolomeo, his father. Now, sir, I have but one question more to ask, and I charge you, in the name of honor, of humanity, and of religion, to answer me candidly. What is it, sir? Do you know with what design Monsieur de Monte Cristo purchased a house at Auteuil? Certainly, for he told me. What is it, sir? To make a lunatic asylum of it, similar to that founded by the Count of Pisani at Palermo. Do you know about that institution? I have heard of it. 
it is a magnificent charity. Having said this, the abbe bowed to imply he wished to pursue his studies. The visitor either understood the abbe's meaning, or had no more questions to ask. He arose, and the abbe accompanied him to the door. "'You are a great alms-giver,' said the visitor, "'and although you are said to be rich, I will venture to offer you something for your poor people. Will you accept my offering?' "'I thank you, sir. I am only jealous in one thing, and that is that the relief I give should be entirely from my own resources. However, my resolution, sir, is unchangeable. But you have only to search for yourself, and you will find, alas, but too many objects upon whom to exercise your benevolence. The abbe once more bowed as he opened the door. The stranger bowed and took his leave, and the carriage conveyed him straight to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. An hour afterwards the carriage was again ordered, and this time it went to the Rue Fontaine Saint Georges, and stopped at number five, where Lord Wilmore lived. The stranger had written to Lord Wilmore, requesting an interview, which the latter had fixed for ten o'clock. As the envoy of the prefect of police arrived ten minutes before ten, he was told that Lord Wilmore, who was precision and punctuality personified, was not yet come in, but that he would be sure to return as the clock struck. The visitor was introduced into the drawing-room, which was like all other furnished drawing-rooms, a mantelpiece with two modern Sevres vases, a timepiece representing Cupid with his bent bow, a mirror with an engraving on each side, one representing Homer carrying his guide, the other Belisarius begging, a greyish paper, red and black tapestry, such was the appearance of Lord Wilmore's drawing-room. It was illuminated by lamps with ground-glass shades, which gave only a feeble light, as if out of consideration for the envoy's weak sight. After ten minutes' expectation, the clock struck ten. At the fifth stroke the door opened, and Lord Wilmore appeared. He was rather above the middle height, with thin reddish whiskers, light complexion, and light hair, turning rather grey. He was dressed with all the English peculiarity, namely in a blue coat with gilt buttons and high collar, in the fashion of 1811, a white kersimere waistcoat, and nankeen pantaloons three inches too short, but which were prevented by straps from slipping up to the knee. His first remark on entering was, "'You know, sir, I do not speak French.' "'I know you do not like to converse in our language,' replied the envoy. "'But you may use it,' replied Lord Wilmore. "'I understand it.' "'And I,' replied the visitor, changing his idiom, "'know enough of English to keep up the conversation. "'Do not put yourself to the slightest inconvenience.' "'Ah,' said Lord Wilmore, "'with that tone which is only known to natives of Great Britain.' The envoy presented his letter of introduction, which the latter read with English coolness, and having finished, "'I understand,' said he, "'perfectly.' Then began the questions, which were similar to those which had been addressed to the Abbe Bussonnet, but as Lord Wilmore, in the character of the Count's enemy, was less restrained in his answers, they were more numerous. He described the youth of Monte Cristo, who, he said, at ten years of age, entered the service of one of the petty sovereigns of India, who make war on the English. It was there Wilmore had first met him and fought against him, and in that war Zucone had been taken prisoner, sent to England, and consigned to the hulks, whence he had escaped by swimming. Then began his travels, his duels, his caprices. Then the insurrection in Greece broke out and he had served in the Grecian ranks. While in that service he had discovered a silver mine in the mountains of Thessaly, but he had been careful to conceal it from every one. After the battle of Navarino, when the Greek government was consolidated, he asked of King Otho a mining grant for that district, which was given him. Hence that immense fortune, which, in Lord Wilmore's opinion, 
possibly amounted to one or two millions per annum, a precarious fortune which might be momentarily lost by the failure of the mine. But, asked the visitor, do you know why he came to France? He is speculating in railways, said Lord Wilmore, and as he is an expert chemist and physicist, he has invented a new system of telegraphy, which he is seeking to bring to perfection. How much does he spend yearly? asked the prefect. Not more than five or six hundred thousand francs, said Lord Wilmore. He is a miser. Hatred evidently inspired the Englishman, who, knowing no other reproach to bring on the count, accused him of avarice. "'Do you know his house at O'Toole?' "'Certainly.' "'What do you know respecting it?' "'Do you wish to know why he bought it?' "'Yes.' "'The Count is a speculator, who will certainly ruin himself in experiments. He supposes there is in the neighbourhood of the house he has bought a mineral spring equal to those at Bagneres, Lucon, and Cotteret. He is going to turn his house into a bought house, as the Germans term it, he has already dug up all the garden two or three times to find the famous spring, and, being unsuccessful, he will soon purchase all the contiguous houses. Now, as I dislike him, and hope his railway, his electric telegraph, or his search for baths will ruin him, I am watching for his discomfiture, which must soon take place. What was the cause of your quarrel? When he was in England— he seduced the wife of one of my friends. Why do you not seek revenge? I have already fought three duels with him, said the Englishman, the first with the pistol, the second with the sword, and the third with the sabre. And what was the result of those duels? The first time he broke my arm, the second he wounded me in the breast, and the third time made this large wound. The Englishman turned down his shirt-collar, and showed a scar whose redness proved to be a recent one. So that, you see, there is a deadly feud between us. But, said the envoy, you do not go about it in the right way to kill him, if I understand you correctly. Ah, said the Englishman, I practice shooting every day, and every other day Grisier comes to my house. This was all the visitor wished to ascertain, or rather, all the Englishmen appeared to know. The agent arose, and having bowed to Lord Wilmore, who returned his salutation, with the stiff politeness of the English, he retired. Lord Wilmore, having heard the door close after him, returned to his bedroom, where with one hand he pulled off his light hair, his red whiskers, his false jaw, and his wound, to resume the black hair, dark complexion, and pearly teeth of the Count of Monte Cristo. It was Monsieur de Villefort, and not the prefect, who returned to the house of Monsieur de Villefort. The procurer felt more at ease, although he had learned nothing really satisfactory, and, for the first time since the dinner party at O'Toole, he slept soundly. End of chapter sixty nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 70 the ball. It was in the warmest days of July, when in due course of time the Saturday arrived upon which the ball was to take place at Monsieur de Morcerf's. It was ten o'clock at night. The branches of the great trees in the garden of the Count's house stood out boldly against the azure canopy of heaven, which was studded with golden stars, but where the last fleeting clouds of a vanishing storm yet lingered. From the apartments on the ground floor might be heard the sound of music, 
with the whirl of the waltz and gallop, while brilliant streams of light shone through the openings of the Venetian blinds. At this moment the garden was only occupied by about ten servants, who had just received orders from their mistress to prepare the supper, the serenity of the weather continuing to increase. Until now it had been undecided whether the supper should take place in the dining-room or under a long tent erected on the lawn, but the beautiful blue sky, studded with stars, had settled the question in favour of the lawn. The gardens were illuminated with coloured lanterns, according to the Italian custom, and as is usual in countries where the luxuries of the table, the rarest of all luxuries in their complete form, are well understood, the supper-table was loaded with wax lights and flowers. At the time the Countess of Morcerf returned to the rooms, after giving her orders, many guests were arriving, more attracted by the charming hospitality of the Countess than by the distinguished position of the Count. For, owing to the good taste of Mercedes, one was sure of finding some devices at her entertainment worthy of describing, or even copying, in case of need. Madame d'Anglas, in whom the events we have related had caused deep anxiety, had hesitated about going to Madame de Morcerf's, when during the morning her carriage happened to meet that of Villefort. The latter made a sign, and when the carriages had drawn close together, said, "'You are going to Madame de Morcerf's, are you not?' "'No,' replied Madame d'Anglas. "'I am too ill.' "'You are wrong,' replied Villefort significantly. "'It is important that you should be seen there.' "'Do you think so?' asked the baroness. "'I do.' "'In that case I will go.' And the two carriages passed on towards their different destinations. Madame d'Anglas therefore came, not only beautiful in person, but radiant with splendour. She entered by one door, at the time when Mercedes appeared at the door. The countess took Albert to meet Madame d'Anglas. He approached, paid her some well-merited compliments on her toilette, and offered his arm to conduct her to a seat. Albert looked around him. "'You are looking for my daughter,' said the baroness, smiling. "'I confess it,' replied Albert. "'Could you have been so cruel as not to bring her?' "'Calm yourself. She has met Mademoiselle de Villefort, and has taken her arm. See, they are following us, both in white dresses, one with a bouquet of camellias, the other with one of my osotis. But tell me, well, what do you wish to know? Will not the Count of Monte Cristo be here tonight? Seventeen, replied Albert. What do you mean? I only mean that the Count seems the rage, replied the Viscount, smiling, and that you are the seventeenth person that has asked me the same question. The Count is in fashion. I congratulate him upon it. And have you replied to every one as you have to me? Ah, to be sure, I have not answered you. Be satisfied. We shall have this lion. We are among the privileged ones. Were you at the opera yesterday? No. He was there. Ah, indeed. And did the eccentric person commit any new originality? Can he be seen without doing so? Elsler was dancing the Diable Boiteau. The Greek princess was in ecstasies. After the cachucha, he placed a magnificent ring on the stem of a bouquet, and threw it to the charming danseuse, who, in the third act, to do honour to the gift, reappeared with it on her finger. And the Greek princess, will she be here? No, you will be deprived of that pleasure. Her position in the Count's establishment is not sufficiently understood. Wait, leave me here, and go and speak to Madame de Villefort, who is trying to attract your attention. Albert bowed to Madame d'Anglas, and advanced towards Madame de Villefort, whose lips opened as he approached. "'I wager anything,' said Albert, interrupting her, "'that I know what you are about to say. "'Well, what is it? "'If I guess rightly, will you confess it? "'Yes. "'On your honour? "'On my honour. "'You were going to ask me if the Count of Monte Cristo had arrived, "'or was expected. "'Not at all. 
"'It is not of him that I am now thinking. "'I was going to ask you if you had received any news of Monsieur Franz. "'Yes, yesterday. "'What did he tell you? "'That he was leaving at the same time as his letter. "'Well, now, then. "'The Count? "'The Count will come. "'Of that you may be satisfied. "'You know that he has another name besides Monte Cristo? "'No, I did not know it. "'Monte Cristo is the name of an island.' "'and he has a family name. "'I never heard it. "'Well, then, I am better informed than you. "'His name is Zaccone. "'It is possible. "'He is a Maltese. "'That is also possible. "'The son of a ship-owner. "'Really, you should relate all this aloud. "'You would have the greatest success. "'He served in India, "'discovered a mine in Thessaly, "'and comes to Paris to establish a mineral water cure at Otul. "'Well, I'm sure,' said Morcerf. "'This is indeed news. "'Am I allowed to repeat it?' "'Yes, but cautiously. "'Tell one thing at a time, "'and do not say I told you. "'Why so? "'Because it is a secret just discovered. "'By whom? "'The police. "'Then the news originated. "'At the prefect's last night. "'Paris, you can understand, "'is astonished at the sight of such unusual splendor.' and the police have made inquiries. Well, well, nothing more is wanting than to arrest the Count as a vagabond on the pretext of his being too rich. Indeed, that doubtless would have happened if his credentials had not been so favourable. Poor Count! And is he aware of the danger he has been in? I think not. Then it will be but charitable to inform him. When he arrives I will not fail to do so. Just then, a handsome young man, with bright eyes, black hair, and glossy moustache, respectfully bowed to Madame de Villefort. Albert extended his hand. "'Madame,' said Albert, "'allow me to present to you Monsieur Maximilien Morel, captain of Spahis, one of our best, and above all, of our bravest officers.' "'I have already had the pleasure of meeting this gentleman at Auteuil, "'At the house of the Count of Monte Cristo,' replied Madame de Villefort, "'turning away with marked coldness of manner. "'This answer, and especially the tone in which it was uttered, "'chilled the heart of poor Morel. "'But a recompense was in store for him. "'Turning around, he saw near the door a beautiful fair face, "'whose large blue eyes were, without any marked expression, "'fixed upon him.' while the bouquet of myosotis was gently raised to her lips. The salutation was so well understood that Morel, with the same expression in his eyes, placed the handkerchief to his mouth, and these two living statues, whose hearts beat so violently under their marble aspect, separated from each other by the whole length of the room, forgot themselves for a moment, or rather forgot the world in their mutual contemplation. They might have remained much longer lost in one another, without any one noticing their abstraction. The Count of Monte Cristo had just entered. We have already said that there was something in the Count which attracted universal attention wherever he appeared. It was not the coat, unexceptional in its cut, though simple and unornamented. It was not the plain white waistcoat. It was not the trousers. "'that displayed the foot so perfectly formed. "'It was none of these things that attracted the attention. "'It was his pale complexion, his waving black hair, "'his calm and serene expression, "'his dark and melancholy eye, "'his mouth, chiseled with such marvellous delicacy, "'which so easily expressed such high disdain. "'These were what fixed the attention of all upon him.' Many men might have been handsomer, but certainly there could be none whose appearance was more significant, if the expression may be used. Everything about the Count seemed to have its meaning, for the constant habit of thought which he had acquired had given an ease and vigour to the expression of his face, and even to the most trifling gesture scarcely to be understood. Yet the Parisian world is so strange— that even all this might not have won attention, had there not been connected with it a mysterious story, gilded by an immense fortune. 
Meanwhile, he advanced through the assemblage of guests under a battery of curious glances towards Madame de Morcerf, who, standing before a mantelpiece ornamented with flowers, had seen his entrance in a looking-glass placed opposite the door, and was prepared to receive him. She turned towards him with a serene smile just at the moment he was bowing to her. No doubt she fancied the Count would speak to her, while on his side the Count thought she was about to address him, but both remained silent, and after a mere bow Monte Cristo directed his steps to Albert, who received him cordially. "'Have you seen my mother?' asked Albert. "'I have just had the pleasure,' replied the Count, "'but I have not seen your father. "'See, he is down there, "'talking politics with that little group of great geniuses. "'Indeed,' said Monte Cristo, "'and so those gentlemen down there are men of great talent? "'I should not have guessed it. "'And for what kind of talent are they celebrated? "'You know there are different sorts.' "'That tall, harsh-looking man is very learned. "'He discovered in the neighborhood of Rome "'a kind of lizard with a vertebra, "'more than lizards usually have, "'and he immediately laid his discovery before the Institute. "'The thing was discussed for a long time, "'but finally decided in his favor. "'I can assure you that the vertebra "'made a great noise in the learned world, "'and the gentleman, who was only a knight of the Legion of Honor, "'was made an officer.' Come, said Monte Cristo, this cross seems to me to be wisely awarded. I suppose, had he found another additional vertebra, they would have made him a commander? Very likely, said Albert. And who can that person be who has taken it into his head to wrap himself up in a blue coat embroidered with green? Oh, that coat is not his own idea. It is the Republic's which deputed David to devise a uniform for the academicians. Indeed, said Monte Cristo, so this gentleman is an academician? Within the last week he has been made one of the learned assembly. And what is his especial talent? His talent? I believe he thrusts pins through the head of rabbits. He makes fowls eat matter, and punches the spinal marrow out of dogs with whalebone and he is made a member of the Academy of Sciences for this. No, of the French Academy. But what has the French Academy to do with all this? I was going to tell you. It seems that his experiments have very considerably advanced the cause of science, doubtless. No, that his style of writing is very good. This must be very flattering to the feelings of the rabbits, into whose heads he has thrust pins, to the fowls whose bones he has dyed red, and to the dogs whose spinal marrow he has punched out. Albert laughed. And the other one? demanded the Count. That one? Yes, the third. The one in the dark blue coat? Yes. He is a colleague of the Count, and one of the most active opponents to the idea of providing the Chamber of Peers with a uniform. He was very successful upon that question. He stood badly with the liberal papers, but his noble opposition to the wishes of the court is now getting him into favor with the journalists. They talk of making him an ambassador. And what are his claims to the peerage? He has composed two or three comic operas, written four or five articles in the sequel, and voted five or six years on the ministerial side. Bravo, Viscount, said Monte Cristo, smiling. "'You are a delightful Sicarone. "'And now you will do me a favor, will you not?' "'What is it? "'Do not introduce me to any of these gentlemen, "'and should they wish it, you will warn me.' "'Just then the Count felt his arm pressed. "'He turned round. "'It was Danglas. "'Ah, is it you, Baron?' said he. "'Why do you call me Baron?' said Danglas. "'You know that I care nothing for my title. "'I am not like you, Viscount.' "'You like your title, do you not?' "'Certainly,' replied Albert. "'Seeing that without my title I should be nothing, "'while you, sacrificing the baron, "'would still remain the millionaire. "'Which seems to me the finest title "'under the royalty of July,' replied Danglas. "'Unfortunately,' said Monte Cristo, "'one's title to a millionaire does not last for life. "'Like that of baron, peer of France, or academician,' 
for example the millionaires Frank and Pullman, of Frankfurt, who have just become bankrupts. Indeed? said Danglars, becoming pale. Yes, I received the news this evening by courier. I had a million in their hands, but, warned in time, I withdrew it a month ago. Ah, mon Dieu! exclaimed Danglars, they have drawn on me for two hundred thousand francs. Well, you can throw out the draft. Their signature is worth five per cent. Yes, but it is too late, said Danglars. I have honored their bills. Then, said Monte Cristo, here are two hundred thousand francs gone after. Hush! Do not mention these things, said Danglars. Then, approaching Monte Cristo, he added, especially before young Monsieur Cavalcanti, after which he smiled and turned towards the young man in question. Albert had left the Count to speak to his mother, Danglars to converse with young Cavalcanti. Monte Cristo was for an instant alone. Meanwhile, the heat became excessive. Footmen were hastening through the rooms with waiters loaded with ices. Monte Cristo wiped the perspiration from his forehead, but drew back when the waiter was presented to him. He took no refreshment. Madame de Morcerf did not lose sight of Monte Cristo. She saw that he took nothing, and even noticed his gesture of refusal. Albert, she asked, did you notice that? What, mother? That the Count has never been willing to partake of food under the roof of Monsieur de Morcerf. Yes, but then he breakfasted with me. Indeed, he made his first appearance in the world on that occasion. But your house is not Monsieur de Morcerf's, murmured Mercedes. And since he has been here, I have watched him. Well, well, he has taken nothing yet. The Count is very temperate. Mercedes smiled sadly. Approach him, said she, and when the next waiter passes, insist upon his taking something. But why, mother? Just to please me, Albert, said Mercedes. Albert kissed his mother's hand and drew near the Count. Another salver passed, loaded like the preceding ones. She saw Albert attempt to persuade the Count, but he obstinately refused. Albert rejoined his mother. She was very pale. Well, said she, you see he refuses. Yes, but why need this annoy you? You know, Albert, women are singular creatures. I should like to have seen the Count take something in my house, if only an ice. Perhaps he cannot reconcile himself to the French style of living, and might prefer something else. Oh, no! I have seen him eat of everything in Italy. No doubt he does not feel inclined this evening. And besides, said the Countess, accustomed as he is to burning climates, possibly he does not feel the heat as we do. I do not think that, for he has complained of feeling almost suffocated, and asked why the Venetian blinds were not opened as well as the windows. In a word, said Mercedes, it was a way of assuring me that his abstinence was intended. And she left the room. A minute afterwards the blinds were thrown open, and through the jessamine and clematis that overhung the window, one could see the garden ornamented with lanterns, and the supper laid under the tent. Dancers, players, talkers, all uttered an exclamation of joy, Every one inhaled with delight the breeze that floated in. At the same time, Mercedes reappeared, paler than before, but with that imperturbable expression of countenance which she sometimes wore. She went straight to the group of which her husband formed the center. Do not detain those gentlemen here, Count, she said. They would prefer, I should think, to breathe in the garden rather than suffocate here, since they are not playing. Ah, said a gallant old general, who in 1809 had sung Partant pour la Syrie, we will not go alone to the garden. Then, said Mercedes, I will lead the way. Turning towards Monte Cristo, she added, Count, will you oblige me with your arm? The Count almost staggered at these simple words. Then he fixed his eyes on Mercedes. It was only a momentary glance but it seemed to the Countess to have lasted for a century. So much was expressed in that one look. He offered his arm to the Countess. She took it, or rather just touched it with her little hand, 
and they together descended the steps, lined with rhododendrons and camellias. Behind them, by another outlet, a group of about twenty persons rushed into the garden with loud exclamations of delight. End of chapter 70 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Chris the Girl. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 71 Bread and Salt. Madame de Marcelf entered an archway of trees with her companion. It led through a grove of lindens to a conservatory. It was too warm in the room, was it not, Count? she asked. Yes, madame, and it was an excellent idea of yours to open the doors and the blinds. As he ceased speaking, the Count felt the hand of Mercedes tremble. But you, he said, with that light dress and without anything to cover you but that gauze scarf, perhaps you feel cold? Do you know where I'm leading you? said the Countess, without replying to the question. No, madame, replied Monte Cristo. But you see, I make no resistance. We are going to the greenhouse that you see at the other end of the grove. The Count looked at Mercedes, as if to interrogate her, but she continued to walk on in silence, and he refrained from speaking. They reached the building, ornamented with magnificent fruits, which ripen at the beginning of July in the artificial temperature which takes the place of the sun, so frequently absent in our climate. The Countess left the arm of Monte Cristo, and gathered a bunch of muscatel grapes. "'See, Count,' she said, with a smile so sad in its expression that one could almost detect the tears on her eyelids. "'See, our French grapes are not to be compared, I know, with yours of Sicily and Cyprus. But you will make allowance for our northern son.' The Count bowed, but stepped back. "'Do you refuse?' said Mercedes in a tremulous voice. "'Pray excuse me, madame,' replied Monte Cristo but I never eat muscatel grapes. Mercedes let them fall and sighed. A magnificent peach was hanging against an adjoining wall, ripened by the same artificial heat. Mercedes drew near and plucked the fruit. Take this peach, then, she said. The Count again refused. What, again? she exclaimed, in so plaintive an accent that it seemed to stifle a sob. Really, you pain me. A long silence followed. The peach, like the grapes, fell to the ground. Count, added Mercedes with a supplicating glance, there is a beautiful Arabian custom which makes eternal friends of those who have together eaten bread and salt under the same roof. I know it, madame, replied the Count, but we are in France and not in Arabia, and in France eternal friendships are as rare as the custom of dividing bread and salt with one another. But, said the Countess, breathlessly, with her eyes fixed on Monte Cristo, whose arm she convulsively pressed with both hands, we are friends, are we not? The Count became pale as death, the blood rushed to his heart, and then again, rising, dyed his cheeks with crimson, his eyes swam like those of a man suddenly dazzled. Certainly we are friends, he replied. Why should we not be? The answer was so little like the one Mercedes desired that she turned away to give vent to a sigh, which sounded more like a groan. "'Thank you,' she said. And they walked on again. They went the whole length of the garden without uttering a word. "'Sir,' suddenly exclaimed the Countess, after their walk had continued ten minutes in silence, "'is it true that you have seen so much, travelled so far, and suffered so deeply?' "'I have suffered deeply, madame.' answered Monte Cristo. But now you are happy? Doubtless, replied the Count, since no one hears me complain. And your present happiness, has it softened your heart? My present happiness equals my past misery, said the Count. Are you not married? asked the Countess. I? Married? exclaimed Monte Cristo, shuddering. Who could have told you so? No one told me you were but you have frequently been seen at the opera with a young and lovely woman. She is a slave, whom I bought at Constantinople, madame, the daughter of a prince. 
I have adopted her as my daughter, having no one else to love in the world. You live alone, then? I do. You have no sister? No son? No father? I have no one. How can you exist thus without any one to attach you to life? It is not my fault, madame. At Malta I loved a young girl, was on the point of marrying her, when war came and carried me away. I thought she loved me well enough to wait for me, and even to remain faithful to my memory. When I returned, she was married. This is the history of most men who have passed twenty years of age. Perhaps my heart was weaker than the hearts of most men, and I suffered more than they would have done in my place. That is all. The Countess stopped for a moment, as if gasping for breath. Yes, she said, and you have still preserved this love in your heart. One can only love once. And did you ever see her again? Never. Never? I never returned to the country where she lived. To Malta? Yes, Malta. She is, then, now at Malta? I think so. And have you forgiven her for all she has made you suffer? Her, yes. But only her. Do you then still hate those who separated you? I hate them? Not at all. Why should I? The Countess placed herself before Monte Cristo, still holding in her hand a portion of the perfumed grapes. Take some, she said. Madame, I never eat muscatel grapes, replied Monte Cristo, as if the subject had not been mentioned before. The Countess dashed the grapes into the nearest thicket, with a gesture of despair. Inflexible man, she murmured. Monte Cristo remained as unmoved as if the reproach had not been addressed to him. Albert at this moment ran in. Oh, mother, he exclaimed, such a misfortune has happened. What? What has happened? asked the Countess, as though awakening from a sleep to the realities of life. Did you say a misfortune? Indeed. I should expect misfortunes. Monsieur de Villefort is here. Well? He comes to fetch his wife and daughter. Why so? Because Madame de saint Mahon is just arrived in Paris, bringing the news of Monsieur de saint Mahon's death, which took place on the first stage after he left Marseille. Madame de Villefort, who is in very good spirits, would neither believe nor think of the misfortune, but Mademoiselle Valentine, at the first words, guessed the whole truth, notwithstanding all the precautions of her father. The blow struck her like a thunderbolt, and she fell senseless. "'And how was Monsieur de saint Mahon related to Mademoiselle de Villefort?' said the Count. "'He was her grandfather on the mother's side. He was coming here to hasten her marriage with Franz.' "'Ah, indeed. So Franz must wait.' Why was not Monsieur de saint Mahon also grandfather to Mademoiselle Danglars? Albert, Albert, said Madame de Morcerf, in a tone of mild reproof. What are you saying? Ah, Count, he esteems you so highly. Tell him that he has spoken amiss. And she took two or three steps forward. Monte Cristo watched her with an air so thoughtful and so full of affectionate admiration that she turned back and grasped his hand. At the same time, she seized that of her son and joined them together. "'We are friends, are we not?' she asked. "'Oh, madame, I do not presume to call myself your friend, but at all times I am your most respectful servant.' The countess left with an indescribable pang in her heart, and before she had taken ten steps, the count saw her raise her handkerchief to her eyes. "'Do not my mother and you agree?' asked Albert, astonished. On the contrary, replied the Count, did you not hear her declare that we were friends? They re-entered the drawing-room, which Valentine and Madame de Villefort had just quitted. It is perhaps needless to add that Morel departed almost at the same time. End of chapter 71 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Joe Burbage from London, UK, in October 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 72 Madame de Saint Marin. A gloomy scene had indeed just passed at the house of Monsieur de Villefort. After the ladies had departed for the ball, whither all the entreaties of Madame de Villefort 
had failed in persuading him to accompany them. The procureur had shut himself up in his study, according to his custom, with a heap of papers calculated to alarm anyone else, but which generally scarcely satisfied his inordinate desires. But this time the papers were a mere matter of form. Villefort had secluded himself, not to study, but to reflect, and with the door locked and orders given that he should not be disturbed excepting for important business, he sat down in his armchair and began to ponder over the events, the remembrance of which had, during the last eight days, filled his mind with so many gloomy thoughts and bitter recollections. Then, instead of plunging into the mass of documents piled before him, he opened the drawer of his desk, touched the spring, and drew out a parcel of cherished memoranda, amongst which he had carefully arranged, in characters only known to himself, the names of all those who, either in his political career, in money matters, at the bar, or in his mysterious love affairs, had become his enemies. Their number was formidable, now that he had begun to fear, and yet these names, powerful though they were, had often caused him to smile with the same kind of satisfaction experienced by a traveller who, from the summit of a mountain, beholds at his feet the craggy eminences, the almost impassable paths, and the fearful chasms through which he has so perilously climbed. When he had run over all these names in his memory, again read and studied them, commenting meanwhile upon his lists, he shook his head. No, he murmured, none of my enemies would have waited so patiently and laboriously for so long a space of time that they might now come and crush me with this secret. Sometimes, as Hamlet says, foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelmed them to men's eyes. But, like a phosphoric light, they rise but to mislead. The story has been told by the Corsican to some priest, who, in his turn, has repeated it. Monsieur de Monte Cristo may have heard it, and, to enlighten himself, but why should he wish to enlighten himself upon the subject? asked Villefort, after a moment's reflection. What interest can this Monsieur de Monte Cristo, or Monsieur Zaccone, son of a shipowner of Malta, discoverer of a mine in Thessaly, now visiting Paris for the first time, what interest, I say, can he take in discovering a gloomy, mysterious, and useless fact like this? However, among all the incoherent details given to me by the Abbe Bussini and by Lord Wilmore, by that friend and that enemy, one thing appears certain and clear in my opinion, that in no period, in no case, in no circumstance, could there have been any contact between him and me. But Villefort uttered words which even he himself did not believe. He dreaded not so much the revelation, for he could reply to or deny its truth. He cared little for that mene, tekel, ufarsin, which appeared suddenly in letters of blood upon the wall. But what he was really anxious for was to discover whose hand had traced them. While he was endeavouring to calm his fears, and instead of dwelling upon the political future that had so often been the subject of his ambitious dreams, was imagining a future limited to the enjoyments of home, in fear of awakening the enemy that had so long slept. The noise of a carriage sounded in the yard. Then he heard the steps of an aged person ascending the stairs, followed by tears and lamentations, such as servants always give vent to when they wish to appear interested in their master's grief. He drew back the bolt of his door, and almost directly an old lady entered, unannounced, carrying her shawl on her arm and her bonnet in her hand. The white hair was thrown back from her yellow forehead, and her eyes, already sunken by the furrows of age, now almost disappeared beneath the eyelids, swollen with grief. "'Oh, sir,' she said, "'oh, sir, what a misfortune! I shall die of it! Oh, yes, I shall certainly die of it!' And then, falling upon the chair nearest the door, she burst into a paroxysm of sobs. The servants, standing in the doorway, 
Not daring to approach nearer, were looking at Noirtier's old servant, who had heard the noise from his master's room, and run there also, remaining behind the others. Villefort rose, and ran towards his mother-in-law, for it was she. "'Why, what can have happened?' he exclaimed. "'What has thus disturbed you? Is Monsieur de saint with you?' Monsieur de saint is dead, answered the old marchioness. Without preface and without expression, she appeared to be stupefied. Villefort drew back, and clasping his hands together, exclaimed, Dead? So suddenly? A week ago, continued Madame de saint we went out together in the carriage after dinner. Monsieur de saint had been unwell for some days. Still, the idea of seeing our dear Valentine again inspired him with courage, and notwithstanding his illness, he would leave. At six leagues from Marseilles, after having eaten some of the lozenges he is accustomed to take, he fell into such a deep sleep that it appeared to me unnatural. Still, I hesitated to wake him, although I fancied that his face was flushed and that the veins of his temples throbbed more violently than usual. However, as it became dark, and I could no longer see, I fell asleep. I was soon aroused by a piercing shriek, as from a person suffering in his dreams, and he suddenly threw his head back violently. I called the valet, I stopped the postillion, I spoke to Monsieur de saint I applied my smelling salts, but all was over, and I arrived at X by the side of a corpse. Villefort stood with his mouth, half open, quite stupefied. Of course, you sent for a doctor. Immediately, but, as I have told you, it was too late. Yes, but then he could tell of what complaint the poor Marquise had died. Oh yes, sir, he told me. It appears to have been an apoplectic stroke. And what did you do then? Monsieur de saint Marin had always expressed a desire, in case his death happened during his absence from Paris, that his body might be brought to the family vault. I had him put into a lead coffin, and I am preceding him by a few days. Oh, my poor mother, said Villefort, to have such duties to perform at your age, after such a blow. God has supported me through all, and then, my dear Marquise, he would certainly have done everything for me that I performed for him. It is true that since I left him, I seem to have lost my senses. I cannot cry. At my age, they say that we have no more tears. Still, I think that when one is in trouble, one should have the power of weeping. Where is Valentine, sir? It is on her account I am here. I wish to see Valentine. Villefort thought it would be terrible to reply that Valentine was at a ball, so he only said that she had gone out with her stepmother, and that she should be fetched. "'This instant, sir, this instant, I beseech you,' said the old lady. Villefort placed the arm of Madame de saint Marin within his own, and conducted her to his apartment. "'Rest yourself, mother,' he said. The Marchioness raised her head at this word, and beholding the man who so forcibly reminded her of her deeply regretted child, who still lived for her in Valentine, she felt touched at the name of her mother, and, bursting into tears, she fell on her knees before an armchair, where she buried her venerable head. Villefort left her to the care of the women, while old Barrois ran, half scared, to his master. For nothing frightens old people so much as when death relaxes its vigilance over them for a moment in order to strike some other old person. Then, while Madame de saint Marin remained on her knees, praying fervently, Villefort sent for a cab and went himself to fetch his wife and daughter from Madame de Morcerf's. He was so pale when he appeared at the door of the ballroom that Valentine ran to him, saying, Oh, father, some misfortune has happened. Your grandmamma has just arrived, Valentine, said Monsieur de Villefort. And grandpapa, inquired the young girl, 
trembling with apprehension. Monsieur de Villefort only replied by offering his arm to his daughter. It was just in time, for Valentine's head swam, and she staggered. Madame de Villefort instantly hastened to her assistance, and aided her husband in dragging her to the carriage, saying, What a singular event! Who could have thought it? Ah, yes, it is indeed strange. And the wretched family departed, leaving a cloud of sadness hanging over the rest of the evening. At the foot of the stairs, Valentine found Barrois awaiting her. Monsieur Noirtier wishes to see you tonight, he said, in an undertone. Tell him I will come when I leave my dear grandmamma, she replied, feeling, with true delicacy, that the person to whom she could be of the most service just then was Madame de saint Marin. Valentine found her grandmother in bed, silent caresses, heart-wrung sobs, broken sighs, burning tears, were all that passed in this sad interview, while Madame de Villefort, leaning on her husband's arm, maintained all outward forms of respect, at least towards the poor widow. She soon whispered to her husband, I think it would be better for me to retire, with your permission, for the sight of me appears still to afflict your mother-in-law. Madame de saint Marin heard her. Yes, yes, she said softly to Valentine. Let her leave, but do you stay. Madame de Villefort left, and Valentine remained alone beside the bed, for the procureur, overcome with astonishment at the unexpected death, had followed his wife. Meanwhile, Barrois had returned for the first time to old Noirtier, who, having heard the noise in the house, had, as we have said, sent his old servant to inquire the cause. On his return, his quick, intelligent eye interrogated the messenger. "'Alas, sir!' exclaimed Barrois. "'A great misfortune has happened. Madame de saint Marin has arrived, and her husband is dead.' Madame de saint Marin and Noirtier had never been on strict terms of friendship. Still, the death of one old man always considerably affects another. Noirtier let his head fall upon his chest, apparently overwhelmed and thoughtful. Then he closed one eye, in token of inquiry. Mademoiselle Valentine? Noirtier nodded his head. She is at the ball, as you know, since she came to say good-bye to you in full dress. Noirtier again closed his left eye. Do you wish to see her? Noirtier again made an affirmative sign. Well, they have gone to fetch her, no doubt, from Madame de Morcerf's. I will await her return, and beg her to come up here. Is that what you wish for? Yes, replied the invalid. Barrois, therefore, as we have seen, watched for Valentine, and informed her of her grandfather's wish. Consequently, Valentine came up to Noirtier, on leaving Madame de saint Marin, who, in the midst of her grief, had at last yielded to fatigue, and fallen into a feverish sleep. Within reach of her hand, they placed a small table, upon which stood a bottle of orangeade, her usual beverage, and a glass. Then, as we have said, the young girl left the bedside to see Monsieur Noirtier. Valentine kissed the old man, who looked at her with such tenderness that her eyes again filled with tears, whose sources he thought must be exhausted. The old gentleman continued to dwell upon her with the same expression. Yes, yes, said Valentine. You mean that I have yet a kind grandfather left, do you not? The old man intimated that such was his meaning. Ah, yes, happily I have, replied Valentine. Without that, what would become of me? It was one o'clock in the morning. Barrois, who wished to go to bed himself, observed that after such sad events, every one stood in need of rest. Noirtier would not say that the only rest he needed was to see his child, but wished her good night, for grief and fatigue had made her appear quite ill. The next morning she found her grandmother in bed. The fever had not abated. On the contrary, her eyes glistened, and she appeared to be suffering from violent nervous irritability. "'Oh, dear grandmother, are you worse?' exclaimed Valentine, perceiving all these signs of agitation. 
No, my child, no, said Madame de saint -Marin. But I was impatiently waiting for your arrival, that I might send for your father. My father? inquired Valentine uneasily. Yes, I wish to speak to him. Valentine durst not oppose her grandmother's wish, the cause of which she did not know, and an instant afterwards Villefort entered. Sir, said Madame de saint -Marin, without using any circumlocution, and as if fearing she had no time to lose, you wrote to me concerning the marriage of this child. Yes, madame, replied Villefort, it is not only projected, but arranged. Your intended son-in-law is named Monsieur Franz d'Epinay? Yes, madame. Is he not the son of General d'Epinay, who was on our side, and who was assassinated some days before the usurper returned from the island of Elba? The same. Does he not dislike the idea of marrying the granddaughter of a Jacobin? Our civil dissensions are now happily extinguished, mother, said Villefort. Monsieur d'Epinay was quite a child when his father died. He knows very little of Monsieur Noirtier, and will meet him, if not with pleasure, at least with indifference. Is it a suitable match? In every respect. And the young man? Is regarded with universal esteem. You approve of him? He is one of the most well-bred young men I know. During the whole of this conversation, Valentine had remained silent. Well, sir, said Madame de saint -Marin, after a few minutes' reflection, I must hasten the marriage, for I have but a short time to live. You, madame? You, dear mamma? exclaimed Monsieur de Villefort and Valentine at the same time. I know what I am saying, continued the Marchioness. I must hurry you, so that, as she has no mother, she may at least have a grandmother to bless her marriage. I am all that is left to her belonging to my poor René, whom you have so soon forgotten, sir. Ah, madame, said Villefort, you forget that I was obliged to give a mother to my child. A stepmother is never a mother, sir. But this is not to the purpose. Our business concerns Valentine. Let us leave the dead in peace. All this was said with such exceeding rapidity that there was something in the conversation that seemed like the beginning of delirium. It shall be as you wish, madame, said Villefort, more especially since your wishes coincide with mine, and as soon as Monsieur d'Epinay arrives in Paris... My dear grandmother, interrupted Valentine, consider decorum, the recent death. You would not have me marry under such sad auspices. My child, exclaimed the old lady sharply, let us hear none of the conventional objections that deter weak minds from preparing for the future. I also was married at the deathbed of my mother, and certainly I have not been less happy on that account. Still, that idea of death, madame, said Villefort. Still? Always. I tell you, I am going to die. Do you understand? Well, before dying, I wish to see my son-in-law. I wish to tell him to make my child happy. I wish to read in his eyes whether he intends to obey me. In fact, I will know him. I will, continued the old lady, with a fearful expression, The time may rise from the depths of my grave to find him, if he should not fulfil his duty. Madame, said Villefort, you must lay aside these exalted ideas, which almost assume the appearance of madness. The dead, once buried in their graves, rise no more. And I tell you, sir, that you are mistaken. This night I have had a fearful sleep. It seemed as though my soul were already hovering over my body. My eyes, which I tried to open, closed against my will. And what will appear impossible, above all to you, sir, I saw, with my eyes shut, in the spot where you are now standing, issuing from that corner where there is a door leading into Madame Villefort's dressing-room. I saw, I tell you, silently enter, a white figure. Valentine screamed. It was the fever that disturbed you, Madame, said Villefort. Doubt, if you please, but I am sure of what I say. I saw a white figure, and as if to prevent my discrediting the testimony of only one of my senses, I heard my glass removed. 
the same which is there now on the table. Oh, dear mother, it was a dream. So little was it a dream that I stretched my hand towards the bell, but when I did so, the shade disappeared. My maid then entered with a light. But she saw no one. Phantoms are visible to those only who ought to see them. It was the soul of my husband. Well, if my husband's soul can come to me, why should not my soul reappear to guard my granddaughter? The tie is even more direct, it seems to me. Oh, madame, said Villefort, deeply affected, in spite of himself, do not yield to those gloomy thoughts. You will long live with us, happy, loved, and honoured, and we will make you forget. Never, 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 said the Marchioness. When does Mr. Epinay return? We expect him every moment. It is well. As soon as he arrives, inform me. We must be expeditious. And then I also wish to see a notary, that I may be assured that all our property returns to Valentine. Ah, Grandma, murmured Valentine, pressing her lips on the burning brow. Do you wish to kill me? Oh, how feverish you are. We must not send for a notary, but for a doctor. A doctor, said she, shrugging her shoulders. I am not ill. I am thirsty, that is all. What are you drinking, dear Grandmama? The same as usual, my dear. My glass is there on the table. Give it to me, Valentine. Valentine poured the orangeade into a glass and gave it to her grandmother with a certain degree of dread, for it was the same glass she fancied that had been touched by the spectre. The marchioness drained the glass at a single draught and then turned on her pillow, repeating, The notary! The notary! Monsieur de Villefort left the room and Valentine seated herself at the bedside of her grandmother. The poor child appeared herself to require the doctor she had recommended to her aged relative. A bright spot burned in either cheek. Her respiration was short and difficult, and her pulse beat with feverish excitement. She was thinking of the despair of Maximilian, when he should be informed that Madame de saint Marin, instead of being an ally, was unconsciously acting as his enemy. More than once, she thought of revealing all to her grandmother, and she would not have hesitated a moment if Maximilian Morel had been named Albert de Morcerf or Raoul de Chateau Renault. But Morel was of plebeian extraction, and Valentine knew how the haughty Marquise de saint Marin despised all who were not noble. Her secret had each time been repressed when she was about to reveal it, by the sad conviction that it would be useless to do so, for, were it once discovered by her father and mother, all would be lost. Two hours passed thus. Madame de saint Marin was in a feverish sleep, and the notary had arrived. Though his coming was announced in a very low tone, Madame de saint Marin arose from her pillow. The notary, she exclaimed, let him come in. The notary, who was at the door, immediately entered. Go, Valentine, said Madame de saint Marin, and leave me with this gentleman. But, Grandmama, leave me, go, the young girl kissed her grandmother, and left with her handkerchief to her eyes. At the door she found the valet de chambre, who told her that the doctor was waiting in the dining room. Valentine instantly ran down. The doctor was a friend of the family, and at the same time one of the cleverest men of the day, and very fond of Valentine, whose birth he had witnessed. He had himself a daughter about her age, but whose life was one continued source of anxiety and fear to him, from her mother having been consumptive. Oh, said Valentine, we have been waiting for you with such impatience, dear Mr. Avrigny. But, first of all, how are Madeleine and Antoinette? Madeleine was the daughter of Monsieur d'Avrigny, and Antoinette his niece. Monsieur d'Avrigny smiled sadly. Antoinette is very well, he said, and Madeleine tolerably so. But you sent for me, my dear child. It is not your father or Madame de Villefort who is ill. As for you, although we doctors cannot divest our patients of nerves, I fancy you have no further need of me 
than to recommend you not to allow your imagination to take too wide a field. Valentine coloured. Monsieur d'Avrigny carried the science of divination almost to a miraculous extent, for he was one of the physicians who always work upon the body through the mind. No, she replied, it is for my poor grandmother. You know the calamity that has happened to us, do you not? I know nothing, said Monsieur d'Avrigny. Alas, said Valentine, restraining her tears, my grandfather is dead. Monsieur de Samarin? Yes. Suddenly? From an apoplectic stroke. An apoplectic stroke? repeated the doctor. Yes, and my poor grandmother fancies that her husband, whom she never left, has called her, and that she must go and join him. Oh, Monsieur d'Avrigny, I beseech you, do something for her. Where is she? In her room with the notary. And Monsieur Noirtier? Just as he was, his mind perfectly clear, but the same incapability of moving or speaking. And the same love for you, eh, my dear child? Yes, said Valentine. He was very fond of me. Who does not love you? Valentine smiled sadly. What are your grandmother's symptoms? An extreme nervous excitement and a strangely agitated sleep. She fancied this morning in her sleep that her soul was hovering above her body, which she at the same time watched. It must have been delirium, she fancies too, that she saw a phantom enter her chamber and even heard the noise it made on touching her glass. It is singular, said the doctor. I was not aware that Madame de Saint-Marin was subject to such hallucinations. It is the first time I ever saw her in this condition, said Valentine, and this morning she frightened me so that I thought her mad, and my father, who you know is a strong-minded man, himself appeared deeply impressed. We will go and see, said the doctor. What you tell me seems very strange. The notary here descended, and Valentine was informed that her grandmother was alone. Go upstairs, she said to the doctor. And you? Oh, I dare not. She forbade my sending for you, and, as you say, I am myself agitated, feverish and out of sorts. I will go and take a turn in the garden to recover myself. The doctor pressed Valentine's hand, and while he visited her grandmother, she descended the steps. We need not say which portion of the garden was her favourite walk. After remaining for a short time in the parterre surrounding the house, and gathering a rose to place in her waist or hair, she turned into the dark avenue which led to the bench. Then, from the bench, she went to the gate. As usual, Valentine strolled for a short time among her flowers, but without gathering them. The morning in her heart forbade her assuming the simple ornament, though she had not yet had time to put on the outward semblance of woe. She then turned towards the avenue. As she advanced, she fancied she heard a voice speaking her name. She stopped astonished. Then the voice reached her ear more distinctly, and she recognised it to be that of Maximilian. End of chapter 72「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Bynum « The Count of Monte Cristo » by Alexander Dumas Chapter 73, Part 1 The Promise it was indeed Maximilian Morel who had passed a wretched existence since the previous day. With the instinct peculiar to lovers he had anticipated after the return of Madame de saint Marin and the death of the Marquis that something would occur at Monsieur de Villefort's in connection with his attachment for Valentine. His presentiments were realized, as we shall see, and his uneasy forebodings had goaded him pale and trembling to the gate under the chestnut trees. Valentine was ignorant of the cause of this sorrow and anxiety, 
and as it was not his accustomed hour for visiting her, she had gone to the spot simply by accident, or perhaps through sympathy. Morel called her, and she ran to the gate. "'You are here at this hour?' said she. "'Yes, my poor girl,' replied Morel. "'I come to bring and to hear bad tidings.' "'This is indeed a house of mourning,' said Valentine. "'Speak, Maximilian, although the cup of sorrow seems already full.' "'Dear Valentine,' said Morel, endeavouring to conceal his own emotion, "'listen, I entreat you. "'What I am about to say is very serious. "'When are you to be married?' "'I will tell you all,' said Valentine. "'From you I have nothing to conceal. "'This morning the subject was introduced, "'and my dear grandmother, on whom I depended as my only support, "'not only declared herself favourable to it, "'but is so anxious for it that they only await the arrival of Monsieur de Ipinay and the following day the contract will be signed. A deep sigh escaped the young man, who gazed long and mournfully at her he loved. Alas, replied he, it is dreadful thus to hear my condemnation from your own lips. The sentence is passed, and in a few hours will be executed. It must be so, and I will not endeavor to prevent it. But since you say nothing remains but for Monsieur de Epinay to arrive that the contract may be signed, and the following day you will be his. To-morrow you will be engaged to Monsieur de Epinay, for he came this morning to Paris. Valentine uttered a cry. I was at the house of Monte Cristo an hour since, said Morel. We were speaking, he of the sorrow your family had experienced, and I of your grief when a carriage rolled into the courtyard. Never till then had I placed any confidence in presentiments, but now I cannot help believing them, Valentine. At the sound of that carriage I shuddered, Soon I heard steps on the staircase, which terrified me as much as the footsteps of the commander did Don Juan. The door at last opened. Albert de Morcerf entered, and I began to hope my fears were vain, when after him another young man advanced, and the Count exclaimed, Ah, here is the Baron Franz de Epinay. I summoned all my strength and courage to my support. Perhaps I turned pale and trembled but certainly I smiled, and five minutes after I left, without having heard one word that had passed. Poor Maximilian, murmured Valentine. Valentine, the time has arrived that you must answer me. And remember, my life depends on your answer. What do you intend doing? Valentine held down her head. She was overwhelmed. Listen, said Morel, it is not the first time you have contemplated our present position which is a serious and urgent one. I do not think it is a moment to give way to useless sorrow. Leave that for those who like to suffer at their leisure and indulge their grief in secret. There are such in the world, and God will doubtless reward them in heaven for their resignation on earth. But those who mean to contend must not lose one precious moment, but must return immediately the blow which fortune strikes. Do you intend to struggle against our ill fortune? Tell me, Valentine, for it is that I came to know. Valentine trembled and looked at him with amazement. The idea of resisting her father, her grandmother, and all the family had never occurred to her. What do you say, Maximilian? asked Valentine. What do you mean by a struggle? Oh, it would be sacrilege. What? I resist my father's order and my dying grandmother's wish? Impossible. Morel started. You are too noble not to understand me, and yet you understand me so well that you already yield, dear Maximilian. No, no, I shall need all my strength to struggle with myself and support my grief in secret, as you say, but to grieve my father, to disturb my grandmother's last moments, never. You are right, said Morel calmly. In what a tone you speak, cried Valentine. I speak as one who admires you, mademoiselle. "'Mademoiselle!' cried Valentine. "'Mademoiselle! Oh, selfish man! He sees me in despair and pretends he cannot understand me. You mistake. I understand you perfectly. You will not oppose Monsieur Villefort. You will not displease the Marchioness. And to-morrow you will sign the contract which will bind you to your husband. But, mon Dieu, tell me, how can I do otherwise? Do not appeal to me, mademoiselle.' I shall be a bad judge in such a case. My selfishness will blind me, replied Morel, whose low voice and clenched hands announced his growing desperation. What would you have proposed, Maximilian, had you found me willing to accede? It is not for me to say. You are wrong. You must advise me what to do. Do you seriously ask my advice, Valentine? 
Certainly, dear Maximilian, for if it is good, I will follow it. You know my devotion to you. Valentine, said Morel, pushing aside a loose plank, give me your hand in token of forgiveness of my anger. My senses are confused, and during the last hour the most extravagant thoughts have passed through my brain. Oh, if you refuse my advice. What do you advise, said Valentine, raising her eyes to heaven and sighing? I am free, replied Maximilian, and rich enough to support you. I swear to make you my lawful wife before my lips even shall have approached your forehead. You make me tremble, said the young girl. Follow me, said Morel. I will take you to my sister, who is worthy also to be yours. We will embark for Algiers, for England, for America, or, if you prefer it, retire to the country, and only return to Paris when our friends have reconciled your family. Valentine shook her head. I feared it, Maximilian, she said. It is the counsel of a madman, and I should be more mad than you did I not stop you at once with the word, impossible, impossible. You will then submit to what fate decrees for you without even attempting to contend with it, said Morel sorrowfully. Yes, if I die. Well, Valentine, resumed Maximilian, I can only say again that you are right. Truly, it is I who am mad, and you prove to me that passion blinds the most well-meaning. I appreciate your calm reasoning. It is then understood that to-morrow you will be irrevocably promised to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, not only by that theatrical formality invented to heighten the effect of a comedy called the signature of the contract, but your own will. Again you drive me to despair, Maximilian, said Valentine. Again you plunge the dagger into the wound. What would you do, tell me, if your sister listened to such a proposition? Mademoiselle, replied Morel, with a bitter smile, I am selfish. You have already said so, and as a selfish man I think not of what others would do in my situation, but of what I intend doing myself. I think only that I have known you not a whole year. From the first day I saw you, all my hopes of happiness have been in securing your affection. One day you acknowledged that you loved me, and since that day my hope of future happiness has rested on obtaining you, for to gain you would be life to me. Now I think no more. I say only that fortune has turned against me. I had thought to gain heaven, and now I have lost it. It is an everyday occurrence for a gambler to lose not only what he possesses, but also what he has not. Morel pronounced these words with perfect calmness. Valentine looked at him a moment with her large, scrutinizing eyes, endeavoring not to let Morel discover the grief which struggled in her heart. But in a word, what are you going to do? asked she. I am going to have the honor of taking my leave of you, mademoiselle, solemnly assuring you that I wish your life may be so calm, so happy, and so fully occupied that there may be no place for me even in your memory. Oh, murmured Valentine. Adieu, Valentine, adieu, said Morel, bowing. Where are you going? cried the young girl, extending her hand through the opening, and seizing Maximilian by his coat, for she understood from her own agitated feelings that her lover's calmness could not be real. Where are you going? I am going that I may not bring fresh trouble into your family, and to set an example which every honest and devoted man situated as I am may follow. Before you leave me, tell me what you are going to do, Maximilian. The young man smiled sorrowfully. Speak, speak, said Valentine, I entreat you. Has your resolution changed, Valentine? It cannot change, unhappy man, you know it must not, cried the young girl. Then adieu, Valentine. Valentine shook the gate with a strength of which she could not have been supposed to be possessed as Morel was going away, and passing both her hands through the opening, she clasped and wrung them. I must know what you mean to do, said she. Where are you going? Oh, fear not, said Maximilian, stopping at a short distance. I do not intend to render another man responsible for the rigorous fate reserved for me. Another might threaten to seek Monsieur Franz, to provoke him, and to fight with him. All that would be folly. What has Monsieur Franz to do with it? He saw me this morning for the first time, and has already forgotten he has seen me. He did not even know I existed when it was arranged by your two families that you should be united. I have no enmity against Monsieur Franz, and promise you the punishment shall not fall on him. On whom, then? On me? On you? Valentine! Oh, heaven forbid! Woman is sacred. The woman one loves is holy. On yourself, then, unhappy man? On yourself? I am the only guilty person, am I not? said Maximilian. Maximilian, said Valentine. Maximilian, come back, I entreat you. 
He drew near with his sweet smile, and but for his paleness one might have thought him in his usual happy mood. "'Listen, my dear, my adored Valentine,' said he in his melodious and grave voice. "'Those who, like us, have never had a thought for which we need blush before the world, such may read each other's hearts. I never was romantic, and am no melancholy hero. I imitate neither Manfred nor Anthony, but without words, protestations, or vows my life has entwined itself with yours. You leave me, and you are right in doing so. I repeat it, you are right.' but in losing you I lose my life. The moment you leave me, Valentine, I am alone in the world. My sister is happily married, her husband is only my brother-in-law, that is, a man whom the ties of social life alone attach to me. No one then longer needs my useless life. This is what I shall do. I will wait until the very moment you are married, for I will not lose the shadow of one of those unexpected chances which are sometimes reserved for us, since M. Franz may, after all, die before that time. A thunderbolt may fall even on the altar as you approach it. Nothing appears impossible to one condemned to die, and miracles appear quite reasonable when his escape from death is concerned. I will, then, wait until the last moment, and when my misery is certain, irredeemable, hopeless, I will write a confidential letter to my brother-in-law, another to the prefect of police, to acquaint them with my intention, and at the corner of some wood, on the brink of some abyss, on the bank of some river, I will put an end to my existence, as certainly as I am the son of the most honest man who ever lived in France. Valentine trembled convulsively. She loosened her hold of the gate. Her arms fell by her side, and two large tears rolled down her cheeks. The young man stood before her, sorrowful and resolute. Oh, for pity's sake, said she, you will live, will you not? No, on my honor, said Maximilian, but that will not affect you. You have done your duty, and your conscience will be at rest. Valentine fell on her knees and pressed her almost bursting heart. Maximilian, said she, Maximilian, my friend, my brother on earth, my true husband in heaven, I entreat you, do as I do, live in suffering. Perhaps we may one day be united. Adieu, Valentine, repeated Morel. My God, said Valentine, raising both her hands to heaven with a sublime expression, I have done my utmost to remain a submissive daughter. I have begged, entreated, implored. He has regarded neither my prayers, my entreaties, nor my tears. It is done, cried she, willing away her tears and resuming her firmness. I am resolved not to die of remorse, but rather of shame. Live, Maximilian, and I will be yours. Say when it shall be. Speak, command, I will obey. Morel, who had already gone some few steps away, again returned, and pale with joy, extended both hands towards Valentine through the opening. Valentine, he said, dear Valentine, you must not speak thus. Rather let me die. Why should I obtain you by violence, if our love is mutual? Is it from mere humanity you bid me live? I would then rather die. Truly, murmured Valentine, who on this earth cares for me if he does not? Who has consoled me in my sorrow but he? On whom do my hopes rest? On whom does my bleeding heart repose? On him. On him, always on him. Yes, you are right, Maximilian. I will follow you. I will leave the paternal home. I will give up all. Oh, ungrateful girl that I am, cried Valentine, sobbing. I will give up all, even my dear old grandfather, whom I had nearly forgotten. No, said Maximilian, you shall not leave him. Monsieur Nortier has evinced, you say, a kind feeling toward me. Well, before you leave, tell him all. His consent would be your justification in God's sight. As soon as we are married, he shall come and live with us. Instead of one child, he shall have two. You have told me how you talk to him and how he answers you. I shall very soon learn that language by signs, Valentine, and promise you solemnly that instead of despair it is happiness that awaits us. Oh, see, Maximilian, see the power you have over me. You almost make me believe you, and yet what you tell me is madness, for my father will curse me. He is inflexible. He will never pardon me. Now listen to me, Maximilian. If by artifice, by entreaty, by accident, in short, if by any means I can delay this marriage, will you wait? Yes, I promise you, as faithfully as you have promised me that this horrible marriage shall not take place, and that if you are dragged before a magistrate or a priest, you will refuse. I promise you by all that is most sacred to me in the world, namely by my mother. We will wait then, said Morel. 
Yes, we will wait, replied Valentine, who revived at these words. There are so many things which may save unhappy beings such as we. I rely on you, Valentine, said Morel. All you do will be well done, only if they disregard your prayers, if your father and Madame de saint Marin insist that Monsieur de Epinay should be called to-morrow to sign the contract. Then you have my promise, Maximilian. Instead of signing, I will go to you and we will fly. But from this moment until then, let us not tempt Providence. Let us not see each other. It is a miracle. It is a Providence that we have not been discovered. If we were surprised, if it were known that we met thus, we should have no further resource. You are right, Valentine, but how shall I ascertain? From the notary, Monsieur de Champs. I know him, and for myself I will write to you depend on me. I dread this marriage, Maximilian, as much as you. Thank you, my adored Valentine, thank you, that is enough. When once I know the hour, I will hasten to this spot. You can easily get over this fence with my assistance. A carriage will await us at the gate, in which you will accompany me to my sisters. There living, retired, or mingling in society, as you wish, we shall be enabled to use our power to resist oppression, and not suffer ourselves to be put to death like sheep, which only defend themselves by sighs. Yes, said Valentine, I will now acknowledge you are right, Maximilian, and now are you satisfied with your betrothal, said the young girl sorrowfully. My adored Valentine, words cannot express one half of my satisfaction. Valentine had approached, or rather had placed her lips so near the fence that they nearly touched those of Morel, which were pressed against the other side of the cold and inexorable barrier. Adieu, then, till we meet again, said Valentine, tearing herself away. I shall hear from you? Yes. Thanks, thanks, dear love, adieu. The sound of a kiss was heard, and Valentine fled through the avenue. Morel listened to catch the last sound of her dress brushing the branches and of her footsteps on the gravel, then raised his eyes with an ineffable smile of thankfulness to heaven for being permitted to be thus loved, and then also disappeared. The young man returned home and waited all the evening and all the next day without getting any message. It was only on the following day at about ten o'clock in the morning, as he was starting to call on Monsieur de Champs the notary, that he received from the postman a small billet which he knew to be from Valentine, although he had not before seen her writing. It was to this effect. Tears, entreaties, prayers have availed me nothing. Yesterday for two hours I was at the church of St. Philippe de Rule, and for two hours I prayed most fervently. Heaven is as inflexible as man, and the signature of the contract is fixed for this evening at nine o'clock. I have but one promise, and but one heart to give. That promise is pledged to you, that heart is also yours. This evening, then, at a quarter to nine at the gate, your betrothed, Valentine de Villefort. P.S. My poor grandmother gets worse and worse. Yesterday her fever amounted to delirium. Today her delirium is almost madness. You will be very kind to me, will you not, Morel, to make me forget my sorrow in leaving her thus? I think it is kept a secret from Grandpapa Nortier that this contract is to be signed this evening. Morel went also to the notary, who confirmed the news that the contract was to be signed that evening. Then he went to call on Monte Cristo and heard still more. Franz had been to announce the ceremony, and Madame de Villefort had also written to beg the Count to excuse her not inviting him. The death of Monsieur de saint Marin and the dangerous illness of his widow would cast a gloom over the meeting which she would regret should be shared by the Count whom she wished every happiness. The day before, Franz had been presented to Madame de saint Marin, who had left her bed to receive him, but had been obliged to return to it immediately after. It is easy to suppose that Morel's agitation would not escape the Count's penetrating eye. Monte Cristo was more affectionate than ever. Indeed, his manner was so kind that several times Morel was on the point of telling him all, but he recalled the promise he had made to Valentine and kept his secret. The young man read Valentine's letter twenty times in the course of the day. It was her first, and on what an occasion. Each time he read it, he renewed his vow to make her happy. How great is the power of a woman who has made so courageous a resolution! What devotion does she deserve from him for whom she has sacrificed everything? How ought she really to be supremely loved? She becomes at once a queen and a wife, and it is impossible to thank and love her sufficiently. Morel longed intensely for the moment when he should hear Valentine say, Here I am, Maximilian. Come and help me. He had arranged everything for her escape. Two ladders were hidden in the clover field. 
a cabriolet was ordered for Maximilian alone, without a servant, without lights. At the turning of the first street they would light the lamps, as it would be foolish to attract the notice of the police by too many precautions. Occasionally he shuddered. He thought of the moment when, from the top of that wall, he should protect the descent of his dear Valentine, pressing in his arms for the first time, her of whom he had yet only kissed the delicate hand. When the afternoon arrived, and he felt that the hour was drawing near, he wished for solitude. His agitation was extreme. A simple question from a friend would have irritated him. He shut himself in his room and tried to read, but his eye glanced over the page without understanding a word, and he threw away the book, and for the second time sat down to sketch his plan, the ladders and the fence. At length the hour drew near. Never did a man deeply in love allow the clocks to go on peacefully. Morel tormented his so effectually that they struck eight at half-past six. Then he said, It is time to start. The signature was indeed fixed to take place at nine o'clock, but perhaps Valentine will not wait for that. Consequently, Morel, having left the Rue Millet at half-past eight by his timepiece, entered the clover field while the clock of St. Philippe du Roule was striking eight. The horse and cabriolet were concealed behind a small room where Morel had often waited. The night gradually drew on, and the foliage in the garden assumed a deeper hue. Then Morel came out from his hiding-place with a beating heart and looked through the small opening in the gate. There was yet no one to be seen. The clock struck half-past eight, and still another half-hour was passed in waiting, while Morel walked to and fro and gazed more and more frequently through the opening. The garden became darker still but in the darkness he looked in vain for the white dress, and in the silence he vainly listened for the sound of footsteps. The house, which was discernible through the trees, remained in darkness and gave no indication that so important an event as the signature of a marriage contract was going on. Morel looked at his watch, which wanted a quarter to ten, but soon the same clock he had already heard strike two or three times rectified the error by striking half-past nine. This was already half an hour past the time Valentine had fixed. It was a terrible moment for the young man. The slightest rustling of the foliage, the least whistling of the wind, attracted his attention, and drew the perspiration to his brow. Then he tremblingly fixed his ladder, and not to lose a moment placed his foot on the first step. Amidst all these alternations of hope and fear, the clock struck ten. It is impossible, said Maximilian, that the signing of a contract should occupy so long a time without unexpected interruptions. I have weighed all the chances, calculated the time required for all the forms. Something must have happened. And then he walked rapidly to and fro, and pressed his burning forehead against the fence. Had Valentine fainted, or had she been discovered and stopped in her flight? These were the only obstacles which appeared possible to the young man. The idea that her strength had failed her in attempting to escape, and that she had fainted in one of the paths, was the one that most impressed itself upon his mind. In that case, said he, I should lose her, and by my own fault. He dwelt on this idea for a moment, then it appeared reality. He even thought he could perceive something on the ground at a distance. He ventured to call, and it seemed to him that the wind wafted back an almost inarticulate sigh. At last the half-hour struck. It was impossible to wait longer. His temples throbbed violently. His eyes were growing dim. He passed one leg over the wall, and in a moment leaped down on the other side. He was on Villefort's premises, had arrived there by scaling the wall. What might be the consequences? However, he had not ventured thus far to draw back. He followed a short distance close under the wall, then crossed a path he had entered a clump of trees. In a moment he had passed through them, and he could see the house distinctly. Then Morel saw that he had been right in believing that the house was not illuminated. Instead of lights at every window, as is customary on days of ceremony, he saw only a gray mass which was veiled also by a cloud, which at that moment obscured the moon's feeble light. A light moved rapidly from time to time past three windows of the second floor. These three windows were in Madame de saint Marin's room. Another remained motionless behind some red curtains which were in Madame de Villefort's bedroom. Morel guessed all this. So many times, in order to follow Valentine in thought at every hour in the day, had he made her describe the whole house, that without having seen it, he knew it all. This darkness and silence alarmed Morel still more than Valentine's absence had done. 
almost mad with grief, and determined to venture everything in order to see Valentine once more, and be certain of the misfortune he feared, Morel gained the edge of the clump of trees, and was going to pass as quickly as possible through the flower-garden when the sound of a voice, still at some distance, but which was borne upon the wind, reached him. At this sound, as he was already partially exposed to view, he stepped back and concealed himself completely, remaining perfectly motionless. He had formed his resolution. If it was Valentine alone, he would speak as she passed. If she was accompanied and he could not speak, still he should see her and know that she was safe. If they were strangers, he would listen to their conversation and might understand something of this hitherto incomprehensible mystery. The moon had just then escaped from behind the cloud which had concealed it, and Morel saw Villefort come out upon the steps, followed by a gentleman in black. They descended in advance towards the clump of trees, and Morel soon recognized the other gentleman as Dr. de Avonray. The young man, seeing them approach, drew back mechanically until he found himself stopped by a sycamore tree in the center of the clump. There he was compelled to remain. Soon the two gentlemen stopped also. "'Ah, my dear doctor,' said the procurer, "'heaven declares itself against my house. "'What a dreadful death! "'What a blow! "'Seek not to console me. "'Alas, nothing can alleviate so great a sorrow. "'The wound is too deep and too fresh. "'Dead! "'Dead!' "'The cold sweat sprang to the young man's brow, "'and his teeth chattered. "'Who could be dead in that house "'which Villefort himself had called accursed?' "'My dear Monsieur de Villefort,' replied the doctor, with a tone which redoubled the terror of the young man, "'I have not led you here to console you. On the contrary.' "'What can you mean?' asked the procurer, alarmed. "'I mean that behind the misfortune which has just happened to you there is another perhaps still greater.' "'Can it be possible?' murmured Villefort, clasping his hands. "'What are you going to tell me?' "'Are we quite alone, my friend?' "'Yes, quite. But why all these precautions?' "'because I have a terrible secret to communicate to you,' said the doctor. "'Let us sit down.'" End of chapter 73, part 1For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Bynum. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 73, Part 2. Villefort fell rather than seated himself. The doctor stood before him with one hand placed on his shoulder. Morel, horrified, supported his head with one hand, and with the other pressed his heart, lest its beating should be heard. Dead! dead repeated he within himself and he felt as if he were also dying speak doctor i am listening said villefort strike i am prepared for everything madame de saint marin was doubtless advancing in years but she enjoyed excellent health morel began again to breathe freely which he had not done during the last ten minutes grief has consumed her said villefort yes grief doctor after living forty years with the marquis "'It is not grief, my dear Villefort,' said the doctor. "'Grief may kill, although it rarely does, "'and never in a day, never in an hour, never in ten minutes.' "'Villefort answered nothing. "'He simply raised his head, which had been cast down before, "'and looked at the doctor with amazement. "'Were you present during the last struggle?' asked Monsieur d'Avonray. "'I was,' replied the procurer. "'You begged me not to leave. "'Did you notice the symptoms of the disease "'to which Madame de saint Marin has fallen a victim?' I did. Madame de saint Marin had three successive attacks at intervals of some minutes, each one more serious than the former. When you arrived, Madame de saint Marin had already been panting for breath some minutes. She then had a fit, which I took to be simply a nervous attack, and it was only when I saw her raise herself in the bed and her limbs and neck appear stiffened that I became really alarmed. Then I understood from your countenance that there was more to fear than I had thought. This crisis passed, I endeavored to catch your eye, but could not. You held her hand, you were feeling her pulse, and the second fit came on before you had turned towards me. This was more terrible than the first. The same nervous movements were repeated, and the mouth contracted and turned purple. And at the third she expired. At the end of the first attack I discovered symptoms of tetanus. You confirmed my opinion. Yes, before others, replied the doctor, but now we are alone. What are you going to say? Oh, spare me! 
that the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances are the same. Monsieur de Villefort started from his seat, then in a moment fell down again, silent and motionless. Morel knew not if he were dreaming or awake. Listen, said the doctor, I know the full importance of the statement I have just made, and the disposition of the man to whom I have made it. Do you speak to me as a magistrate or as a friend? asked Villefort. As a friend, and only as a friend at this moment. The similarity in the symptoms of tetanus and poisoning by vegetable substances is so great that were I obliged to affirm by oath what I have now stated, I should hesitate. I therefore repeat to you, I speak not to a magistrate, but to a friend. And to that friend I say, during the three-quarters of an hour that the struggle continued, I watched the convulsions and the death of Madame de saint Marin, and am thoroughly convinced that not only did her death proceed from poison, but I could also specify the poison. Can it be possible? The symptoms are marked, you see. Sleep broken by nervous spasms, excitation of the brain, torpor of the nerve centers. Madame de saint Marin succumbed to a powerful dose of brucine or of strychnine, which by some mistake perhaps has been given to her. Villefort seized the doctor's hand. Oh, it is impossible, said he. I must be dreaming. It is frightful to hear such things from such a man as you. Tell me, I entreat you, my dear doctor, that you may be deceived. Doubtless I may, but— But? But I do not think so. Have pity on me, doctor. So many dreadful things have happened to me lately that I am on the verge of madness. Has any one besides me seen Madame de saint Marin? No. Has anything been sent for from a chemist that I have not examined? Nothing. Had Madame de saint Marin any enemies? Not to my knowledge. Would her death affect any one's interest? It could not, indeed. My daughter is her only heiress, Valentine alone. Oh, if such a thought could present itself, I would stab myself to punish my heart for having one instant harbored it. Indeed, my dear friend, said Monsieur d'Avenray, I would not accuse any one. I speak only of an accident, you understand, of a mistake. But whether accident or mistake, the fact is there. It is on my conscience and compels me to speak aloud to you. Make inquiry. Of whom? How? Of what? May not Barat, the old servant, have made a mistake, and have given Madame de saint Marin a dose prepared for his master? For my father? Yes. But how could a dose prepared for Monsieur Nortier poison Madame de saint Marin? Nothing is more simple. You know poisons become remedies in certain diseases, of which paralysis is one. For instance, having tried every other remedy to restore movement and speech to Monsieur Nortier, I resolved to try one last means, and for three months I have been given him brucine, so that in the last dose I ordered for him there were six grains. This quantity, which is perfectly safe to administer to the paralyzed frame of Monsieur Nortier, which has become gradually accustomed to it, would be sufficient to kill another person. My dear doctor, there is no communication between Monsieur Nortier's apartment and that of Madame de saint Marin, and Barat never entered my mother-in-law's room. In short, doctor, although I know you to be the most conscientious man in the world, and although I place the utmost reliance in you, I want, notwithstanding my conviction, to believe this axiom, Barare humanum est. Is there one of my brethren in whom you have equal confidence with myself? Why do you ask me that? What do you wish? Send for him. I will tell him what I have seen, and we will consult together and examine the body. And you will find traces of poison? No, I did not say of poison, but we can prove what was the state of the body. We shall discover the cause of her sudden death, and we shall say, Dear Villefort, if this thing has been caused by negligence, watch over your servants. If from hatred, watch your enemies. What do you propose to me, D'Avenray? said Villefort in despair. So soon as another is admitted into our secret, an inquest will become necessary, and an inquest in my house impossible. Still, continued the procurer, looking at the doctor with uneasiness, if you wish it, if you demand it, why then it shall be done. But, doctor, you see me already so grieved, how can I introduce into my house so much scandal after so much sorrow? My wife and my daughter would die of it. And I, doctor, you know a man does not arrive at the post I occupy, one has not been king's attorney for twenty-five years without having amassed a tolerable number of enemies, mine or numerous. Let this affair be talked of, it will be a triumph for them which will make them rejoice and cover me with shame. Pardon me, doctor, these worldly ideas. Were you a priest, I should not dare tell you that, but you are a man, and you know mankind. Doctor, pray recall your words. You have said nothing, have you? My dear Monsieur de Villefort, replied the doctor, my first duty is to humanity. I would have saved Madame de saint Marin if science could have done it, but she is dead, and my duty regards the living. 
Let us bury this terrible secret in the deepest recesses of our hearts. I am willing, if any one should suspect this, that my silence on the subject should be imputed to my ignorance. Meanwhile, sir, watch always. Watch carefully, for perhaps the evil may not stop here. And when you have found the culprit, if you find him, I will say to you, you are a magistrate, do as you will. I thank you, doctor, said Villefort, with indescribable joy. I never had a better friend than you. And, as if he feared Dr. de Avonray would recall his promise, he hurried him toward the house. When they were gone, Morel ventured out from under the trees, and the moon shone upon his face, which was so pale it might have been taken for that of a ghost. I am manifestly protected in a most wonderful but most terrible manner, said he. But Valentine, poor girl, how will she bear so much sorrow? As he thought thus, he looked alternately to the window with red curtains and the three windows with white curtains. The light had almost disappeared behind the former. Doubtless Madame de Villefort had just put out her lamp, and the night lamp alone reflected its dull light on the window. At the extremity of the building, on the contrary, he saw one of the three windows open. A wax light placed on the mantelpiece threw some of its pale rays without, and a shadow was seen for one moment on the balcony. Morel shuddered. He thought he heard a sob. It cannot be wondered at that his mind, generally so courageous, but now disturbed by the two strongest human passions, love and fear, was weakened even to the indulgence of superstitious thoughts. Although it was impossible that Valentine should see him hidden as he was, he thought he heard the shadow at the window call him. His disturbed mind told him so. This double error became an irresistible reality, and by one of the incomprehensible transports of youth he bounded from his hiding place and with two strides at the risk of being seen, at the risk of alarming Valentine, at the risk of being discovered by some exclamation which might escape the young girl, he crossed the flower garden, which by the light of the moon resembled a large white lake, and having passed the rows of orange trees which extended in front of the house, he reached the step, ran quickly up, and pushed the door, which opened without offering any resistance. Valentine had not seen him. Her eyes, raised towards heaven, were watching a silvery cloud gliding over the azure, its form that of a shadow mounting towards heaven. Her poetic and excited mind pictured it as the soul of her grandmother. Meanwhile, Morel had traversed the anteroom and found the staircase, which being carpeted prevented his approach being heard, and he had regained that degree of confidence that the presence of Monsieur de Villefort even would not have alarmed him. He was quite prepared for any such encounter. He would at once approach Valentine's father and acknowledge all, begging Villefort to pardon and sanction the love which united two fond and loving hearts. Morel was mad. Happily, he did not meet any one. Now especially did he find the description Valentine had given him of the interior of the house useful to him. He arrived safely at the top of the staircase, and while he was feeling his way, a sob indicated the direction he was to take. He turned back. A door partly open enabled him to see his road and to hear the voice of one in sorrow. He pushed the door open and entered. At the other end of the room, under a white sheet which covered it, lay the corpse, still more alarming to Morel since the count he had so unexpectedly overheard. By its side, on her knees, and with her head buried in the cushion of an easy chair, was Valentine, trembling and sobbing, her hands extended above her head, clasped and stiff. She had turned from the window which remained open, and was praying in accents that would have affected the most unfeeling. Her words were rapid, incoherent, unintelligible, for the burning weight of grief almost stopped her utterance. The moon shining through the open blinds made the lamp appear to burn paler and cast a sepulchral hue over the whole scene. Morel could not resist this. He was not exemplary for piety. He was not easily impressed, but Valentine's suffering, weeping, wringing her hands before him was more than he could bear in silence. He sighed and whispered a name, and the head bathed in tears and pressed on the velvet cushion of the chair, a head like that of a Magdalene by Correggio, was raised and turned towards him. Valentine perceived him without betraying the least surprise. A heart overwhelmed with one great grief is insensible to minor emotions. Morel held out his hand to her. Valentine, as her only apology for not having met him, pointed to the corpse under the sheet and began to sob again. Neither dared for some time to speak in that room. They hesitated to break the silence which death seemed to impose. At length Valentine ventured. "'My friend,' said she, "'how came you here? Alas, I would say you are welcome, had not death opened the way for you into this house.' "'Valentine,' said Morel, with a trembling voice, "'I had waited since half-past eight, and did not see you come. 
I became uneasy, leaped the wall, found my way through the garden, when voices conversing about the fatal event. What voices? asked Valentine. Morel shuddered as he thought of the conversation of the doctor and Monsieur de Villefort, and he thought he could see through the sheet the extended hands, the stiff neck, and the purple lips. Your servants, said he, who were repeating the whole sorrowful story, from them I learned it all. But it was risking the failure of our plan to come up here, love. Forgive me, replied Morel, I will go away. No, said Valentine, you might meet someone, stay. But if any one should come here, the young girl shook her head. No one will come, said she. Do not fear, there is our safeguard, pointing to the bed. But what has become of Monsieur d'Epinay? replied Morel. Monsieur Franz arrived to sign the contract just as my dear grandmother was dying. Alas, said Morel, with a feeling of selfish joy, for he thought this death would cause the wedding to be postponed indefinitely. But what redoubles my sorrow, continued the young girl, as if this feeling was to receive its immediate punishment, is that the poor old lady on her deathbed requested that the marriage might take place as soon as possible. She also, thinking to protect me, was acting against me. Hark, said Morel. They both listened. Steps were distinctly heard in the corridor and on the stairs. It is my father who has just left his study. To accompany the doctor to the door, added Morel. How do you know it is the doctor? asked Valentine, astonished. I imagine it must be, said Morel. Valentine looked at the young man. They heard the street door close, then Monsieur de Villefort locked the garden door and returned upstairs. He stopped a moment in the anteroom, as if hesitating whether to turn to his own apartment or into Madame de saint Morin's. Morel concealed himself behind a door. Valentine remained motionless, grief seeming to deprive her of all fear. Monsieur de Villefort passed on to his own room. Now, said Valentine, you can neither go out by the front door nor by the garden. Morel looked at her with astonishment. There is but one way left you that is safe, said she. It is through my grandfather's room. She rose. Come, she added. Where? asked Maximilian. To my grandfather's room. I, in Monsieur Nortier's apartment? Yes. Can you mean it, Valentine? I have long wished it. He is my only remaining friend, and we both need his help. Come. Be careful, Valentine, said Morel, hesitating to comply with the young girl's wishes. I now see my error. I acted like a madman in coming in here. Are you sure you are more reasonable? Yes, said Valentine, and I have but one scruple, that of leaving my dear grandmother's remains which I had undertaken to watch. Valentine, said Morel, death is in itself sacred. Yes, said Valentine, besides it will not be for long. She then crossed the corridor and led the way down a narrow staircase to Monsieur Nortier's room. Morel followed her on tiptoe. At the door they found the old servant. Baroy said Valentine, shut the door and let no one come in. She passed first. Nortier seated in his chair and listening to every sound was watching the door. He saw Valentine and his eye brightened. There was something grave and solemn in the approach of the young girl which struck the old man and immediately his bright eye began to interrogate. Dear grandfather, she said hurriedly, you know poor grandmamma died an hour since and now I have no friend in the world but you. His expressive eyes evinced the greatest tenderness. To you alone, then, may I confide my sorrows and my hopes? The paralytic motioned yes. Valentine took Maximilian's hand. Look attentively, then, at this gentleman. The old man fixed his scrutinizing gaze with slight astonishment on Morel. It is Monsieur Maximilian Morel, said she, the son of that good merchant of Marseilles, whom you doubtless recollect. Yes, said the old man. He brings an irreproachable name, which Maximilian is likely to render glorious, since at thirty years of age he is a captain, an officer of the Legion of Honor. The old man signified that he recollected him. Well, Grandpapa, said Valentine, kneeling before him and pointing to Maximilian, I love him, and will be only his. Were I compelled to marry another, I would destroy myself. The eyes of the paralytic expressed a multitude of tumultuous thoughts. You like Monsieur Maximilian Morel, do you not? Grandpapa asked Valentine. Yes. And will you protect us, who are your children, against the will of my father? Nortier cast an intelligent glance at Morel, as if to say, Perhaps I may. Maximilian understood him. Mademoiselle, said he, you have a sacred duty to fulfill in your deceased grandmother's room. Will you allow me the honor of a few minutes' conversation with Monsieur Nortier? That is it, said the old man's eye. Then he looked anxiously at Valentine. Do you fear he will not understand? Yes. 
oh, we have spoken so often of you that he knows exactly how I talk to you. Then turning to Maximilian with an adorable smile, though, although shaded by sorrow, he knows everything I know, said she. Valentine arose, placed a chair for Morel, requested Baroy not to admit any one, and having tenderly embraced her grandfather and sorrowfully taken leave of Morel, she went away. To prove to Nortier that he was in Valentine's confidence and knew all their secrets, Morel took the dictionary, a pen, and some paper, and placed them all on a table where there was a light. But first, said Morel, allow me, sir, to tell you who I am, how much I love Mademoiselle Valentine, and what are my designs respecting her. Nortier made a sign that he would listen. It was an imposing sight to witness this old man, apparently a mere useless burden, becoming the sole protector, support, and adviser of the lovers who were both young, beautiful, and strong. His remarkably noble and austere expression struck Morel, who began his story with trembling. He related the manner in which he had become acquainted with Valentine, and how he had loved her, and that Valentine, in her solitude and her misfortune, had accepted the offer of his devotion. He told him his birth, his position, his fortune, and more than once, when he consulted the look of the paralytic, that look answered, That is good. Proceed. And now, said Morel, when he had finished the first part of his recital, now I have told you of my love and my hopes, may I inform you of my intentions? Yes, signified the old man. This was our resolution. A cabriolet was in waiting at the gate, in which I intended to carry off Valentine to my sister's house, to marry her, and to wait respectfully Monsieur de Villefort's pardon. No, said Nortier. We must not do so? No. You do not sanction our project? No. There is another way, said Morel. The old man's interrogative eye said what? I will go, continued Maximilian. I will seek Monsieur Franz de Epinay. I am happy to be able to mention this in Mademoiselle de Villefort's absence, and will conduct myself toward him so as to compel him to challenge me. Nortier's look continued to interrogate. You wish to know what I will do? Yes. I will find him as I told you. I will tell him the ties which bind me to Mademoiselle Valentine. If he be a sensible man, he will prove it by renouncing of his own accord the hand of his betrothed and will secure my friendship and love until death. If he refuse, either through interest or ridiculous pride, after I have proved to him that he would be forcing my wife from me, that Valentine loves me and will have no other, I will fight with him, give him every advantage, and I shall kill him, or he will kill me. If I am victorious, he will not marry Valentine, and if I die, I am very sure Valentine will not marry him. Nortier watched with indescribable pleasure this noble and sincere countenance on which every sentiment his tongue uttered was depicted, adding by the expression of his fine features all that coloring adds to a sound and faithful drawing. Still, when Morel had finished, he shut his eyes several times, which was his manner of saying no. No, said Morel, you disapprove of the second project as you did the first? I do, signified the old man. But what then must be done? asked Morel. Madame de St. Marin's last request was that the marriage might not be delayed. Must I let things take their course? Nortier did not move. I understand, said Morel. I am to wait. Yes. But delay may ruin our plans, sir, replied the young man. Alone, Valentine has no power. She will be compelled to submit. I am here almost miraculously, and I can scarcely hope for so good an opportunity to occur again. Believe me, there are only the two plans I have proposed to you. Forgive my vanity, and tell me which you prefer. Do you authorize Mademoiselle Valentine to entrust herself to my honor? No. Do you prefer I should seek Monsieur d'Epinay? No. Whence, then, will come the help we need? From chance? resumed Morel. No. From you? Yes. You thoroughly understand me, sir? Pardon my eagerness, for my life depends on your answer. Will our help come from you? Yes. You are sure of it? Yes. There was so much firmness in the look which gave this answer, no one could at any rate doubt his will if they did his power. Oh, thank you a thousand times, but how, unless a miracle should restore your speech, your gesture, your movement, how can you chain to that armchair, dumb and motionless, oppose this marriage? A smile lit up the old man's face, a strange smile of the eyes in a paralyzed face. "'Then I must wait?' asked the young man. "'Yes. "'But the contract?' "'The same smile returned. "'Will you assure me it shall not be signed?' "'Yes,' said Nortier. "'The contract shall not be signed,' cried Morel. 
Oh, pardon me, sir, I can scarcely realize so great a happiness. Will they not sign it? No, said the paralytic. Notwithstanding that assurance, Morel still hesitated. This promise of an impotent old man was so strange that instead of being the result of the power of his will, it might emanate from enfeebled organs. Is it not natural that the madman, ignorant of his folly, should attempt things beyond his power? The weak man talks of burdens he can raise, the timid of giants he can confront, the poor of treasures he spends, the most humble peasant in the height of his pride calls himself Jupiter. Whether Nortier understood the young man's indecision, or whether he had not full confidence in his docility, he looked uneasily at him. "'What do you wish, sir?' asked Morel, "'that I should renew my promise of remaining tranquil?' Nortier's eyes remained fixed and firm, as if to imply that a promise did not suffice. Then it passed from his face to his hands. "'Shall I swear to you, sir?' asked Maximilian. "'Yes,' said the paralytic, with the same solemnity. Morel understood that the old man attached great importance to an oath. He extended his hand. I swear to you on my honor, said he, to await your decision respecting the course I am to pursue with Monsieur d'Epinay. That is right, said the old man. Now, said Morel, do you wish me to retire? Yes. Without seeing Mademoiselle Valentine? Yes. Morel made a sign that he was ready to obey. But, said he, First, allow me to embrace you as your daughter did just now. Nortier's expression could not be understood. The young man pressed his lips on the same spot on the old man's forehead where Valentine's had been. Then he bowed a second time and retired. He found outside the door the old servant to whom Valentine had given directions. Morel was conducted along a dark passage, which led to a little door opening on the garden, soon found the spot where he had entered with the assistance of the shrubs, gained the top of the wall, and by his ladder was in an instant in the clover field where his cabriolet was still waiting for him. He got in it, and thoroughly wearied by so many emotions, arrived about midnight in the Rue Malay, threw himself on his bed, and slept soundly. End of chapter 73, part 2「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Clark Bell, Tucson, Arizona, October 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 74. THE Villefort FAMILY VAULT CHAPTER 74 THE Villefort FAMILY VAULT Two days after, a considerable crowd was assembled towards ten o'clock in the morning around the door of Monsieur de Villefort's house, and a long file of mourning coaches and private carriages extended along the Faubourg Saint-Honoré and the Rue de la Pepinere. Among them was one of a very singular form, which appeared to have come from a distance. It was a kind of covered wagon, painted black, and was one of the first to arrive. Inquiry was made, and it was ascertained that by a strange coincidence this carriage contained the corpse of the Marquis de saint Morin, and that those who had come thinking to attend one funeral would follow two. Their number was great. The Marquis de saint Morin, one of the most zealous and faithful dignitaries of Louis the Eighteenth and King Charles the Tenth, had preserved a great number of friends, and these, added to the personages whom the usages of society gave Villefort a claim on, formed a considerable body. Due information was given to the authorities and permission obtained that the two funerals should take place at the same time. A second hearse, decked with the same funereal pomp, was brought to Monsieur de Villefort's door, and the coffin removed into it from the post-wagon. The two bodies were to be interred in the cemetery of Père Lachaise, where Monsieur de Villefort had long since had a tomb prepared for the reception of his family. The remains of poor René were already deposited there, 
and now, after ten years of separation, her father and mother were to be reunited with her. The Parisians, always curious, always affected by funereal display, looked on with religious silence, while the splendid procession accompanied to their last abode two of the number of the old aristocracy, the greatest protectors of commerce and sincere devotees to their principles. In one of the morning coaches, Beauchamp, de Bray, and Chateau Renard were talking of the very sudden death of the Marchioness. I saw Madame de saint Moran only last year in Marseilles, when I was coming back from Algiers, said Chateau Renard. She looked like a woman destined to live to be a hundred years old, from her apparent sound health and great activity of mind and body. How old was she? Franz assured me, replied Albert, that she was sixty-six years old. But she had not died of old age, but of grief. It appears that since the death of the Marquis, which affected her very deeply, she has not completely recovered her reason. But of what disease, then, did she die? asked Bray. It is said to have been a congestion of the brain, or apoplexy, which is the same thing, is it not? Nearly. It is difficult to believe that it was apoplexy, said Beauchamp. Madame de saint Morin, whom I once saw, was short, of slender form, and of a much more nervous than sanguine temperament. Grief could hardly produce apoplexy in such a constitution as that of Madame de saint Morin. At any rate, said Albert, whatever disease or doctor may have killed her, Monsieur de Villefort, or rather Mademoiselle Valentin, or still rather our friend Franz, inherits a magnificent fortune, amounting, I believe, to eighty thousand livres per annum and this fortune will be doubled at the death of the old Jacobin Nortier. That is a tenacious old grandfather, said Bouchamp. Tenacem propositi virum. I think he must have made an agreement with death to outlive all his heirs, and he appears likely to succeed. He resembles the old conventionalist of ninety-three, who said to Napoleon in 1814, you bend because your empire is a young stem, weakened by rapid growth. Take the Republic for a tutor. Let us return with renewed strength to the battlefield, and I promise you five hundred thousand soldiers, another Marengo, and a second Austerlitz. Ideas do not become extinct, sire. They slumber sometimes, but only revive the stronger before they sleep entirely. Ideas and men appeared the same to him. One thing only puzzles me, namely how Franz Depanay will like a grandfather who cannot be separated from his wife. But where is Franz? In the first carriage with Monsieur de Villefort, who considers him already one of the family. Such was the conversation in almost all the carriages. These two sudden deaths so quickly following each other astonished everyone, but no one suspected the terrible secret which Monsieur d'Avigny had communicated in his nocturnal walk to Monsieur de Villefort. They arrived in about an hour at the cemetery. The weather was mild but dull, and in harmony with the funeral ceremony. Among the groups which flocked towards the family vault, Chateau Renau recognized Morel, who had come alone in a cabriolet and walked silently along the path bordered with yew trees. "'You here?' said Chateau Renau, passing his arms through the young captains. "'Are you a friend of Villefort's? How is it that I have never met you at his house?' "'I am no acquaintance of Monsieur de Villefort's,' answered Morel, "'but I was of Madame de saint Morin. Albert came up to them at this moment with Franz. The time and place are but ill-suited for an introduction, said Albert, but we are not superstitious. Monsieur Morel, allow me to present to you Monsieur Franz Depanay, a delightful traveling companion, with whom I made the tour of Italy. My dear Franz, Monsieur Maximilien Morel, an excellent friend I have acquired in your absence, 
and whose name you will hear me mention every time I make any allusion to affection, wit, or amiability. Morel hesitated for a moment. He feared it would be hypocritical to accost in a friendly manner the man whom he was tacitly opposing, but his oath and the gravity of the circumstances recurred to his memory. He struggled to conceal his emotion and bowed to Franz. Mademoiselle de Villefort is in deep sorrow, is she not? said de Bray to Franz. Extremely replied he, she looked so pale this morning I scarcely knew her. These apparently simple words pierced Morel to the heart. This man had seen Valentin, and spoken to her. The young and high-spirited officer required all his strength of mind to resist breaking his oath. He took the arm of Chateau Renau, and turned toward the vault, where the attendants had already placed the two coffins. "'This is a magnificent habitation,' said Bouchamp, looking toward the mausoleum. "'A summer and winter palace. "'You will in turn enter it, my dear Depanay, "'for you will soon be numbered as one of the family. "'I, as a philosopher, should like a little country house, "'a cottage down there under the trees, "'without so many free stones over my poor body. "'In dying I will say to those around me "'what Voltaire wrote to Perron, "'Eorus, and all will be over.' But come, Franz, take courage. Your wife is an heiress. Indeed, Beauchamp, you are unbearable. Politics has made you laugh at everything, and political men have made you disbelieve everything. But when you have the honor of associating with ordinary men, and the pleasure of leaving politics for a moment, try to find your affectionate heart, which you leave with your stick when you go to the chamber. But tell me, said Beauchamp, what is life? Is it not a hall in death's anteroom? I am prejudiced against Beauchamp, said Albert, drawing Franz away, and leaving the former to finish his philosophical dissertation with Debray. The Villefort vault formed a square of white stones, about twenty feet high. An interior partition separated the two families, and each apartment had its entrance door. Here were not, as in other tombs, ignoble drawers, one above another, where thrift bestows its dead and labels them like specimens in a museum. All that was visible within the bronze gates was a gloomy-looking room, separated by a wall from the vault itself. The two doors before mentioned were in the middle of this wall, and enclosed the Villefort and saint Moran coffins. There grief might freely expend itself without being disturbed by the trifling loungers who came from a picnic party to visit Père la Chasse, or by lovers who make it their rendezvous. The two coffins were placed on trestles, previously prepared for their reception in the right-hand crypt belonging to the saint Moran family. Villefort, Franz, and a few near relatives alone entered the sanctuary. As the religious ceremonies had all been performed at the door, and there was no address given, the party all separated. Chateau Renau, Albert, and Morel went one way, and de Bray and Bouchamp the other. Franz remained with Monsieur de Villefort. At the gate of the cemetery, Morel made an excuse to wait. He saw Franz and Monsieur de Villefort get into the same morning coach, and thought this meeting foreboded evil. He then returned to Paris, and although in the same carriage with Chateau Renaud and Albert, he did not hear one word of their conversation. As Franz was about to take leave of Monsieur de Villefort, "'When shall I see you again?' said the latter. "'At what time you please, sir,' replied Franz. "'As soon as possible. I am at your command, sir. Shall we return together? If not unpleasant to you?' On the contrary, I shall feel much pleasure. Thus the future father and son-in-law stepped into the same carriage, and Morel, seeing them pass, became uneasy. Villefort and Franz returned to the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. The procureur, without going to see either his wife or daughter, went at once to the study, and offering the young man a chair. 
Monsieur Depanay, said he, allow me to remind you at this moment, which is perhaps not so ill-chosen as at first sight may appear, for obedience to the wishes of the departed is the first offering which should be made at their tomb. Allow me then to remind you of the wish expressed by Madame de saint Morin on her deathbed that Valentin's wedding might not be deferred. You know the affairs of the deceased are in perfect order, and her will bequeaths to Valentin the entire property of the saint Morin family. The notary showed me the documents yesterday, which will enable us to draw up the contract immediately. You may call on the notary, Monsieur Deschamps, Place Vauveau, Faubourg Saint-Honoré, and you have my authority to inspect those deeds. Sir, replied Monsieur d'Epinay, it is not perhaps the moment for Mademoiselle Valentin, who is in deep distress, to think of a husband. Indeed, I fear Valentin will have no greater pleasure than that of fulfilling her grandmother's last injunctions. There will be no obstacle from that quarter, I assure you. In that case, replied Franz, as I shall raise none, you may make arrangements when you please. I have pledged my word and shall feel pleasure and happiness in adhering to it. Then, said Villefort, nothing further is required. The contract was to have been signed three days since. We shall find it all ready, and can sign it to-day. But the morning, said Franz, hesitating. Don't be uneasy on that score, replied Villefort. No ceremony will be neglected in my house. Mademoiselle de Villefort may retire during the prescribed three months to her estate of saint Morin. I say hers, for she inherits it to-day. Then after a few days, if you like, the civil marriage may be celebrated without pomp or ceremony. Madame de saint Morin wished her granddaughter should be married there. When that is over, you, sir, can return to Paris, while your wife passes the time of her mourning with her mother-in-law. As you please, sir, said Franz. Then replied Monsieur de Villefort, have the kindness to wait half an hour. Valentin shall come down in the drawing-room. I will send for Monsieur de Chans. We will read and sign the contract before we separate, and this evening Madame de Villefort shall accompany Valentin to her estate, where we will rejoin them in a week. Sir, said Franz, I have one request to make. What is it? I wish Albert de Morcerf and Raoul de Chateau Renard to be present at this signature. You know they are my witnesses. Half an hour will suffice to apprise them. Will you go for them yourself, or shall you send? I prefer going, sir. I shall expect you then in half an hour, Baron, and Valentin will be ready. Franz bowed and left the room. Scarcely had the door closed when Monsieur de Villefort sent to tell Valentin to be ready in the drawing-room in half an hour, as he expected the notary and M. Depinay and his witnesses. The news caused a great sensation throughout the house. Madame de Villefort would not believe it, and Valentin was thunderstruck. She looked around for help, and would have gone down to her grandfather's room, but on the stairs she met M. de Villefort, who took her arm and led her into the drawing-room. In the ante-room Valentin met Barois, and looked despairingly at the old servant. A moment later, Madame de Villefort entered the drawing-room with her little Edouard. It was evident she had shared the grief of the family, for she was pale and looked fatigued. She sat down, took Edouard on her knees, and from time to time pressed this child on whom her affections appeared centered, almost convulsively, to her bosom. Two carriages were soon heard to enter the courtyard. One was the notary's the other that of Franz and his friends. In a moment the whole party was assembled. Valentin was so pale one might trace the blue veins from her temples round her eyes and down her cheeks. Franz was deeply affected. Chateau Renaud and Albert looked at each other with amazement. The ceremony which was just concluded had not appeared more sorrowful than did that which was about to begin. 
Madame de Villefort had placed herself in the shadow behind a velvet curtain, and as she constantly bent over her child, it was difficult to read the expression of her face. Monsieur de Villefort was, as usual, unmoved. The notary, after having, according to the customary method, arranged the papers on the table, taken his place in an armchair, and raised his spectacles, turned toward Franz. "'Are you Monsieur Franz de Quenel, Baron d'Epinay?' asked he, although he knew it perfectly. "'Yes, sir,' replied Franz. The notary bowed. I have then to inform you, sir, at the request of Monsieur de Villefort, that your projected marriage with Mademoiselle de Villefort has changed the feeling of Monsieur Nortier toward his grandchild, and that he disinherits her entirely of the fortune he would have left her. Let me may hasten to add, continued he, that the testator, having only the right to alienate a part of his fortune, and having alienated it all, the will will not bear scrutiny, and is declared null and void. Yes, said Villefort, but I warn Monsieur d'Epinay that during my lifetime my father's will shall never be questioned, my position forbidding any doubt to be entertained. Sir, said Franz, I regret much that such a question has been raised in the presence of Mademoiselle Valentin. I have never inquired the amount of her fortune which, however limited it may be, exceeds mine. My family has sought consideration in this alliance with M. de Villefort. All I seek is happiness. Valentin imperceptibly thanked him, while two silent tears rolled down her cheeks. Besides, sir, said Villefort, addressing himself to his future son-in-law, accepting the loss of a portion of your hopes, this unexpected will need not personally wound you. Monsieur Nortier's weakness of mind sufficiently explains it. It is not because Mademoiselle Valentin is going to marry you that he is angry, but because she will marry. A union with any other would have caused him the same sorrow. Old age is selfish, sir, and Mademoiselle de Villefort has been a faithful companion to Monsieur Nortier, which she cannot be when she becomes the Baroness d'Epinay. My father's melancholy state prevents our speaking to him on any subjects, which the weakness of his mind would incapacitate him from understanding, and I am perfectly convinced that at the present time, although he knows that his granddaughter is going to be married, Monsieur Nortier has even forgotten the name of his intended grandson. Monsieur de Villefort had scarcely said this when the door opened and Barrois appeared. Gentlemen, said he, in a tone strangely firm for a servant speaking to his masters under such solemn circumstances, Gentlemen, Monsieur Nortier de Villefort wishes to speak immediately to Monsieur Franz de Quenel, Baron d'Epinay. He, as well as the notary, that there might be no mistake in the person, gave all the titles to the bridegroom-elect. Villefort started. Madame de Villefort let her son slip from her knees. Valentin rose pale and dumb as a statue. Albert and Chateau Renard exchanged a second look more full of amazement than the first. The notary looked at Villefort. It is impossible, said the procureur. Monsieur Depinay cannot leave the drawing-room at present. It is at this moment, replied Berrois with the same firmness, that Monsieur Nortier, my master, wishes to speak on important subjects to Monsieur Franz Depinay. Grandpapa Nortier can speak now, then, said Edouard with his habitual quickness. However, his remark did not make Madame de Villefort even smile. So much was every mind engaged, and so solemn was the situation. Astonishment was at its height. Something like a smile was perceptible on Madame de Villefort's countenance. Valentin instinctively raised her eyes, as if to thank heaven. "'Pray go, Valentin,' said Monsieur de Villefort, "'and see what this new fancy of your grandfather's is.' Valentin rose quickly, and was hastening joyfully toward the door, when Monsieur de Villefort altered his intention. "'Stop,' said he, "'I will go with you.' 
"'Excuse me, sir,' said Franz. "'Since Monsieur Nortier sent for me, I am ready to attend to his wish. "'Besides, I shall be happy to pay my respects to him, "'not having yet had the honour of doing so.' Pray, sir, said Villefort with marked uneasiness, do not disturb yourself. Forgive me, sir, said Franz in a resolute tone. I would not lose this opportunity of proving to Monsieur Nortier how wrong it would be of him to encourage feelings of dislike to me, which I am determined to conquer, whatever they may be, by my devotion. And without listening to Villefort, he arose and followed Valentin, who was running downstairs with the joy of a shipwrecked mariner who finds a rock to cling to. Monsieur de Villefort followed them. Chateau Renard and Morcerf exchanged a third look of still increasing wonder. End of chapter 74「The Count of Monte Cristo » by Alexandra Dumas Recording by Mark Nelson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. « The Count of Monte Cristo » by Alexandra Dumas Chapter 75 A Signed Statement Noirtier was prepared to receive them, dressed in black and installed in his armchair. When the three persons he expected had entered, he looked at the door, which his valet immediately closed. "'Listen,' whispered Villefort to Valentine, who could not conceal her joy, "'if Monsieur Noirtier wishes to communicate anything which would delay your marriage, I forbid you to understand him.' Valentine blushed but did not answer. Villefort approaching Noirtier. "'Here is Monsieur Franz d'Epinay,' said he. "'You requested to see him. We have all wished for this interview, and I trust it will convince you how ill-formed are your objections to Valentine's marriage.' Noirtier answered only by a look which made Villefort's blood run cold. He motioned to Valentine to approach. In a moment— Thanks to her habit of conversing with her grandfather, she understood that he asked for a key. Then his eye was fixed on the drawer of a small chest between the windows. She opened the drawer and found a key, and, understanding that was what he wanted, again watched his eyes, which turned toward an old secretary which had been neglected for many years, and was supposed to contain nothing but useless documents. "'Shall I open the secretary?' asked Valentine. "'Yes,' said the old man. "'And the drawers?' "'Yes.' "'Those at the side?' "'No.' "'The middle one?' "'Yes.' Valentine opened it and drew out a bundle of papers. "'Is that what you wish for?' asked she. "'No.' She took successively all the other papers out till the drawer was empty. "'But there are no more,' said she. Noirtier's eye was fixed on the dictionary. "'Yes, I understand, grandfather,' said the young girl. He pointed to each letter of the alphabet. At the letter S the old man stopped her. She opened and found the word secret. "'Ah, is there a secret spring?' said Valentine. Yes, said Noirtier. And who knows it? Noirtier looked at the door where the servant had gone out. Barois, said she. Yes. Shall I call him? Yes. Valentine went to the door and called Barois. Villefort's impatience during this scene made the perspiration roll from his forehead, and Franz was stupefied. The old servant came. Bawa, said Valentine, my grandfather has told me to open that drawer in the secretary, but there is a secret spring in it, which you know. Will you open it? Bawa looked at the old man. Obey, said Noitier's intelligent eye. 
Bawah touched a spring. The false bottom came out, and they saw a bundle of papers tied with a black string. "'Is that what you wish for?' said Bawah. "'Yes.' "'Shall I give these papers to Monsieur de Villefort?' "'No.' "'To Mademoiselle Valentine?' "'No.' "'To Monsieur Franz d'Epinay?' "'Yes.' Franz, astonished, advanced a step. "'To me, sir?' he said. "'Yes.' Franz took them from Barois, and casting a glance at the cover, read, "'To be given, after my death, to General Durand, who shall bequeath the packet to his son, with an injunction to preserve it as containing an important document.' "'Well, sir,' asked Franz, "'what do you wish me to do with this paper?' "'To preserve it and seal it up as it is, doubtless,' said the procurer. "'No!' replied Noitier eagerly. "'Do you wish him to read it?' said Valentine. "'Yes,' replied the old man. "'You understand, Baron, my grandfather wishes you to read this paper,' said Valentine. "'Then let us sit down,' said Villefort impatiently, "'for it will take some time.' "'Sit down,' said the old man. Villefort took a chair, but Valentine remained standing by her father's side, and frowns before him, holding the mysterious paper in his hand. "'Read,' said the old man. Franz untied it, and in the midst of the most profound silence, read, "'Extract from the report of a meeting of the Bonapartist Club in the Rue Saint-Jacques, held February 5th, 1815.' Franz stopped. "'February 5th, 1815,' said he. "'It is the day my father was murdered.' Valentine and Villefort were dumb. The eyes of the old man alone seemed to say clearly, "'Go on.' "'But it was on leaving this club,' said he. "'My father disappeared.' Noitier's eye continued to say, "'Read.' He resumed. The undersigned, Louis-Jacques Beaurepaire, lieutenant-colonel of artillery, Etienne du Champy, general of brigade, and Claude La Chapal, keeper of woods and forests, declare that on the 4th of February a letter arrived from the island of Elba, recommending to the kindness and the confidence of the Bonapartist Club General Flavian de Quenel, who, having served the emperor from 1804 to 1814, was supposed to be devoted to the interests of the Napoleon dynasty, notwithstanding the title of baron which Louis the Eighteenth had just granted to him with his estate of Epinay. A note was in consequence addressed to General de Quenel, begging him to be present at the meeting next day, the fifth. The note indicated neither the street nor the number of the house where the meeting was to be held. It bore no signature but it announced to the general that someone would call for him if he would be ready at nine o'clock. The meetings were always held from that time till midnight. At nine o'clock the president of the club presented himself. The general was ready. The president informed him that one of the conditions of his introduction was that he should be eternally ignorant of the place of the meeting, and that he would allow his eyes to be bandaged, swearing that he would not endeavor to take off the bandage. General de Quenel accepted the condition, and promised on his honor not to seek to discover the road they took. The general's carriage was ready, but the president told him it was impossible for him to use it, since it was useless to blindfold the master if the coachman knew through what streets he went. "'What must be done, then?' asked the general. I have my carriage here, said the President. Have you, then, so much confidence in your servant that you can entrust him with a secret you will not allow me to know? Our coachman is a member of the club, said the President. We shall be driven by a state councillor. Then we run another risk, said the General, laughing, that of being upset. We insert this joke, to prove that the general was not in the least compelled to attend the meeting, 
but that he came willingly. When they were seated in the carriage, the President reminded the General of his promise to allow his eyes to be bandaged, to which he made no opposition. On the road, the President thought he saw the General make an attempt to remove the handkerchief, and reminded him of his oath. "'Sure enough,' said the General. The carriage stopped at an alley leading out of the Rue Saint-Jacques. The General alighted, leaning on the arm of the President, of whose dignity he was not aware, considering him simply as a member of the club. They went through the alley, mounted a flight of stairs, and entered the assembly room. The deliberations had already begun. The members, apprised of the sort of presentation which was to be made that evening, were all in attendance. When in the middle of the room, the general was invited to remove his bandage. He did so immediately, and was surprised to see so many well-known faces in a society of whose existence he had till then been ignorant. They questioned him as to his sentiments, but he contented himself with answering that the letters from the island of Elba ought to have informed them. Franz interrupted himself by saying, "'My father was a royalist. They need not have asked his sentiments, which were well known.' "'And hence,' said Villefort, "'arose my affection for your father, my dear Monsieur Franz. Opinions held in common are a ready bond of union.' "'Read again,' said the old man. Franz continued. The President then sought to make him speak more explicitly, but M. de Quenel replied that he wished first to know what they wanted with him. He was then informed of the contents of the letter from the island of Elba, in which he was recommended to the club as a man who would be likely to advance the interests of their party. One paragraph spoke of the return of Bonaparte, and promised another letter and further details on the arrival of the pharaoh belonging to the shipbuilder Morel of Marseilles, whose captain was entirely devoted to the emperor. During all this time, the general, on whom they thought to have relied as on a brother, manifested evidently signs of discontent and repugnance. When the reading was finished, he remained silent, with knitted brows. "'Well,' asked the President, "'what do you say to this letter, General?' I say that it is too soon after declaring myself for Louis the Eighteenth to break my vow in behalf of the ex-emperor. This answer was too clear to permit of any mistake as to his sentiments. General, said the President, we acknowledge no King Louis the Eighteenth, or an ex-emperor, but His Majesty, the Emperor and King, driven from France, which is his kingdom by violence and treason. "'Excuse me, gentlemen,' said the general, "'you may not acknowledge Louis the Eighteenth, but I do, as he has made me a baron and a field-marshal, and I shall never forget that for these two titles I am indebted to his happy return to France.' "'Sir,' said the President, rising with gravity, "'be careful what you say.' Your words clearly show us that they are deceived concerning you in the island of Elba, and have deceived us. The communication has been made to you in consequence of the confidence placed in you, and which does you honor. Now we discover our error. A title and promotion attach you to the government we wish to overturn. We will not constrain you to help us. We unroll no one against his conscience. But— we will compel you to act generously, even if you are not disposed to do so. You would call acting generously, knowing your conspiracy, and not informing against you. That is what I should call becoming your accomplice. You see, I am more candid than you. Ah, my father, said Franz, interrupting himself, I understand now why they murdered him. Valentine could not help casting one glance towards the young man, whose filial enthusiasm it was delightful to behold. Villefort walked to and fro behind them. Noirtier watched the expression of each one, and preserved his dignified and commanding attitude. Franz returned to the manuscript, and continued. "'Sir,' said the President, 
You have been invited to join this assembly. You were not forced here. It was proposed to you to come blindfolded. You accepted. When you complied with this twofold request, you well knew we did not wish to secure the throne of Louis the Eighteenth, or we should not take so much care to avoid the vigilance of the police. It would be conceding too much to allow you to put on a mask to aid you in the discovery of our secret, and then to remove it that you may ruin those who have confided in you. No, no, you must first say if you declare yourself for the king of a day who now reigns, or for his majesty the emperor. I am a royalist, replied the general. I have taken the oath of allegiance to Louis the Eighteenth, and I will adhere to it. These words were followed by a general murmur, and it was evident that several of the members were discussing the propriety of making the general repent of his rashness. The president again arose, and having imposed silence, said, "'Sir, you are too serious and too sensible a man not to understand the consequences of our present situation, and your candor has already dictated to us the conditions which remain for us to offer you.' The general, putting his hand on his sword, exclaimed, "'If you talk of honour, do not begin by disavowing its laws, and impose nothing by violence.' "'And you, sir,' continued the President, with a calmness still more terrible than the general's anger, "'I advise you not to touch your sword.' The general looked around him with a slight uneasiness. However, he did not yield. But— calling up all his fortitude, said, "'I will not swear.' "'Then you must die,' replied the President calmly. Monsieur Depinay became very pale. He looked round him a second time. Several members of the club were whispering, and getting their arms from under their cloaks. "'General,' said the President, "'do not alarm yourself. You are among men of honour who will use every means to convince you before resorting to the last extremity. But, as you have said, you are among conspirators, you are in possession of our secret, and you must restore it to us. A significant silence followed these words, and, as the general did not reply, "'Close the doors,' said the President to the doorkeeper. The same deadly silence succeeded these words. Then the general advanced, making a violent effort to control his feelings. "'I have a son,' he said, "'and I ought to think of him, finding myself among assassins.' "'General,' said the chief of the assembly, "'one man may insult fifty. It is the privilege of weakness. But he does wrong to use his privilege. Follow my advice. Swear, and do not insult.' The general, again daunted by the superiority of the chief, hesitated a moment, then advancing to the president's desk. "'What is the form?' said he. "'It is this. I swear by my honour not to reveal to any one what I have seen and heard on the 5th of February, 1815, between nine and ten o'clock in the evening. And I plead guilty of death should I ever violate this oath.' the general appeared to be affected by a nervous tremor, which prevented his answering for some moments. Then, overcoming his manifest repugnance, he pronounced the required oath, but in so low a tone as to be scarcely audible to the majority of the members, who insisted on his repeating it clearly and distinctly, which he did. "'Now am I at liberty to retire?' said the general. The president rose appointed three members to accompany him, and got into the carriage with the general after bandaging his eyes. One of these three members was the coachman who had driven them there. The other members silently dispersed. "'Now am I at liberty to retire?' said the general. The president rose, appointed three members to accompany him, and got into the carriage with the general after bandaging his eyes. One of those three members was the coachman who had driven them there. The other members silently dispersed. "'Where do you wish to be taken?' asked the President. "'Anywhere out of your presence,' 
replied Monsieur Depinay. "'Beware, sir,' replied the President. "'You are no longer in the Assembly, and have only to do with individuals. Do not insult them unless you wish to be held responsible.' But instead of listening, Monsieur Depinay went on. "'You are still as brave in your carriage as in your assembly, because you are still four against one.' The President stopped the coach. They were at that part of the Quai d'Orme where the steps led down to the river. "'Why do you stop here?' asked Depinay. "'Because, sir,' said the President, "'you have insulted a man, and that man will not go one step farther without demanding honorable reparation.' "'Another method of assassination,' said the general, shrugging his shoulders. "'Make no noise, sir, unless you wish me to consider you as one of the men of whom you spoke just now as cowards, who take their weakness for a shield. You are alone. One alone shall answer you. You have a sword by your side. I have one in my cane. You have no witness. One of these gentlemen will serve you.' Now, if you please, remove your bandage." The general tore the handkerchief from his eyes. "'At last,' said he, "'I shall know with whom I have to do.' They opened the door, and the four men alighted. Franz again interrupted himself, and wiped the cold drops from his brow. There was something awful in hearing the son read aloud in trembling pallor these details of his father's death which had hitherto been a mystery. Valentine clasped her hands as if in prayer. Noirtier looked at Villefort with an almost sublime expression of contempt and pride. Franz continued. It was, as we said, the 5th of February. For three days the mercury had been five or six degrees below freezing, and the steps were covered with ice. The general was stout and tall. The President offered him the side of the railing to assist him in getting down. The two witnesses followed. It was a dark night. The ground from the steps to the river was covered with snow and hoar-frost. The water of the river looked black and deep. One of the seconds went for a lantern in a coal-barge near, and, by its light, they examined the weapons. The President's sword which was simply, as he had said, one he carried in his cane, was five inches shorter than the general's, and had no guard. The general proposed to cast lots for the swords, but the president said it was he who had given the provocation, and when he had given it, he had supposed each would use his own arms. The witnesses endeavored to insist, but the president bade them be silent. The lantern was placed on the ground, the two adversaries took their stations, and the duel began. The light made the two swords appear like flashes of lightning. As for the men, they were scarcely perceptible, the darkness was so great. General Depinay passed for one of the best swordsmen in the army, but he was pressed so closely in the onset that he missed his aim and fell. The witnesses thought he was dead, but his adversary— who knew he had not struck him, offered him the assistance of his hand to rise. The circumstance irritated, instead of calming the general, and he rushed on his adversary. But his opponent did not allow his guard to be broken. He received him on his sword, and three times the general drew back on finding himself too closely engaged, and then returned to the charge. At the third he fell again. They thought he slipped, as at first, and the witnesses, seeing he did not move, approached and endeavored to raise him, but the one who passed his arm around the body found it was moistened with blood. The general, who had almost fainted, revived. Ah, said he, they have sent me some fencing-master to fight with me. The president, without answering, approached the witnesses who held the lantern, and, raising his sleeve, showed him two wounds he had received in his arm. Then, opening his coat, and unbuttoning his waistcoat, displayed his side, pierced with a third wound. Still he had not even uttered a sigh. General Depinay died five minutes after.
Franz read these last words in a voice so choked that they were hardly audible, and then stopped, passing his hand over his eyes as if to dispel a cloud. But after a moment's silence, he continued. The president went up the steps, after pushing his sword into his cane. A track of blood on the snow marked his course. He had scarcely arrived at the top when he heard a heavy splash in the water. It was the general's body, which the witnesses had just thrown into the river after ascertaining that he was dead. The general fell then in a loyal duel, and not in ambush, as might have been reported. In proof of this, we have signed this paper to establish the truth of the facts, lest the moment should arrive when either of the actors in this terrible scene should be accused of premeditated murder or of infringement of the laws of honor. Signed, Beaurepaire, Deschamps, and Le Charpal. When Franz had finished reading this account, so dreadful for a son, when Valentine, pale with emotion, had wiped away a tear, when Villefort, trembling and crouching in a corner, had endeavoured to lessen the storm by supplicating glances at the implacable old man. "'Sir,' said Depanay to Noitier, "'since you are well acquainted with all these details, which are attested by honourable signatures, since you appear to take some interest in me, although you have only manifested it hitherto by causing me sorrow, refuse me not one final satisfaction. Tell me the name of the president of the club.' that I may at least know who killed my father." Villefort mechanically felt for the handle of the door. Valentine, who understood sooner than any one her grandfather's answer, and who had often seen two scars upon his right arm, drew back a few steps. "'Mademoiselle,' said Franz, turning towards Valentine, "'unite your efforts with mine to find out the name of the man who made me an orphan at two years of age.' Valentine remained dumb and motionless. "'Hold, sir,' said Villefort. "'Do not prolong this dreadful scene. The names have been purposely concealed. My father himself does not know who this president was, and if he knows, he cannot tell you. Proper names are not in the dictionary.' "'Oh, misery!' cried Franz. The only hope which sustained me and enabled me to read to the end was that knowing at least the name of him who killed my father. "'Sir, sir,' cried he, turning to Noitier, "'do what you can. Make me understand in some way.' "'Yes,' replied Noitier. "'Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle,' cried Franz, "'your grandfather says he can indicate the person. Help me.' Lend me your assistance. Noitier looked at the dictionary. Franz took it with a nervous trembling, and repeated the letters of the alphabet successively until he came to M. At that letter the old man signified, Yes. M, repeated Franz. The young man's finger glided over the words, but at each one Noitier answered by a negative sign. Valentine hid her head between her hands. At length, Franz arrived at the word, myself. Yes. You, cried Franz, whose hair stood on end, you, Monsieur Noitier, you killed my father? Yes, replied Noitier, fixing a majestic look on the young man. Franz fell powerless on a chair. Villefort opened the door and escaped for the idea had entered his mind to stifle the little remaining life in the heart of this terrible old man. End of chapter 75「The Count of Monte Cristo」read by Mark Nelson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 76 Progress of Cavalcanti the Younger. 
Meanwhile, Monsieur Cavalcanti, the elder, had returned to his service. Not in the army of His Majesty, the Emperor of Austria, but at the gaming-table of the Baths of Lucca, of which he was one of the most assiduous courtiers. He had spent every farthing that had been allowed for his journey, as a reward for the majestic and solemn manner in which he had maintained his assumed character of father. Monsieur Andrea, at his departure, inherited all the papers which proved that he had indeed the honour of being the son of the Marquis Bartolomeo and the Marchioness Oliva Corsonari. He was now fairly launched in that Parisian society, which gives such ready access to foreigners, and treats them, not as they really are, but as they wish to be considered. Besides, what is required of a young man in Paris? To speak its language tolerably, to make a good appearance, to be a good gamester, and to pay in cash. They are certainly less particular with a foreigner than with a Frenchman. Andrea had, then, in a fortnight, attained a very fair position. He was called Count, he was said to possess fifty thousand lira per annum, and his father's immense riches, buried in the quarries of Saravezza, were a constant theme. A learned man, before whom the last circumstance was mentioned as a fact, declared he had seen the quarries in question, which gave great weight to assertions hitherto somewhat doubtful, but which now assumed the garb of reality. Such was the state of society in Paris at the period we bring before our readers, when Monte Cristo went one evening to pay Monsieur Danglars a visit. Monsieur Danglars was out, but the Count was asked to go and see the Baroness, and he accepted the invitation. It was never without a nervous shudder, since the dinner at Autuy and the events which followed it, that Madame Danglars heard Monte Cristo's name announced. If he had not come, the painful sensation became most intense. If, on the contrary, he appeared, his noble countenance, his brilliant eyes, his amiability, his polite attention even towards Madame Danglars, soon dispelled every impression of fear. It appeared impossible to the Baroness that a man of such delightfully pleasing manners should entertain evil designs against her. Besides, the most corrupt minds only suspect evil when it would answer some interested end. Useless injury is repugnant to every mind. When Monte Cristo entered the boudoir, to which we have already once introduced our readers, and where the baroness was examining some drawings, which her daughter passed to her after having looked at them with Monsieur Cavalcanti, his presence soon produced its usual effect and it was with smiles that the baroness received the count, although she had been a little disconcerted at the announcement of his name. The latter took in the whole scene at a glance. The baroness was partially reclining on a sofa. Eugenie sat near her, and Cavalcanti was standing. Cavalcanti, dressed in black, like one of Goethe's heroes, with varnished shoes and white, silk open-worked stockings, passed a white and tolerably nice-looking hand through his light hair, and so displayed a sparkling diamond, that in spite of Monte Cristo's advice, the vain young man had been unable to resist putting on his little finger. This movement was accompanied by killing glances at Mademoiselle Danglars, and by sighs launched in that same direction. Mademoiselle Danglars was still the same, cold, beautiful, and satirical. Not one of these glances, nor one sigh, was lost on her. They might have been said to fall on the shield of Minerva, which some philosophers assert protected sometimes the breast of Sappho. Eugenie bowed coldly to the Count, and availed herself of the first moment when the conversation became earnest to escape to her study whence, very soon, two cheerful and noisy voices being heard, in connection with occasional notes of the piano, assured Monte Cristo that Mademoiselle Danglars preferred to his society, and to that of Monsieur Cavalcanti, the company of Mademoiselle Louise d'Armelie, her singing-teacher. 
It was then, especially while conversing with Madame Danglars, and apparently absorbed by the charm of the conversation, that the Count noticed M. Andrea Cavalcanti's solicitude. His manner of listening to the music at the door he dared not pass, and of manifesting his admiration. The banker soon returned. His first look was certainly directed towards Monte Cristo, but the second was for Andrea. As for his wife, he bowed to her, as some husbands do to their wives, but in a way that bachelors will never comprehend, until a very extensive code is published on conjugal life. "'Have not the ladies invited you to join them at the piano?' said Danglars to Andrea. "'Alas, no, sir,' replied Andrea, with a sigh still more remarkable than the former ones. Danglars immediately advanced towards the door and opened it. The two ladies were seen seated on the same chair at the piano, accompanying themselves, each with one hand, a fancy to which they had accustomed themselves and performed admirably. Mademoiselle d'Armely, whom they then perceived through the open doorway, formed with Eugenie one of the tableaux vivants of which the Germans are so fond. She was somewhat beautiful and exquisitely formed, a little fairy-like figure with large curls falling down her neck, which was rather too long, as Perugino sometimes makes his virgins, and her eyes dull from fatigue. She was said to have a weak chest, and, like Antonia in the Cremona Violin, she would die one day while singing. Monte Cristo cast one rapid and curious glance round this sanctum. It was the first time he had ever seen Mademoiselle d'Armilly, of whom he had heard much. "'Well,' said the banker to his daughter, "'are we then all to be excluded?' He then led the young man into the study, and either by chance or manoeuvre the door was partially closed after Andrea, so that from the place where they sat neither the Count nor the Baroness could see anything. But as the banker had accompanied Andrea, Madame Danglars appeared to take no notice of it. The Count soon heard Andrea's voice, singing a Corsican song accompanied by the piano. While the Count smiled at hearing this song, which made him lose sight of Andrea in the recollection of Benedetto, Madame Danglars was boasting to Monte Cristo of her husband's strength of mind who, that very morning, had lost three or four hundred thousand francs by a failure at Milan. The praise was well deserved, for had not the Count heard it from the Baroness, or by one of those means by which he knew everything, the Baron's countenance would have not led him to suspect it. Hmm, thought Monte Cristo, he begins to conceal his losses a month since he boasted of them. Then aloud, "'Oh, madame, Monsieur Danglars is so skilful, he will soon regain at the bourse what he loses elsewhere.' "'I see that you participate in a prevalent error,' said Madame Danglars. "'What is it?' said Monte Cristo. "'That Monsieur Danglars speculates, whereas he never does.' "'Truly, madame, I recollect Monsieur de Bray told me—' Apropos, what has become of him? I have seen nothing of him the last three or four days. Nor I, said Madame Danglars. But you began a sentence, sir, and did not finish. Which? Monsieur de Bray had told you. Ah, yes, he told me it was you who sacrificed to the demon of speculation. I was once very fond of it but I do not indulge now. Then you are wrong, madame. Fortune is precarious, and if I were a woman and fate had made me a banker's wife, whatever might be my confidence in my husband's good fortune, still in speculation you know there is a great risk. Well, I would secure for myself a fortune independent of him even if I acquired it by placing my interests in hands unknown to him. Madame Danglars blushed, in spite of all her efforts. 
"'Stay,' said Monte Cristo, as though he had not observed her confusion. "'I have heard of a lucky hit that was made yesterday on the Neapolitan bonds.' "'I have none, nor have I ever possessed any. "'But really we have talked long enough of money, Count. "'We are like two stockbrokers. "'Have you heard how fate is persecuting the poor Villeforts?' "'What has happened?' said the Count, simulating total ignorance. "'You know the Marquis of saint Morin died a few days after he had set out on his journey to Paris, and the Marchioness a few days after her arrival.' "'Yes,' said Monte Cristo. "'I have heard that. But, as Claudius said to Hamlet, it is the law of nature. Their fathers died before them, and they mourn their loss.' They will die before their children, who will in turn grieve for them. But that is not all. Not all? No, they were going to marry their daughter. To Monsieur Franz d'Epinay. Is it broken off? Yesterday morning, it appears, Franz declined the honor. Indeed! And is the reason known? No. How extraordinary! And how does Monsieur de Villefort bear it? As usual, like a philosopher. Danglars returned at this moment alone. Well, said the baroness, do you leave Monsieur Cavalcanti with your daughter? And Mademoiselle d'Armilly, said the banker, do you consider her no one? Then, turning to Monte Cristo, he said, Prince Cavalcanti is a charming young man, is he not? But is he really a prince? I will not answer for it, said Monte Cristo. His father was introduced to me as a marquis, so he ought to be a count, but I do not think he has much claim to that title. Why, said the banker, if he is a prince, he is wrong not to maintain his rank. I do not like any one to deny his origin. Oh, you are a thorough democrat, said Monte Cristo, smiling. But do you see to what you are exposing yourself? said the baroness. If perchance Monsieur de Morcerf came, he would find Monsieur Cavalcanti in that room, where he, the betrothed of Eugenie, has never been admitted. "'You may well say, perchance,' replied the banker, "'for he comes so seldom, it would seem only chance that brings him. "'But should he come and find that young man with your daughter, he might be displeased. "'He, you are mistaken. Monsieur Albert would not do us the honour to be jealous. "'He does not like Eugenie sufficiently. "'Besides, I care not for his displeasure.' still situated as we are. Yes, do you know how we are situated? At his mother's ball he danced once with Eugenie and Monsieur Cavalcanti three times, and he took no notice of it. The valet announced Vicomte Albert de Morcerf. The baroness rose hastily and was going into the study when Danglars stopped her. Let her alone, said he. She looked at him in amazement. Monte Cristo appeared to be unconscious of what passed. Albert entered, looking very handsome and in high spirits. He bowed politely to the baroness, familiarly to Danglars, and affectionately to Monte Cristo. Then, turning to the baroness, "'May I ask how Mademoiselle Danglars is?' said he. "'She is quite well,' replied Danglars quickly. She is at the piano with Monsieur Cavalcanti. Albert retained his calm and indifferent manner. He might feel perhaps annoyed, but he knew Monte Cristo's eye was on him. Monsieur Cavalcanti has a fine tenor voice, said he, and Mademoiselle Eugenie a splendid soprano. And then she plays the piano like Thalberg. The concert must be a delightful one. "'They suit each other remarkably well,' said Danglars. Albert appeared not to notice this remark, which was, however, so rude that Madame Danglars blushed. 
I, too, said the young man, am a musician. At least my masters used to tell me so. But it is strange that my voice never would suit any other, and a soprano less than any. Danglars smiled, and seemed to say, it is of no consequence. Then, hoping doubtless to effect his purpose, he said, "'The prince and my daughter were universally admired yesterday. You were not of the party, Monsieur de Morcerf.' "'What prince?' asked Albert. "'Prince Cavalcanti,' said Danglars, who persisted in giving the young man that title." "'Pardon me,' said Albert, "'I was not aware that he was a prince. "'And Prince Cavalcante sang with Mademoiselle Eugenie yesterday. "'It must have been charming indeed. "'I regret not having heard them. "'But I was unable to accept your invitation, "'having promised to accompany my mother to a German concert "'given by the Baroness of Chateau Renaud. "'This was followed by rather an awkward silence.' "'May I also be allowed,' said Morcerf, "'to pay my respects to Mademoiselle Danglars?' "'Wait a moment,' said the banker, stopping the young man. "'Do you hear that delightful cavatina? "'Ta-ta-ta, ti-ta-ti-ta-ti-ta, it is charming. "'Let them finish. One moment. "'Bravo, bravi, brava!' "'The banker was enthusiastic in his applause.' Indeed, said Albert, it is exquisite. It is impossible to understand the music of his country better than Prince Cavalcanti does. You said Prince, did you not? But he can easily become one, if he is not one already. It is no uncommon thing in Italy. But to return to the charming musicians, you should give us a treat, Danglars. Without telling them there is a stranger, ask them to sing one more song. It is so delightful to hear music in the distance when the musicians are unrestrained by observation. Danglars was quite annoyed by the young man's indifference. He took Monte Cristo aside. "'What do you think of our lover?' said he. "'He appears cool. But then your word is given.' "'Yes. Doubtless I have promised to give my daughter to a man who loves her, but not to one who does not. See him there, cold as marble, and proud like his father. If he were rich, if he had Cavalcanti's fortune, that might be pardoned. Ma foi, I haven't consulted my daughter, but if she has good taste. Oh, said Monte Cristo, my fondness may blind me, but I assure you I consider Morcerf a charming young man, who will render your daughter happy and will sooner or later attain a certain amount of distinction, and his father's position is good. Hmm, said Danglars. Why do you doubt? The past, that obscurity on the past. But that does not affect the sun. Very true. Now I beg of you, don't go off your head. It's a month now that you have been thinking of this marriage, and you must see that it throws some responsibility on me, for it was at my house you met this young Cavalcanti, whom I do not really know at all. But I do. Have you made inquiry? Is there any need of that? Does not his appearance speak for him? And he is very rich. I am not so sure of that. And yet you said he had money. Fifty thousand lira, a mere trifle. He is well educated. Hmm, said Monte Cristo in his turn. He is a musician. So are all Italians. Come, Count, you do not do that young man justice. Well, I acknowledge it annoys me, knowing your connection with the Morcerf family, to see him throw himself in the way. Danglars burst out laughing. "'What a Puritan you are!' said he. "'That happens every day. "'But you cannot break it off in this way. "'The more serfs are depending on this union.' "'Indeed.' "'Positively. "'Then let them explain themselves. "'You should give the father a hint. 
You are so intimate with the family. I? Where the devil did you find out that? At their ball it was apparent enough. Why did not the Countess, the proud Mercedes, the disdainful Catalan, who will scarcely open her lips to her oldest acquaintances, take your arm, lead you into the garden, into the private walks, and remain there for half an hour? "'Ah, Baron, Baron,' said Albert, "'you are not listening. What barbarism in a megalomaniac like you!' "'Oh, don't worry about me, Sir Mocker,' said Danglar. Then, turning to the Count, he said, "'But will you undertake to speak to the father?' "'Willingly, if you wish it.' but let it be done explicitly and positively. If he demands my daughter, let him fix the day, declare his conditions. In short, let us either understand each other or quarrel. You understand, no more delay. Yes, sir, I will give my attention to the subject. I do not say that I await with pleasure his decision, but I do await it. A banker must, you know, be a slave to his promise. And Danglar sighed, as M. Cavalcanti had done half an hour before. "'Bravi! Bravo! Brava!' cried Morcerf, parodying the banker as the selection came to an end. Danglar began to look suspiciously at Morcerf when someone came and whispered a few words to him. "'I shall return,' said the banker to Monte Cristo. "'Wait for me.' I shall perhaps have something to say to you. And he went out. The baroness took advantage of her husband's absence to push open the door of her daughter's study, and Monsieur Andrea, who was sitting before the piano with Mademoiselle Eugenie, started up like a jack-in-the-box. Albert bowed with a smile to Mademoiselle Danglars, who did not appear in the least disturbed, and returned his bow with her usual coolness. Cavalcanti was evidently embarrassed. He bowed to Morcerf, who replied with the most impertinent look possible. Then Albert launched out in praise of Mademoiselle Danglar's voice, and, on his regret, after what he had just heard, that he had been unable to be present the previous evening. Cavalcanti, being left alone, turned to Monte Cristo. "'Come,' said Madame Danglar, "'leave music and compliments.' Let us go and take tea. Come, Louise, said Mademoiselle Danglars to her friend. They passed into the next drawing-room, where tea was prepared. Just as they were beginning, in the English fashion, to leave the spoons in their cups, the door again opened, and Danglars entered, visibly agitated. Monte Cristo observed it particularly, and by a look asked the banker for an explanation. "'I have just received my courier from Greece,' said Danglars. "'And yes,' said the Count, "'that was the reason of your running away from us?' "'Yes.' "'How is King Otho getting on?' asked Elbert in the most sprightly tone. Danglars cast another suspicious look towards him without answering, and Monte Cristo turned away to conceal the expression of pity which passed over his features, but which was gone in a moment." "'We shall go together, shall we not?' said Albert to the Count. "'If you like,' replied the latter. Albert could not understand the banker's look, and turning to Monte Cristo, who understood it perfectly, "'Did you see,' said he, "'how he looked at me?' "'Yes,' said the Count, "'but did you think there was anything particular in his look?' "'Indeed I did. And what does he mean by his news from Greece?' How can I tell you? Because I imagine you have correspondents in that country. Monte Cristo smiled significantly. Stop, said Albert, here he comes. I shall compliment Mademoiselle Danglars on her cameo, while the father talks to you. If you compliment her at all, let it be on her voice, at least, said Monte Cristo. No, everyone would do that. "'My dear Viscount, you are dreadfully impertinent.' Albert advanced towards Eugenie, smiling. Meanwhile, Danglars, stooping to Monte Cristo's ear, "'Your advice was excellent,' said he. "'There is a whole history connected with the names Fernand and Yanina.' 
Indeed, said Monte Cristo. Yes, I will tell you all, but take away the young man. I cannot endure his presence. He is going with me. Shall I send the father to you? Immediately. Very well. The Count made a sign to Albert, and they bowed to the ladies and took their leave. Albert, perfectly indifferent to Mademoiselle Danglars's contempt, Monte Cristo reiterating his advice to Madame Danglars on the prudence a banker's wife should exercise in providing for the future. Monsieur Cavalcanti remained master of the field. End of chapter 76